Chapter 161 Jeanette Soth to Tenny and Gual instantly raised their heads, when they heard their masters shout. But before they could react, several people came out nowhere, held their waists and covered their mouths. Why? Dot. Why did you have to do this to me? Jeanette was thoroughly confused. She had loved him and even given him her all, so why would he betray her like his? My darling sister, isn't it very obvious by now? Carrie walked into the room with Angela, and some other knights. Antony immediately grabbed Carrie's tiny waist and kissed her passionately. Jeanette was shocked. She could see two Carries kissing two Anthonis. Of course she was drugged so she was seeing double. No no no. Dot. I'm definitely hallucinating. U B C H. Get away from my man. She yelled out hysterically. Your man? Tell me elder sister, in what way is he your man? Carrie said leaning against Anthonis' broad shoulders. Wretch. Dot. I said you should get away from him. Janet yelled as she tried to stand up from the floor, although her head was hurting. Her heart was currently bleeding from pain. Her man? How could Antony love her unattractive younger sister? Didn't he know of Carrie's reputation within the Empire? So how could he choose a praying mantis over a goddess? No, impossible. She probably deceived him in believing her lies. Jeanette was currently within the stage of denial. You. Dot. You tricked him into liking you, didn't you? What have you done to my Antony? Jeanette yelled as she gazed at Antony affectionately. I tricked him. Ha 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 ha. It's even worse than I thought. You actually believed that my man would find your overgrown breasts attractive, or your ugly figure as seductive? Please. Dot. Why would he bother with you when he can just have me? Carrie said angrily. Granted, she was less prettier than Jeanette. But so what, at the end of the day didn't the man that Jeanette loved end up with her? Who has beauty ever helped? Power and money was all that mattered. Truthfully, Carrie was exceptionally beautiful. But when she stood by her sister, her looks faded away to oblivion. She had always been pitted against her sister right from birth. Was it her fault that she had small boobs? Well guess what? Her man had told her that he hated big boobs so she knew that a man wouldn't fall for her sister's sour bags of melons. Her sister had always ruined her image, and set her up multiple times within the empire. She had even accepted punishment for crimes she didn't commit. And finally, her ancestors had listened to her prayers. After today, the empire would only have one princess. Carrie Barn, my dear sister, I hate to break it to you. But Anthony is my boyfriend, not yours, Carrie said arrogantly. What the hell are you talking about? Exclamation mark. Jeanette yelled out angrily. Well you see elder sister, before you had ever seen him. He and I were secretly an item. But when I found out that you had the hots for him, he and I came up with this plan to take you down. You know, I used to have a little bit of respect for you. But how could you be so stupid to assume that Antony here will side with you in anything when my brother will be the future king? Any fool would choose Elis' side over yours. The more Janet listened, the more she couldn't believe her ears. Baby. Tell me it's not true. Please tell me that she's holding you as a hostage. That's it. This shameless BCH is holding you as a hostage right? Everyone in the room was at loss for words at this point. Even Carrie and Angela were surprised. They told this woman that they had planned everything, yet she still believed in it being a lie. Just how much did she love him to defy logic? You shameless BCH. Deal with me fairly. Why must you involve Antony in this? Free him now. Slap. Antony had slapped Jeanette so hard, that she had almost knocked her head on the ground from the impact. Let me make this clear to you Jeanette Barn. I, Antony Martinez, have been in love with Carrie Barn for two years now. Yes, I used you. And now, I'm dumping you. It seemed like that slap and those words had made Jeanette come to her senses because now, she was sitting quietly and looking at the shameless couple coldly. At this point, she wanted nothing more than to tear up their faces, and feed them to her pet bears. She had never been hit before in her life, and coupled with Anthonis' words. It was safe to say that she could see clearly, now that the rain was gone. Hey, are you forgetting about me? Angela interrupted as she pouted her face cutely. Ha 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 cousin. How would I dare forget about you? 
All this was made possible because of you, Carrie said playfully. Jeanette looked at Angela, and everything started to make sense now. So Angela herself wasn't interested in Anthony? She only did this so as to make Jeanette fall madly in love with Anthony? When someone fights for something they want, the value of that object in their minds double. And eventually, they make stupid decisions and choices just for that person. Some people have given all their money, power and have even stolen money from their parents. Just to please someone they loved. The current Jeanette, had told all her plans to Anthony. All of them. At this point, she realized that she was truly a fool. There was a thin line between love and hate, and Jeanette had just started crossing the borders. She started to feel hate for this man that she had given her entire world to. Ah. Dot. I forgot to tell you big sis, all your men who were supposed to hide around the palace, have been captured by us. So don't even think that anyone would be coming to save you. Ha 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 ha. Jeanette started laughing like crazy. Of course they would know about her plans. After all, she had willingly told Anthony hadn't she? For this operation, she had only needed 100 men to act. Her plan was simple. Usually during the wedding ceremony, there was a time frame where her father had to leave the hall alone and head to the private royal grave and pray to the ancestors for her marriage. He was supposed to pray the for 15 minutes. She had already stationed her men to hide within the tombstone hall, and kill the fool. But now, it seemed that she had been guarding against the wrong enemy this wild time. She had truly underestimated this little sister of hers. All right elder sister, we really must be going. After all, we don't want anyone knowing that we came here. So this is our final goodbye all right, Carrie said while smiling, Jenny, I really had fun with you these few years. Oh, make sure to say hello to my ancestors when you see them wherever they are dot 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 he ha he, Angela said while blowing her a kiss. Anthony didn't even bother to look at her. His gaze had always stayed on Carrie. Carrie smiled as she noticed this too. Finally, her man was free from this villain, Sir Death. Please finish the job. After this, our contract will officially be terminated. Sir Death was the assassin that she had hired several months ago. Previously, the contract expired. And when she thought that Sir Death would leave, he chose to renew the contract instead. He said that her life was interesting. Whatever that means. And now that Jeanette would die, was there any need to keep him here again? Her biggest nemesis was dead. As for her stepbrothers, she was sure that Eli would be able to deal with them easily. Sure, Sir Death said. He walked towards Jeanette, and shook his head wryly. It was truly a waste to kill such a beauty without even touching her soft plump skin. But time was of the essence so killing her couldn't be delayed any further. Jeanette watched the cloaked man walk towards her, and her body began to tremble slightly. How did she allow herself to reach such an outcome? Wasn't it because of love? Just remembering the hint of disgust in Anthony's eyes when he slapped her, truly made her want to stab her former self. What did she ever see in that bastard? She couldn't help but remember Marda Shannon, who had explicitly warned her against him. Shannon had clearly loved her more than Anthony did. So why did she end up choosing Anthony? It was all because of Angelina. When she first met Anthony, she wasn't as smitten with him as she was a few hours ago. Her love had come from a build-up of hardship and hard work. She fought for that man like crazy. Sure, she had killed, crippled and dealt with some of the women who approached him, but she refused to believe that she was a bad person. Love justified everything. She knew that she was going to die today, so she made an oath in her heart. Even if I, Jeanette Barn go towards the heavens, I shall never fall in love again. Even as an ancestor. This is my oath. Chapter 162 A Mother's Cry As Jeanette saw the dagger coming towards her chest, she closed her eyes and prayed that the pain wouldn't be too unbearable. Ah! Dot! She yelled out, as she slowly lost consciousness. The pain was so unbearable and gut-wrenching that she began to press her hand against her chest. While struggling to gasp for air, she could feel herself slipping from this world, as everything around her suddenly became dark and cold. Until finally, she was dead. After making sure that she was dead, 
Sir Death walked towards the two maids who were still being held down by his men. He killed one of them, and whispered into the other one's ear before knocking her out cold. Dot. An hour and a half had passed and the bride was nowhere to be found. Everyone was in the hall waiting anxiously. Even Carrie, Angelia and Anthony. They too pretended to be worried. Dead. 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 She's dead. A 21-year-old guard was running like crazy into the hall. This was the guard that had been sent to bring Jeanette's entourage into the hall. Who's dead? Alec Barn asked. M. My lord. The princess. She's dead. Dot dot dot. Princess Janet is dead. Off. Everyone was shocked. Quickly. Dot. Lead the way. Alec yelled out angrily. Who would dare to sneak into his palace and kill his daughter? A royal for that matter? Wouldn't people take this as a sign of weakness? It looked like he had to aimlessly kill again, to remind certain people of the power within his possession. No no. Dot. My daughter, Jeanette's mother ran faster than anyone else. Her speed greatly shocked everyone. Since she was Alec's wife, she had to remain in the hall and entertain the guests as they waited. So she hadn't seen her daughter at all. Who the hell did this? She swore that if she caught the person she would skin them alive. And the worst part was that she didn't even have the chance to say goodbye to her daughter one last time. No mother would be happy to be robbed of such an opportunity. Although she would rather take her daughter's place if there was ever a situation where her daughter was put to death. At least let her speak to her daughter one last time before she dies. Cowards. The murderer was indeed a coward. From now on, she would walk a bloody path. For her daughter, she would turn this entire empire upside down until she found the bastard. When they arrived at Jeanette's courtyard, they realized that all her guards were dead. Jeanette's mother pushed the door open, and immediately saw her daughter lying in a pool of blood. Who? Dot. Who did this to my baby? Exclamation mark. Jeanette's mother hugged her body and rocked her body back and forth. Her eyes looked bloodthirsty, as she looked at everyone that surrounded her. Suddenly, the little maid Gaul groaned softly. Dot dot oh. Everyone rushed over to her and saw that she held a murder weapon in her hand. And her entire dress was covered in blood. Jeanette's mother quickly rushed over to the maid, sat on top of her chest, held her clothes firmly and slapped her multiple times. Slap, 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 bastard. Wake up. Dot. Wake up now. Gaul woke up in pain and immediately panicked. Tell me the truth. What happened? Alec asked. Gaul honestly wanted to point at the shameless couple at the side that was busy crying and pretending to mourn her master. Antony that bastard, had acted so shocked that he had forced a teardrop to fall out of his eyes making him look so pitiful. Meanwhile Carrie had been crying like crazy, while Angela stood the comforting her. Gaul wished for nothing more than to slice their throats. But before she passed out, that cloaked man had told her that if she says anything, then her entire family would be killed. Her brother was just four years old, and her mother was currently bedridden. The cloaked man had promised that if she didn't say anything, then he would move her family away to the next city. But what Gaul didn't know was that her entire family had already been burnt alive by the cloak man this morning. If she had known, then there was no way that she would hesitate in this matter. Truthfully, she herself didn't know why she was kept alive. Was she left alive as a punching bag, so that the royal family could air out their grievances on her? She had no clue why she was alive. But for the sake of her family, she chose to stay silent. Answer me. Alec Barn yelled. Gaul shivered, and almost peed herself. But she steeled her heart and kept quiet. Looked at her deeply. Men. Take her to a prison cell and. Before Alec could finish his sentence, Jeanette's mother snapped when she heard the mention of a prison cell. So you killed my daughter. And you think that by keeping silent, you labeled to buy your time to escape? Well over my dead body. She quickly took the dagger that Gaul was holding, and stabbed it through Gaul's throat. Die bch. In her mind, the little maid had definitely been working with the killers. Although it was good to keep the girl alive, she needed a way to vent out her anger. Or else she was sure that she would murder everyone within the room. Everyone looked at the third queen in shock. After today, none of them would ever want to get on her bad side. 
The woman was the devil when she was pissed off. She literally kept scraping off Gaul's flesh. Dot 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 and even went as far as neatly piling it at one corner. No one understood why she did this. But in the next few days, they would. Gaul's flesh had been dried and hung at the city square for all to see. They who looked at it shuddered in fear as they wondered if this was a new form of torture that the royals had developed. As for Jeanette's mom, she had promised to skin the culprit so she did. She knew that there was some other person pulling the strings. But this was just a message to them. Previously from that maid's actions, it was clear that she would rather die, than point out who the real culprits were. So although she killed the girl mostly to vent her anger, she also knew that torturing the little girl would be useless. Hence she decided to send out a message to the killers. Once caught, they'd end up in worse conditions than the girl. It has been so long since she used her 6,000 soldiers, that was stationed far away in her private camp. It looked like she would have to go all out to find the culprit. No matter who they were, they would find them even if it was the last thing that she did. It pained her dearly. Her beautiful daughter would no longer exist. From this day forth, Jeanette Barn would no longer exist in her Tfilia. Chapter 163 Dissecting Time While the people of Arcadina cried for the loss of their beloved goddess, Landon on the other hand, was currently at the Medical and Healthcare Academy. Dissecting Time, currently, Baymard had 52 professional nurses and doctors within it. Before coming here, these people were already known healers and apothecaries within their villages, towns and cities. But because of war, some of them had ended up as slaves, while others remained as refugees. Anyway, Landon had decided to show these doctors and nurses what the inside of the human body looked like. Presently, the students at the medical academy were having a week-long break before their final examinations begin. So although no lecturer would be teaching the students, they still needed to do their weekly shifts at the hospital and clinics. Hence Landon had decided to dissect the bodies in batches. Every day, he would focus on dissecting one human body. Until all eleven bodies were properly dissected. Also, he decided to keep organs like the heart, liver and so on. For learning purposes. Today, Landon was only working with 6 out of 52 teachers. Before his teaching session began, he removed the dead body from the pool of chemicals, as well as thoroughly cleaned and dried it. Once it was time for the lesson to begin, everyone wore their surgical safety wear, and headed towards the table with the dead man on it. Nurse Ramona. What do you know about the patient? Landon asked. Patient's name, added age. 29. Place of birth, unknown. Medical history, non-available. Body injuries. The patient has six scar wounds around his back and chest. The patient is also missing a toe on his right leg, as well as his left pinky finger. Time and day of death, 11.30 a.m. November 3rd, 1024. Cause of death nine gunshots. Everyone nodded as they listened to the Ramona. This information was what all of them currently had about the patient. Three days ago, Landon had made up fake profiles for these dead men, and distributed them out to the doctors and nurses. He had also mentioned all the surgical procedures that would be carried out on them during the operation. So before everyone came for surgery, Hesh was expected to know everything about their patient before surgery could proceed. Every little detail was important, from age, to even minor swellings around the patient's body. All of this would aid them in choosing and prescribing the right drugs and surgical procedures for their patients. Good. Dot. For today's operation, we'll start off with the patient's chest and tummy area, followed by the patient's legs, feet, arms, neck head and face region. And of course once we're done with the patient's front view, well look at the patient's back view. But, back and so on. The main goal of today's lesson is to allow you all to understand and gain tremendous experience from the surgery, as well as carefully removing all the patient's organs within his body. Nurse Chloe and Nurse Idria, you too will be in charge of note taking. Everything that is done during surgery, has to be properly recorded down no matter how unimportant it may seem to be. Yes your majesty. Sorry dot 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 Dr. Landon. In the theater, 
Landon was seen as a doctor. So they had to address him as one. Both nurses quickly took their pens and notebooks out, and waited at the sides. Nurse Ramona and Nurse Sheil, you both will focus on handing out whatever tools are needed during surgery. Here's the checklist. You know what to do. Oh. And make sure you sterilize all the tools before bringing them here, Landon said, while handing the list over to them. Their task was simple. Sterilize the tools, and put everything dot dot including cleaning cloths and so on into a trolley, and once placed, they were to tick off the names on the list and sign at the bottom. As for Dr. Wayne and Dr. Rufus, you both will assist me during surgery. Dot. Seven minutes went by, and the nurses with their trolleys had returned. Everyone immediately assumed their positions, and the surgery had finally begun. Everyone, well start off by removing the bullets. Ill start with the patient's right chest region. As he spoke, the nurses taking notes were busy writing, while stretching their heads to see what he was doing. For this operation, Rufus, Wayne, you two will be my medical assistants. Scissors. Cloth. Bovid and Odine. Ramona and Gilles, quickly took out a clean bowl. Dot 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 poured the chemical in the bowl, and dropped several strips of cloth into it. Then they passed the bowl and scissors to Wayne and Rufus. Landon took the scissors and picked up a piece of soaked cloth from the bowl. Why do we do this step? He asked. For disinfecting. They all replied. Correct. Dot. If a doctor or nurse doesn't disinfect a wound, then any of you have the right to call them out. No one is allowed to do any surgical procedure without this step. Forceps. Underscore. As Landon removed the bullet, greenish colored blood slowly crept out from underneath the area. The stench of the man, immediately filled the air. Some of the nurses felt like puking. But they knew better than to do so. This was their first time working on a man that had died for several days now. Usually when people died, they would burn or bury their bodies immediately. Since dead men couldn't heal. And even though they had smelled dead bodies before. Especially when they aided as healers around a battlefield. Nothing could compare to this kind of revolting stench. Was it that greenish blood that made it smell like this? Once the bullet was removed, Landon cleaned up the wound. And did a neat vertical mattress stitch on it. Dot 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 so when doing it, you have to place your needle just a little distance from the wounded area. As Landon operated, he continued to explain what they should and should not do during surgery. Dr. Wayne and Nurse Ramona. You two will work together in taking out the bullets from the patient's upper belly region. As for Dr. Rufus and Nurse Sheil, you two should do the same for the patient's bullet wound just below his neck. Everyone immediately became nervous. Wayne was hands were currently trembling as he held the forceps in his hands. Although he was a doctor, this was the first time that he would have to do such a procedure. Swords were never that complicated. If someone left a sword in another person's body, all he had to do was pull out the damn sword, pour alcohol or rum on the wound, burn the wound, and bandage it with cloth. From there, he would give the patient a broth filled with herbs and leaves. And other times, he would just smear medicinal paste on the wounds. Before coming to Baymard, he thought of himself as a great doctor. But presently, his self-confidence was at its lowest. Reading and attending his majesty's lessons. He had realized that there was just so much that he didn't know. Like the fact that blood flowed through channels within the body and so on. If he didn't do anything properly, in the long run, the patient might suffer even more from his recklessness. So how could his hands not tremble? It wasn't just him. Dr. Rufus was also in a state of panic as well. Theory was indeed different from practicals. He thought that by reading so much, he would be prepared. But clearly, that was not the case. Dr. Wayne, easy there. When taking out the bullet, it's important to not push back towards the patient's skin. Doing this might make the bullet damage the blood vessels around the wound. What Wayne was doing, was what people would usually do when their car was stuck in the snow. He was basically reversing, so as to create distance and momentum for when he would yank the bullet out which was not how the human body worked. Wayne changed his technique under Landon's guide, 
and had finally succeeded in removing the bullet. He felt like he had aged a full ten years after the procedure. Dr. Rufus. With the method using right now, if the patient were alive, he would have probably died from excessive pain. Don't wiggle the bullet around the patient's wound. Dot. After eight minutes, both doctors were finally done. They had successfully removed the bullets, as well as stitched the wounds. To give them more experience, Landon had let them take out all the other bullets on the patient. The second time, they were still somewhat uneasy. But by the third, fourth and fifth time, their nerves had finally calmed down, and their technique had improved as well. From there, Landon had requested for everyone to try pumping water into the bloodstream with the syringes. This time, the nurses joined in as well. At this point, Landon truly pitied the dead man. To be a study experiment was really sigh. Hopefully, he had found the promised land. And after a while of continuous needle stabbing, they finally proceeded to open up the patient's chest and belly region. All right. Dot. Let's go back to the human anatomy. Looking at what we have on display, can anyone name all this the organs or bones in front of us? Your Majesty. I mean Dr. Landon. This is the heart, liver, spleen, ribcage, underscore. The more they listed, the more confident they became, and for some reason, it was more fulfilling, to realize that the books were right. Everything that they had painstakingly studied, was presently in front of them. Landon continued operating on the patient. And at the end, the poor guy had been torn and sliced into pieces by everyone within the room. Heck. Dot. Even his face and eyeballs were removed for research purposes. They placed their body parts in jugs of chemicals, for preservation. And at the end of their lecture, Landon gave them a one hour's quiz that covered everything that they had done today. With that, Dissection 101 was finally over. Chapter 164 Scenario Missions in a Blink of an Eye Two and a half weeks had passed by quickly. So many things had happened within this time frame. The children and the students at the school and academies were currently writing their final examinations. And within this time, all of them have been walking around Baymard like mindless zombies. Every time Landon saw them, he would giggle at their appearance. In fact, one might even argue that they looked as mad as the Hatter. They would mumble about formulas, equations and theoretical knowledge as they walked around Baymard. As for the military, the first batch that arrived in May began their final examinations on the 5th and were already done by the 14th. Today was the 22nd, and presently, their exams had already been graded and given back to them. Now, they all knew whether they would graduate or not. Of course, on their report cards, they could easily see their total marks and scores. So by combining and dividing their total scores from the first examination and this one, they would easily see if they qualified for graduation or not. And those that didn't make it, would have to wait another two months before having a trial examination which would let them advance to the next military rank. Within this two-month period, they were expected to brush up their skills and knowledge on all army subjects. Anyway on the 27th of this month, Baymard would hold its first graduation ceremony for those that passed. These soldiers would successfully climb up the ranks, from Private E1 to Private E2. And next month, those who came in June, will be holding their own exam and graduation ceremony as well. Today, Landon, Lucius, and the soldiers, were currently heading towards two empty estates within the upper region. These estates were close to the barracks, and were perfect for scenario training. With the new Psy munition guns out, Landon had already drawn up training sheets for all the soldiers within the army, police academy and guard academy, for the soldiers. Landon had decided that this scenario training will be held on Tuesdays and Thursdays for two hours only. Dot, 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 as well as on weekends. Of course, the classes on weekends were going to be long as hell. These classes would usually take a day and a half. After their rock climbing class on Saturday mornings, they would rest for a while and then head on over to those estates by 2 p.m. He expected them to stay there up until 10 p.m. the next day Sunday. And within that time frame, 
Landon expected them to attack each other's camp. For example during today's scenario training. One side would be a terrorist organization, while the other side would be the good guys. Of course each side would have their mission laid out for them. The terrorists were tasked with safekeeping the hostages as well as taking killing all their enemies and destroying their enemy's base. While the good guys were tasked with rescuing the hostages, capturing the leader of the terrorist organization, and of course overtaking their enemy's base. And while both sides stayed within the estates, Landon expected them to sleep on the floors, and cook for themselves over open fire. Since this was all part of their training, soon, he would be sending them out for missions, so it wasn't good to let them be too pampered. In these missions, they would have to sleep in the wild, or an inn, hunt their food, cook, and so on. So having them do all these things would definitely toughen them up for the future. Anyway, Landon had come up with an army list that made sure that everyone would have short scenario missions twice a week. As for the lengthy ones, each soldier would go through them at least once a month. Also, these lengthy training sessions will have soldiers from all ranks working together as a team. All these sessions were mandatory for everyone. Well, everyone except those who came in May, since they had just finished their final exams and would have a one and a half month vacation. Landon didn't want to force them to do anything as of now. If they wanted to join in on the training session, they could. But if they didn't feel like it, then that was okay as well. As for the police officers and guards, since they wouldn't go out on missions in future, Landon thought that there was no point in having them spend the night within these estates. Their job was to stay within Baymard and protect the people, so of course their own training would be different. With all this in mind, Landon had decided to let them use these estates for five hours every weekdays. Today, Landon was currently leading his team towards one of the camp's estates as the leader of a terrorist organization. While Lucius led his own team towards the other one, as the leader of Baymard's army. Dot. Captain Thray, Major General Gary. Have the men gather within the front courtyard immediately, Landon asked. Yes General. They both answered. Twenty minutes later, everyone had stood in straight lines as they looked up to their new arm general. His Majesty Landon. Listen up. From now till we all leave this place. We are all scum. We are an evil organization that terrorizes the people, murders the innocent, as well as take down our enemies ruthlessly. This is the identity that we will assume within this camp, so all of you are to call me boss, and not his majesty or general. You all have trained hard and long ever since you came to Baymard. Today, I want to see the full extent of your skills, and anyone who will hold back will be punished later on. As usual, the rules are simple. If you ever get hit, fall down on the ground and act dead, and when the fight isn't around you anymore, hoe the last building on the left within the estate, and stay there. Also, it's important to know that when you get hit on your legs, arms and any other part that wouldn't immediately kill you, I expect you to limp and continue fighting or retreating, that is until your enemy shoots you in the head or heart. Do understand? Yes boss. They yelled. Excellent. Bring out the hostages. Chapter 165 Scenario Missions 2 Bring out the hostages. Immediately, the three musketeers and the Fantastic Seven came out pitifully. They all wore worn out clothes and their faces were all covered with dirt. Their hands were currently bound together with thick pieces of rope and their hair was rough and unkempt. In fact, they looked like they hadn't eaten in days. You, cough cough. You all are monsters, said old man Willow, as he yelled out pitifully. The soldiers were taken aback. This man could really act, they thought. Please, let us go. We promise not to tell anyone about your evil deeds. So let us go, old man Bitus said as he pretended to shiver from fear. I, I have lots of money, it'll give you everything I have, so just let me out. Here. Look at my wife, isn't she pretty? Dot. If you let me go, it'll definitely give her out to you all for free. So please, just let me out. Let me out I tell you, said Grandpa Kyle, as he pointed to his fake believe wife. The soldiers who were listening, 
were already disgusted with the man's shamelessness. How could one give up their family just like that? If they had their way, he would be the first one to die. Have you all no shame? Can't you see that my husband here and my child are poor? Let me tell you all, kidnapping us is useless. So free us up immediately, yelled Granny Frieda arrogantly. As Granny Frieda spoke, old man Herman stood there acting like a baby. Apparently, he was supposed to be Frieda's child. The soldiers were speechless. In what way did old man Herman resemble a baby? And why the heck was he making weird baby sounds? Fine. Fine. He's a baby. But which baby says gaga -ga -ga? and lady? Why the hell are you yelling at us? Couldn't you have asked us politely like the first two grandpas over there? Landon looked at their performance and smiled. Choosing this hilarious bunch was definitely the right choice. In real life, all hostages had different personalities. Some were quiet, while others were arrogant dot 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 and a few were even clever enough to escape on their own. Landon had given these ten seniors different profiles for them to act out. Some acted weak, selfish, frightened and unreasonable. There were also those hostages who acted weak, but were actually strong in disguise. One could never judge a book by its cover. Landon wanted the men to get used to all these personalities. Because in future, they might have to keep their enemies as hostages. So one false move could actually make their enemy gain the upper hand over them. And by that time, it would definitely be game over for Baymard. Take them to their cells, Landon yelled. The make-believe cell was actually a comfortable room close to Landon's room within the estate. This was the only room that had beds, chairs and so on. Since they weren't real hostages, there was no way that Landon would treat them like one. They were just paid actors. That was all. As the hostages left the scene, two out of ten started screaming hysterically. No. No, I know my rights. Dot. Am a citizen of Tariq. I just came to Baymard for a visit. You can kill the other bastards. But please let me go. Me too. Am a citizen of Arcadine. I promise to give you all my money so let me go. You can't do this to me. My father is a noble within Tariq. Mark my words, he will have your head for this. Bloody bastards. The last guy spat towards the soldiers, and looked like he was about to beat them up for not listening to him. Just how powerful was his pretend father? Their acting was so real that the soldiers almost started clapping for them. Now that you've all seen our prisoners, let's focus on our mission. Immediately, Landon divided the men into several groups. Some would be in charge of cooking food, while others would be in charge of guarding the prisoners, guarding the perimeter of the estate and of course setting traps within and around the camp. Some were also supposed to spy on their enemies. As well as relay the message back to London, he knew that Lucius would definitely make his first attack tonight. Since they were staying here till 10 p.m. the next day, it was very clear that Lucius would bombard them with four or five attacks before the mission's deadline. It was already 4 p.m. And by 5 p.m., the darkness would silently spread its wings all over Baymard. So Lucius could attack at 7, 9 or even 12 midnight. Worse, he could choose to attack at 1, 3 or even 5 a.m. And since they would be leaving on Sunday at 10 p.m., Lucius could still choose to attack at 6 or 7 p.m. tomorrow. The whole mission called for vigilance. Even though it seemed like a bad situation, it was more like a double-edged sword. For example, if Lucius succeeded by 3A.M, Landon could still take back his hostages and destroy Lucius' base before the deadline. So bottom line, they would have to continuously fight each other. Until Sunday 10pm. Also, one of Landon's goals for this mission was to capture Lucius. So he immediately created five new squads and tasked Gosh with it handling capturing Lucius. At 8p.m, the first group would go. Followed by the next group will leave at 1am. And so on. For the mission, Landon felt like he was thoroughly prepared. Over at Lucius' camp, Lucius, Mark, Josh and some warrant officers, were coming up with several plans for tonight's operation. Just as Landon had guessed, 
They planned to attack Landon four times within this night. And two times the next day. Captain Billy. In two hours time, you lead the first attack on our enemy. Our goal is to test out their defense, and find out any hidden traps that they have around their base. Remember. If you get cornered, immediately retreat. Now go. Dot. Get ready. Chapter 166 Scenario Missions 3 The sky was dark, and both camps were still and quiet. Captain Billy and his team, were stealthily crawling towards their enemy's camp. Of course 70% of the grass here was ankle level. But there were still a few, that had grown to be knee level. The soldiers chose to move crawl towards their enemy's camp. Some also moved by stooping and walking low within the grass. They began to act like lions that were hunting their prey within the safari. Billy and his men had also painted their faces and hands black. As well as worn black shirts, just for this operation. Once they had reached a close enough distance to their enemy's camp, Billy signaled for them to stop. He then moved towards his four second-in-command officers, and whispered out several commands to them. Coy in charge of making the switch at the left perimeter wall. Hilbert, you'll take care of the right wall. And Van, you'll tackle the back wall. As for the front gate, Lenny, you'll handle it. His plan was simple. Take out some of the men guarding around the perimeter, and replace them with his own men. He would put two or three within each area, and leave them there to act as spies. Once it was time for their enemies to change their shifts, those men would then be able to freely infiltrate the camp. Since they were going to be here for a day and a half, it would only make sense for the men to have their shifts changed. So when that happened, they spies would blend in with the group and pretend to be terrorists as well. Their spies were tasked with gathering intel about their enemy's plans. As well as where their enemy had kept the hostages. And more importantly, they had to find out which room belonged to their enemy's leader. Since one of the missions for this drill was to capture the leader of the terrorist organization. Of course every three hours, Billy would send someone to meet with the spies outside the camp and collect all the information from them. Everything had been laid out properly. They would switch some of the guards around the left, right and back walls of their enemy's camp. But for this to happen successfully, they needed to make a massive distraction at the front gate. From this distraction. They would also get to know the hidden traps around the perimeter of their enemy's camp. After the men make the switch, get some other people to kidnap the bodies of these terrorists and drag them away silently, Billy advised. From his binoculars, Billy could see that their enemies at the front gate dot 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 had also painted their faces and hands black. So if they did this, then that meant that those around the walls also did this as well. And since it was completely dark like ink now, Billy was sure that no one would really recognize the other wild guarded. The main issue would come up once they change shifts. Billy was hoping that with all that paint on the men's faces, no one would be able to identify them as frauds. He needed the spies to successfully integrate with the group. Billy gave several hand signals to the men, and instantly, Everyone assumed their positions. G.I. 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 Multiple shots were fired all at once. Some men charged towards the front gate, while some continued to crawl stealthily towards the left, right and back walls of the camp. At the front gate, some of the terrorists noticed the situation and immediately took cover. While those who noticed it late, got shot and wounded badly. Ah! The men yelled out in pain. As their shoulders, knees, legs and other body parts were hit. Was this how being shoy felt like? No no no. Dot. His Majesty said that the pain was only 10%, compared to that from actual bullets. This was supposed to be 10%. In fact, they didn't understand why His Majesty had said that if they were shot, they should pretend to limp. One didn't even need to pretend in this situation. The pain was agonizing enough, and some of them, had even thought that their bones had dislocated within their bodies. Why didn't they dodge on time? Damn their slow reflexes. Those who were shot, immediately took out their guns and shot the bloody good guys. As they slowly limped towards their camp. There was no way that they would go down without a fight. The bullets continued to rain on all the terrorists, 
as their enemies kept closing in on them, men, shoot their heads and hearts dot 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 not their legs, we will not be beaten down so easily, we are the strongest terrorist organization for heaven's sake, you all should remember that whatever we do today, our boss will be watching, want an officer Dobby from the terrorist camp yelled, as he shot down some good guys from behind a rock pillar, this was a test of skills, if they didn't do a good job, then they would have let their boss his majesty down, gi, 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 both sides were constantly shooting at each other, those that were shot on their ankles, legs and so on, immediately limped back into hiding, so that they could blow their enemies into pieces, as time went on, everyone realized that their focus and shooting skills had greatly improved, shooting moving targets that could think, was really different from shooting a stationary paper or metal board, warrant officer Dobby had realized this as well, even his hiding technique had improved as well, when he first hid behind the pillar, he had received immense pain from being shot from his upper left arm, he himself hadn't been aware of the fact that his arm was seeking out when he hid, but after he got shot, he immediately changed his position and improved it as the battle continued, Dobby looked at their enemies and smiled, soon, they would fall into their trap. Chapter 167 Scenario Missions for Bam, Bam, Bam. Several of Billy's men, who were close to the gate, had all mysteriously fallen down. Captain, I think there's a trap at the front lines, whispered one of Billy's men. Billy frowned and viewed the scene with his binoculars, which were hanging around his neck. He and some of his men, were currently laying low in the bushes, since he had to ensure the switch at the other perimeters, he couldn't join the battle yet, until he was sure that the switch had been made successfully, he looked at the scene and nodded, indeed, there was a trap laid out at the front lines, there were several thin ropes of wire stretched around the area, when the soldiers ran at full speed towards the gate, they were instantly tripped by these wires, and once they fell, those terrorists around them, would shoot them dead, captain, not good, some of the men who tried to sneak towards the right wall, were caught in net traps, staying here any further would be risky for our mission, how many spies have successfully been added, bully asked, three at the back wall, one at the left wall, and none at the right wall, that's good enough, sound the command for everyone to retreat, immediately, one of his men got up and yelled, retreat, 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 on the battlefield, everyone paused for a millisecond, and immediately ran back, of course as they escaped, a stream of bullets continued to rain on them, how could these terrorists let them go so easily, never, gi, 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 the good guys ran as fast as they could, while jumping around like grasshoppers, as they tried to dodge these bullets, of course those that were shot, limped away in a sorry state, some died, while others were brutally injured, as the night passed by, both sides were constantly battling and injuring each other, at some point, the terrorists had discovered the spies within their camp, and at another point, both Lucius and Landon had lost a considerable amount of men, Sunday was here and there were only four hours left before the deadline approached, Lucius and his men were currently standing within Landon's estate, they had finally succeeded in getting in, with only four hours left, they decided to go all out, no matter what, they had to rescue those hostages, Lucius and his men were standing on one side, while Landon and his own men were standing on the other side, we, the armed forces of Baymard, are here to arrest you for several charges against our home, do you know your crime, Lucius yelled out, ugh, what crimes could I and my family possibly commit, Landon said, don't play dumb, dot, where are the hostages, Lucius said, HMMP, if you want them, you'd have to take them over my dead body, my thoughts exactly, Mark, focus on Gary, Josh, focus on Thray, the rest of you, kill these terrorists and rescue the hostages, as for me, I tackle their leader, 
Lucius commanded, Landon looked at them and smiled, I was thinking the exact same thing, it seems that our minds really are alike, instantly, everyone scattered about the estate, G.I., 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 Landon ran up to Lucius and fired several shots at him, Lucius immediately rolled on the ground and hid behind a pillar that was a little distance further from Landon, as Lucius was about to poke his head out from behind the pillar, Landon shot several bullets at its edges, never would I have thought, that I would fight you like this old man, brat, Dot. Watch yourself. Who are you calling old? Instantly, Lucius ran away from the column. And made several shots, as he ran backwards. G.I., 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 G.I. Landon backflipped away, as he continued to dodge the bullets. Hey old man. Dot. Didn't you say that you wanted to know how painful these bullets are? Just stay still and it'll show you, no need brat, I already shot my shoulder with one two days ago, there's no way that I'll allow myself to receive another shot again, as they fought, everyone within the estate was busy tearing themselves down, guarding the hostages, were Ruby Gary's girlfriend, Yara Thray's girlfriend and twelve other soldiers, footsteps slowly approached as they guarded their prisoners, Ava, Yara and Ruby thought, Ava was Mark's girlfriend, so of course she would sign up to be in his camp, Ava came over with 14 soldiers, you all give up and return our hostages to us immediately, another soldier said, no way, not without a fight, Yara said, that works even better, Ava said smilingly, everyone immediately dispersed themselves, Ava had decided to attack Ruby since she was one of the strongest within the group, G.I., 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 everyone tried to shoot their targets, as Ava shot, Ruby front flipped in a zigzag manner, while ensuring that she moved towards Ava, once she was close, she immediately fell on the floor in a split, and spinned her legs like fan blades, in attempt to trip Ava, one would say that Ruby was as flexible as a gymnast, in fact, her fighting style was a mixture of Eddie Gordo from Tekken and Mystique from the first X-Men series, Ava wasn't weak either, as she was about to fall, she immediately used her hat to do a handstand, and swiftly landed back on her feet again, but of course, Ruby didn't even give her time to breathe at all, bam, Ava had blocked Ruby's fist with her own fist, and quickly grabbed onto Ruby's left hand, from there, she pulled Ruby towards her and used her left knee to hit Ruby's left side, Ruby blocked the attack by using her other hand to block Ava's knee, dot, gi, 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 everywhere within the estate, one would find people running around and shooting each other, and just like that, time was up, only 6 out of 10 hostages were rescued, and both leaders from each camp were still alive, it was concluded that both sides had lost, for Lucius team, they lost because they couldn't even rescue all their hostages, and they didn't even manage to kill Landon, for Landon's team, they lost for exactly those same reasons, they lost their hostages, and couldn't even kill the leader of the Baymard's army, but even though everyone lost, they were still feeling pumped and excited, dude, dot, I've learned my lesson, never will I shoot such a shitty shot again, telling me, I fired seven bullets towards Van, but he managed to dodge all of them, by back flipped, front flipped, and even used some close combat moves to kick my gun away, at the beginning, that's how it was for me too, but as time went on, I could easily predict my enemy's next step, sigh, we need more practice, don't worry, his majesty had said that we will have short two hour sessions at least twice or thrice within each week, I got shot, and I swear that my heart almost stopped from the pain, look, I'm still limping, dude, if not of our head shields, I would have lost my head by now, bottom line, I never want to be shot again that's for sure, yeah, me too, underscore, chapter 168 new manufacturing industries, new buildings your majesty, I'm afraid that I don't know where the young master is currently at, but I promise you that he'll definitely pass on your message, when I see him, said one of Santa's subordinates, December had come, 
and Landon had thought it wise to personally hand over the information about the underground businesses to Santa. With information like this, one needed to make sure that not too many people heard of it, because if these people were threatened, one could never be sure if they prefer to spill the beans, or choose to die with the information. Hence to keep Santa's subordinates safe, it was best for them to remain unaware of the situation. Plus he was afraid that if he passed on those letters, they might get lost or fall into the wrong hands on their way to Santa. All right. Dot. Tell him he'll be waiting for his arrival. Once Santa's subordinates left, Landon focused on this month's task. Presently, he had already taken care of the learned slaves, children, caretakers, new teachers, nurses, new police officers, guards, soldiers and so on. And right now, Landon was left with 5,870 workers. Speaking about population, Baymard currently had 57,422 people living within it. Landon had estimated that by July next year, Baymard would have definitely reached a population of 90,000 people, which would be enough for now. In truth, Baymard could host up to 9.5 million people if it wanted to. But the reason why Landon decided to stop buying slaves in July, was simply due to the fact that Baymard would be open to the public within that month. And the simplest way for people to infiltrate the city, would be to disguise themselves as slaves and refugees. To solve this problem, Landon had thought about various approaches. Firstly, only Santa would be in charge of sending slaves and refugees to him. Secondly, when these people were taken, all of them had to think that they were heading to Corona, Tariq and so on. In other words, when Santa and his men buy these slaves, they would have to lie about their final destination. In these way, the slave traders and spies around several shipping docks, wouldn't be bothered about sending their spies to them. After all, these spies wanted to head to Baymard, and not towards Tariq, Deiferous or Corona. And when these slaves and refugees finally arrived, Landon wouldn't let any of them become citizens yet. They would have to spend several years in Baymard, before getting their permanent residence card. And from there, they would have to spend extra years again, before becoming a citizen. Of course, if they gave birth to children here, their children would be permanent residents. And not refugees like them. There was no slavery in Baymard. So all slaves would automatically become refugees. These refugees could work in all places around Baymard. Except within the manufacturing industries and armed forces. In fact, Landon had come up with more than 20 ways to keep these spies in check. But of course, nothing was ever guaranteed in this life. He was sure that some of them would still find a way to wiggle around the system. But they would be in for the shock of their lives when they try to break entry into any industry or building within Baymard. There will be electric fences, heat sensor cameras, smoke bombs, alarm systems that would trigger an automatic lockdown within the building and so on. Even getting information from the citizens was going to be a pain in their butts. This was because everyone within Baymard knew about the punishment for releasing such information. The punishment was death. Landon didn't want to seem too harsh. But his life was also on the line here. The system would definitely deal with him if you went easy on these spies. Everyone knew better than to give up any info about Baymard. They were all paid well and had peace within Baymard. No one was willing to throw their lives away just like that. And even if they were given all that money, where would they go to? Please. Dot. They were already used to electricity and good living here. They were absolutely sure that there was no place like Baymard. So how could they leave all this luxury, just to go out there and suffer? And to make matters worse, they could even be double-crossed and killed by the people that offered them the money. Many of them had been slaves, so they knew how the world worked. For all they knew, their actions could lead them right back into slavery later on. Also, some of them came here with their families, and had also made new friends here as well, so how could they help the enemy to kill and conquer Baymart? Even the little children in school, were taught about the consequences of releasing anything about Baymart, as well as the dangers about releasing their family situation to strangers. Although the children weren't told any classified information in school, 
they still had to learn about keeping their mouth shut. There was no reason why they should tell strangers, about how much their parents make, where money is usually kept in their homes, or even what their parents do in Baymard. One should always be wary of strangers. That's why Landon had read out multiple stories about such matters and the consequences for such actions. He had also made sure that they knew what would happen if they followed strangers there and there. Also, the people have also been briefed and taught about the role of police officers and guards within the city. They had been told about the importance of reporting anything suspicious to these officers. All in all, Landon was sure that by the time the city welcomed visitors in July, Baymard would be ready for attacks from spies and other armies. Anyway with 5,870 workers, Landon sent 500 to the alchemy industry, 500 to the food industry, 500 to the textile industry, 370 to the cleaning industry, 1,000 to the construction industry, 3,000 to all construction sites within Baymard. Your Majesty. At the start of October you requested for the pharmaceutical industry and the waste and recycle management industry to be built. And last month, you requested for the new printing industry to be constructed as well. In a few days time, the printing industry and the pharmaceutical industry would be fully constructed. And by next week, the other ones should be completed as well. So what do we do about the workers? Well, Landon had already known that these industries would be completed within this December. So he had already come up with several designs for other industries. Tim, have those who focused on building the pharmaceutical industry, split them into two groups. One group will immediately construct a boat and ship manufacturing industry, while the other will build a car manufacturing industry. As for those who focused on the waste and recycle industry, have them build a weapon manufacturing industry instead. And finally, those who focused on the printing industry, should start building Baymard's new bank ASAP. As for the new construction workers, send them to a those constructing the roads homes, shopping mall, city wall and all other construction sites around Baymard, fishing and military boats and ships. These were Landon's main reasons for building this industry. Ships were usually built indoors with the help of indoor cranes, and other heavy electrically powered machines. Anyone who had ever visited a boat PR shipbuilding industry back on Earth, would know how much work went into building these ships and boats. A one or two deck level fishing boat, could be built within a month or two, based on the size of the boat, and how many people or machines were working on these boats at once. But for proper military ships, five or six months would be enough to construct them. And sometimes, they could even take up to ten months to build. Depending on their size. For merchant ships, those ones would probably need three to four months to build. And for cruise ships, these ones could take seven months to several years to build. Again, depending on their sizes. For now, Landon didn't want to focus on super massive ships that would take years to build. Landon wanted ships that could be built in a matter of months. All in all, Baymard needed ships and boats. And it will take two and a half months to build the actual ship industry itself. Hence Landon wanted to use this winter time, to construct as many ships as he could possibly make. Of course a car industry was needed as well, so that all car parts could be installed mechanically. This would drastically cut down the time used for the workers to build several cars and heavy machines as well as improve productivity and work efficiency. This industry would probably take about four to five months to construct as well. So it was best to get it done now. A weapon manufacturing industry was definitely a must as well. This one would take three and a half months to complete, and by then, Landon would make missiles, grenades and so on. And finally, based on the bank's massive size that Landon had depicted, it had to be built now since it would take about four to five months to complete. Plus, it was always important for money to be stored properly. This was Baymard's safe period. No one knew of the development within the city, and everyone was currently minding their own business right now. But after Baymard gets open to the public, everyone would stick their noses in the cuts business. Hence it was better to take advantage of this piece, 
and build everything that they needed ASAP. With the construction workers out of the way, Landon could now focus on new goods for the month. Chapter 169 Watches, Alarm Clocks and Photocopying Machines Your Majesty so these watches and alarm clocks would be able to tell the time, HMHM. They will. Tim was really mind blown by the fact that such a thing could even exist. Sometimes, he felt like Landon wasn't human. No no no. Scratch that. Most of the time, he felt like Landon was a god in human skin. The more he read the notebook in his hand, the more fidgety he became. Your Majesty. Will we sell these goods out of Baymard in future? Yes. These ones will be sold out, since they work on batteries. The concept of batteries, wasn't new to Tim and a lot of workers within his industry. The only battery that existed in Baymard right now, was the one for heavy machines. These ones consisted of sulfuric acid solution, and several flat plates that acted as galvanic cells in series. Granted when they made their first battery ever, it wasn't as well done as those ones back on earth. But it still got the job done either way. The only problem was that those ones didn't last as long as those ones back on earth. When they made their first battery, its outer box was made of metal. And some of the plates were done unevenly. But once better tools and plastic came into the picture, Landon switched it up and modified several outer components once again. All in all, these batteries were constantly improved upon monthly. For wristwatches, tiny coin or button sized batteries were ideal for them. And for wall clocks and alarm clocks, the batteries needed to be like the ordinary batteries made back on Earth. Landon was talking about the A, 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 AAA battery types and so on. To make batteries, one needed special materials and chemicals that would aid in the transfer of electricity. There needed to be a cathode, anode, and a fluid or material that would aid in electrical flow. Landon was sure that the people outside Baymard wouldn't be able to come up with the exact components and chemical solutions required for battery production without guidance. So why should he be worried? Even if they made the other components of the watches and put them together, the watch's hands wouldn't tick without a battery. Take for example lithium batteries. He had already planned on extracting lithium from a lithium feldspar rocks underground the caves, and use them to make ordinary batteries as well as coin batteries. Lithium was the core drive within these types of batteries. And if people didn't know how to extract it from ores and rocks, how were they supposed to make these batteries? Plus other places didn't have plastic or rubber, to make the outer frames for wall clocks, as well as alarm clocks. So there was essentially nothing for him to worry about. Once Baymard officially opened up to the public in July, these items would be exported to various regions around Hertfilia. And your majesty, this photocopying machine is supposed to lessen the burden within the printing industry. If it does what you say it can do, then the workers would probably celebrate in your honor. Was it that bad? Your Majesty, you have no idea. We have a massive waitlist from all the workplaces already. Well, Landon could understand their joy as well. To put it simply, when any workplace needed to make copies of any document, they would immediately place orders with the printing do that their copies could made. This industry handled school papers, report, books, I.D. cards, driving licenses, and other important documents around Baymard. So if the hospital needed 20 copies of a particular document, the workers within the printing department would have to get it done for them. Of course the hospital would have to pay for these services as well. And all these printing orders had put everyone around Baymard on a waiting list which greatly slowed down development and productivity. Hence Landon had wanted to make photocopying machines ASAP. Firstly, all industry and workplace documents should be photocopied within those particular workplaces. For security reasons, it wasn't proper to have confidential documents leave those workplaces. And secondly, this would greatly improve productivity and efficiency around Baymart. Everyone wouldn't need to run up and down the place as they could just make several copies of multiple documents within their offices or workplaces. And the printing press could finally focus on their numerous jobs, like printing books, I.D. cards, labels on several company boxes, plastic bags, 
clothes and so on. Plus having a photocopying machine will also be good for the land port and banks in future. Any visitor or customer's document that needed several copies, could be done within those establishments. Rather than running back and forth, and keeping these people waiting. Now focusing on the machines themselves. The interior part consisted of five main components within them, a light bulb, a photosensitive drum, two rollers, a toner, and a conveyor belt for loading the paper. Baymard already had conveyor belts, as they were previously manufactured at the start of October. And of course light bulbs and rollers already existed as well, so that just left London with the toner and the photosensitive drums to make which weren't hard to do. Anyway the machine worked like so, when one places his document upside down and presses the start key, an intense beam of light from the bulb dot 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 flashes onto the document. This light then gets reflected towards the photosensitive drum. Now here's where the magic really happens. This drum is electrostatically charged by a high voltage wire as well as coated with a photosensitive chemical selenium. Since selenium is a semiconductor, that would mean that it would act as an insulator in dark areas, as well as conduct electricity when light falls on it. Bottom line, when the light gets reflected off the document, it reaches the photoconductive drum, and gets its ions displaced. As negative charges make an electrical shadow, the drum begins to rotate, and finally, this negatively charged shadow moves towards a positively charged toner. Negative and positive. You get the picture. Both charges stick to each other, and an inked image of that document is formed within the charges. Then a new sheet of paper is feed into the hopper of the photocopying machine. The hopper carries the paper on a conveyor belt upwards, and moves towards the drum and the toner. The charges drop onto the new sheet of paper and the document is finally photocopied. As the photocopied paper makes its way out of the machine, it will pass through two hot rollers. These rollers aid in fusing the toner particles onto the paper permanently, by inserted heat and pressure onto it. The whole process involved light, reflection, conductivity and ions. Well anyway, this machine will have an on and off button on it, and would work electrically, and steam powered for those within buildings that don't have electricity. A photocopying machine doesn't necessarily need the internet. It wasn't a printer. Also, Landon had decided to add several other buttons at the corners of the photocopying machine. Kind of like a keypad. If they wanted to make 10 copies, they just had to tap 1 and 0 keys. And then press start. Well, with this, he decided to start teaching the workers a little bit about computer engineering as well. Up next Landon wanted to focus on radios. Chapter 170 Calculators and Radios Up next, Landon wanted to focus on radios. In any society, communication was key, be it within the military, schools, police forces, hospitals and so on. Communication gadgets were a must within any developed city. When talking about radios, there were two major factors that come up, frequency and waves especially sine waves. In the modern era, radio waves control everything, from the tunes played in cars, to the police radios used for alerting police officers, to the radios within planes. Radios waves and frequencies could be seen everywhere. In fact even cell phones, televisions, Morse codes, and walkie-talkies. Use these wave systems. Making radios a rent that hard to do. Back on Earth, some people in the wilderness could make them with spoons, wires, coins and an energy source dot dot like batteries. Essentially, radios send out wave signals, which in turn involve frequency. Understanding the basic concept and laws of physics applied here was what was really important. Different radio channels had different frequencies. Hence Landon wanted the workers to properly understand these concepts now. Every modern radio had three main parts, the transmitter, the receiver actual radio box, dot dot and the antennas, that focus on radiating the signal all around various areas. Of course, there were several other components as well that'll be molded separately and attached to each other when putting the radio together. So in essence, Landon wanted the workers to start understanding these concepts now. 
as almost every communication gadget involved waves and frequency. He had also decided that from now up till April, he wouldn't create any new goods again. Except for food, books and medicine, especially medicine. He needed to focus on this area, so that he could quickly complete the system's mission. Hence within this time period, construction will be his main focus. After all, the coastal region needed protection against enemy ships, and these peaceful times were the best times to improve Baymard's defenses. Don't worry your majesty, we'll get it done immediately, Tim said. No. Take your time. There's no major rush in producing these radios. I just need them to be done before March, Landon said. Although April was Landon's deadline, he gave the workers an early deadline, so that even if they're late on production, it wouldn't really affect his main plan for Baymard. Within this time frame, he would be teaching them about physics, so that they could better understand what they were doing. By May, he had hoped to start making walkie-talkies for the army, guards and police officers, as well as house phones for all buildings. And these calculators were supposed to aid us in solving math. Tim was really confused. Was his majesty trying to build a human being from metal? How can it do math for them? Usually, he would believe Landon. But this time, his heart wanted to believe it but his mind kept saying that it wasn't logical. Trust me Tim, it's possible. Anything is possible. Of course the last thing that Landon wanted to focus on, were calculators. They needed calculators in the banks, schools and all other offices. Calculators were basically simple programmable computers. For the workers to better understand the theory, Landon had decided that from now December to April, he would start teaching the workers about hardware and software engineering. And while they earn, of course he expected them to make these calculators as well. In this way, they would definitely gain knowledge and experience about computing systems. And coupled with the fact that the photocopying machine would still have computer systems as well, it was very clear that the men would have as much practice as needed within this time frame. Bottom line, Landon was hell-bent on introducing computer-operated gadgets within Baymard. For now, Landon wanted to make small tools and gadgets that ran fewer computations. Of course things like mobile phones, video games, actual computers and laptops wouldn't come up until two or three years later, since they were more complicated and performed too many functions at once. But things like walkie-talkies and calculators, or even landlines, just did basic operations that weren't hard for the workers to currently make. So those were good. One had to know that there were several computer systems that existed. And Landon was going to take computer development step by step. So in essence, only systems that could be made presently, were those that did one mode operated functions. Anyone could put a calculator together provided that they knew all the parts. Hardware engineering was totally different from computer engineering. For programming and multiple computational functions, those would have to take several more years to be done. But those ones that did over hundreds of applications, would have to wait for later. Like Landon had said, why should he wait for hundreds of years just to get things done? Unlike those on in the 60s, 70s or even 90s. He knew everything, PR rather he had access to everything. So why should he wait? If someone sat another person down, and aided them in building all the calculator parts from scratch, and putting them together, will it really be hard for them to grasp the concept of hardware engineering? Please. Dot 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 back on earth. There were 11 year old children that could build their own calculators from scratch YouTube. Given that all the parts were made for them, Landon was giving them four months December to March, just to build this calculator and learn about the basics of hardware and software engineering. How is that not enough? Within this time frame, he expected them to make several trials and errors, so as to get the perfect calculator. Plus, it wasn't like Landon was overcrowding the workers' brains. Some workers were only focusing on electrical engineering while others focused on chemistry, and so on. This time, 
He was determined to make software and hardware engineers from some of the men. Landon didn't care about the development speed at all. Was it his fault that he knew or had access to everything at once? If those on Earth knew how to teleport or fly, do you think that they would wait for anyone else? He knew everything, so why couldn't he create what he wanted as he deemed fit? His world, his business, his soul. He had to hurriedly pass Earth's standards, so that he could start researching another world's technology. He might as well do all he could ASAP. One could never know, he might just die in a year or two. Of course if he truly died by then, Landon was sure that he would probably failed his mission. And by that time, his soul will definitely be shred into pieces. All in all, Baymard was going to breathe after these tools were made and only focus on construction up till April. That was four months. Within this time, he would teach them hardware and software engineering. And sometime next year or the year after that, he would start teaching them computer engineering for programming. So just to be clear, Landon wasn't making a laptop computers or cell phones. He was just making a calculator, which was basically the simplest form of a computerized operations. What he wanted to do, was to introduce these concepts now, so that the workers could use the next two or three years to focus on hardware and software engineering, before advancing to computer engineering years later. As for radios, they used wave frequency to operate. So within these years, he will teach them in physics. Anyone could literally make a radio from a coin, spoon, battery and wires. Heck. Some people who got stranded on the forest could moor them from all the metal that they had. And even some children on YouTube channels back on Earth, could make them from scratch. Landon was willing to use this entire winter period to focus on them. Dot. Riverdale City, Arc 18. Dot. In a large hall, several men had gathered around 86 other men. These 86 men knelt on the floor while everyone else surrounded them within the hall, and standing directly in front of them, were four other men. Speak. What happened to my father? Marda Shannon and the three night captains, had finally arrived at Riverdale City with their men, two days ago. Well, speak. What happened? The men on the floor shivered as they struggled to explain their story frantically. Why, young master? Dot. Lord Shannon had gotten a letter from the capital, we didn't know what the letter had said. But after a few days, the Lord had gathered us all to head out towards the capital, and... And once we had passed Omar City, we were ambushed at the Valley Road by 15,000 mercenaries. Marder and the night captains were shocked. Who had Shannon offended? 15,000 mercenaries were really a lot. Omar City? Isn't that three cities away from here? One of the night captains asked. One should know that their mission here, was to locate Shannon's whereabouts. And once they did, then they had to find a way to kill him. Or report back to the king if killing him was too hard for them to do. Shannon was indeed a tough nut to crack, as he was usually one stop ahead of his enemies. They had come prepared with thousands of men, just to take him down. But now, they had just heard that he was dead. Could it really be true? Or was this all part of his scheme to make them drop their guard? And if he did die, who was the one who had done them such a great service? So many questions kept popping within their minds as they looked at the men kneeling before them, but no matter what, they had to make sure that these soldiers kneeling on the floor, were indeed telling the truth, yes my lords, we were attacked three cities away from here, we, we struggled to save the lord but the enemy was too strong, and we were already outnumbered, Marder was fuming as he listened to their story, who on earth could have done this, no matter how he looked at it, Baron Kane and Alec Barn were the only ones who could have done this. Deep within his heart, he knew that his father was already dead. H.M.P. Dot. It seems like that wild father of yours, went around looking for trouble here and there. One of the captains said, serves him right. He acted as if he was more important than the king himself. This is the ancestor's punishment onto him. Another captain said, we will stay here for three months to fully investigate everything. And at the end of us day, you will receive his majesty's verdict. You will become the next city lord of this rundown city. 
but that's only if your father is truly dead. All right, well leave you to sort out this mess. Marda bowed his fists as he stared at the three captains, who were just leaving the room. How dare they talk about his father like that. Bastards. Marda looked at the men on the floor and his eyes turned cold. So you're all telling me that when my father needed you most, you turned around and fled? Under my father's rule. What is the punishment for not saving your master? The men on the floor shivered with fear, and their faces turned pale. N. No young master. We. We tried our best to save him. We only came back after he died. Underscore. All the men started begging Marda for mercy. Marda looked at his own personal men standing around him, and issued out his command. Kill them all by hanging. As for their families, kill everyone above the age of 20, and for those below that age group, sell the boys to any slave traders. As for the girls, lock them up within the dungeon. It's been a long time since I've tasted the pleasure of a woman. All those soldiers who were kneeling, began crying almost immediately. If they had known that this would happen, then they would have just allowed themselves to be killed on the battlefield instead. At least those who had died previously still had their families safe and sound, while they on the other hand, had to have their whole lineage destroyed, wh about their innocent wives, what about their children, no please young master, please, my daughter is just five years old, dot, please spare her, underscore, Marda stood there silently, as he watched these men beg and wail out loud, now they cared about their families, where were they? when his own family was destroyed, he had lost his brothers and his father. But had anyone ever shown him compassion? He had wanted to be king, so he had tried his best to woo Jeanette Barn. But did that BCH ever agree to his request? Instead, she was busy falling in love with Antony Martinez. And now, they were probably happily married while he was still struggling to get more power. Lock them up and capture their families. Make sure that no one escapes. Chapter 171 Border Battle 1 Jungo Border City, Arc 18. Dot. Eli and his group had arrived at the border five days ago, and made camp around the outskirts of the city. They had laid out their plans cleanly, and were currently undergoing their first battle. Currently, there were four city lords with Eli, and each lord had brought 5,000 men with them. Although Eli officially had 10,000 men under him as the first prince, he had decided to only bring half of the amount for this battle. Of course the rest were currently staying at his other bases around Arc 18. Anyway, in total, Eli and his group had come to Jungo City with 25,000 men. In battles like these ones, it was good to send the men out in batches. Hence Eli had began by sending 5,000 men to the battlefields. From there on, they would continue sending back up in batches of 1,000s to aid those on the fields. Dot. How is the battle proceeding? Your Highness. The men are holding up just fine. At daybreak well send out the next group to attack the city. One of the city lords answered. Eli looked at the old map in front of him, and pointed at a certain location. I think we should hit this point next. Judging by the defense tactics that they had displayed these past few days, it's obvious that they have been neglecting this area. The city lords looked at the map and nodded. I agree with you your highness. We have been attacking the northern gates ever since we got here so it's safe for them to think that we will continue with that same approach. This will lead us with a chance to create a diversion. Exactly. From what the scouts and spies have said, most of the enemy's knights have been too focused on that northern gate. So other areas currently have fewer knights guarding them. First thing tomorrow morning, send 1,500 knights towards the other gate. We will attack all sides at once, Eli said. This would surely cause a huge wave of confusion and disorderliness within the border city. All right. Let's wrap up this meeting for now. Rawl dismissed. Everyone gave a slight bow and exited the tent. It was time for Eli to sleep. He got up and walked further into the tent. He walked towards his bedroom chambers. The tent was large and massive like one of those large ancient Egyptian tents seen in movies. As the general, he wouldn't necessarily go to the battlefields. He was just supposed to strategize for the battle, 
as well as have his men command and fight these battles in his place. His job was to make sure that everything went on according to plan. He operated like the CEO of a company, while the knights worked under him to ensure that the company makes money. His presence on the battlefield was only needed if the army was in dire need of help, encouragement or moral support. Sometimes, his presence and his speeches, would make the men feel energized and strong. Ever since he got here, he had been sleeping for four hours a day only. This was a battlefield, and things changed quickly. Hence as the general, his time and attention was always needed. Two hours into Elis' sleep, two hooded men jumped down from the trees and landed beside his tent. It was currently 3 a.m. The men stealthily approached Elis' tent. They had to be quiet because while some of Elis' men were fast asleep, a majority of the knights were still wide awake. Since the war was still going on at the battlefield. With all this in mind, the assassins had purposely left their swords behind. And had only brought only their daggers with them. Killing Eli in his tent, was the only way for them to complete their mission. Since they weren't sure whether or not their prey would ever step onto the battlefield, the assassins on the other hand, had been observing Eli for a while now. They noticed that this general here, didn't like people guarding his tent. So the tent was always left unguarded. Eli had told his men that all the knights were needed on the battlefield. He had told them that it would be a waste for them to spend their nights guarding him. Hence there were no guards around his tent. The assassins moved like the wind, as they made their way towards Eli's tent. And just when they were about to enter the tent, they froze instantly. They could feel the immense killing intent directed at them. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Two other men had come out from the bushes. How could Eli not be prepared for these assassins? The real reason why Eli had insisted on having no guards around his tent, was because he felt like he didn't need them, since he already had skilled hidden guards around him. Before coming here, he had paid 18 of the top assassins within Arcadena to be his bodyguards within this time frame. The reason why these enemy assassins didn't notice them, was because they had always remained in hiding all through his stay here. When these assassins came earlier to spy on Eli, these bodyguards hadn't moved from their hiding spots, and had always blended in with nature. They weren't supposed to communicate with Eli at all, unless there was an emergency. And if they really had to talk to him, they would have to wear a knight's uniform in order to do so. Out of these 18 bodyguards, Eli had nine constantly were currently watching over him. While the other half rested, although they were nine people currently protecting Eli, only one had popped up, no matter what, they all felt like it would be insulting to their pride. If they all ganged up and killed those two assassins, hence only one bodyguard showed himself to these assassins. The bodyguard was much larger and taller than the assassins. This made him look like a giant, to the assassins. Chapter 172 Border Battle 2 The bodyguard walked backward slowly, instantly drawing the assassins away from the tent. Of course the assassins followed him ever so slowly. They took their time too and acted as if they had all the time in the world. But the truth was that, they themselves were assessing the situation as well. They had a gut feeling if they did not deal with this ogre, then they wouldn't be able to complete their mission quietly and quickly. Usually, only one person would have handled any main issues within the mission. But as they looked at this huge bodyguard, something told them that he was more skilled than any of them. But if they worked together, then they might just end his life and get back to their mission. As they walked closer to the bodyguard, they immediately took out their daggers, and once the bodyguard stopped, they slowly circled him slowly. They moved in closer until their fists were within striking distance, before they made their move. 1 versus 2. Swish, swish. Both assassins aimed their daggers at the bodyguard. One of them aimed for his neck while the other one aimed for the left side of his back. The slicing motion made the air whistle, as the daggers moved towards their target. The bodyguard immediately leaned to his right side, instantly dodging both dagger attacks aiming for his throat and left back. As he leaned, he swiftly delivered a fierce punch towards the assassin in front of him, poor. The assassin's upper belly had been hit. G-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-
lest he made any noise that would attract more knights here, the assassin behind the bodyguard, swung his knife in attempt to stab the bodyguards back again. But when he was so close in doing that, the bodyguard immediately grabbed the other assassin's throat and swung him around. The QE. It happened in a flash. The dagger had been plunged into the assassin's back. Truthfully, this assassin felt like he was so unlucky. Why him? First he received that fierce punch, and now he was getting stabbed at the center of his chest. Damn. It was really painful. As they continued to fight, the bodyguard would duck, lean, jump, kick and punch them here and there. They fought for about seven minutes and at the end, both died by accidentally stabbing each other. Of course the bodyguard had a cut on his face and a stab on the back of his leg after the fight. Once the battle was over, Eli surprisingly came out. Well done. How could Eli not hear the commotion outside? With all his years of training, Eli had easily felt the killing intent targeted at him when the assassins were about to enter his tent. Plus as a general and a knight, how could he not be aware of his surroundings when he slept? I'm sorry my lord. I couldn't get any information out of them while I fought. Please punish me as you deem fit. The bodyguard said while kneeling. There's no need to get anxious. I already know the culprits for this matter. Take off their masks and let's see who they are. Once the masks were taken off, the bodyguard was somewhat taken aback by one of the faces. Everyone come out. The other eight bodyguards immediately appeared. My lord. Comma they replied. Do any of you recognize these assassins? No my lord. They all relied. But you do. Eli said, as he looked at the other bodyguard who had previously fought. My lord. In truth, I've worked all over the Pino continent. Assassins are rent bound by empires. What we like as freedom and the thrill for adventure. I know these two, or rather, I've seen them before. They are all in the top 100 list of assassins within the Empire of Tariq. The first guy is the 56th on the list, and the second one is the 48th. Eli was confused. Tariq? Something didn't add up. This wasn't Eli's first border battle. He had come here when he was 15 and 17. So why would they target him now? And what did they stand to gain from him being dead? Was it one of his brothers that had contacted them? Did his brothers betray their empire just to see him dead? Or was it someone else in the shadows that had sent these assassins to him? He decided that he would wait for Slytherin to arrive, before he launched a full investigation on this matter. He knew that it couldn't be the ghostly prince, as he himself was too smart to make a deal with the people from Tariq. Who could it be? If they started by sending me these low-class assassins, then that would mean that they plan on sending the top assassins sometime during my stay here. You all should keep sharp during this time. Yes my lord. The Empire of Tariq? Things were getting more and more interesting. Dot. Back within the Jungo city, several Tariq knights were gathered around three knight captains. Have they returned? One of the captains asked impatiently, one should know that their king had said that once Eli Barn's death was confirmed, then they could all go home back to Tariq. They didn't understand why their king suddenly thought that Eli Barn was a threat. But since it was their king's command, as his noble subjects, they would do their best to complete their mission. They just hoped that the assassins that were sent, could at least hurry the job along. So that their men wouldn't be dying daily. Their king had only given them 15,000 soldiers for this mission. Their goal was to keep the war going for at least a month. And within this time frame, several assassins will come over in attempts to kill Eli Ban. But the problem was that five days had already gone by, and they had already lost 4,000 men. This Eli Ban was definitely a genius strategist. No my lord. The assassins haven't returned. Damn. Another captain got up his seat, and shot his cup towards the floor. Pang. Lang. Lang. Lang, it's been three hours since they left. And they just do their jobs right? Don't they know that if they don't complete the mission, then we will continue fighting and losing men? Patience Johnny. Dot. I believe they'll get it done. Let's just wait a little longer. Chapter 173 Elijah's new home Elijah hurriedly got up and washed his face thoroughly. Today was a brand new day. He used to be a wandering worker 
until he got to Baymard eleven days ago. He came from the empire of Deiferes. His parents, grandmother and sister, had come here because their little town had been raided by blood gangs. Some of the people had perished, while the few that survived, either fled or got sold into slavery. A few days before the attack, one of the newly established blood gangs came over to the town to make a deal with the town's leader. He had told the leader to submit to them, or prepare for war. The problem was that submitting meant taking sex, slaves and so on. Of course the leader submitted to them, although the people were against it. Actually, the town leader really didn't care, since they had promised to give him as much money as possible if he could keep sending women and children to the gang. On the day that the town leader had made the official announcement to welcome the gang into the town, some of the people became frightened, and immediately planned to flee, while others decided to stay and submit themselves as well. There were also those who wanted to put up a fight, but they had obviously lost their lives at the hands of this gang. For religious family, immediately after the announcement was made, they took a group of their closest friends and fled the town, and since then, they had been wandering about non-stop from one place to another. They would move from place to place, doing tiresome jobs. And sometimes, they would get beaten up badly while at work. The worst thing of all, was that his sister got targeted here and there because of her looks. Hence they had to disguise her as a boy whenever they traveled. They had decided to wander into cities that wouldn't call too much attention on themselves, since they were afraid that some nobles might capture them and sell them as slaves. So when they finally reached Banwe city, their luck had turned for the better. When a ship had arrived at the dock of the city, after listening to a strange man, they took the chance and got on the ship which then brought them to Baymard. Elijah was 17 years old, while his sister was 19. Bang, bang, bang. Paula, Paula. Wake up, we're going to be late. Mom and Dad are up already. He yelled out, as he banged the door to his older sister's room. When their family first got here, they had been taken to an estate within the upper region. And even though His Majesty had settled them in, he had also arranged for the slaves and refugees to tour homes within District F. He and his family had spent two days looking through several homes. And on the 5th of December, they had finally picked a home, signed their mortgage contract and moved in. Some of their friends were still staying at the refugee estate within District C Upper Region, but they chose and preferred to be independent. Elijah's father worked at the construction industry. His mother worked at the textile industry, while his sister worked at the bank. As for him, he worked at the newly established waste and recycle management industry. Words couldn't describe how excited and amazed he was, the first time he stepped into the industry. Is your sister up yet? His father yelled out from downstairs. Im up, im up, im up. Oh my heavens. What time is it? Why didn't you guys wake me up earlier? What do you think I've been doing here for the last couple of minutes? And mind you, this is my fourth attempt at waking you today. Elijah thought. Elijah could hear his sister's voice, as well as footsteps from behind her door. It almost sounded like she was currently fighting with a bear in her room. She quickly opened the door and dashed towards the bathroom. Now that you're up. Don't forget to lock the door when you leave. Breakfast is already on the table, Dad. Mum and he will be heading to the lower region now. By sis. His parents were already waiting for him at the door. It was time for him to leave. Dot. Once he got to work, he immediately changed in the locker room, clocked in, and headed to his duty post. Drrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrr
the garbage gets sent to different sectors within the plant, the non-recyclable waste is crushed and literally turned to powder, while the recyclables are sent to where he was working. Anyway, when the recyclables got to the plant, they were loaded and spread on a massive conveyor belt. The belt was ridiculously long. The conveyor belt carried the garbage up an inclined slope, towards the second floor of the building, which was the sorting station. Of course, there were several sorting stations within the building. But Elijah was working on the first station. He opened the massive door and quickly stood at his station. The workers were supposed to stand at different sections along the conveyor belt. The belt, winded like a racetrack, making several turns and bends all within the sorting room. Chapter 174 Elijah's new home to Elijah stood at a stand, that was about the same size as a witness stand in court. All the workers had their own box-like stand around the conveyor belt. Morning bro. Morning Wally. Ah. Here it comes, get ready. Elijah looked at there. VRRRMMMMMM. The recyclables were moving at a moderate speed towards them. As the waste moved closer, Elijah's eyes were quickly scanning what he should leave or remove. His job, as well as all the other 49 workers around him, was to make sure that only recyclable material passes this phase. He would remove things like plastic bags and other non recyclables and throw them down a large hole on the right side of his stand. The hole was like a large laundry chute, that dropped non-recyclables, from the second floor back to ground level. Once at ground level, they would be sent to the non-recyclable sector within the plant. All the workers had these large holes at their sides for this purpose. Elijah's hands and eyes were attentive to the garbage that was quickly passing in front of him. He quickly grabbed several plastic bags, and dumped them into the hole. This job needed quick hands. But of course the ones that he couldn't pick out, would eventually be taken care of by someone else along the conveyor belt. As Elijah worked, he continued to converse with his friend Wally. Bro. Will you still be working at this post after two weeks? Asked Wally, who was working on the opposite side of the conveyor belt. Since 70% of the work in the plant involved sorting out garbage. His Majesty had decided that everyone could work at different sorting areas within the plant every after two weeks. This way, they would learn how to work at different areas within the plant. No, not this post. My schedule says that he'll have to work at the glass section within the building. Ah, me too. We aren't sorting the glass right? No no no. Dot. Look up there. When the recyclable waste leaves this section. It moves up to the next floor and finally passes through a different type of moving table conveyor belt that would filter the glass out. I heard that on that floor, the workers will collect the broken glass pieces and store up several metal containers. Ugh. And from there, the alchemy industry will buy these bottles or broken pieces for the glass making department right? Yup, that's it. Not just them but all the other industries as well. You know what, I can't wait to work at the bailing sector. Ah, to drive those machines would be like a dream come true. He he he, are you forgetting something? We need to take the driving test first before getting our driving license. At least that's what Senior Damon from the bailing sector said. Truthfully, Elijah also wanted to drive those machines as well. At the bailing sector, all the cardboard plastics and so on dot 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 are compressed into large bales and loaded onto a truck. The truck then sends it to the storage warehouse. From there, Senior Damon and his team would drive their lifting machines and offload each bale from the truck and store in the warehouse. And when the bales need to be sent out, they would still be the ones in charge of loading the trucks again. Honestly, it looked like so much fun to Elijah, so he wanted to get his license immediately. Wally. Let's sign up for driving classes. Look at you. I thought you'd never ask. Let's sign up tomorrow after work. They continued to talk as work progressed. And before Elijah knew it, it was already 5 p.m. Closing time. Dot. As he and Wally walked back to District F, they began to talk about the current changes in their lives. Elijah. Thank you for talking me and my family into following you all here. Wally said, somewhat emotionally. Bro, there's nothing for you to thank me about. I too was taking a risk in coming here. 
but thank heavens that it turned out all right. We have better food, amazing houses, clothes. And best of all, our pay is higher than what we used to make. Coming here was definitely the best decision we have ever made. I know. But that's not why I was thanking you, Wally said. Wally was Ilja's longtime friend ever since they were six. They had been neighbors when they were in Dayferus, and they were still neighbors in Baymard. Along the time they spent wandering, Wally's sister had been raped by seven men. And all Wally could do was watch and cry. He and his sister went out to the fields to work. And on their way, they met some ruffians. They had beaten him up and had made High Dot watch the whole ordeal. Ever since that day, his sister had stopped taking all together. She had changed from her happy 16-year-old girl, to a quiet shut-in, who would cry when she was all alone. Wally and his family really didn't know how to comfort her. His mother tried talking to her, but nothing went through. The lucky thing was that his sister didn't get pregnant after that ordeal or else he was sure that she would have really killed herself. With seven men all taking turns, who could the father actually be? The thought of having all those men on her, was enough to drive her insane as it is. Wally didn't know if it was their ancestor who saved her from such a terrible faith, or her womb that was barren Wally, it's called a non-fertile window within her ovulation cycle. Bruh. Wally and his family were so worried about her. She hadn't spoken to anyone for heaven's sake. But when she came to Baymard, it was like a miracle. She had started smiling at them. His sister was currently working at the textile industry. Since rape wasn't a strange thing in this continent, he explained her situation to Chief Sophia. From there, he had heard that everyone at the workplace had been cracking jokes with her and making her smile here and there. Although she hadn't spoken yet there was as visible progress with her condition. At home, she would smile at them, and even make hand gestures to show that she wanted to cook for them. I, I dot dot am happy that we came here. She looks really happy here. And you, do you still want to marry her? Wally asked, while struggling not to cry. He was afraid of Elijah's rejection. He knew how much his sister cared about Elijah. So how could he not be afraid? What man would like to be with a touched woman? He wouldn't blame Elijah for breaking their engagement. But it would really hurt his heart if that were the case. What the hell are you talking about? Do you know how much I love her? Do you really think that he'll blame her for something that isn't her fault? I won't change my mind about marrying her. Wally looked at Elijah and nodded passionately. Good. Dot. I knew I could always count on you, bro. Let's make the best out of our blessings. Let's make Baymard our home. Chapter 175 Delivery at the hospital today, Landon was hurriedly rushing over to the hospital to deliver a baby. Who are the patients currently in labor? Your Majesty, only patient Wanner in Ward D33 is in labor. Dr. Gerson replied, as he ran alongside Landon. What about the other patients within the childbirth ward? None at the moment your majesty, said nurse Chanel, as she too ran alongside them as well. Previously, Landon had created different departments within the hospital, based on his rewards from the system. The system had rewarded him with surgical knowledge on, suturing, debridement of wounds, burns or infection, dental restoration, wrist fusion and hand tendon repairs, leg bone fusion, as well as knowledge on childbirth and so on. Hence with all these in mind, Landon had created different departments that handled, childbirth and labor, accidents and emergencies, dental, which looks at dental restoration for now, central sterile services, which focuses on sterilization of all equipment and tools, critical care departments, which focuses on those who are seriously ill and need extensive care, pharmacy, elderly service department, general surgery department, pain management department, for acupuncture, massages and other procedures that decrease pain, medical records department, that records, dates and stores all patient information for the hospital, discharge lounge, for patients who don't need to stay in their ward on the day of their discharge, they could just wait here until their guardian comes to get them. This room would also have chessboards, magazines, books, puzzles and so on. Dot. He had named these departments, 
based on the general departments that were present within any hospital back on earth for now the hospital would only have these departments but of course in the future more departments would be created when Baymard made more tools and drugs as well as when Landon got more knowledge from the system anyway within this month the childbirth and child care department already had seven women who were nine months pregnant and any time from now it was clear that they would fall into labor hence Landon had them stay within the hospital in Landon's opinion these people were very strong-willed and capable compared to people back on earth when the doctor told these women that they would have to be admitted into the hospital they immediately rejected the idea and said that it would be too troubling but of course the doctor insisted and finally they got admitted into the hospital the reason was simple dot 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 distance like Landon had said it would take someone 16 minutes to drive from one region to another if there was no traffic but with traffic one was looking at a 35 minute drive now it took these people one hour and 45 minutes to walk from district E central region to district A upper region and with the hospital being within district C that meant that they would have to walk for about 55 minutes before they got there that is if they were living at district T and not district F these people were so used to walking such long distances that they didn't see anything wrong with it but how could Landon allow a nine month pregnant woman to walk for so long on the road although they were fine with it Landon's conscience was not this was one of the reasons why he had decided to construct a car assembly industry and so on once that was done he would create buses and make bus schedules for the people also he had decided that from January to June he would also start focusing on railway as well transportation had to be done properly for the sake of the people as well as for the grand opening in July before Landon had come to Bay Mud only about 3% of the people had horses they were all comfortable waking up at 5 a dot m and walking for two to three hours to their final destination no wonder they are all fit how could one gain weight as a peasant as for the pregnant women they could just forget it they were getting admitted to the hospital and that was that plus what if on their way to the hospital they give birth on the road while in labor in fact everything was just dangerous about the situation well in this era almost all the peasant women knew a thing or two about delivery especially in this spay mart before dr gerson and his group came in may the people delivered their own babies themselves the women neighbors and everyone else would help with the process but because they weren't really trained some of their patients ended up dying from loss of blood untied umbilical cord and so on of course other times they would be successful in their attempts so with all these reasons Landon had made sure that the women got admitted into the hospital lest they try to have the baby at home and lose their lives in the process once the babies are born the mother and baby would have to stay within the hospital for another month as that the hospital staff could check the baby and the mother as well they would also tell the mother what type of diet she needed to focus on as well as how to take care of the baby and what the baby should be eating in Landon's opinion these people had no knowledge on real knowledge of child care hence it was the responsibility of the doctors and nurses to examine a MD teach all new mothers within Baymard dot for the past two months the main doctors and nurses have been studying all the books that Landon had given them and now Landon had wanted to perform the delivery process for all seven women last month he delivered four beautiful children from three women of course one of the women carried twins and now he was going to aid these seven women in their delivery process for some reason he had a hunch that one of these women would give birth on Christmas Day which was in two days time 15th of December Landon's mission from the system was to perform and teach all surgical procedures produce all 25 drugs needed for the patients who undergo those surgeries as well as teach the people on all beginner and intermediate knowledge that he had received right now he had been performing and teaching these surgeries so as to quickly complete his mission as for the drugs he had decided to only produce four drugs this month next month 
he would create four more and so on. Helpfully by June, all 25 drugs would be produced. Landon ran to Dr. Gerson's office, and immediately changed for delivery. Have the tools been checked, sterilized and placed on the trolleys? Landon asked as he wore his green surgery overall. Cleaned and ready to go your mage. I mean Dr. Landon. Nurse Chanel said, good. Dot. Quickly, to the theater. As they ran, Landon continued to ask several other questions. Did you send someone to inform the patient's family? Yes, Dr. Landon. We sent for them the same time that we sent for you. The patient's husband, sisters and mother were currently at work. So we brought the patient's father instead. We drove him in one of the hospital's trucks, to save time. Dr. Gerson replied, since there were no phones present yet, all they could do was go to the family's house and notify any of the members. And if there was no one present, then they would go to their workplaces and get any of them over. All workplaces were informed that, if there was an emergency like death, accidents or childbirth, then those involved could take a day or two off to deal with the crisis, before going back to work. And if they needed more time, then they could just ask for an extension. No one would get fired because they had to hold a funeral, or see their wives at the hospital. So currently, only the patient's father was available. And how long had she been in labor before the contractions increased? It has been 25 hours and 42 minutes since the patient's water broke and within that time frame the patient had mild contractions for 23 hours and 22 minutes but after that time the patient's contractions and pain had increased rapidly and right now the patient presently has excruciating back pain dr gerson said she is ready actually women would usually give birth within any time between 16 72 hours after their water broke the time depended purely on the woman. Of course the doctors would only pop the baby out when it was time to do so. They would check the woman's discharge which could have different colors like pink, brown, slightly bloody. Which all showed the patient's current pregnancy stage. They also checked the pain factor and cramps that the woman was having to see if it was time for the baby to be pushed out. With mild contractions, they start every after 20 minutes. And after mild contractions, the patient's contractions grow closer, stronger and longer. So they could change from 20 minutes to 16 minutes. All the way to 2 minutes or even 1. Mild contractions show that the baby isn't ready to come out yet. But when the contractions increase to the level where the patient gets excruciating back pain, then that baby is ready to come into the world. That's why after mild contractions, Landon had the doctors send for the patient's family. Sometimes, the pain could build up for six more hours after mild contractions. Before the woman was ready for surgery. And other times, it would only take three more hours. So depending on the women these times vary. That's why immediately after mild contractions, the family members were rushed over. In their patient's case, it only took two hours and twenty minutes after mild contractions, for her to be ready. Bang! Landon opened the theatre room wide open. The room was clean and well lit, and all equipments were readily available. Wheel the patient in immediately and get her father suited up. Chapter 176 Delivery at the hospital 2 in a ward a little distance from the theater, Wanna was currently moaning and yelling out crazily. The beds within the ward all had curtains around them for privacy. As well as a stool and bedroom table beside it, the girl looked weak, haggard and exhausted. Her blonde hair was messy and rough. And her lips had little blood stains on them from her biting them when trying to handle the pain she was currently experiencing. Just who the hell said that childbirth was the best thing in the world? She felt like after this experience, she may never allow her husband to touch her again. Over her dead body, she honestly felt like someone was currently stabbing her with hundreds of knives all over her body. Especially her back. If her husband were here, then she was sure that she would punch him hard and give him a piece of her mind. Bastard. If not for the breathing exercises, massages and medicinal paste given by the hospital, 
She was sure that she would be dead from the pains she was feeling. What the hell? Ah, it hurts so bad. Papa, don't you love me? Why didn't you stop me when I said that I wanted to get married? Now look at the mess that I'm currently in. How did I let Xander husband talk me into this? And if Xander really loved me, why did he have to put me through all this? As the 19 year old girl aired her grievances out, her father who had been listening to his hanger like daughter, felt helpless on the side. In truth, he was shocked at his daughter's transformation. Does pregnancy change women? Before he came here, his daughter had always been quiet, calm and sweet. But over the past one hour, she had been growing more aggressive and angry by the minute. Honestly, this was his first time seeing a woman in labor, so he really didn't know what to do. Usually, the neighbor's wives and daughters would push all the men out and deal with the woman's childbirth process. So he didn't know what exactly went down inside the rooms. He would just hear screaming and cursing. And that was it. There. Their dot 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 lemon nickname. Like pumpkin. It will be over very soon. Papa can promise you that. As they discussed, they could hear several footsteps getting closer and closer. Tap, tap, tap. Tap, 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 Mr. Zeke, Mrs. Wanna, it's time. Very quickly, they got Wanna on a wheelchair. While someone else took her her father Zeke away, so that he could suit up. Wanna keeps screaming from pain, as she was led into the theater. Ah, ah, dot, 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 oh, why me? What did I do to deserve this? Ah, Papa. Where's Papa? Once she was in. She was immediately put to bed that had two high leg holders at the lower part of it. Wanna looked up and saw six people in the room. She didn't know who they were since they all wore face masks and hair covers. But when she looked at the last person closely, she suddenly realized that it was her father. She felt so happy. At least, now even if she died, she would die knowing that she didn't go without seeing or telling someone in her family that she loved them. Mrs. Please concentrate, said a doctor, who for some reason, had a different voice from those who previously attended to her during her stay at the hospital. But at the same time, she still felt that the doctor's voice was very familiar to someone she knew. Who could it be? Mr. Zeke, please hold your daughter's hands and give her support. Ye dot dot yes Dr. Zeke answered. It was only when he got here that he realized how serious the situation was. He was panicking about what he should do. He held his daughter's hand tightly and ensured her that everything would be all right. From there, everything became serious. And after 35 minutes, Wanna felt like someone was instantly ripping her private part out. Push Mrs. Wanna. Push. Ow ha. Mr. Zeke was scared silly. Is this what his wife went through? He could see his daughter's red face and all her veins that were popping out from her hands. Tell and head. He could also see her baby's head struggling to come out. The blood. The process. Everything scared him silly. He had no qualms seeing an animal's blood, or even his enemy's blood. But his daughter's blood were a whole different story. Plus he could tell that she was feeling unimaginable pain, just from the way she was gripping his hands. He quickly used his other hand to massage her head lightly. He was truly scared and afraid that she would die. He tried to hold on and keep strong, but at the end, he fainted. Nurse Chanel, take care of the patient's father. Mrs. Wanna push. We are almost there. After another 11 minutes, Mr. Z woke up to the sight of his daughter making her last push. Ah, the baby was out. Wah, wah, wah. The blood-covered baby cried out loud as the nurse carried him. It's a boy. Congratulations Mrs. Wanna. Congratulations Mrs. Congratulations. Underscore. My baby. Wanna said softly. She was truly exhausted. Zeke got up, dashed to his daughter's side. Papa. Wanna called out. Papa is here. Sorry for leaving you earlier, Zeke said, while trying to hold back his tears. He had never cried before, but now. It seemed like the tears from his dried up stream, were threatening to flow out. The two chatted as the doctors and nurses cleaned the baby. Mrs. Would you like to hold him for a while before we check him? As Wanna held the baby, she now understood that after all the suffering came the biggest gift of all. Her baby, Zeke on the other hand was also emotional as well. But after this, 
If his daughter didn't want another child, then he wouldn't be bothered about it at all. He had seen her almost lose her life, so when all was said and done, he wouldn't fault her if she decided to stop after this. So Lemon, would you still have another child after all this? Wanna looked at her papa and smiled. Before, I would have said hell no, but after looking at my little baby here, I feel like I want to have five more with Xander. That's my lemon, Zeke said while kissing her forehead. Mrs. What would the baby's name be called? Asked Nurse Chanel. She had to fill the baby's form for all his information. When I was well prepared, on the first day that she was admitted at the hospital, they had told her to discuss such things with her husband before she went into labor. Her and Xander had decided that if it were a boy, then they would name him Maximus. And if it were a girl, then she will be called Maximilia. His name will be Maximus Dalwine, she said while lovingly looking at her baby. Zeke looked at the little Maximus, and smiled. He had just witnessed a miracle. Thank you ancestors, for not taking my daughter and grandson away from me. Dot. Landon stepped out with Dr. Gerson and Dr. Rufus, while the nurses took care of the baby and the patient. Did you all learn anything? Yes your majesty, they both said while nodding. This was Rufus second time watching the delivery process. And for Gerson, it was his third time. Good. Because next time, Dr. Rufus would handle everything. And after that, Dr. Gerson, you'll take charge as well. This pattern will continue until all doctors within the hospital perform these procedures. Of course everything will be done under my supervision so no need to worry. Can you all handle it? Landon asked. Under your guidance, I'm sure we can your majesty Gerson said, while Rufus nodded. Good. Dot. I'll train you all for seven more months, before I can give you all free reign over the patients. This was the only way he could complete his mission and move on to the next phase. Chapter 177 New Drugs A few more days had passed and Baymard had already had its first Christmas. On Christmas Eve, Landon had held a grand Christmas party to show the people how Christmas was celebrated. During the party, some of the children came on stage, and acted out a play that symbolized the spirit of Christmas. They even sang Christmas songs from the new Baymard hymnal, and did several other dance as well. On Christmas Day itself, the people stayed at their homes and gave gifts to each other. Some celebrated with their guests and neighbors, while others celebrated with their families only. Of course Landon stayed at the castle with his family, Mark, Gary, Thray, Josh and their girlfriends. They celebrated all night long, as well as exchanged gifts too. And just like that, Christmas had passed and it was time to get back to work. For this month, he had decided to focus on Tylenol, Advil. Relax and penicillin V. Tylenol could only effectively give in relieving pain, fever, headaches, cramps, fever and so on. While Advil was good at relieving inflammation, as well as doing everything that else that Tylenol could do. Like relieving pain, fever, toothache and cramps. The difference between the two was that, if one one got a flu and his throat got swollen or inflamed, then Advil would be used. But if there's no swell, then it was advisable for the patient to stick to Tylenol. Likewise if one had a sprained body part and wanted to relieve the pain and tackle inflammation, then Advil was the way to go. But if there's no inflammation, Tylenol would be perfect to use. It's very important for one to use the proper drug, as taking Advil when there's no inflammation, could actually worsen one's condition. And vice versa. One could treat their fever but have prolonged swells and inflammations instead. The next drug type that Landon wanted to focus on, were laxatives. There were different types as well, that focused on whether the patient's constipation was short term or long term. For now, Landon decided to focus on the short term one, hence he decided to make lax. In this era, constipation was still a dangerous affair that led to more intestinal issues and diseases. Several people had even died from chronic constipation due to lack of proper drugs, and medical knowledge. Hence Alax was necessary to sort out these constipation issues within Baymard. Up next, Landon wanted to look at penicillin. Penicillin was an antibiotic drug, 
that had over 10 different types that varied based on their uses. For now, the only type of penicillin that would be made was penicillin V. Penicillin V is generally used to treat soft tissue infections, mild infections and severe skin infections. It could also treat laryngitis, pneumonia, scarlet fever and rheumatic fever. All in all, Landon thought that these drugs were perfect for Baymard now. And the best thing was that these drugs could be taken during pregnancy, and could also be helpful towards treating infections in infants. Dot. Ramsey, I think we're all set now, Landon said, as he inspected the last raw material sample in his palms. Ramsey was the new overseer for the new pharmaceutical industry. He was one of Wiggins' close friends, who used to be a supervisor within the alchemy industry. With his skills and experience, Landon was sure that he had made the right choice in promoting him to overseer. Anyway, this new industry had alchemists chemists mechanical engineers in training, electrical engineers, chemical engineers in training and operation engineers. Last week, Landon had focused on making penicillin V and Alax. But for the next four days, he would only teach them how to make Advil. And the week after this, he would follow up by making Tylenol. Today was all about Advil. The first step in making Advil, was to ensure that all the raw materials were available, treated and mixed properly. For Advil. Landon had gotten 23 different raw materials which were plants that were grounded into powder form, as well as several other chemicals like silicon dioxide, sodium lauryl sulfate and so on. Of course all these chemicals came from the chemical production department within the alchemy industry. Presently, Landon was currently in the storage building, that stored both raw materials and finished goods. Right now. Landon and Ramsey had just finished checking samples of all the raw materials present. All right, 100 of you should focus on sending these raw materials to the second floor of building 2. When you get to the loading station, send them up on the conveyor belt with the sign Advil raw material offloading on it. The rest of you will follow Chief Ramsey and I into the building. Immediately, the workers loaded up several trucks and drove towards the building. The building was huge and wide, and 56 of the ground floor was used by the trucks for loading and offloading. While the other 16 of the ground floor had a bathroom, reception desk and so on. Anyway, 56 of the ground floor had 48 wide conveyor belts that moved in different directions. 24 were going up while 24 were coming down. The building itself was five stories tall, so that meant that only four stories would be used for manufacturing. Anyway, each floor had six conveyor belts heading up its way, as well as six conveyor belts from their floor heading back to the ground floor. So that would mean that each floor would accommodate six different drug making departments within the building. The workers quickly drove to raw materials to the ground floor and found their spot. One could imagine the ground floor to be like an airport baggage area for large containers and drums. Each conveyor belt had a large sign above it, that showed where it was heading to, or coming from. As they drove by, they saw other workers offloading drums of raw materials for penicillin V and Alax as well as other workers who were loading the finished products on their trucks. Once the men saw the massive sign, they immediately parked their trucks alongside the conveyor belt, and began their work. VRRRMMMMMM, the massive conveyor belt was already on, as Landon and the rest of the men had headed towards the building way ahead of those who focused on loading. At the same time on the second floor, Landon, Ramsey and the rest of the workers immediately got to work when they saw the drums coming in. Time to get started. Chapter 178 New Drugs 2 Once the raw materials arrived, Landon and the workers set the drums that they needed for today on the floor. And those that weren't needed, were sent to a small storage room within the department. After this, Landon began to explain the mixing ratio needed during production. There were eight large industrial shaped mixers within the Advil production department. And for each mixer, Landon had specified that they should add six drums of this, two drums of that and so on. Chief Ramsey, 
Please press the large green button on the side of the machine. Dia ra 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 The non-stationary part of the machine shaped mixer started rotating round and round, like it spinned like those astronauts during a gravity test. Can anyone tell me why we chose do this step? Landon asked. Some of the workers had been pulled in from the other drug making departments, so they immediately knew why. We do it so that the whole powdered mixture can be even someone answered. Correct. Dot. But what could happen if it's not even or homogenized? The quality will be bad. The pill will not be effective. The pill might not work. It means that we would have bought and used up our raw materials for nothing. Underscore. Landon continued to hold a mini lecture with them, while they waited for the machine to properly blend and mix the ingredients. After 15 minutes, the homogeneous mixture was sent to another large tank that acted as a fluidized bed. This next step was known as granulation. Within the tank, air was pumped into the tank from the bottom, and the powdered particles immediately suspended in midair, and danced within the funnel shaped tank. While this was going on, Solvents were constantly being spraying on the dancing particles from tiny holes at the midsection of the tank. As the spraying and dancing continued, the particles sticked to one another forming lumps. From there, the lumps were sent to a milling machine. Within this particular machine, the lumps were passed through several mechanisms that shaped the lumps into tablet sizes. Of course at this stage although the tablet sizes had been formed, the pill was still somewhat soft. Hence, the tablets headed towards a large tablet pressing device. This machine could solidify up to 4000 tablets every 5 minutes. And after 10 minutes, they had successfully created two batches of pills. They had made a total of 7119 tablets of Advil. After this phase, the tablets were sent to a huge coating machine which could coated the pills to any color that they wanted, based on all the raw material used for producing the coating. Actually, coating was absolutely necessary for easy swallowing. Back on Earth, some pills will taste like strawberries on the outside, but were bitter on the inside. This was because of coating, to make children and other people swallow the pills easily. Even normal pills have unflavored coatings on them. That's why one could only get the real bitterness of a pill, after chewing it. This coating machine was similar to a drying machine. But the only difference was that holes could release the coating agents, as well as cool air for drying. The machine also did small swishes, unlike a drying machine that rotated super fast. If the machine went with that speed, then the pills would surely break or scatter from there. The tablets passed through a polishing machine to give them shine. When the tablets have been well polished, they were later sent to a massive packaging machine. The machine had a large assembly line, that could package over 100 plastic pill bottles a minute. Previously, while the loaders were doing their thing loading the trucks, Landon and the workers had already loaded several empty plastic pill bottles and bottle caps to the machine. The machine had a feeder for caps pills and empty pill bottles. Chief Ramsey, please turn the dial to medium speed and push the green button Landon said. Chimp, chimp, chimp. Wah! Look, it's filling the pills into the machine on its own. That's nothing, just wait until you see it close the bottle cap on its own. Really? It can do that? Yeah it can. I was previously working at the Tylenol department, so I saw it. Amazing. Underscore. The workers discussed as they watched the entire process. From there, the pill bottles headed towards another assembly line where they would be placed in small cardboard packages. The box packing was simple dot 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 it was red in color, with the words, Advil, made in Baymard and the expiration date on its bottom. The bottom of the pill bottle also had the expiration date as well. For the expiration date, Landon estimated bases on when the plant was grown chemical preservatives added and other minor factors. Of course drugs usually last for one to three years. But Landkn had estimated all the new drugs to last for eight months maximum. But with radio signals coming out, it shouldn't be long before Landon made dating machines. These sort of machines used analog signals, sensors and frequency to measure things like acidity, 
acidity in all other factors that would be used in calculating the right expiration date. Anyway, after the pills got packaged, they were led on a conveyor belt towards several large brown colored boxes, and from there, they were to be recounted, sealed and sent down towards the ground floor and sent to the storage room. Dot. In fact, the process wasn't hard to follow. The issue was always having the right raw materials and getting an even mixture, and of course, one also had go control the airflow within the fluidized beds as well. Different airflow levels, gave different lump sizes and results. Your Majesty, how do I divide the workers up? Ramsey, asked. There are 274 people in this new department right? Yes your Majesty, all right. Let's do it like this, 74 people should focus on loading and offloading, and the rest will be divided evenly between all machines, and the other work posts. I'll draw a new schedule for all the workers within this department. Since you're the overseer, you should hold a meeting with the employees and speak about your expectations, work schedule and monthly goals. You'll also bring new secretaries, accountants and auditors that will focus on this new sector only so you need to communicate with them at all times. They will be located on the first floor of Building 5, with all the other business-related workers. Oh! And next week, we will start creating another new drug. So tomorrow morning, I'll give you a list of raw materials that you need to buy from the food and alchemy industry. No problem your majesty. After Landon was done, he decided to head towards the castle so that he could think more on the system's mission. The earlier he finished everything, the more missions he would get. Of course he couldn't produce all the drugs now, since some of the plants weren't particularly available yet. Ah rather, they were available. But their amount was too small for mass production. That way he had pushed production of some of some, to spring and early summer. Sigh. This damn mission was giving him a headache. Well. At least the people would have drugs to treat their colds, pains, fever, headaches and even toothaches. This was good. Chapter 179 Men from the Queen Caden City, the Empire of Corona. Dot. Santa was in a fine mood. He kept his smile and his pace restrained as he slowly caught up to his longtime friend, Queen Penelope. Benji. I think we lost them, so let's stop here, Penelope said as she pulled her horse reins. Santa Benjamin Hamilton and Penelope, had been good friends for years now. When Santa was just ten years old, the seven-year-old Penelope had joined his class within the Knighthood Academy. She was always aloof and very protective of him. One should know that because of his round ball-like physique, the children would always make fun of him. They took him like the class clown. At that age, his stamina wasn't too good, and he always ended up being the weakest swordsman in the class. But of course, Penelope would kick Hanon's ass, if they tried to bully him. And just like that, he ended up being her property within the academy. For sure, this made things worse because when she wasn't there, everyone would still pick on him. They would mock him for hiding behind a woman, and even shoot tiny pebbles his way. In their eyes, he wasn't a man. But did he care? Dot. Nope. To him, they were just jealous. He had just arrived Corona a few days ago, and was immediately greeted with a letter from Penelope. Well, he couldn't really call it a letter. It was more like a death threat. It just had ten words on it. See me as soon as you arrive, or dead. Although Penelope was usually aloof and unbothered. But when it concerned him, she would show a little bit of emotions here and there. Maybe it was because she had been used to protecting him always, or maybe she felt like she had raised him. Who knows? No matter how unattached someone seemed to be, there would always be another person around them, that could bring a little change in their character. For Penelope, Santa was one of her weaknesses. He was always happy and never seemed to act like all the other men around her. While everyone else pampered her and treated her like a princess, Santa had always been the only one who treated her like a regular human being. When she was little, she introduced herself to him. And unlike the other boys who seemed to treat her like a precious egg, Santa treated her like everyone else. She instantly realized that his way of thinking, 
was different from the general masses, and it was then and there that she decided to recruit him as her first friend. Presently. If someone ever tried to kidnap or attack her Benjamin, she was sure that she would throw caution to the wind and hack the person into several pieces. Presently, they had successfully sneaked away from the many bodyguards that were supposed to be around Queen Penelope. When did you arrive? Penelope asked in an unemotional tone, three days ago. So you saw my message and you only thought it wise to meet me now? Penelope asked in a calm but intimidating tone. Why did this buffoon seem like he didn't care about her at all? Ever since her coronation day, he hadn't even bothered to say congratulations to her. Is this what her mother always meant whenever she said that her little baby is all grown up? Penelope felt like she couldn't read Santu anymore. Well, she couldn't understand herself as well. Why was she pissed? Calm down thinking too much. I just wanted to clear my head for a bit. Clear your head my foot. Comma she thought inwardly. Looking at her, he felt truly helpless. After so many years together, how could he not tell when she was angry? One could say that she was his weakness as well. Two years ago, he had begun to understand his feelings towards her. And in a way, he had tried to kill them multiple times. But after the coronation, he immediately travelled so as to clear his head. With her being queen, how could he hope to successfully marry her? He wasn't a well-respected knight. He was a well-known merchant instead. For her, he was willing to stop travelling and settle down. After all, he had subordinates who could look after his shops. Well, he was willing to decrease the amount of times that he travelled. It would be a lie if he said that he would completely give up traveling. He truly loved his profession. Just like how a general had to go to war for several months. He too needed to travel around as a merchant. But for her, he would do it once in every four months. Or five, if need be. He had thought about all these things over the past two years, since he thought that one of her brothers would be king. But now that she was the ruler, it was a whole new ball game. A king needed to be accepted by the people and her family. Wouldn't it be downgrading for her to end up with a merchant? Yes he was from a noble family, but that didn't change the fact that his occupation was still that of a merchant. When he saw the her message three days ago, he was somewhat hesitant to see her again. What did you need to think about? Penelope asked. Although she seemed calm, her whole mind was in a mess. She didn't like what she was currently feeling right now. Why was she afraid? Something inside her felt wrong. I was thinking that we should stop seeing each other. Silence followed for 40 seconds, before Penelope snapped back to her senses. She felt something wet, not her cheek, and when she wiped it off, she realized that there were tears. What was happening? Why was she crying? Even her crying mode was cold. Her facial expression stayed the same, but the tears kept falling down like a waterfall. Santa was shocked and frightened by her actions. She was crying. This. This. This was bad. I immediately regretted his actions. The last thing he wanted to do was hurt her. But he couldn't help asking himself, why was she crying exactly? The queen was crying. If anyone came to see this scene, they would surely tie him up and burn him alive. In fact, even if he was innocent, no one would believe him. They would kill first, and then ask questions later in this case. No one had ever seen the queen cry. Not even her own parents. Penelope please don't cry. Calm down and let me finish. What I mean is that I want to be more than a friend to you. Instantly. Her tears stopped flowing and looked at Santu in a questionable manner. She was confused. Her brain couldn't process the information. What do you mean? Sigh. He'll say this only once, so listen up okay? For a long time now, I've been in love with you Penelope. Keeping you as my friend, will only cause me grief and pain. As well as make your life uncomfortable. So, you love me? Dot. Penelope asked as her heartbeat quickened for some unknown reason. Isn't it obvious? Dot. When you call me out, no matter what time it is, I always come. Whatever you demanded, I've always done. Haven't you realized that the only woman that I treat like this, Penelope? Do you understand now? She fell silent for a while, and when she was about to answer, 
She heard strange voices coming from afar. She immediately placed her palms over Santa's mouth, and pushed him downwards. These voices weren't from any of her men, so who could it be? Chapter 180 Men from the Queen 2 Are you sure that they came in this direction? I'm sure of it. Let's keep searching then, maybe we'll see their horses nearby. Seven thuggish men were currently looking around the premises in hopes of finding Santa. After a while, one of them spotted two horses hidden a little further from Santa and Penelope. Boss. Dot. I've found their horses. One of the men yelled out. As they conversed, Santa and Penelope began to think about the origins of these men. Do you know them? Penelope asked in a whispery tone. No. But they said they were looking for a he. And since a man. Then they were definitely talking about you. HMHM. It looks like they are here for trouble. Santa replied, Don't worry, he'll protect you. Santa turned and looked at her warmly. Well, protect each other. He relied, Sure. For some reason, she felt all warm and fuzzy inside when she held heard him. She concluded that something must definitely be wrong with her. When she got back home, she would have to ask her grandfather and parents about her current state. Hopefully, she wasn't sick. As the men walked closer to the horses, they continued to scan the area in hopes of spotting their target. You two, ride these horses away from here, so that they wouldn't have any means of escaping from us. Yes boss. The two men turned to the horses and tried to climb on them. Hee 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 hee. The horses tried to avoid the men, as they didn't recognize them. Bang, bang, bang. The men who tried to ride the horses, were abruptly kicked by the horses. What a joke. These horses had been used by their owners for several years now, and no one else had ever ridden them. So how could they allow anyone apart from their owners to ride them? Ah! A filthy animal like you dares to kick me? One of the men became pissed and immediately took out his dagger in attempt to kill the beast. Stop. Step away from my steed. Penelope yelled out. How could she let them kill her trusty steed? The men turned around and spotted Penelope and Santa coming their way. They immediately knew who Santa was, since they had been trailing him for the past three days. But for Penelope, everyone had no idea who she really was. They thought she looked familiar, but they brushed it off. If she really had a high enough position, why was she here was a merchant? Even if he was a wealthy one, a merchant was still a merchant. Dot. I'm glad that you guys have finally arrived. This would make my job go faster. Benjamin Hamilton Wright, the leader of the group asked. Even though he knew the answer. Excuse me. But I believe that we have never met before. So why have you all looking for me? Santu asked with a smile on his face. I have just one simple question for you. If you answer me truthfully, then me and my boys here won't play with your little girlfriend over there. Penelope who heard this, immediately grew mad. But when she sneaked a peek at Santu and saw how angry he was, she couldn't help but smile a bit. And when she remembered that she had been called his girlfriend, blushed intensively until it looked as if the sun had burnt her. Although she still maintained her unemotional facial expression, her blush was still very eye-catching. Santa looked at her and was utterly confused. Was she so mad that she had anger had roasted her face off? Are you okay? I mean, your face is so red. If you're sick, why did you come out? Dot. Blah blah blah. Santa had totally forgotten the people in front of him. Penelope looked at the nagging man and smiled. Truly a fool, even in a time like this one. But she couldn't help smiling at this idiot. Underscore. The seven men who were left out of the conversation grew angry the more they watched the shameless couple. Are you two looking down on us? Exclamation mark. One of the men asked angrily. Ugh. You're still here. Pardon our manners. You were saying? The leader looked at the hateful couple, and didn't want to waste any more time on them. Boy, he'll make this quick. Where is Queen Winnie? Santa's eyes immediately lit up, as he heard the question. True enough, that old hag Queen Ivy, couldn't sit still anymore. It looked like she sent these men here to kill Barry and his family. Sorry. 
the name you mentioned doesn't ring a bell. Santa replied, doesn't ring a bell, your ship was spotted around the same time as their disappearance. Plus we have eyewitnesses that said that they personally saw you on that ship as well. The leader said, the leader couldn't understand it, they had already been in Corona for a month and a half now and they hadn't been able to spot Queen Winnie or any of her children this entire time. It was like sorcery. From the reports they had gotten, they left with Santa to Corona. People had even said that they had seen the exact ship land in Corona a while later. So was it magic? Where did they all disappear to? Sorry but, for real, I have absolutely no idea of who you're talking about. Santa said while yawning. It seems like you're willing to die for them right? No problem. Well do it your way then, men. Play with the girl, while I tie up this ingrate. Can you hold on? Penelope asked. Ill dry. Santa responded. Do you best, and don't die on me. Santa looked at Penelope, and they immediately nodded at each other. Instantly, Santa ran up to the leader and unsheathed his sword. Cling, cling, cling. Their swords clashed several times. Cling. Santa was forced to lean backwards as his enemy's attacks were fierce and mighty. His enemy was bigger and taller when compared to him. And it was clear that the man had more strength too. Sigh. At this point, he try regretted why he didn't grain seriously. He was more of a thinker, than a fighter. Ha. The leader yelled, while swinging his sword sideways at full force. The leader was aiming for Santa's arm. Cling. Santa blocked the attack, but this time, the force of the attack pushed him down. He immediately rolled away, as the leader tried to pierce his rolling body multiple times. If he didn't think of something quick, then he was sure that he would be at a complete disadvantage. He looked at the floor and his eyes lit up. Ah! My eyes! You bastard! Benjamin had thrown dirt into the leader's eye. Taking advantage of the situation, he immediately swung his sword at the leader's knees. Son of a BCH, I'm going to kill you. The leader started swinging his sword around like crazy. He couldn't see well, and his left leg had been cleanly cut off. What more could he do? F whip. The leader's swings were all over the place. Santa meticulously dodged them, and swiftly cut off the leader's head. He turned around in hopes of helping Penelope but was stunned at the sight before him. She had just finished dealing with the other six men. She had left the last one unconscious for questioning. Benji, I thought you said that your skills had greatly improved. Why did you take so long to deal with just one person? Hey, that wasn't my fault all right. Have you seen his size? All I hear are excuses and more excuses. If I wasn't here, Aren't you aware that they would've ganged up on you? Penelope asked with a cold tone. How could she not be angry? But I'm okay aren't I? Indeed, you're fine. But what about next time? Tomorrow morning, I want to see you at the Royal Training Field. It looks like I've been really soft on you over the years. For some reason when he heard her, a chill ran down his spine. As he looked at the unconscious man on the floor, he immediately began to think of his next move. It looked like he would have to head over to Baymar de SAP. Chapter 181 Graduating Class of 1024 Today was the 27th of December. Graduation Day. The students had finished their exams on the 2nd. And on the 20th, their report cards were given out within the school premises. With this, the semester had officially come to an end. Those who had passed would of course be able to graduate. But those that failed, would take one more semester to better themselves before they could graduate. In this way, graduation ceremonies would always be held at the end of every semester. Dot. Ring. A golden colored twin bell alarm clock rang out loudly. Henry quickly got up and turned it off. If one were to describe the alarm clock, they could imagine it like a head with ridiculously large ears. The clock had two bells which looked like ears, as well as a tiny metal stick between the bells. When it was time for the alarm clock to ring, the stick would move from side to side, hitting both bells one after the other. Honestly, Henry was really impressed by this alarm clock that his parents had bought for him four days ago. It was truly a lifesaver, today was his graduation day, and there was no way that he would be late for such an occasion. The event would start at 11 a.m. But as graduates, 
they were required to come in by 10.30 a.m. maximum. For this ceremony, Henry had bought three guest tickets for his family. His mom had to work today, so his dad, his 16-year-old elder brother and his 10-year-old sister would be attending the ceremony. Two hours had passed and everyone was finally ready to head out. They had decided to set out together, since the event would take place at 11 a.m., and it would take 55 minutes to walk there. Of course eight days ago, Baymard had received its first snowfall. On the first two days, the snowfall was light. And on the third day, the snow had decided to give itself a break. On the fourth to sixth days, it fell down hard. It seemed like the heavens were having a mythical battle up in the sky. And after this intense battle, the snowfall had suddenly decided to back into hibernation. Although gone, it still left its lingering presence around Baymard. The ground, trees, streams, and roofs, had all been hugged by the snow like a day-old baby. The entire area was covered by a thick blanket of white making the streets look like an unfinished canvas. But the thing that surprised Henry was that, standing outside now, the roads kicked clear and devoid of snow. As they walked towards the school, they could see several snow-clearing machines, cleaning up the streets and walkways for them. The workers would also sprinkle salt here and there on several places as well. Baymard had really changed. Right now, he was still amazed at how effective these winter clothes were. Rather than feeling cold, he had begun to feel hot under his many layers of clothing. His hands, feet, head, and even his neck was protected with a thick scarf. Along the way, they met several other people walking towards the school. Of course amongst the group, he saw his good friend Matilda as well. She was walking with her father and older sister. You excited? She asked playfully. How could I not be? I think I'm both excited and nervous at the same time. I have absolutely no idea what to expect. He said wryly. I know what you mean. But for me, I'm more nervous about preparing for a job interview than anything else. What if I get turned down for my dream job? I told you that I want to work at the horse ranch remember? Mildred said worriedly. Her ancestors knew damn well how she felt about the ranch. Ever since it was created in June, she had been dreaming about working there for the rest of her life. So what should she do if she was turned down? You don't need to worry too much about that. His Majesty had said that on the first day of January, we'll get something called a newspaper, apparently. This paper will tell us what jobs are available, and when the interview for them will be held. He also said that every department within each workplace will be hiring people, so think about it. If you don't get into one department within the horse ranch, try the next one. And if your true goal is to be a caretaker for the horses, and you get hired in the other departments there, then all you have to do is work in that department for a while, and then transfer to your dream area when there's an available spot. Mildred's eyes lit up. And she wasn't depressed anymore. Eh. Then that means that what I should focus on is getting into the ranch first, right? Yup. Dot. That's it. Dot. They walked for a more, and finally arrived at their destination. There were a lot of families around the premises as well. I, Henry, isn't this your name? Asked his father. On one of the hallways, there were large four frames hanging on the wall. The frames had columns and rows in them forming several boxes. Each box had the names of every graduate enclosed within them in alphabetical order. The names were written in black. Built the column lines, row lines and frames were all in gold. Of course the background paper used was white, and the main header read, graduating class of fall 1024. Looking at his name, Henry's family felt immensely proud of him. Son. Will this stay here forever? His father asked. H-M-H-M. That's what his majesty said. Ha. Ah, I'm so proud of you my boy. Way to go bro. His older brother said while giving him two thumbs up. Congrats big bro, said his cute little sister. The other families around were also proud about seeing their children's names as well. The parents began entering the main hall after they showed their tickets while the graduates followed their teachers and headed towards another massive empty room. Time passed by quickly dot 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 and just like that, 
it was time for the ceremony to begin. Chapter 182 Graduating Class of 1024 Part 2 As the music played, Henry grew extremely nervous with every passing second. Breathe. Breathe. He told himself. The musicians used their oboreos which were basically violins and harps to set the mood amd walking pace for the students. Of course Landon had modernized their violins just for this occasion. Previously, their instruments used the same strings from their crossbows, and its outer shell was made from either wood, metal, and even tortoise shells. But now, Landon had ordered for new instruments to be made from wood and metal for the strings and nails. Within the hall, the audience was seating on the bleachers, while the middle area had numerous chairs all lined up neatly on it. There was also a massive wide stage ahead of the chairs. As the music played, three rows of students and teachers walked out in an orderly fashion, with Landon leading the group forward. The teachers led the group wearing black robes, scarfs and hats, while the students followed behind by wearing all blue. For the teachers, their robes were lined with gold at the collar and shoulder region. In Landon's case, he wore a red robe that literally looked like Harry Potter's Gryffindor or Quidditch robe. Of course he couldn't waste such a grand opportunity just like that. The music continued and everyone walked. Steadily, but nervously, they all tried not to look at the crowd. Look! Look! That's my boy there! My little girl is now a woman! Little brother! Dot! Little brother! Dot! Smile more! Underscore! The audience pointed and yelled out emotionally, as they watched the group of graduating students walk forward. The graduating students tried not to laugh, as they kept hearing their names being mentioned. Some of the teachers walked up on stage, while the rest aided the graduates in taking their seats. For this ceremony, Landon had prepared for it to be relatively short and straight to the point. Compared to those back on earth. There were a total of 187 graduates this year. Before they walked in, there were already several guests seated on the stage. All the overseers were present, as well as Lucius, three government workers and Dr. Gerson. Once everyone had a seat, they remained standing. And one of the teachers walked towards the podium holding a megaphone in his hand. Welcome to the Baymard Public School graduation ceremony. Now. Let's give it up for our graduates. Woo, clap, clap, clap. The audience and those on stage clapped loudly and made several approving sounds, as they looked at the students who were currently standing below them. All right, I will like to ask the audience to please join our graduates and rise, while our military sings our national anthem. Immediately, a group of twelve walked onto the stage holding a flag and megaphones. Three people spread out the large flag while nine others sang the anthem. This wasn't the first time that the people had heard this anthem. There were books about the anthem, and during every major event, it would be sung for all to hear. As the military men began singing, the audience placed their right hands across their chests, and tried to follow the song along. After the anthem, they did a short prayer to their ancestors followed by a speech from the valedictorian. And lastly Landon came up to make his speech. Everyone adjusted themselves and sat up upright. One should know that his majesty's speeches were always moving. The man could move mountains with his words. Graduating class of 1024. Words cannot describe how immensely proud I am of you all. Congratulations. You did it. But. You should always remember that you could never have gotten here alone. Take a look at your families for one moment. Henry turned around and tried to find his family. After looking for a while, he finally spotted his cute little sister waving at him and calling out his name. From where he was sitting, he could tell that his family was overjoyed and pleased with him. This feeling was awesome. As he listened to Landon's speech, he became somewhat emotional. It matters not your gender social status or background. Our struggles in this world are mostly similar, at one point in everyone's life. You all have been blessed with the rare opportunity that so many others would kill for. Seize this moment and be the best you can be. I think a lot of people dream. And while they dream, the real happy people, the real successful people, 
are those that get busy. Time waits for no one. Today, everyone here has blossomed into adulthood. So I expect you all to reflect on yourselves, and make the right choices in future. Once again, congratulations graduating class of 1024. Of course Landon had mixed some few famous speeches from Earth, but who would know? Henry clapped as he was utterly moved. His majesty was right. Time waited for no one. If one only dreamt, and never did anything, then the situation might never change. His majesty was a clear example of this concept. If his majesty had still waited for his father to take him back, where would he be now? Clap, clap, clap. Everyone clapped, as they were also touched by Landon's awe-inspiring speech. The ceremony proceeded and it was time for them to receive their certificates. Bro, I'm so nervous. M dot 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 me too. I didn't realize that we would have to walk up on stage. Calm down. You will do fine all right. As Henry conversed with those around him, the butterflies in his tummy had started to act out. They were currently seated in alphabetical order. So he was also sure that everything would happen in that same manner as well. Soon, it was time for his column to get up. He patiently followed the person in front of him, and stood at the line. Henry Moores, boom, boom. As he climbed the stage, his heartbeat started pounding loudly and heavily. Congratulations, congratulations, underscore. He had just shook, Army General Lucius' hand, as well as several other guests on the stage. Finally, he stood in front of His Majesty and was lost for words. Was His Majesty actually going to shake his hands? How could a god touch a mortal's hands so easily? Congratulations Henry. Remember. Be kind, work hard and stay positive. Your life is in your hands. His Majesty said while shaking his hand. Thank you. Your Majesty. When he walked down the stage, he felt like it was all a dream. He opened his certificate and felt proud. The certificate had the date of today, his name, the school's name and stamp seal, the head of education's name and signature, as well as His Majesty's name and signature on it. He looked at the certificate in his hand and smiled back at his family. My life is in my hands, he thought. Dot. After the celebration, Everyone was guided into another hall where they ate and drank. With the money from the guests' tickets, the school had organized this meal for them. Landon smiled and decided to head back after a while. With this, Baymard would now welcome 187 new workers. December was finally about to end, and he vowed now focus on serious work. This entire month was a big distraction to Landon. From military graduation and school ceremonies, to Christmas and so on. And now that all this was out of the way, the workers could focus on their jobs with no more holidays or activities hindering them. For New Year, Landon had decided that he wouldn't give them any public holiday. Those who were off on that day could celebrate it, but those who had to work, well, too bad. They had already wasted enough time already. No more public celebrations for the time being. Chapter 183 Moving on to the next phase currently, time had passed by very quickly. And just like that, it was April again. Spring. During the winter, Landon and the workers had been working tirelessly to reach their goals. In January, Landon had thoroughly focused on construction. He began by allocating several workers towards the construction of the Navy's base within District L of the coastal region. One should know that this region was to be divided horizontally from the beach. Hence each sector here would have its own mini beach in front of it. District I, shipping dock and port, merchant stores and so on. District J, luxury beach hotels and beach entertainment. District K, space which Landon just wanted to keep, between the other districts and District L. This space was to create ample distance between the other sectors and military posts in District L. And it also had the waste and recycle management industry within it. District L, Baymard Marine, Coast Guard and Navy stations and posts. So during January, Landon began building the Navy's base which he estimated to be completed in seven months time June. He decided to build 15 massive buildings and 10 moderate size buildings within the base, 
as well as several extremely tall fences that kept people out. There would be three main fences that workers would have to pass through, before successfully entering the first sector of the base. From there, there will also be several other gates and checkpoints needed before the workers reach the second, third and fourth sector of the base. And each sector will have multiple weapons to deal with intruders. With the way Landon designed everything, no stray person could easily walk in without access. Dot. Apart from the main navy base in District L, Landon had also decided to build several police stations, navy posts and military bases within the other coastal region districts as well. The navy posts in the other coastal districts will be fenced, and have just one building within it as well as a lighthouse. This lighthouse will be used to scan through the waters of every district, just in case someone wanted to sneak attack them at night. If the Navy men notice anything, they were to immediately notify the military, as well as the Navy's base at District L. As for the military posts, although Landon didn't want it to be large, it still needed to be properly fenced as well. It would have four main buildings and a lot of space to keep army tanks and so on. What if an enemy ship successfully made it to the shores? He expected the military to handle them. The navy had to focus on the sea, but the military had to kill those enemies who managed to make it on Baymard's soil. These police stations would definitely have prison cells as well. For example, if some visitors and merchants cause trouble at the docks within District I, Landon expected the police officers to handle the situation immediately, and since these police stations will have cells, then they can just lock them up for a few hours or a day until those involved in brawls calm down. Dot. Well, apart from assigning men to start building police offices, military posts and the Navy's base, Landon also began construction of a radio station within the District C upper region. He just wanted to construct the station now. So that when the workers were ready to build the radios, there wouldn't be any hiccups on the way. And lastly, he decided to construct a train manufacturing and maintenance industry. These people would be responsible for building trains, fixing and maintaining them whenever an issue arises. He had planned for this industry to have an assembly line as well so as to ease manufacturing. Lastly, Landon wanted to start constructing a train manufacturing and maintenance industry. Transportation was a serious problem within Baymard. People would walk for two to three hours just to go to their job sites at the lower region and so on. It was utterly ridiculous. Trains, cars and buses were a must. Hence Landon decided to focus on this train manufacturing industry which will take two months march to complete. But while this industry was being constructed, Landon had still gotten another group of workers to start making the train tracks. As well as placing them all over Baymard as per the city plan. In his mind, it was better to start now, than to wait for the industry to be built first. Time was money. Dot. Once February came, the workers started constructing the land port and all the military buildings within King's Landing. Construction would be a breeze. Since they had cranes, loaders, excavators, aerial work platforms, and so many other heavy machines available, Landon had estimated that construction would only last for five months. Hence it was essential for the men to begin immediately. As for the fortified city walls, they had started working on them in October. And by May 8th month's total, everything should be completed. Up next, Landon focused on making antennas, receivers, transmitters and other parts needed to produce these radios. The workers had been taking his classes for two months now December to January. So it was time that they start making all the parts, as well as building all those massive antenna structures all over Baymard. Within this month, paper money also began to circulate. And the people and workers at the bank became more pleased. No more heavy pockets, no more losing coins here and there. Money became more convenient for them. There were five types of bills that were made, 100, 50, 20, 10 and 5 BM bills. Dot dot where BM was short for Baymard. Landon's face was on a pale yellowish 100 BM bill, while his mother Kim's face was on a green 50 BM bill. Of course Lucia's face was on a reddish 20 BM bill, 
the image of Lucy was on a bluish 10 bm bill and the image of the castle was on a purplish 5 bm bill, and of course, each bill had the words Baymard on it. As well as several letters and numbers on them. Well, with creating these paper notes, the images, words and numbers were all engraved on a steel plate. From there, a special die was placed only on the engraved sections of the steel plate. Of course following that, a light sheet of plastic was placed on the steel sheet and baked for 8 minutes in low heat. And once it was done, the die on the sheet transferred to the plastic, forming the exact image and design outline on the plastic. In fact, the process was somewhat lengthy. But long story short, the printing industry had successfully created paper notes for all the citizens. Chapter 184 Moving on to the next phase 2 Once February ended, Landon and the workers immediately began working on all his plans for March. The first thing he focused on was radio manufacturing. Communication was also essential in times like this. If there was a serious crisis at hand, how were the citizens supposed to prepare themselves? Running up and down was never the answer. Word needed to get out fast, and having a proper means to communicate was key. When the workers started making these devices, there were a lot of issues, like finding the right wavelength and so on. But after three weeks of constant failure, they had finally reached a breakthrough thanks to Landon. Landon had just let them be because he wanted them to make their own discoveries on their own. Every day, the workers would focus on their radios and try to solve problems here and there. It was like a school assignment that they had to finish. Anyone who had ever gone to university back on earth, would know how much energy one could put in, when they wanted to complete an assignment. They sat in groups around their radios, took the device apart and tried to make it perfect. They had sleepless nights, as they tried to get the answer from their textbooks. Where did they go wrong? At the start of the month, Landon had created 10 samples for them to follow. They had used their calculators, as well as the formulas within their physics books, and were stuck on it for a while. They had erased, drawn and calculated the same thing over and over again, but could never arrive at the right answer. This was sorcery. When they were at home, their minds would wander back to the problem they were facing. And they immediately felt like all the studying that they had done from December to February, was for nothing. That was three months for heaven's sake. Back on earth. That would be a whole semester. Were they truly that stupid? All the main formulas was short and simple, so what were they missing? Like, they had understood and read the concepts. But why was practical work always so different from theory? They felt like even if they studied for several more years, they might never get it. But fortunately, His Majesty took pity on them and after three weeks, they corrected all their mistakes. All the while explaining where they went wrong. And once they finally realized their errors, they redid their work and tried creating these radios from scratch all by themselves. Some of them could even create frequencies and waves using other metal pieces. And even coins. It was so surprising. Dot. Moving on, Landon decided to focus on the newly constructed industries. The ship and boat manufacturing industry had been successfully completed. Hence he decided to start making navy warships, as well as fishing boats and ships. The train manufacturing and maintenance industry that began construction in January. Of course, Landon immediately put them into work in creating new trains. With this new industry completed, Landon began assigning workers to build several train stations at different locations within Baymard. At this point, these construction workers were always busy. When they finished building anything, Landon would immediately give them a new project and ship them off. And at the start of every month, each construction group would increase in size, due to the addition of new citizens. Without these new citizens, how could Baymart have enough workforce for all these projects? For now, it was okay. But once July came, Landon would put a stop to taking in more citizens, unless it was absolutely necessary. One of the industries that had just been completed this month, was the weapon manufacturing industry. With its completion, 
Landon began producing long-range artillery weapons. He had decided to focus on creating stationary howitzer guns and rocket launchers on the city walls. For these weapons, one could imagine the guns or rockets launchers that were usually placed on war tanks. What Landon wanted was to place these machines on the city walls as well as on the different military posts within the coastal region. One could never be too prepared when tackling an enemy. He also decided to make Taser guns for the guards and police officers, as well as bulletproof vests, and other safety gears. Walkie-talkies were also made and distributed to all military, guard, and police personnel within this period. For now, Landon was focusing on strengthening the soldiers and safeguarding the city walls and perimeters. July was coming fast, and the safety needed to be guaranteed before that. Up next, Landon had decided to focus on traffic lights and car sensory detectors. Soon, highway contraction will begin. So it was essential for these lights to be readily available before then. Dot. Finally for the month of March. Landon had began construction of the People's Temple. Yes. A temple. The people had been requesting that he build one. Their reason was simple. They felt grateful to their ancestors, and wanted a way to thank them. Landon wasn't opposed to the idea at all. Like he said, no one had the right to deny any one of their beliefs. All major cities had temples. There were money temples worshipping temples and even sex-driven temples. And since some of the slaves were sensitive to the word temple, Landon decided to change its name and call it a church. The people had requested for a place where they could pray, have heavenly teachings, and give offerings, money and other worldly possessions to their ancestors in exchange for blessings. With all this in mind, Landon had decided to let them appoint several church leaders and members themselves. But the leaders AMD members would have to meet Landon weekly, to say how these offerings were being used. Landon had decided that the church would have its workers and leaders have services on, weekdays at 7a.m, Saturday at 9a.m and 5p.m, and Sunday services at 9a.m. 11a.m and 5p.m and 7pm. These leaders would have to take these jobs full time. They would also have to visit the sick in the hospital, as well as do charity work here and there. Landon expected the church leaders to encourage and lead the people towards the path of righteousness and goodness. In fact, for this one, Landon was ready to fabricate a whole Bible about their ancestors just for them. What he wanted to do was build their character. He didn't want them to think that raping, beating or killing people with no reason was fine. Greed and other sins would always lead one to their end. So he wanted the people to grow a coincidence whenever they were tempted. But of course, he also wanted to paint a vivid picture of hell for them. For their offerings, he would allow them to choose what they wanted to do with it. Did they want to send the money to unfortunate people outside Baymart? Then maybe Santa could open up an orphanage around his stores and take care of the people. Of course of that truly happened, Landon would also travel to those places to also see things for himself. He would never allow for money meant for the poor or the sick to be advised by greedy people. Even though Santa was upright, that didn't mean that all his subordinates were like him. And when people live round areas where crime is okay in the people's eyes, temptation was always present. In Landon's opinion, Santa was truly upright because he grew up in Corona. As a noble, it was rare for one to be upright. They existed, but it was truly rare. And sometimes, even the best people could change due to their environment. That's why Landon wanted to make the people grow a conscience. Sometimes, no matter how much one is tempted, their conscience wouldn't allow them to sin. As for the church leaders and members, of course their salaries would come from part of the offerings as well. They too are human beings as well. They needed to eat pay their bills and even drive good cars. So should they suffer and dress in rags because they are holy people? That's ridiculous. It wasn't a crime for a holy man to live well, provided he or she didn't steal the money. Anyway, Landon had used these four months to completely focus on construction. And now, spring had come and April was finally here. Time for Baymard to move towards phase two of his plans. Chapter 185 Landon to the rescue little bro. What the hell is that? 
Exclamation mark. Santa looked at the huge monster-like carriage heavy machine, as it continued construction on what seemed an uncompleted building. It's been a month since Landon had asked for several police stations military and navy posts to be built. He felt like his brain had just witnessed something that was supposed to be impossible. If he ever told what he saw to anyone else, no one would believe him. For sure, they would call him a liar. Where were the horses that were supposed to push the carriage? Was it magic? Little bro. Is it for sale? Ah. Dot. Don't smile at me so mysteriously. Little bro. How can you tease me like this? You know that I'm a merchant, yet you allowed me to see such a thing? How is this fair? The more he looked at the machine, the more he felt like crying. It's been a long time since something could get him all excited like this. And yet it wasn't for sale. He knew the reasons to why his bro didn't sell these carriages. But still, he was a merchant for heaven's sake. Just watching these machines operate made his eyes bleed out. Looking at Landon's smile, he coiled and helped but wonder what else felt Baymard could be hiding. This place wasn't as simple as everyone thought it was. It wasn't just him. His own crew felt like they had just seen a miracle. Bro, tell me the truth. What the hell is going on in your city? Santu asked excitedly. He could feel his whole body shake. The more he looked at the carriage, he ha he. Don't worry, you'll know in July. July? Santu asked curiously. Yeah July. I plan to open Baymard to the public in July. Oh. That reminds me, here are ten passes for you. When and if you decide to come over, bring anyone you want to and use these passes. Of course don't forget to keep one for yourself as well. Basically. These passes will allow you or your family to have easy access into Baymard when you arrive. Santa was so amazed by the VIP passes that he forgot to respond or even thank Landon for them. Was this still paper? How come it had a different color and design from the normal yellowish colored parchment paper? The passes were thicker than normal paper, and were all black in color. To be honest, they were as hard as a credit card back on Earth. These passes were deep dark blue in color and had the words, VIP Pass and Baymard on them. Of course the expiration date for the passes was also written on them as well. And each pass had a rope around it, for the owners to wear around their necks. Santa looked at the cards in amazement. He wanted to ask how they were made. But something in him told him that this little bro of his wouldn't give up for no one. Sigh. The disappointments of a merchant. Dot. So how do these passes work? Normally when you arrive, You'll need to get your documents made at any of the checkpoints. But this will pass, you could just use the VIP station. Rather than waiting online like everyone else, you'll be attended to immediately, and your documents will be processed ASAP. For the passes, Landon was the only one who could give them out. Hence when the workers saw Santa, they would immediately know that he was his person. Santa had aided Baymard for months now and Landon thought that it wouldn't be fair to let him have the same treatment as others. Apart from Santo and his family, everyone else had to wait in line. Even if they were kings of other empires. Wait. Wait wait. Little bro, you lost me there. Documentations? Santu asked confusedly. He had traveled all around the Pino continent, and usually, he just paid his say in. No one checked if he was a bad person or good person provided there was enough money to pay. He had no idea what Landon meant by documentation. You'll know, when you come back in July. Speaking of which, did you get my message? Sorry bro, I got it, but I was a bit tied up at the moment. That's why I couldn't rush back since then. Santa replied, as he puffed out his jaws and batted his eyelids at Landon. His pleading puppy dog face had truly made Landon speechless. This guy was as shameless as ever. Landon thought. Truthfully, Santa had wanted to come as soon as possible. But would Penelope let him go? Nope. She had insisted that since he was almost killed, then it was her job to protect him and also ensure that he train more. She had watched him like a hawk watching its prey for the past four months now. Honestly, he had attempted to flee on multiple occasions. But of course, he was always caught. She had placed posters and sketches of him around the empire, as if he were a wanted criminal. If anyone saw him escaping, 
they were to report it immediately and get their reward. She had also stationed her most trusted knights to block all entrances and exits of his estate. Wherever he wanted to go, they would follow. In his opinion, she was a bit too protective. Sigh. What could he do? This was definitely his punishment for falling in love with an overly caring woman. Could there be anyone more pitiable than he was? He had even been caught once, when he tried to climb a tree and scale the fence. Within this period, Penelope had organized her feelings and had told her family that he was the one she was going to marry. She had truly treated him like a wife instead. Not that he minded anyway. She was a domineering and stubborn woman and he was a chilled person. So they were a perfect fit. Of course within this time, her family had given him hell. How could they allow a softy like him to be with their princess? Never. They trained him day and night, until his legs became wobbly. His weight glad also gone done, and he was more fit than he usually was. But so what? Dot. He wanted to go back to his carefree days, where he would eat, sleep, and think, and to make matters worse, his own father would come to his estate and train him as well. Yes. He had finally made up with his father and brothers. Previously, they didn't get along with him because he had chosen to be a merchant instead of a knight. How could anyone not want to serve such a noble and good royal family? Anyway, now that Santa had sat down with them and explained his reasons for being a merchant, they had become close, but instead of sympathizing with him, his family continued training him like he was about to go to war. He had never been so happy to escape from Corona. When Penelope gave him a pass, he almost cried with joy. The pass only granted him to go to Baymard and come back. If he even thought about delaying his trip, then he wouldn't be able to travel for another two years. That was his punishment. Of course, he wouldn't even think about it since he knew how strict Penelope could be. Seeing Landon now, he felt like crying and complaining to his bro. Other people's wives would blush and get shy. But why was his own case different? Bro. You have no idea what I went through okay? Anyway, I too have something important to tell you as well. Chapter 186 Landon to the rescue to Santa began narrating his experience with those thugs to Landon. And when he was done, Landon in turn gave him the letters and maps to the illegal underground sex camps within Corona. Santa was so shocked that he felt his hair stand up. The royal family and the people had worked hard in keeping Corona free from such activities. But this no blind guy dared to create them. Santa knew that he would soon be Penelope's king. So any problem or threat targeted at Corona, was also part of his concern. Thinking about it now. He was fortunate that Landon had an upright personality. If another noble knew of this scheme, they would have used it against Corona instead. Santa stood quietly for a while, as he tried to calm himself down. This was no plan they were talking about. The guy had the forces that could rival an entire empire. If they made any wrong moves, this guy could even launch a full-scale attack on Corona. This guy could literally send ships to attack them and dominate the empire if he chooses to. It was either they risked it and rescued all those people, or they pretended like they didn't know anything. But he knew deep within his soul that there was no way in hell that he or the royal family, and even the people, could allow such a crime to go unpunished. But, what should he do? Why not stay for two more days and have my men? and myself follow you back, Landon said calmly, truth be told, this was a golden opportunity in Landon's eyes, this was the perfect hostage scenario mission for the men to undergo, training could never beat the real thing, Landon thought that it wasn't a big deal for them to aid Corona, as he didn't want to give no plan a reason to conquer Corona, plus, he had a bone to pick with the guy as well, how dare he try to make the people of Baymard slaves, his plan was to rescue the slaves, destroy all underground camps and let no plan know that it was Baymard that did it, and not Corona. He would only let one person escape with a message to no plan. And by the time the message got through, July would have already arrived. Even if no plan wanted to attack, Landon was sure that he would be blasted to pieces. Be it on land or sea, 
Baymard's forces would be unstoppable by July. Santo was both touched and worried. Why was this brother of his so reckless? Little bro, I can't allow you to do that. I. If you take me as your brother, then you would allow me to aid you in your time of need. Even though you don't believe me right now, I guarantee that I won't be at the losing end. Santa looked at his little bro who was oozing with confidence, and was at loss for words. What more could he say? Fine, he'll listen to you, he said, while raising his hands up in defeat. Why did this brother of his remind him so much of his wife-to-be? Landon thought for a while and realized a huge problem. The warships would only be completed in June, and Baymard didn't have any boats at the moment. He needed a ride. Elderbro, can you give us a lift to Corona and back? Dot. As well as leave us some of your crewmen who could aid us in manning the ship. Currently, he hadn't taught the men about sailing. So it would be difficult to man the ship without an experienced crew. That's definitely not a problem. It's the least I can do, since taking care of this problem for Corona, Santa said while nodding. All right. Since I don't want you or Corona to be implicated, send two ships back and leave one ship with me, Landon said. Okay. But I'm coming with you on this mission. Don't worry. I'll properly disguise myself up. This way, no one will be able to link me with Corona. Landon thought for a while and agreed. Santa probably felt guilty for putting him in such a dangerous situation, and nothing he would say would change the guy's mind. So why not agree? All right. I accept. Dot. Within this two-day period, Landon wanted to choose and brief the soldiers on their new mission. He also wanted to select soldiers who would stay and protect Baymard's city gates if any attacks occurred within his time if absence. Truth be told, he knew that his half-brother Eli should have already arrived at the capital. And Landon had a hunch that he should be sending his minions to Baymard any time soon, so he needed the men to completely wipe them out. And judging from the distance between the capital and here, Landon was guessing that they should arrive in May or June at most. The second wall was 92% completed. By the end of this April, and at most the first weeks of May, Landon expected it to be finished. Long story short, he would leave Lucius in control for all decisions linked to Baymard's safety. He also wanted to use this period to plan out all industry and construction activities within this month and the next. Depending on how long the mission would take. Landon was sure that he would be back at the start of June, so he had to give out plans for this April, as well as May. And just in case he came back in late June, then he also had to give the people June's work plan as well. All he knew was that he would be back at most two weeks, before the grand opening in July. So little bro. You mean that he'll finally be able to see what you've got in your city? Santu asked curiously. Of course. But you all will stay in the castle with me. Just know that whatever you see now, will only be the tip of the iceberg for what Baymard will offer in July. I guarantee you that this place is like no other within Hurtfilia. Santa looked at Landon doubtfully. Granted, he was impressed with those monster-like carriages. But that didn't mean that he would believe that an entire city could change because of those carriages. He had been to so many cities and towns. And even though they were beautiful, they still had the same things that other cities had. Water was still being fetched from the wells. People still used torches and every basic necessity was the same. So just how different could Baymard truly be? Chapter 187 A whole new world There was no way that this city would be different from others. Or so Santa thought. F it. Dot. He took it all back. This place was definitely heaven. As he and his crewmen sat in the double-decker bus with Landon, as their eyes beamed out at all the magnificent buildings and carriages passing by, they looked around, and their breaths were almost blown away. The clean roads ran in a neat orderly grid pattern, that enabled the onlookers to know what was beyond the numerous buildings and narrow roads around the highway. The beautifully crafted buildings all had various shapes and sizes, that were made from strange materials that Santa couldn't identify. While driving in the carriage, he truly felt like he was in another world. He could see the citizens walking around in their beautifully tailored clothes, 
as they walked about minding their own businesses. Some were boarding other carriages, while others were going in and out of these godlike buildings frequently. If the heavens truly existed, then Santa would have sworn that it would look just like Baymard right now. His hands began to tremble slightly, as he took in the scene in front of him. Marvelous, he thought. You said that this moving carriage is called a buzz? Santu asked as he kept touching the seat in front of him. The bus was red in color, and had the Baymard's flag and name painted on it. As well as the words, tour bus on it. Of course the second floor if the Decker bus was open roofed, which allowed the men to have a better view of the city. Seriously little bro. Can I just get one bus? Santu asked helplessly. How could he see all these things and let it go? Landon just looked at him and smiled wryly. Obviously, the answer was no. As they moved forward, they saw the workers constructing several new buildings within each district. One should know that it was currently eight months since the residential builders had started construction. So of course they were done with the residences. With the homes completed, Landon had immediately instructed for them to build several other buildings in other districts ages ago. One should know that Landon was following Asia's standards when doing construction. In Landon's opinion, it was either Europe or North America was too lazy or too stingy when it concerned construction. Landon could still remember numerous incredible feats that Asians had done back on Earth. For example in 2015. These people had built a massive 57-story tower in a matter of 19 days. That's 57 stories tall in 19 days for God's sake. 57. The rest of the world would probably take two or three years to do it. But with Asians, no. Comma they didn't believe in wasting time. For example, the rest of the world would only hire 100 to 200 people to build such buildings. But with Asians, they could just hire thousands of people at once. Just to get it done early, I mean. If you have the raw materials and people, why wait forever? It makes no sense. Just construct the dam building. These people could build 2,000 homes in just one week. But the rest of the world would take years to achieve that same feat. In Asia, even getting approval for construction could be done in a matter of days but the rest of the world would approve these documents in a matter of months. And sometimes even years. People usually did their work half-heartedly, and would take time just to read a single report. But Asians wouldn't waste any time and get it done ASAP. Their system was built on time and efficiency. Those people were the most efficient people that existed on Earth. And that was a fact. There were also many cases, where they had built 15-story to even 25-story buildings in a matter of 6 to 9 days. And yet the rest of the world would use months and years to do that. If one looked at these construction sites, they would see more than 500 heavy machines building all at once. But the rest of the world would only use 50 to 70 machines. Unbelievable. Landon was talking about people who used 14 days to install train tracks for a distance that would take the rest of the world a year to install. They used 2,000 people just to build it fast. But yet, the rest of the world would hire just 100 to 200 people for the job. Why wouldn't it take years to complete? TSK. Dot. Stingy people. So in conclusion, the world was either lazy or stingy compared to them. Heck. Dot. These people could build ships in a matter of days, yet the rest of the world would do it in years. Nah. Dot. There was no way that he would use the Western world as his standard. As far as he was concerned, they were backwards when compared to Asia. Even when building their bridges, technology, cars and so on. They never spent so long to build them like the rest of the world. As for Landon, he had the people, he had the raw materials. And for God's sake, he had thousands of heavy machines. So what exactly would stall him from building fast? Unlike the western world that would use 3 to 7 people to build a single home, Landon used 27 to 50 people to do so. And for large enterprises, he used thousands to build them instead of a measly 100. So really, what would stop him in developing the place fast? Like he had said, he didn't know if the rest of the world was lazy, 
or just stingy, or maybe their project budgets could only use 100 people, instead of 1000s. Who knew? Anyway, the construction workers within Baymard had been building a lot of empty buildings as of late. They didn't know what these buildings were for, but since their king had requested them to be built, then they had just followed the design plans for these buildings and constructed them. Time was money. Well, instead of something like a 57 story building, Landon had preferred 5 to 15 story buildings all around Baymard within the various districts. Also, some of the workers had been renovating the palace within this time, as well as most of the estates within the upper region. Driving through the massive city, Santa was thoroughly convinced by Landon's words. Baymard was definitely one of a kind. It was more than that, it was a whole new world. Chapter 188 A Whole New World 2 Once they arrived at the palace gate, Santa and his men were amazed by how majestic the palace looked. Landon had long requested for the palace to be renovated so as to resemble the iconic Hawley Disney Castle logo. So what Santa and his men were feeling right now? was what he had felt the first time he had visited Disneyland. Of course during the renovation period, the workers had broken down parts of the floor and walls, so as to connect pipes, electricity and so on. The soaring majestic castle was bold on the blue beyond, giving off a celestial feel to it. It stood there as if conjured from a child's fairy tale imagination. It was simply perfect. The towering whitish grey walls, gave a beautiful blend with the bluish cord roofs. Some of the castle walls had two feet tall windows, and several balconies that were positioned at various points around the structure. There were also 21 buildings other mini and tall glass buildings within the palace premises, that were similar to the main castle in design. The men had never seen any castle like this. Although Landon had made sure to retain most of the castle's features. He had still gone out of his way to renovate it to have a modern touch as well. This sort of palace could definitely make most of the rulers die from envy. Dot. At the palace gate, there was a huge towering golden colored gate that wrote, the royal palace on it. Once they neared the gate, five guards walking towards the bus, while several others remained seated within the left and right office posts of the gate. The men checked the driver's I.D card and palace pass. And once they were done, the driver drove in. They passed through several buildings, as well as several fountains, statues, pole thingies, pole lights. And once they stepped into Landon's actual castle, Santa felt like he was going to faint from excitement. That's it. Don't try to change my mind. I'm staying here forever, he exclaimed frantically. The floors were decked with beautiful white marble tiles, and the grayish colored walls were elegantly decorated with large paintings and several oversized mirrors. Bro, how come I can see my reflection so clearly? Santu asked in amazement, as he touched his face multiple times while looking at the mirrors on the walls. This was the first time that he had actually seen his real appearance. Is this what I truly look like? He thought, one should know that what they used, were used polished copper or silver plates that showed just 20 to 30 percent of their true reflections. All the crewmen couldn't help looking at themselves as well. I need to shave my beards. I need to trim my hair. I need to grow out my chest hairs. Underscore. Once they were all shown the bathrooms, everyone screamed in excitement. So you mean that this thing will let out water when we need it to? And this other thing here is soap. Wait. You said there is heating within the rooms as well? So this toothbrush thing is for keeping our mouths clean? And where is the fire for the light? How come there's no fire? Underscore. Everyone had immediately forgot that Landon was a king, and literally clamored him with questions here and there. Of course he didn't mind, and politely answered them. And when he showed them their beds and individual rooms, they felt like they didn't want to go back to Corona anytime soon. At first, the men were scared to wrinkle such clean and beautiful beddings, but when they finally succumbed to the temptation before them, they were utterly shocked. The beds, pillows, and even the blankets were as soft as a baby's buttocks. It was at that moment that they had all made up their minds, 
to follow their master Santa back to Baymard for the grand opening. How could their master be so shameless as to enjoy these comforts first without them? Was it really fair? They had already agreed to keep their mouths shut when they got back. Lest someone else dared to take their spot for the trip, one should know that their master had over thousands of workers around him. What if the others got all excited and wanted to take their spot as crew members for that trip? No way. They would definitely come back for the grand opening. Once everyone was shown their rooms, Santu immediately pulled him to the side. Little bro, he'll be honest with you, can I buy a house here? Santu asked curiously. Actually? It isn't possible for any visitors to get homes yet, but they could still rent out luxury suites and even luxury homes within the visitor-based districts when they arrived. They could rent them for the period of time that they had to stay here. They could also rent cars, as well as pay for chef airs and so on. No one was supposed to drive without passing their driver's lessons so only chef heirs could drive these visitors around. So what you're saying is that I can only get them when I come back in July. Can't I even book it now in advance? I want my family to have the best options, Santa said while pouting. Landon was really helpless when facing this guy. He didn't know why Santa was so worried about people taking the best spot before he did. Even though Baymard would be accessible to the public in July, who would know the opening date. He had roughly guessed that people would actually start to coming to the city around October time. Firstly, it would take time for people to start paying attention to Baymard. For example, during this mission with No Pline, he had surmised that No Pline would probably receive the news around late July or August. And even if he wanted to attack, No Pline would need time to organize his soldiers. So there was no way that No Plan's attack would come any time soon, and even if it did, No Plan wasn't aware of the weapons at the front gates. So the fool would only be sending more people to their deaths at Baymard's hands. Elis' case was exactly the same as well. When his men wouldn't return from war, then he would probably have to send a larger group on a four-month journey towards Baymard. In this era, there was literally no better means of communication or transportation so everything took time to accomplish. Lastly, even if Santa comes here for a month or two and goes back, it would still take time for news about Baymard to travel around. So, Landon knew that Santa and his family would literally be the only ones to come here in July. Yes Baymard was going to be open to the public in July. But why should he announce it to all his enemies? Let them bloody hell find out on their own. This would also give him a lot of time to make and perfect weapons around Baymard. So why should he be worried? Just thinking about it now, Landon speculated that his father would probably get wind of his success around November or December. Who knows? All in all, Landon was sure that no one would truly give Baymard a hard time this year. If it were back on Earth. People could easily use landlines or phones to pass out information. But unfortunately within this period, news could travel for several months on horseback before anyone could receive it. Dot. Bro, I don't think you don't have to worry about fighting with others for the best home, Landon said as he giggled. Ah, that reminds me, bro, you said earlier that only Baymard's money could be used here. So what do I do? When I want to anything in July, Santa knew that his bro wouldn't allow him to buy and ship these goods now. So he decided to suck it up and wait till the grand opening. He had seen Landon's wristwatch, and was so fascinated by it. For heaven's sake, the thing could tell the time. This damn brother of his was truly killing him. On the bus, Landon had shown him all the currencies within Baymard, which amazed him greatly. His little brother's face was actually drawn on money. How was that even possible? After entertaining Santa for a while, Landon immediately called for all the overseers, as well as the high-ranking military personals to come to the palace. It was time to get serious. Chapter 189 Allocating Out Tasks System You'd like to buy a capsule for an hour using my technology points, Landon said. He needed to quickly write Baymard's development plan for the next three months. Before he left for this mission, one hour in the real world, 
was equivalent to five days within the capsule. The system has processed the host's request. Teleporting host now, Vrup. Landon had appeared in a large white hall. The entire room resembled those white rooms that one saw in movies. The floor, ceiling, walls and even the tables, couches and chairs were immaculate white. Although he had the option of modifying the room, Landon still preferred for it to remain like so. This way, he could concentrate better. Having color and other distracting objects will only distract him and slow down his progress and time. After all, he got this place to concentrate, and not to relax or play. He walked towards his office table, and pulled open the first two drawers which had unused notebooks and pens in them. For phase two and three of his plan, Landon had planned to focus on entertainment and food. There were a lot of unused buildings that had been built around the districts, especially within the entertainment districts. Typically, District D should have things like side bank branches, luxury hotels, luxury villas for guests, amusement parks, zoo, car stores, malls, main bus station and so on. While District G would have regular hotels for visitors, bank branches, Baymard National Park, bars, stores, and so on. For the next three months, Landon expected the workers to focus on these entertainment centers, go-kart racing, national park, bowling, trampoline rooms, restaurants, cafe, painting and sculpting, spas, gym, roller skating, skateboarding, obstacle course games houses, large indoor adventure playground homes, multiple street shops and stores that focused on food like pizza, burgers, body care products, books, plates, clothes, and even plastic toys. Dot. Although the new mall in the upper region would be completed and opened by July, he had to admit that having individual stores within the central region was still a good business move for Baymard. The largest mall was at the upper region, but those who would stay at District G of the lower region dot 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 might need night snacks and other items at convenient times. Hence it was good to have individual stores scattered around the city for entertainment. Even though Landon couldn't make things like amusement parks, laser tag rooms, planetariums, aquariums, zoos, arcades and other fun activities yet, he was somewhat confident that the current activities would still be able to capture the heart of their visitors. For spas, Landon had already written down a list of oils and lotions, that he needed alchemy industry to produce. They also had to build saunas, facial masks, body scrubs and so on. He needed them done within these three months. At this point, Landon was purely thinking about business. No matter what era it was, women were always obsessed with beauty and staying forever young. For beauty, they could even drain all their own money, as well as their husband's or boyfriend's pockets just to buy products that would keep them forever young. Landon didn't see anything wrong in capitalizing on that. Anyway, he was focused on making products and equipments that weren't high-tech. Like laser hair removal treatment machines, scar removal machines and so on. He only wanted basic things like smooth and polished massaging stones, towels, nail fillers, nail clippers and other basic tools. Of course, the oils and chemicals would be made available by the alchemy industry. For the national park within the central region. Landon just needed them to create walkways, benches, staff buildings, as well as transport trees and flowers to the park. Like he had said, the area had a plain terrain. So the grass was already low, but the trees were scarce. No matter how Landon looked at it, parks were always filled with trees and flowers. Hence they needed to transport them immediately. The area Landon had chosen was the area where the streams converge forming a massive pond, which leads back to the coastal region. As for the gym, Landon wanted a painted running track within one of the floors, as well as basic equipments like jump ropes, dumbbells, barbell and benches press weights, indoor cycle bikes and machines that worked using pulleys and string systems. Landon wasn't going to make that were digitalized like treadmills and so on. Those would of course be made in the future. He also wanted the gym to have several multi-purpose courts for tennis, squash, badminton, 
and volleyball. Of course there would be courts for basketball and indoor soccer as well. Also, when visitors came, they could also sign up for workout classes, as well as dance, cycling or yoga classes in one of the empty rooms. Once Landon came back, he would make sure that he personally picked out instructors and showed them what to do for every class. He would also teach them what to do if someone wanted to lose weight or gain muscle. These activities were good for everyone, not just the visitors. As for things like toy stores, Landon wanted plastic and rubber toys and puzzles for both girls and boys. He wanted to make simple toys and games that weren't electronic. He wanted Legos, Leos, baby rattles hoopla hoops, bogo sticks, and of course toys that look like the princesses and characters from all the fairy tale books within Baymard. He also wanted to make children costumes from all the books that he had made. He had already written about Superman, Spider-Man, Batman, Wonder Woman and a few more, as well as Sleeping Beauty and other popular Disney princesses. Even though the children didn't know how their favorite characters looked, the toys would have the character's name on it. So with time, he was sure that these girls would want their tiaras, wands and sparkly dresses to look like their favorite characters. And the boys would also like to be superheroes as well. There would also be teddy bears, mythical toys like dragons, My Little Pony and Barbie dolls within the toy stores. With all the books about Barbie's adventures out, how could he not make this plastic doll? For outdoor toy sets. He wanted to make plastic playhouses, plastic slides and swings for children, toy basketball hoops, soccer goal posts, and sandboxes. For things like puzzles and board games, Landon was thinking of snakes and ladders, Scrabble, the game of life, Monopoly, princess-themed board games, Twister, you know and regular card games. With all these toys and games in mind. Landon was sure that Baymard could do without things like Xboxes, Playstations, Game Boys, arcade games and the internet for the time being. For arts and craft, paint and sculpting classes, Landon had decided to place them together, and make more games within those buildings so as to call in more people. Like adding scavenger hunts, house of mirrors, murder mysteries with hired actors and other thought-provoking games. Apart from all these things, the main attraction areas would be the buildings that host things like trampoline park, multiple obstacle course, bowling, children game homes with bouncy castles, go-kart racing, roller skating and skateboarding buildings. Hence Landon needed the workers to create, bowling boards, roller skates, skateboards and other items needed for these games. So far, these were all the things that Landon had decided to focus on. Chapter 190 Allocating Out Tasks 2 with Entertainment Taken care of, Landon began to focus on Phase 3 Food. Within these three months, he wanted the food industry, as well as the chefs to produce, sugar from the six-month grown sugar beets, biscuits, popcorn, pretzel sticks, pretzel buns, pizza, sandwiches, pastries, waffles and pancakes, fried wings with different seasonings, and lastly, ice cream. Processed sugar was absolutely a must. Right now, the people just crushed sweet foods and fruits and used the juices as sugar since honey was somewhat expensive for the average household to afford. Foods like sugar beets, strawberries, and so on dot 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 were used daily by the people. For drinks, he wanted lemonade, smoothies and milkshakes. If the workers followed his instructions, and the cooks followed his recipes, then with time, he was sure that they would perfect the taste before these three months were up. For the first month, he expected these goods to not be all that good. But with time, he was sure that it would be even tastier. After all, the chefs had to make these every day for the next three months. That's 90 days doing the same thing over and over again. No matter what, they were sure to get it right within this time frame. Since he was making these foods, Landon had also decided to make electric cookers, Fridges, freezers and blenders. The ice cream and, and drinks needed to be cooled for the customers, and the workers needed reliable cookers for fast pace customer service. Also, since he couldn't make things like Fanta, 
coke, wine or other beverages. Things like smoothies were a perfect choice. Hence he had to make blenders, and because he was going to make hotels, Landon had also made up his mind to make washing and drying machines. With phase two and three out of the way, Landon continued with development. There were just four things that Landon wanted done within this period. First, he needed a seaport constructed. So in essence, he needed a proper harbor for ships to dock and sail within District I. He also needed another large building which was similar to the landport or airport. And of course at the back of the building, there would be a car park for the buses to carry these visitors to and from Baymard. Landon decided to call this building the Coastal Port. The building would be a little distance away from the harbor and the beachy sand. In general, Landon decided that he would basically bar the entire coastal area, so he would have the men put four meters tall iron fences and gates around the area. For this, they just had to dig up the ground in a straight horizontal line all around the coastal region using those heavy machines. From there, they would place the iron fences into the ground, and place cement around it. Landon wanted them to do this a four meters away from the sand. Back on Earth, there were a lot of fences beach areas that spanned for miles away. Especially those around navy bases or other military bases. Blocking and controlling the crowd was paramount for safety. Of course, the fences would have barbed wires. As well as gates and doors at certain points, so as to let visitors or officers in and out of Baymard. There would also be guard tower posts at particular points around the fence, for safety. So when people arrive at the harbor, they would have to proceed to the gates, and from there, they would walk into Station 1 for check-in services. In future when Landon made a beach resort, the gates within District J will open up at particular times for the guests to swim if they wanted to. Within District I, Landon also wanted to construct another building for storing goods that were meant to be shipped out or transported into Baymard. This place was basically a storage facility. Up next. Landon wanted the workers to focus on upgrading the various industries. So far, they had already began modifying the military, school, government buildings and hospital. In short, they had primarily focused on making the estates within the upper region have a blend between modern and ancient architecture. But right now, Landon needed them to focus and expand the industries within the lower region. He wanted them to have water, heat and electricity, dot 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 as well as for them to have proper structures, gates and so on. Also, he needed the lower region areas that were facing the central region to be fenced off as well. Only those who work within these regions can have access to them. Moving on. Landon had wanted the men to start building several gas stations around Baymard as well. They had built numerous buildings, but only one gas station had actually been built. Landon needed at least three stations in each district, so they needed to get that done immediately. So with all this happening, he had decided to make fire extinguishers as well. One could never be too sure. Finally, Landon needed the men to build a proper police headquarters as well as a prison facility. Dot. Once he was done, he quickly left the time capsule and immediately sent for the overseers. And after dealing with them, he sent for Lucius and all the major military personals. As arrived, Landon ushered them toward his study. The study was broad with a large table at the front, as well as several couches, bookshelves and side tables neatly positioned within it. Please, have a seat, Landon said while gesturing towards the grayish colored couches. Everyone was puzzled by Landon's actions. Usually, Landon would head on towards the military base to see them. This was the first time that they had been called into his study. Somehow, they all felt extremely nervous. As if Baymard was currently in attack. They could feel butterflies churning in their bellies. Ten minutes passed by and all the men had gotten the gist of it. Landon then spoke in private with Lucius and came out with a detailed military plan. Gary. Dot. You and 500 soldiers will follow me to Corona. When you get back, make a list of those who you want to work with. And briefly them on the mission. We set out in two days time, so I expect you all to be prepared by then. Yes your majesty. Gary answered. Mark. 
you will take six soldiers and head on towards Riverdale City for two and a half months. During this mission, you are to leave all Baymard products here, and head out with only a dagger and enough money to keep you fed and housed there. I need you to pick both female and male companions for this journey. Your identity is that of a married man, so I expect another female to act as your wife. Stay there and keep your eyes and ears to the ground. Take note about new on City Lord Shannon, as well as the royal family or anyone that plans to target Baymard. Although Shannon is dead, we need to know if we are being suspected or not. You have two days to get ready as well. Yes your majesty, Josh. You will stay here with Army General Lucius and protect Baymard. Within this time, I expect any and every threat to be properly dealt with. Don't fail me. Yes your majesty. Chapter 191 Who the hell was Master G.P the Royal Barn Palace? Dot. A storm was coming. Black clouds stretched across the sky rolling in from the north. These thick swelling clouds that were carried in by heavy winds, began crying excessively, as they poured gloomily on the land. And for a moment, everything stood still for a while, as even the wind had held its breath silently. The lightning flashed and split the dark horizon, instantly brightening up the streets. And slowly following the lightning, was an earth-shaking thunderous sound from the heavens. Poor. It was just 11 a.m., yet the sky was dark, wet and misty. Dot. Where is she? My king. My king. The third queen has locked herself in her chambers again. Alec Barn hit the wooden door, instantly smashing it open. This woman sure knew how to cause trouble for him. In the room sat a haggard but delicate barefooted woman who sat on the floor around a pile of clothes and broken ornament pieces, and poor. The lightning illuminated the woman's side frame, forming a scarry-like appearance. And when the thunder echoed through, the maids standing behind Alec were scared silly. At this point, the woman looked like a vengeful ghost here to take the souls of the guilty. Just how long are you going to act like this? Alec asked with a hint of disgust on his face. It's been six months since their daughter Jeanette, had passed away. And since then, he hadn't been able to get any action with her. Amongst his wives, she was the only one who had managed to keep her luscious figure and youthful glow. Hence she was the only one who had been pleased him thoroughly. Sure. There were several harlots and sex workers around the palace. But only she knew how to do that thing with her tongue so well, so he had no choice but to pacify her and hope that she would be in the mood. He had made up his mind that by next month if she wasn't ready yet, then he would just lock her in a room and force her to have perform her wifely duties. Who was the boss? He was, that's who. He was the man. And he had married her into his family not the other way around, it really annoyed him that he had to pamper her, a mere third wife. For the sake of pleasure, women, truth be told, he wasn't really sad or angry that his daughter died. After all, women really weren't important to him. He had grown to love his sons, but his daughters were a different matter. They could at best be used to as bait to form political treaties, get powerful men and families under him and so on or a way to please and appease powerful empires or continents that want war against Arcadina. They were just political tools to be used for future purposes, so why should he be sad? What really annoyed him, was that someone had the guts to insult him by doing such an act under his very nose. For him, that was the important point to note here. Arginia. That was his third wife's name. Within this six-month period, she had stopped taking care of herself and had slowly started taking the appearance of a savage. If not for the fact that she was the only one who knew his body so well, would he ever come here to beg or pacify her? No matter how he explained what he wanted done during his sexual activities, those hat lots could never get it right like Argenia. She was a pro. She had been with him for more than 15 years now, and she knew just what to do where to touch and how to please him. Nothing could beat years of experience. She's never coming back, so how long are you going to keep this up? You kept your window open this entire time? Can't you see that the water is seeping in, 
into the room, she's dead for heaven's sake, so let it go, Alec said while trying to endure foul stench coming out from the bedroom chambers, every time a maid would come in attempts to clean the room, Adrian would throw a fit and start attacking them, all she wanted was peace and quiet, yet these people kept talking to her and pestering her, when it was time to eat or take a bath, the maids would knock on the door and relay their message from outside, no matter what, she had forbidden them to step into her chambers, she didn't want anyone in her space, period, Argenia stared angrily at Alec, as her body trembled from anger, dead, let it go, never, wasn't Jeanette his daughter as well, how can he be so heartless, she knew what he truly wanted, after so many years together, how could she not know how his mind worked, in her eyes, he was truly a bastard, for these past months, she had turned the city upside down just to find the culprit, and she had also sent her men to different cities, towns and even villages to see if they could find the culprit, but no one had turned up yet, six months of turning round and round with no culprit yet, and this damn bastard dared to tell her to let it go, she felt like she was slowly losing her sanity because of this villain, if he had assisted her like she had asked, wouldn't the culprits be dead and buried by now, son of a bch, don't come any closer, she yelled out, as she quickly grabbed a broken ornament piece the size of her palm and shot it at him, just as she threw it, the lighting flashed and the thunder rang out loud as the piece hit the floor, and poor, since she didn't have enough strength, the piece hit the floor and shattered a little distance in front of Alec, looking at the tiny pieces in front of him, the anger in his heart doubled, did she even realize that he could have her killed for attempting to kill the king, he looked at her coldly, and quickly but carefully made his way towards her while stepping over the pile of clothes and broken ornaments scattered all over the room, once he finally reached her, his eyes almost turned misty due to the pungent smell coming from her body, how long had it been since she took a bath, breathe Alec, breathe, he told himself, just looking at her appearance, he could see flaky and ashy skin on her arms, neck and face, especially around her nose, eyes and mouth, her reddish pink lips were so dry and chapped, that Alec was afraid that if he ever kissed them, then her blade like lips would slice through his own instantly, disgusting, chapter 192 who the hell was master g.p2 Alec quickly held Argenia's arms, and took another piece of ornament in her hand that she was about to throw at him, let me go you bastard, you don't care for our child at all, you, the more she struggled, the more Alec Ruff handled her, he hurriedly carried her and violently threw her on the messy bed, her clothes and body were all soaked from her sitting under the window the entire time, you there, bring me a rope, he yelled out angrily, five minutes later, he had successfully tied both her feet and hands together, the smell of her foul odor, coupled with the smell of her wet clothes, had gotten the best of Alec, he really couldn't take it any longer, you dot 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 you stink, he said while holding his nose, you there, get her cleaned and changed, while the rest of you make sure that his room is spotless, he commanded, yes your majesty, they answered, everyone, get out and leave us for a bit, Alec commanded, as he looked and smiled at Argenio arrogantly, once everyone had left, he slowly traced his hands on her collarbones, shoulders and neck, my beloved, wouldn't you say that I've given you enough time already, do you know how long six months is, it looks like I've pampered you too much these years, so starting from today, you won't have a choice anymore, when I want you to perform, you do it, when I want you to jump, then you jump, and if you were not able to please me, then you'll just have to do it over and over again until you get it right, and if you don't do it the way I like it, then you can kiss getting revenge for your daughter goodbye, remember, if I want you dead, then it will be so, this is your past chance, use it well, it'll come back by nightfall, and I expect you to move your body the way I want you to, Alec said while smiling at the angry but frightened woman, she looked at him, as if looking at a beast, what he said was the truth, if he wanted her dead, then no one would be able to save her, so for the sake of staying alive, taking care of her son James, and finding her daughter's murderer, 
she had to please this demon with everything that she's got. She stopped struggling and immediately calmed down. Seeing that she had thought it through, Alicon hurriedly untied the ropes and gave her a warning look. You know what to do after this, so do not disappoint me. See you tonight my beloved. With that, he took off without giving her a second look. She dug her fingernails on her bed in anger. She couldn't breathe as her heart pounded with force against her ribs from immense anger. She wanted to scream and damage the things that weren't already broken within her room, but she knew that if he lashed out, the maids might hear her and report it back to that damn mother of her patience. For the time being, it was best for her to act like a docile wife and wait silently, and just like that, Alec had unintentionally added another enemy to his list. Argenia swore that this embarrassment and resentment would be given back to Alec in tenfolds. He threatened to kill her. Just you wait. Comma she thought. Dot. The maids quickly came into the room and silently did what they were asked to do. They led her into a bathtub the size of a two meter wide circular fish pond, and gently cleaned her skin as well as detangle and comb out her messy hair carefully. Because it was raining hard outside, the maids hard boiled the bath water so as to keep it hot, lest their master catches a cold. After three hours of skin care and hair care, she headed back to her bedroom chamber which was now spotless. Once they dressed her up, she walked towards her bed and asked everyone to leave. She needed a moment to think. For the first time in her life, she felt like a prisoner. How ironic it was, that after so many years of love and loyalty, that bastard had decided to treat her like this. The love had instantly cleared from her eyes, and all that was left was pain and resentment. Even though she didn't hate him enough to kill him, she still resented him for not caring enough about her daughter. She turned around and placed her hands under her pillow and was taken aback. She quickly held up her pillow and saw a rolled up letter there. Who could have put it there? Was it Alec? Was it her son? So many questions popped in her head instantly. She slowly sat up and pulled the reddish ropes that were used to tie the rolled up letter. I know who killed your daughter. If you truly want to know the culprits, come to the Venegar Tavern at 6p.m tomorrow. When you arrive, check in at room 7 and gently move the wall mirror to the side and wait the quietly and patiently. The culprits will be in the next room. Oh. And you can call me Master GP. P.S. Destroy this note when you're done with it. Argenia looked at the note in shock, as her hands trembled slightly. Her first thought was that this was a trap. What if this Master G.P. was the one responsible for killing her daughter? Wouldn't she just be playing at his hands? The man had found a way to get the letter under her pillow. Dot 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 so wouldn't he be the most suitable suspect? A person that could have things moved in and out of the heavily guarded palace? would definitely be a powerful and dangerous man. Her daughter had died in a similar manner, with no one being able to trace it back. So how could she truly trust such a mysterious person? Then again, if it was really a trap, wouldn't she also be dead right now? After all, he could poison her food, or even send his men to kill her in silence. But he didn't. So many he wasn't the culprit. And if he was truly to be trusted, why would he show her who the culprit was? No one would do or say anything for free. Was this Master G.P. an enemy to her daughter's killer? Was that why he wanted her to know? If that was the case, then it seemed that he wanted her and the enemy to fight it out to the death. But even so, she didn't mind. Jeanette's murderer had to die, and that was a fact. Argenia was conflicted on what to do. To go, or not to go. That was the question. After thinking for a while, she decided to go. Screw it. This was her first clue to finding her daughter's killer, so taking the risk was definitely worth it. Could she rely on that bastard husband of hers? Nope. She had to make all the moves herself. Right now. The only thing that she was truly curious about, was the identity of her informant. Who the hell was this Master G.P? Chapter 193 Revelations The Next Day Argenia stretched her hands over her head as she groaned with displeasure. It was 3.15 p.m., and she had just woken up. All through the night, and well into the early part of the morning, she had been pleasuring that vagabond. Every time she had fallen asleep, 
he would wake her up two hours later and continue these tedious adult exercises with her. When he left at 9 a.m., she felt like her ancestors had finally taken pity on her poor body. Her lower body ached with pain. As most of the time, she wasn't in the mood when that beast had penetrated her. She could see blood stains on her beddings, as well as around her thighs. The scoundrel had really forced his way through. Thankfully before he left, he had told her that today would be her rest day. And tomorrow night, they would continue on from where they had stopped. Oh my heavens, what time was it? She thought, as she looked at the gloomy sky outside, even though it wasn't raining. The air was cold and windy. And the sun was still hidden away by the clouds. Argenia quickly jumped out of bed, and hurried away to look for her maids. Since she had decided to be at the tavern by 6 p.m., how could she dare to be late? She needed to clean up and arrive there around 5.30. For situations like these, it was best for one to come early. As one could never tell if some unforeseen circumstances could occur. The only problem now, was bypassing Alex's security. He had specifically said that she needed to rest. So if he found out that she had enough energy to walk about, then he would never give her any resting days again. Before cleaning up, she immediately wrote a letter for her most trusted knight, Benvolio. Benvolio had been with her way before she became queen. He and several other guards had been given by her father as a means to protect herself against Alec if any bad thing happened to her. When she was done, she quickly went to her audience room and sent for Benvolio. Dot. My queen, Benvolio said on bended knees. The man's bluish hair, purplish eyes, and handsome face, made him look extremely friendly and approachable, which usually deceived those around him a lot. Most people who had never seen him fight, thought that he was weak and docile. But when the smiled, most people shrieked in fear. His creepy crazed smile, coupled with the numerous scars and injuries he had left on his enemies, made people bellow away. When he fought, he would smile and laugh, while licking his enemies' blood off his face or hands. It scared the SHT out of those who observed his battles. Hence his nickname, The Laughing Maniac. Honestly, those back on earth would easily relate this guy with Hisoka in Hunter x Hunter. Their pale skin and creepy smile literally freaked everyone out. In fact, the only difference between these two were their dressing, eye color and hair color. Their personalities were too alike. You may rise. I called you here to follow up on your search for my daughter's killer. Have you found him yet? She asked while throwing the letter towards his direction. Since Alec had requested that these maids pay attention to her every move, that meant that they would probably be listening in on the conversation as well. No my queen, Benvolio replied with a creepy smile on his face, as he gently picked up the letter a few inches in front of him. He licked his lips playfully and unhurriedly hid the letter away. I only called you here to see how far along you were with the search. Since you haven't found the culprit yet, then we had nothing further to talk about. He dismissed. With that, Benvolio unhurriedly bowed at her, winked at her and walked away while smilingly looking at him, she could help but feel helpless. Honestly, all through the time that she had spent with him, she could never fully decode what the guy's deal was. In the beginning, he truly frightened her. But after several years of complete loyalty, she had just concluded that he was a mental case. Once he was gone, she quickly called her maids, cleaned up and then made up an excuse to go to the royal prayer rooms. She told them that she wanted to pray for her daughter's fortunes in the heavens. My queen. Do you want us to pray with you as well? asked one of her maids. No, I need time alone, so he'll only come out after three hours, she replied. Typically, it wasn't weird for one to spend hours in a prayer home or a temple. If one wanted the souls of their loved ones to have fortune in heaven, then they needed to sit within the temple and polish spiritual stones. These stones were just white pebbles that were found on the coastal shores. If some Eon's loved one committed 20 sins that they were aware of, then 20 pebbles would be enough to polish. For example, if Adrian believed that her daughter had sinned 12 times her entire lifetime, then 12 stones would be polished. But usually, one could polish as many stones as possible 
just in case their loved one committed more sins than they were aware of, white pebbles were used as a sign of purity. And were used to purify the souls of the dead. Once the stones were polished, they were thrown into the fire and until their outer appearance turned black. It was believed that during prayers for the dead, as the burning process continued, the soul of the dead would absorb the purity of the pebbles, and in turn, the blackness of the stone showed that the soul's sins had been absorbed by the pebble instead. White pebbles were believed to be a natural hurtfulian blessing to the world, hence they were used. Once her maids left, she quickly walked towards the backyard of the prayer courtyard and looked left and right suspiciously. Benvolio! Come out! You called my queen, he replied as he popped out from a large wooden barrel, where are Flick and Ron? Here my queen, said two others, who jumped out from behind a huge pile of firewood. Good. Now that you all are here, then let's make our escape. But first, where are the clothes that I asked for? Arginio asked. Here they are my queen, Benvolio said while passing on a bag towards her. She quickly went into one of the empty rooms in the courtyard and changed. She had changed her flashy clothes, and was presently wearing sack-like male peasant clothing. Which cheap male shoes as well. She had also tied her hair like a man, and had chosen to wear a cheap mask to go with the outfit. Once she was done, her subordinates aided her in climbing and jumping over the two-meter fence around the prayer courtyard. On the other side of the wall, her other subordinates were already ready with two merchant wagons. Previously when she was cleaning herself up, her subordinates had quickly gotten merchant wagons and had immediately used Arginia's name and seal to come into the palace as merchants. They claimed that Arginia had specifically asked them to bring their jewelry and makeup products for her to see. They would now leave under the guise that Arginia was praying. And would it come back later again to see if she was still available to see them? Ron. You stay back and make sure that no one comes into the prayer courtyard. Flick. Benvolio. Ving with me on this one. Chapter 194 Revelations 2 After escaping the palace, they quickly made their way towards the Venegard Tavern. In this mission, the hooded Benvolio was in charge of talking. The tavern was filled with the strong aroma of ale, and sweaty men. There were men seated around the wooden tables, that had been soaked with overspilled ale from their cups. Some were toasting and laughing while others were having a small organized bar fight at the side. Some gambled on these fights, while others slapped the butts of the serving women that passed by. Some were heading upstairs to have their fun with these serving girls, while others were heading downstairs while burrowing up their pants. The trio moved closer to the front desk carefully, as they tried to avoid all the chaos that was currently happening around them. As they moved, the servant girls would call them out seductively. Hey handsome, wanna have a good time with mama? Oh I love mysterious men. Why don't I show you how mysterious I can be as well? Underscore. Since Adrian was dressed as a man, they also tried to seduce her as well. They touched her arms and clothes as she passed by, while biting their lips and shaking their assets in front of her. Ladies dot 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 ladies dot 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 I'm a married woman okay? She thought, as she tried to maintain her composure. Check in at room 7, Benvolio said seductively, as he tapped his hands on the front desk playfully. Normally, he would have slaughtered every woman in this room for touching him, but since they were undercover, he had to keep his cool and restrain himself. Just thinking about killing them and seeing their blood spraying out of their bodies made him smile even more. It would indeed be a beautiful sight. The young girl was confused. But because he had asked in a seductive tone, she had chosen to comply with his request. Strange enough, room 7 hadn't been booked all day. Which was very odd indeed, but what did she care? The reason why she was confused was because she was usually the one who told people where to be at. So why were these particular guests insistent in being at room 7? Although she wanted to know the reason, she knew better than to let her curiosity get the best of her. She had seen people get killed within this same tavern because they poked their noses into things that didn't concern them. Another thing that piqued her curiosity, was the fact that these people were all men. Did they plan to sleep with each other instead? If so, 
then that would explain why they were turned off by women. After all, it was very common for men to sleep with men. Especially those knights who camped out for years and years away from the taste of a woman. It made sense now, the front desk girl thought, as she tried to convince herself that it wasn't that she or any of the other girls were ugly. It was that those three men preferred a man's touch to that of a woman. How else could she explain the fact that three full grown men, would pass up the chance to sleep with hot women that were throwing themselves at them. HMHM. That must be it. They liked men. While the front desk girl was coming up with her own theories, the supposedly gay trio had just entered the room and had immediately went towards the large silver mirror on the left side of the room. Apparently, this mirror was placed here so that those men could watch their woman's actions from the back as well so as to heighten their pleasure. Benvolio, flick. Gently lift the mirror away from the wall. The men nodded and did as they were told. The space that was blocked by the mirror had certain tiny holes on it that were hard to see from afar, except one stood right in front of them. Based on the positioning of these holes, it was safe to say that they would be able to hear everything that comes out from those next door. Provided they were on the bed. From the holes. One could see the bed sheets just directly below them, meaning that these holes were placed on the front wall of the bed's upper frame. Time passed by quickly, and they soon heard voices next door. Dot. Baby, I've missed you, Carrie said, as he closed the door behind Anthony. Adrian on the other side, couldn't see them clearly, and could only faintly hear them, as they were somewhat far away from the bed. But when they climbed on the bed, she immediately knew who those voices belonged to. She tried to calm her anger and breathed in and out, sleeping with your sister's fiancé. What a good child. Dot 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 she thought, as she continued to listen in on their conversation. Baby, how long do we need to keep pretending just to be together? Anthony asked. You know that I want to be with you more than anything else. Dot 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 but that bitch's mother is still looking for her daughter's murderer. If we hook up? Wouldn't she immediately suspect us? Even if she killed that slut Jeanette, I still think that we should lay low for the time being. But don't worry, I heard that my father has ordered for the old hag to be kept under lock and key within the palace, Carrie said while seductively running her hands across Anthonis back. On the other side of the wall, Argenia almost lost her mind when she finally confirmed that this shameless couple had killed her beloved daughter. She calmed herself down and continued to listen in on them. True. But how do we introduce our relationship? Anthony asked. He 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 I've already thought about it. We could just say that we found comfort in each other. After all, grieving and him also grieving. So who would question our newfound love? When my brother becomes king, do you think that anyone would dare to question us? Anthony frowned. Although he agreed with what she was saying. Eli would only become king in the future and not now. So what do they do if they get discovered before then? The old hag was indeed a problem. But baby. What if she finds out that we were the ones who killed Jeanette? Even if she finds out what can she do? She's a bloody prisoner, whose life solely depends on my father. If she attempts to kill me, father would definitely not let her go. Do you know why? Carrie asked smilingly. Anthony knitted his brows and shook his head. When Jeanette died, Alec looked for the culprit for just two weeks. Before burning down an entire town up display his power and might for his enemies to see. So why would Carrie's situation be any different? It's because of brother. To appease brother, father would probably kill the old hag and her entire family with his own bare hands for brother. It's simple. The old hag gave birth to a useless son, while mother gave birth to the future king. On the other side of the wall, Argenia frowned. What the girl said was true. Even though she wanted revenge, Alec would never support her if it conflicted with Elis' interest. And if he ever dug deep into the matter and found her to be guilty, then her old father, mother, brothers and sisters, as well as their families, will all be killed. Today's revelation was indeed jaw-dropping. But since she had made up her mind to kill her daughter's murderers, then the shameless couple had to die. Adrian looked at Carrie in particular and smiled coldly. Good child. 
Auntie here will play this game with you a little longer. Chapter 195 Undercover Agent Mike Riverdale City. Dot. Major General Mark and his comrades were presently undercover. His Majesty had assigned him the task of collecting intel in Riverdale City. For this mission, he had brought his girlfriend Ava, as well as five other men and women with him. Originally, he didn't plan on taking her along. But when he said that he would be away for three while months, she immediately insisted on coming with him on this mission. She was also excited, as this would be her first time being an undercover agent. How exciting! Before leaving, everyone had been briefed about their identities. Mark and Deva were newly wedded peasants, who had moved here all the way from the Chusa village four cities away. Their village was burned and raided by bandits, hence they had no choice but to flee. And ever since then, they had been wandering around from city to city like nomads. As for his other male comrades, they were to take the identities of Mark's brothers, who had also traveled with Mark alongside their wives as well. It had been three weeks since they had settled in, and right now, the men had successfully gotten work at the fields, while the women stayed at the inn aiding in doing laundry. When they first arrived, they had pleaded with the owner of the inn to hire the women as laundry maids for the guests. This was a great way to pick up intel, since the inn had a bar at its ground level. When there was a bar, they would definitely be drunk people who would talk about the happenings within the city. Gossip was what they needed right now, just to be safe from harassment. The women had worn several layers of clothing to make themselves look fat and they had also put dirt and fake black spots on their faces to mask their beauty. Anyone who looked at them right now, would be totally turned off by their hideous appearance. So far, they had found out that some captains from the capital had left Riverdale a while ago, and that Shannon's only son, Marder, was bloodthirsty for his father's killer. Apparently, the knights had escaped when his father was being killed, were immediately killed and their families weren't let go even after their death. From everything that they had found out, this Marda character was a dangerous and tricky fellow who would all be problematic for Baymard. Hence it was best for them to keep an eye on him while they stayed here. Dot. Carriages and horses passed along the busy roads, as the peasants walked through the busy city. The roads were muddy and dirty, from the numerous cries from the sky. It was springtime, and the skies were always gloomy. The cool breeze gently massaged the chests of Mike and his men, as they carried the last stack of hay towards their employer's barn. On the way, the soldiers on horses, and even the snobby rich merchants and noble in carriages would splash puddles on mud water on their bodies. Poo, yi. Dot. They stink. Honestly. Dot 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 why must we share our oats with these filthy peasants? Just look at their muddy clothes. Don't they have any awareness at all? Underscore. As they walked by, these upper class men would sometimes spit at them or insult them alongside other peasants. Just to get to rise out of them. But no matter what type of insults were thrown their way. They stayed firm and continued on with their work. One false move, and they could be burnt alive as examples for all to see. As they moved, they couldn't help but compare His Majesty's attitude to these so-called nobles. He was truly one in a million. Tsar. What did you find out, when you sneaked into the city lord's palace last night, Majo? I mean Mark. It appears that this murder guy plans to send some of his trusted subordinates towards Omar City, which is just three towns away. Apparently, he believes that Shannon was killed there. So he's personally going there secretly to investigate. In fact, there were so many things that had puzzled Mark. Why did the survivors not confess about the fact that Baymard was responsible for Shannon's death? Were they scared silly by the attack from back then, that they had made up their own stories in their heads? No matter how he looked at it, something didn't add up. Well, provided they weren't looking toward Baymard for revenge, then he wouldn't be bothered. And what about Marda? What will he be up to during this time? He said that he would like to recruit and build up more forces for the time being. From what I reckon, more than 90% of his father's soldiers had been destroyed by us. So although he had his own forces, 
it would still be nothing when faced with a powerful enemy. I think he plans to lay low and act docile for the time being. This is also good. We need to make sure that no enemy heads on towards Baymard which jarred our knowledge. Mark said, just to keep an eye on the road leading to Baymard, they had all chosen to work on the fields facing that direction. From the hilly fields, they could see and observe the roads outside the gates while working. The men continued their discussion as they walked towards the barn. Tsar, Hoden. When we get to the inn, you two focus on drinking with those at the bar. Pay attention to every minor detail. I want to know everything that's happening within the city. The two men nodded as they listened on. Nembo. How much longer before the city map is completed? I need two more weeks to complete it Majo. Sorry Mark, Nimbo replied. It was hard for them not to call Mark, Major General Mark. He was their major and leader for heaven's sake. Good. Continue taking your normal stroll around the city until you get it done. As for me, I'll head on towards the market area to collect intel as well. But before that, I think we should lay low for the time being as well. Someone has been watching us. Chapter 196 Busy Baymard Back in Baymard, everyone was busy. The public school students had already school, while those at the academies were already done with their final examinations. Three weeks had already passed since His Majesty had left, and the workers had immediately dived back into their work. No one wanted to disappoint His Majesty. At the plastic making department, Supervisor Moriarty was busy working supervising and inspecting the new dolls from the new doll making sector. Careful, careful, he said, as he watched the men pour the pasty liquidy plastic into the molds. The workers carefully carried the large pocket of liquid plastic, and poured it carefully into the mold. The liquid dripped like thick glue, as it fell onto the molds. The liquidy polyethylene plastic used, had been mixed with an orange dye so as to make it look skin-like. In this world, people had four main skin tones, white, black, blue, and pink. And of course each skin tone had its own shade as well. Like deep pink, pale pink and so on. As for the people within the Pino continent, their skin tone was whitish, with an orange undertone to it. Of course due to the slaves and merchants from different continents, the people knew about some of these skin tones. Hence Landon didn't see anything wrong in creating them. Who knows? Maybe merchants from those places can come over and buy them from him. Another thing that was noteworthy, was the fact that black deep drownish eyes were very rare. Even those with black skin tones, had colorful eyes ranging from white to violet. In fact, most of them looked like Storm from Xman when her eyes turned white. Taking all this into account, his Landon had also requested for the dolls to be made with different skin tones and sizes as well. Dot. Anyway, the plastic was placed into the molds. And when it cooled down, 50 tiny plastic body parts were formed. So each mold could make 50 left arms, 50 right legs, and so on. When the molds were done, they were sent immediately to be painted dot 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 before they got put together. For this part, the workers had to be careful. Barbie's lips, teeth, eyebrows, nails and so on, needed to be painted on carefully. And if they made any mistake, then they could just use alcohol to wipe the paint off and start all over again. As the workers painted away, Moriarty walked around and inspected the doll's makeup before His Majesty had left. He had left them with close to 30 different portraits for how Barbie should look like, irrespective of skin tone. In some of the portraits, Barbie had a smoky eye makeup, with a long winged eyeliner and pink lips, while in others, Barbie only had average makeup on. In essence each portrait had a different outfit, makeup and accessories. Landon had tried to relate her to every profession in Baymard. In some, she was a knight, while in others, she was a teacher, scientist, nurse, doctor and so on. Moriarty was amazed at how clear and surreal the portraits looked. If his majesty wasn't king, Moriarty was sure that by now, he would be a renowned painter. Supervisor Moriarty. What do you think about this look? It's good. But make the eyeliner wing a little bit longer. What about mine Supervisor Moriarty? Please look at mine too. Me too. Underscore. At the beginning. 
Barbie's makeup was done very poorly. Hence all those dolls that had been made then, had to be reheated back into liquid plastic and redone again. But after three weeks of doing this daily, the workers had improved their painting techniques significantly. Granted, there were still a lot of things that needed to be changed, but Moriarty was sure that by the next 60 days two months, they would definitely get it right. After the paint had dried off, the rest of the body was put together. While the head was sent off to the next group of workers, who would sew in Barbie's hair. The hair was literally made from polymer nylon, and was sewn into the head using those old steam sewing machines from the textile industry. D-R-R-R-R-R-M-M-M. The sewing machines churned, as they sewed the different colored nylon polymer fibers into Barbie's head. And once they were done, the head was sent to attached with the other body parts. Body parts like the head, limbs and arms, all had ball sockets at their connecting joints. Dot 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 so as to force the balls into the holes at places like Barbie's neck and shoulders. Up next, Barbie's outfit was gotten from the textile industry and worn on her. Of course, her plastic shoes, bags and other accessories are also but tether in an next transparent plastic box. As for how the Max design got printed, it was done in a similar manner like paper money. The box design and drawing was imprinted on a steel plate. From there, a die was added on the outline of each stroke and line within the design. Following that, a thin transparent plastic sheet was placed on the top of the steel plate and backed for 8 minutes. And at that point, the image and die colors on the steel plate gets transferred to the transparent plastic sheet. The whole process was very similar to making different colored paper money. That particular transparent plastic sheet would pass through six more steps, before it would finally be used to print out identical designs over one hundreds of cardboard boxes all at once. Well, the first few process steps were only done within the first of the month. Those first steps were only needed to get the exact design for Barbie's boxes. But once they made specific designs for all 30 design types, they immediately began printing out hundreds and hundreds of copies on different colored boxes. His Majesty had stated that Barbie could only have three main box colors, pink, white and red. Moriarty held the box in his hand that already contained Barbie and her accessories within it. 34 of the box's front, was made of transparent plastic, while the rest of the box was made of a pinkish cardboard box. After inspecting most of the Barbie products for a while, he continued on to look at more dolls within the storage room. This sector had 550 workers who were all in charge of making plastic toys. They made several toys like Wonder Woman, Mulan, Superman and so on. Generally, each toy had 20 molds that could produce at least 50 tiny body parts from it. A day, at least 200 people would be present for each shift, and they would sit there for 8 hours and make over hundreds of plastic toys. So every day, they make at least 600 toys from both shifts. Granted, that 600 could mean 50 Milan toys, 20 Superman toys and so on. But all in all, 600 were made daily, and by the end of the week, they would generally make over 3,000. The thing that took time, was to paint the toys. If they workers got more proficient, then more toys would be produced daily. Hence as time goes by, it's evident that production will also increase as well. All in all, Moriarty was pleased with the results so far. It was indeed. A beginner's job well done. Chapter 197 A brand new semester Momo. Hurry up. Dot. We're going to be late, yelled Linda, as she rushed towards the newly constructed building within the school premises. Little Momo and her, were on their way towards the chemistry laboratory. Today, they were taking chemistry 3. Ever since the beginning of April, they had been taking six main courses. Biology 1 Classes of Living Organisms Math 4 Simple Variable Math, like Find X Chemistry 2 Chemistry 3 Introduction to Lab Science Physics 1 Fun of 4 Apart from these ones, they also had other fun and creative courses that occurred once a week. Like, Arts and Craft 1 Ethics and Morality 1 Health and Hygiene 1 Literature 1 Music 1 
and physical education. Another surprising thing for the students was that this year, the school had created a student council body based on the votes from the students. Also, each class had a class monitor and deputy class monitor that entrusted in assisting the teachers in class, aiding the weak students, roll call, and so on. No matter what amongst the two leaders, one had to be female and the other male. Generally, once the winners for both the male group and female group emerged, the students would then vote between the two and choose who should be the class monitor or deputy class monitor. For the biology class, the students were taught the basics like cells, microbes, plant systems, animal systems, invertebrates, and vertebrates. In short, they were taught about all the classes of living organisms. Of course, for Math 4, they focused on simple variable math, like 5x equals 10, find x. In that class, they focused on understanding one to two variable equations, which were usually linear equations. For chemistry too, the students would still focused on reactions, atoms and so on. But now with the use of calculators, they had begun learning about calculating molecular weight and so on. Of course just so that the students could breathe a little, music, literature, physical education and arts and craft were essentially a must. In short, this semester was a busy one. Today, Linda and little Momo were heading towards the chemistry lab in the new school building. Once they got in, they immediately climbed the stairs until they arrived at the third floor where they were greeted with a large group of students outside the lab. The area was bustling with busy students. Friends greeted each other with hugs or playful punches, while others had their eyes glued on their books as they continued doing assignments that were due in the next class. Some already had their lab coats and safety wears on, while others were busy wearing theirs on now. In fact, everyone was doing their own thing as they waited for the class to begin. Instantly. The duo opened their bags and quickly pulled out their neatly folded lab coats and safety items. For this class, everyone was required to wear their lab coats, gloves, rubber boots, and goggles. Linda looked at her watch and knew that it would soon be time for them to go in. And right on cue, Mother Kim and Teacher Gofen opened the lab doors from instead and ushered the students in. Morning Teacher Kim. Morning Teacher Gofen. Morning Teacher. Underscore. Everyone greeted their teachers, as they walked in and immediately found their usual spot. The laboratory was massive, with several working slabs, cupboards with equipment stored in them, and a small storage room at its front. Linda and Momo immediately spotted their other group members, and rushed over to join them. Ever since the beginning of the semester, they had been put in groups of five. Apparently. These people would be their lab partners throughout the entire semester. All right. Before we begin, you all know the drill. In front of each group, are five question sheets. You all have seven minutes to answer them. Remember, no cheating and no copying. These small tests make up 20% of your final grade. Now, begin. Linda immediately flipped her question sheet and got to work. For this Chemistry 3 course, they had one theory class on Tuesdays, and one lab session on Thursdays. And at the beginning of each lab session, they would have mini quizzes that would test them on what they had learnt in their Tuesday classes. Chemistry 3 was a course based on laboratory work, so they had to know about the equipments in front of them, safety lab hazards and so on. In fact, ever since the students knew that these questions were 20%, they had taken them seriously. Linda filled her name and school number on the question sheet, before proceeding to answer the questions. The questions were straight to the point, and easy to answer if one was paying attention during lectures. And just like that, time flew by quickly. Seven minutes later, the quiz is collected back by teacher Gofin, and the papers were collected. Mother Kim began distributing the lab manual sheets for today's experiment. Dot. All right. Before we begin our laboratory experiment, let's recap on what teacher Winnie has been you all in chemistry too. Mother Kim said. The students immediately took out their books and writing materials, while others flipped the pages of their books to the last pen-filled page. It was important for the students to know about what reactions they were going to perform today, 
Hence it was good for them to recap on what they were previously taught. So as usual, let's look back on what you all have been learning so far. I need a few examples of chemistry around us. Anyone? Mother Kim asked, as she waited for the students to raise their hands. Yes Philippa, she said, while pointing at a little girl at the front of the room. Air is essentially chemistry, because it's constantly undergoing a chemical change. For example, we breathe out carbon dioxide and take in oxygen. So air is always changing. Also, air undergoes changes whenever smoke is released into the atmosphere by burning, hence it's part of chemistry. Correct. Dot. Any other examples of chemistry around us? Kim asked. Our bodies. The ocean. When we make bread. Underscore. Chapter 198 A brand new semester to as Kim listened to all of the examples of chemistry around us, she nodded in acknowledgement. But when someone gave bread making as an example, some people giggled. As they thought that it was definitely wrong. How could bread making be chemistry? Good good good. Dot. These are all good examples. Now, let's focus on bread making. Which is essentially baking. As she spoke. Some of the students looked at her in doubt dot 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 they weren't buying it at all. Let's step back for a little bit and go back to the basics. What is chemistry? Again some people raised their hands up, while others flipped through their books. Yes Callis, it's the science of different kinds of matter, and how that matter changes. Correct. So how do we link baking and chemistry together? She asked. Everyone thought for a while before more hands were raised up again. Both baking and chemistry require careful timing and measuring someone answered. Both of them are a result of the formation of a mixture. Wonderful! In baking, we can change matter like eggs, butter, milk and flour into a new mixture, which would later be used in creating bread. And likewise in chemistry, several substances form mixtures which give rise to new products. So in essence, when there's a change of matter, then a chemical reaction has occurred. Even mixing and creating the dough is chemistry. And even more so. Heating the dough under fire, will change the dough's properties and make it hard hence forming bread. Ah, the students responded. As Mother Kim spoke, Linda and her group members continued to write down all the key points like mixtures, chemical change and so on. Ever since she started taking chemistry classes. Her view on the world had changed. She began wondering what chemical reaction would give rise to this, and what chemical reaction would give rise to that. In fact, her whole world was now filled with chemistry. Can anyone give an example of a chemical change that cannot be undone? Teacher Gofin asked. Linda immediately raised her hand. When wood burns, as the wood burns, it changes into ash. The ashes can never change back to wood. Dot. So burning is a chemical change which can never be undone again. And what are the characteristics of chemical changes? Some chemical changes make matter change color. Like the blackness of the ash. They also make the smell change. Like when the bread is just removed from the oven. Sometimes they also release light and gases. And other times, they give off or take in heat. Underscore. When teaching chemistry. Landon had told the teachers to always relate everything to the things done daily. People were more inclined to remember something, if they could relate it to things that they could see daily. If they had just taught the children without these examples, Landon was sure that even if some of them had passed their exams, most of them would have done so be my cramming. But if they could relate everything to the food they ate, the things they did, and their life experiences, then most of the concepts would stick in their brains. And because of this teaching method, the students had really become inquisitive as time went by. They would ask about why the sky was blue, why the grass was green, or even why water was clear and so on. Dot. Once their recap session was done, they finally began experimentation. If you answered the questions on the quiz correctly, then you would be able to identify the tools in front of you. today. We will be doing two experiments. Up first, we'll be making elephant toothpaste. As for the last experiment, it'll tell you all once you're done with this one. Now, let's focus on making the toothpaste. Each group should find several beakers in front of you, as well as two measuring cylinders, 
one round bottom flask, two stirrers and a thermometer in front each group. Some of the beakers in front of you are already filled with ingredients like water, liquid soap and potassium iodide. But for chemicals like hydrogen peroxide, each group would have to send someone to come and get it from me, once ready to begin. Also, each slab has just two small electric Bunsen burners on them. So since there are six teams on each slab, I suggest you share nicely. Previously, I had distributed printed lab manuals to each group. Hence if any of you still have questions about the instructions on the lab manuals, don't hesitate to call either me or teacher Gofeng for assistance. And remember, please label whatever chemical or ingredient you take from us before you continue your experiments. Now, begin. Linda and her team immediately read through the instructions carefully, and recorded everything in front of them. They recorded things like the color of potassium iodide and its smell before experimentation. Some people started measuring the exact volumes and quantities needed for the experiment, while the others focused on boiling the water. The students went to the electric Bunsen burners and heated the water to a slightly higher temperature than what was required. And while the others kept measuring the proper amounts needed, those handling the hot water placed a thermometer in it, and waited for it to cool down to the required temperature needed. Once everything was recorded, measured and ready, they immediately began adding all the ingredients according to their lab manuals, and stepped back just as the instructions had advised. The solution started foaming up and instantly shot out of the large cylindrical flask. PFFFF. Since Linda and her group were the first ones to complete this experiment, everyone looked at the foam in marvel. Awesome. So cool. Look. Dot. It's still flowing out of the flask. Why does it smell like lemons? Underscore. Those who saw it got pumped up and wanted to complete their own experiments as well. Linda and her team were still stupefied by what they were seeing. How? How did these liquid substances turn to foam? We were just mixing the ingredients in, without fire. So why did the substances change their form so fast? Was it because of the hot water? Quick quick, let's record what we saw before we forget, Linda said excitedly. Linda was amazed at the rapid change that occurred right now. She looked at the ink in her pen, the book she was writing on, and even the tiny veins that she could see on her wrists. Chemistry was everywhere around her. She breathed it, she lived it and she herself was a part of it. It was like a great force that connected everything in the world. This was her own unique understanding of chemistry. Dot. Far away from the calm and busy Bay Mud, was a ship that had finally reached its destination. Landon looked at the shores of Corona and smiled. It was finally game time. Chapter 199 Soldiers on the Move 1 Loplin City, The Empire of Corona. Dot. The night sky was dark, cold and cloudy. It was currently 8 p.m., and Landon's ship had already docked at the port. Landon stepped out of the ship captain's office, and felt the damp breeze sweetly blowing against his face. The whole place smelled of fish and salt. The city was indeed busy. Landon could see several groups of moving goods in and out of their ships. There were also fishermen on tiny boats a little distance from the harbor, who were leaning against their boats as they lifted a net filled with fish. Some on the shores were currently selling their catch to the housewives and restaurant owners, while others stood the cleaning and cutting out the unwanted parts of the fish. For them, the ocean was a source of cleaning water, as well as a good garbage bin for all their dirt. The whole place was chaotic, as everyone hurriedly did their tasks. As he stood on the balcony, he could hear the tiny whistles of the sea's waves singing their lullabies to the world. Are you sure you can get it done undetected? Landon asked the hooded Santa. Of course, little bro. Just wait here for two more hours, and it shall be done. And with that, Santa get off the ship with some of his men. From the map, Landon had found out that there were three underground camps. All of them were around the shores so as to make it easier for the slaves to get in without the authorities noticing. The only point was that they were all scattered around different coastal cities within Corona. For example, the first camp was situated eight hours away by horseback, from the coastal city that they were currently in. In fact, 
they needed to travel past a few villages and cities before getting there. The second one was a 14 hour ride away from the Windle coastal city. And the third one was a day's ride from Grendel coastal city. For Landon's plan to work, he needed Santa to get at least four other ships for the slaves to hop into when they freed them. As for things like wagons, Landon had decided that they would buy them from the towns or cities that were close to these underground camps. Of course, the money for all this would come from Santa's pockets. Since they were aiding them in taking care of this issue, the least Corona could do was to pay the bills. Landon wasn't that charitable. Also, Santa had to get 502 war horses for the Landon and his men as well. Fortunately, Santa had a mansion at almost all coastal ports since his goods got delivered and shipped in and out of Corona frequently. One should know that Santa was a very wealthy merchant, had thousands of guards at most of his ports. So for sure, he would have 502 war horses readily available for them. While they waited for Santa, the men began eating their supper. They were about to travel on an eight-hour journey, so supper was indeed essential. Time flew back. And finally, Santa was back. Everything is ready just outside the city. Little bro, how many days will it take before you come back? Should I send you more guards? No no no. Should I go with you? Santu asked anxiously. Now that it was time for his little bro to head out, he couldn't help but get worried. His little bro was actually going to go head on with Noplin's forces. Sure, Baymard had indeed changed. But that didn't mean that they were strong. He had a hunch that there would be at least 1,000 men each, guarding these camps. So how could 500 go against such huge numbers? Plus, from what he had heard, his bro couldn't fight at all. Wasn't this just rushing towards instant death? He had visited other cities in Arcadina and had heard about his bro, so from everything that he had gathered, he knew that this little bro of his was somewhat weak when it came to fighting. And even if the knights had taught him during this one year period, it wasn't enough for him to improve greatly. Sword fighting took years to achieve. From the age of seven, the men were constantly being trained in the way of the sword. Sure, his bro had practiced when he was in Arcadina. But his bro was always the weakest in his class. Plus how could a 16 year old compete with experienced men who have worked as guards, or even gone to war? Some of the men that they would face today would be over the age of 25, and he would be a fool to believe that his bro of 16 years old had more skills than them. Somehow, he felt that this might be the last time that he would see his bro. He felt that he had pushed everything onto his brother's shoulders. He dot 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 he felt sad. But how could he have known that not only was Landon very capable, he had guns and bullets to kill all these motherfers easily. Very soon he would know how silly he was in worrying about Landon. But that would all be in the future. Dot. Bro, I assure you. I won't lose. As for the number of days that will use, I guess you could say that we'll be back in three days time, so wait for us here. What I need you to do right now, is to ready the ships. We need enough crew members and ships to hold all the slaves from all three camps. But all in all, the entire mission should be done in no more than fifteen days. As for your fears about no pline, Trust me a little bit more will you? I meant what I said. I won't be the one at the loosing end. So there's no need for you to worry so much. Landon assured. How could he loose? As far as he was concerned, this was just target practice for the men. That was all. Santa looked at him and helplessly shook his head. His little bro was indeed as stubborn as his future wife. Talking to him was like talking to a brick wall. Sigh. Fine. I'll believe you on this one. But if it gets too tough, do me a favor. Run. Sure. After Landon spoke to Santa for a while, he and his men quickly wore their hooded cloaks. And immediately got off the ship. Once the men stepped onto the harbor, they became extremely vigilant as they walked past the busy crowd. In their minds, their mission had already begun. Chapter 200 Soldiers on the Move to the Outskirts of Reginal City Corona. Dot. After eight long hours of journeying through Corona, they had finally made it towards their destination. On their way here, they had decided to pass through the forest trails, rather than the roads. It would be somewhat suspicious, 
if people see over 500 cloaked men walking into Corona, even worse, people might begin failing them due to curiosity. One had to know that for one of these camps to be so close to Reginal City, meant that those people in power within the city were aware of everything that went on there. Maybe they were threatened to keep their mouths shut, or they were bribed. Either way, walking on the roads would bring attention to their potential enemies. They might even suspect that it was the Queen or the nobles that had sent them, and that wasn't what Landon wanted. That's why they had passed through a forest trail that was commonly used by merchants during this journey. There were several merchant forest trails that led towards Reginal City from the Loplins coastal city. But Landon chose the most difficult and dangerous trail of all. In this way, they were guaranteed to not meet too many people on the way. It was usually difficult because of the terrain, and dangerous because bandits hid there. But all in all, Landon saw this as more practice for the men. Funny enough, their entire journey was blissful. And no one had even attempted to attack them. This was because there were too many in numbers, and those bandits were only like fifty or so in a tiny group. Real blood gangs colonize villages, towns, and even cities. They would never come out to hide in the woods just to steal goods. Instead, they would have the entire town give them a certain percentage of their monthly products and money. Hence these bandits who hid in the woods all day, were indeed small fries. And generally since most merchants had stopped using these dangerous roads, most of these petty thieves had also changed their stealing locations to the other forest trails as well. Anyway, Landon and his men had currently camped on top of a cliff that oversaw Reginal City. Landon walked around their campsite and marked the entire region on the system. In fact, ever since he had been moving about, he had been mapping and marking the trail on the system's map. Granted, he could see every other place in this world if he wanted to. But when it wasn't his territory, he would have to pay the system to do so. He was trying to save more points to level up again. So how could he allow himself to be so thrifty? Even though Corona wasn't his territory, he still marked and added the trail and this campsite as part of his territory. In this way, even if he wanted to view this particular part back in Baymard, he wouldn't necessarily need to pay the system again. Everything costed points, and he was currently low on those right now. He has spent points on getting information on making money, missile rocket launches for the city walls food, toys and so on. Dot. Listen up. Dot. It's 535A. M, and I assume that everyone is dead tired. So, he'll let you all rest till 1 p.m. While you sleep, he'll stay up and guard the camp. Now, go to bed. That's an order. Silence. Everyone was taken aback. They hadn't seen His Majesty sleep. So how could they allow him to guard the camp while they slept? Wasn't he tired as well? Somehow, the idea didn't sit well with them. Granted, they were tired and sleepy as hell. But how could they have the heart to allow their commander and king stay awake while they snored away? They truly felt touched. His majesty was kind and selfless. Gary and Thray were somewhat uncomfortable with the idea as well. They felt like if they truly followed Landon's command, they'd have nightmares instead of a sound sleep. How could they allow their king to accomplish such a task all on his own? Immediately, several people wanted voiced out their complaints. But before they had a chance to say anything, Landon had issued out his orders again. I understand and appreciate everyone's concern. But let's not forget why we are here. When the night falls, you all will have your first rescue mission. Tonight, all of you will save those poor children who have been captured by those animals. To those innocent children, you will be their light and hope in this cold and dark world. Those children have all experienced the worst of this world. From being kidnapped, forced sexually, starved and even forced to kill others in a cage. This children have seen it all. Some of them have cried and even thought of killing themselves, while others have died due to poor health. Some of them haven't even eaten for several days now, while others haven't even slept all through the night. So tell me, is my sleep more important than theirs? I can afford to this because I know how important this mission is. I need you all to do your best during battle, 
hence you must go to bed now. Every single one of you here is very dear to me, so I wouldn't want any of you to lose your lives during battle because of sleep deprivation. Now, I'll say it one last time, go to sleep. This time, the men immediately obeyed. They knew that his majesty was right. But it was just that as they drifted away into dreamland, they still felt a bit of pain in their hearts at the thought that his majesty wasn't sleeping as well. Truthfully, there was nothing for them to be worried about. System. Inform me if anyone attempts to climb this hill from any direction. Landon said inwardly. The cliff was currently at the edge of a tall hill. And just below the cliff was the official road leading into Reginal City. Yes host the system replied. Also, inform me when any of my men have woken up as well. Normally, Landon would have used a time capsule pill and rest within the system. But in this particular situation, it would just be a waste of points. Which he didn't have enough of. One hour in the real world was five days in the time capsule. So since he had asked the men to sleep for 7.5 hours, wouldn't that be too much time for him to spend within the time capsule just to sleep? And even if he bought just one capsule, after one hour he would need to get out. Which would be around 6.30 am. What'll he be doing from that time till 1 p.m.? Sleeping in the real world was the only situation. Hence he decided to climb on one of the massive trees a little distance from the camp, and sleep on its wide branches. He had the system, so if anything happened, he would know. After making a comfortable tree bed, he quickly turned on his monitor and watched the campsite. ZZZZZZ. The fatigued men were all fast asleep. He closed his eyes shut, and immediately joined them in dream world. Tonight was going to be bloody show. Chapter 201 Soldiers on the Move 310p.m. The men all sat around Landon, discussing their plans for tonight's show. Even though he had the map from those slave dealers. Landon had still decided to pay the system and get a better layout of this underground camp, and his decision proved right. The original map just showed one entrance exit at the forest. But the system zone showed three entrances exits in total. Two entrances were within Reginal City, and one was within the forest. More still, the system's map was so detailed that it showed each room within Thos underground camp. Indeed. Anything from an almighty being was bound to be top-notch and well detailed. With a better map, they could easily know each danger zone within the camp. On this mission amongst his soldiers, Landon had brought, Gary who was a major general, Thray who was a captain, Kins who was also a captain, Captain Bolivar, Captain Berserk Barrett and eight other warrant officers. With these men leading these inexperienced recruits, Landon somewhat helped everything would go well. Right now, Landon had given copies of the maps to the men. Dot. Before we begin, I expect everyone to wear their bulletproof vests for this mission. Now, Captain Berserk Barrett, you'll position 100 men at entrance A on the map. I need you to make sure that no one leaves or enters the camp area, Landon said while pointing at entrance A on the map. Entrancer was actually within a barn at the far back of the city. From the map, the exact entrance should be a door on the floor that was located within the barn at its left-hand corner. Two hours, Landon had gone out to the city with twelve men. They had seen the barn from afar, as well as how many people were actually guarding it. Well, using the system, he could easily tell that there were just 230 men at this barn. He and the men had made note of all their hiding points, so as to come up with an efficient plan for tackling them. There were currently 50 knights hiding around the barn, 50 standing guard outside the barn, and 130 people within the barn itself. Captain Berserk dot 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 amongst the 80 men within your group. Use 15 to deal with those garads hiding around the barn. With your sniper guns, I'm sure that you all will be able to deal with this efficiently. Once you've killed all the enemies, position yourselves there and kill anyone who dared to make their way towards the entrance. Of course the other 65 men within your group should focus on tackling your enemies and conquering the barn. Again once you succeed. 15 men amongst the 65 should set up traps and hide around the entrance of the barn, Landon said. Even though the snipers could take care of those who were approaching the entrance, 
nothing was guaranteed in life, maybe one or two could sneak past them, so they had to be prepared just in case. As for the remaining fifty, they should continue staying within the barn and guard the entrance. Is that understood? Yes your majesty. Berserk answered. Good. Captain Kintz, you will also lead eighty men and guard entrance B. Landon commanded. This particular entrance was different from the others. This one was located within the busy part of the city. The entrance was actually placed behind one of the doors within an old restaurant. It was no brainer that everyone there would probably be working for this no blind guy. For this entrance, there were just eighty men guarding it. Ten in hiding, thirty standing guard outside and forty within the restaurant. Captain Kintz. Amongst your group of eighty, I need you to follow the exact instructions that I gave to Captain Berserk. I need you to position fifteen men and take down all the other men who are hiding around nearby buildings. Once you get in position, kill only those who seem like guards. Remember your behavioral studies and analyze your suspects before killing them. One had to know that this was still a restaurant after all. Innocent children, women, men also came here to eat. So they couldn't take the risk of harming those with good intentions. Landon would have preferred to wait until everyone left the restaurant, but time was of the essence. He wanted this mission completed within the next two hours. So that he, his men and the slaves could leave fast by the dead of night. That way even if anyone noticed tomorrow, they would be long gone. Well Noplin's guards were east to spot, since they wore blue night wares, and carried white crested sword sheaths around. With this, he was hoping that the men would kill the right people tonight. For that scene, like could imagine it like how those old cowboy movies pictured it. The cowboys would be on the roofs or rooms of several buildings, while looking down on the roads or the restaurant. As for the rest of your men, I expect you to lead them in attacking the restaurant. Is that clear? Yes your majesty Kins replied. As for Captain Bolivar Ray.K.A.0. You'll hold of entrance C with 100 men. Follow the same routine as the other captains and Siculus forest entrance. There are only 200 guards there. So do your best and deal with them undetected. Understood? Yes your majesty. Oh zero answered. Now, Major General Gary and Captain Thray dot 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 you'll work with me and infiltrate the camp. After oh zero clears the forest entrance. Well advance in. And work our way through till we get to the other entrances. The reason why he didn't want to interfere or raid 0 at the entrance, was because this was a learning experience. He wanted the men in the team to do their work efficiently without his help. Major General Gary, you lead 80 men towards this left wing here. And kill every guard until you reach entrance at the barn, Landon said. From his monitor screen, he could tell that there were just 213 men scattered around that wing. So you Gary should be fine. While you do that, he'll personally lead another 80, towards the right wing until I reach entrance B. As for Captain Thray, Warrant Officers Golden Fox and Idle Fox, will be your second in command soldiers for this task. You and one of your second in commands should focus on getting the slaves from both left and right wings out. While your last second in command officer will focus on providing backup at the entrance, should in case more knights dare to come towards the forest. When Landon had checked out the base with the help of the system, he had seen that within the forest cavalike entrance, there were several wagons and horses deep within the cave. When one entered the cave, they would descend a bit and entire a massive room that had wagons and horses. Because of this, he didn't feel the need to buy any wagons or horses within the city. He had planned that when he got back, he would return Santa's money back. Is everyone clear on their responsibilities? Yes your majesty. They answered. Good. Now we wait. Chapter 202 Soldiers on the move for the night fell like a rich velvet quilt of black, swallowing up the day. Instantly engulfing up all the light from the sun, the darkness was almost absolute, and the sky was still cloudy with no presence of stars. The night crawlers began whistling, singing and croaking, as they hoped and danced around the darkness. The crickets creaked, the owls hot 
and the sounds of wolf-like howls could be heard from miles away. 1.30 a.m., Landon and his men had already gotten into position around every entrance exit. Dot. At entrance A, the barn was somewhat quiet, and those guarding it were seemingly lax. It was 1A.M after all, and those guards were used to being a little lazy. They just didn't think that anyone would have the guts to attack their boss no pline. Wasn't that just courting death? Even though the citizens around the city didn't know about these underground camps, they still feared to go close to any building or property that was owned by no pline. Some of the night guards were snoring away, while others were busy hosting with their friends while eating and drinking. Of course, there were still a few that didn't drop at their guard down as well. Be, be, be. The snipers were already moving in action, while the others were killing those shooting those around the barn's perimeter. Bro, what's wrong with you? Why did you suddenly fall down? Said a knight who was standing outside the left wall of the barn. Bro wake up alright. Another guard said, you're scarring. Be Before the other one could complete his sentence, he too fell down hard. And before anyone could react, they all dropped down like flies. Berserk and his team quickly ran up to the barn and began their rainstorm of attacks. Be dot. Meanwhile at entrance B, the restaurant had less customers now. Since it generally closed around 2 p.m. Nightlife was the way for these people to let loose and have fun. They loved drinking, eating and dancing. So of course some of them, although few, were still there enjoying themselves. Right now, 95% of people present within and around the restaurant were all guards. Immediately. The men outside started dropping like flies as well. Ah, why the heck did you fall like that? Asked a guard, as he hurriedly tried to reach his friend. He quickly turned him over, and to his surprise, he saw a very tiny but deep hole borrowed into his friend's head. A thin trace of blood rolled down from the hole and slid across his friend's left eye. He shook his friend violently as he was scared as hell. Was this place cursed, or was it just bad karma from his ancestors? Damn it. I knew that sleeping with that cursed eight-year-old girl was no good, he thought. A few days ago, he and his buddies had paid to rest out the new merchandise. Usually, they would do this to make the women easy for access to others. But a few days ago, one stubborn eight-year-old girl actually big him and lay a curse on him while dying. He thought that it was a joke. But seeing his dead friend life this, he couldn't help but became fearful. How could such a wound appear from nowhere? It was like the heavens had pointed at his friend's head, immediately killing him off. The knight quickly placed his dead friend on the floor and was about to run away. But when he turned around, he gasped, drip drip drip, warm pee trickled down his pants, as he took in the scene before him. All those around him were dead. How dot 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 how did this happen? He immediately thought of running away, far away from this cursed area. But before he could move, he too had been hit by the heavens. Bear. He dropped onto the floor knees first, before falling face down on the hard cold road. This must be my retribution, he thought before finally blacking out for good. Move in. Consorted, while leading his team into the restaurant stealthily. Dot. Far away from the city at outskirts of entrance C, three as team guests were currently driving their carriage towards the forest entrance. Through a secret rail. Din. 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 The thundering of hooves split the forest's silent musical tune as the horses galloped through the secret rail, The wind whisked the manes of these horses into the air, like black fiery flames that danced captivating around the darkness. There was a noble carriage making its way into the forests for a fun night. Fun indeed. Eight guards rode in front of the carriage, while another eight rode at the back. And of course surrounding this carriage, were another group of four there as well. The guards were buff, with muscles that rippled from under their clothes. But when his buffness ever stopped a bullet from hitting its target, be, 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 the men on dropped to the floor like flies, as their horses trampled all over their dead bodies. One of the men within the luxurious carriage lifted the reddish carriage curtain slightly, and tried to peep out without getting caught. Within the carriage, Baron Winchester, 
Baron John and Baron Ralph were scared silly. W. Well. What do you see? said an anxious Baron Winchester, as he continued to poke Baron John who was currently on all fours on the carriage floor. Baron John had closed his left eye, while using his right eye to focus. His left hand trembled slightly, as he lifted the curtain ever so gently. In fact at this point, he wished that he could see through the damn carriage. While he was trying to spy, Baron Ralph was so frightened that his teeth began to chatter, 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 chatter. As for Baron Winchester, he truly felt like he was currently having a stroke due. His heart kept beating so loudly, that it almost made him faint. Baron Jean peered outside with his right eye and was taken aback. Just a little distance away from the carriage curtain, he could see that the two guards who were guarding around this side of the carriage had dropped dead. He tried to look for any arrow sticks poing around their lifeless bodies. But funny enough, he couldn't see anything at all. I, I think they are dead, he said. Say what? So, what do we do now? Baron Ralph asked anxiously as well while wringing his fingers. Why the hell did he come out tonight? He had lied to his three wives that he was going for a meeting at the city lord's palace. What bloody meeting? He silently prayed to his ancestors and promised that if they kept him alive, he would never come to this place again. Rather than coming here, he would get sex workers instead. He would get service at home rather than outside. Yes. Dot 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 this was better than risking his life in the middle of the night. Before they could come out with a plan, their carriage door was literally smashed apart. Step out quietly, any noise, and you're dead, said a hard voice that was void of emotions. The soldier was warrant officer in Kosheim. He was under 000, and was tasked with stopping those who tried to get close to the forest entrance. They came out at once like frightened chickens. Kneel down now. Yes. Yes yes, they answered nervously. Once they knelt, the soldiers hit their acute points. And the men immediately blacked out. Tie them up, gag their mouths. And keep them away from the trail. Also, drive their horses and carriages away, and hide the dead bodies of their guards away from as well. Rinkoshim commanded. Dot. Near the entrance C's cave, Oo Zero had already finished his task. As all the men guarding the cave were all dead, the bodies were cleared and now it was time for phase two of tonight's show to commence. Oo Zero raised his hand to signal that the job was completed. Following that, Landon in turn signaled his own men as well. It was time for them to move out. Chapter 203 Destruction of the Underground Camp Stepping into the cave, Landon and his men moved stealthily against its walls. The cave's tunnel spiraled into infinite darkness, as they moved further away from the entrance. Presently, all the men were wearing night vision goggles that were roughly about half the size of regular binoculars. These goggles had a thick long head straps, as well batteries, a cathode, an anode, imaging tubes, several lenses that were coated with multiple chemicals and so on. With these goggles, if the men wanted to turn off night vision mode, they could just flip the tiny switch at the lower right end of their goggles. The cave was pitch black, so this was the best way to know if an enemy was hiding in secret. After all from the system's map, it was clear that guards were supposed to be positioned at several checkpoints within this long winding cave. For security purposes, these guards didn't light a torch as well so that they could easily sneak in or out and notify their masters of any dangers undetected. From the night vision goggles, they men could easily see reddish yellow colored figures a little distance away from them that were hiding within the darkness. This technology was really heaven sent to the men. They could see if their enemies were waving, walking or even dancing. Nothing could be hidden from these goggles. Pewee, pewee, pewee. The seven guards who thought they had hid away safely, had all dropped to the floor as bullets penetrated their heads. They were all dead. Landon and his men continued to move forward, until they had successfully passed through three more guard checkpoints. They had successfully passed through the first main passage within the underground camp, based on the system's map. A little distance from here, the path should descend until it reaches a massive hall. This hall was where they kept their carriages, wagons and horses. Landon had no use for the carriages, 
as what he was looking for were wagons. Carriages were meant to carry a maximum of six people within them. Three sitting on one side, while the other three on the other side. Of course, sometimes, eight people could squeeze in. But this was totally useless to London. Wagons on the other hand, could load up to 50 people in them. From the map, there was a secret footpath at the side of the wall that allowed the guards to oversee the hall from the hall's ceiling. In essence, Nopline had ordered his men to dig the cave's floor a little deeper, which caused the road, hall and other underground rooms to descend. Hence while the rooms descended, the secret footpath still remained on the cave's original ground level. In this way, his guards could overlook the hall. Of course this secret footpath only ended at the hall itself. The secret footpath led to several holes that were three feet wide and tall. This size was enough for someone to lie on the floor and there their body through the hole. The guards were generally just supposed to watch the hall from the top. And if any disturbances occurred, they were to find a way to head back into the city and inform the city lord. Anyway dot 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 for the task of taking care of those guards on the secret footpath, as well as shooting those in the hall. One of Thray's second in command, warrant officer Idle Fox, was now in charge of operations. He and his men quickly made their way to through the secret footpath and killed all those guards there. This skill was somewhat easy and ridiculous because almost all the guards had their heads stuck in the hole. Hence they were totally unprepared. And while they were lying down with their butts face up, some of them had fallen asleep, while others were busy watching the hall. Bro. Do you want to eat? Idle Fox asked playfully. Of course I want to eat. Who can say no to food? Ah bro, this place is so boring, said a guard who was currently trying to get out of the hole. But as soon as he turned to face Idle Fox, he was met with a cold metal weapon in his forehead. Pewee, the guard had died without even seeing it coming. Take care of the body Idle Fox said to some of the men under his command. Once all the guards had been taken care of, he sent a few people to guard the entrance to the secret footpath. As for him and a few other soldiers, they immediately fell down on all fours, crawled through these holes, and positioned his gun at all the guards in the hall below. While all this was happening, those within the hall were having their fun while teasing the slave workers that usually took care of the carriages, horses and wagons. Within the hall, there were forty knights stationed at different locations. Of course the back of the hall that faced the other underground chambers, were guarded by 15 knights, while the front of the hall had 15 knights who were presently surrounding a buff hooligan looking man. The man was sitting on a table within the hall, a little distance from the hall's entrance. His duty was simple. He was in charge of collecting entrance fees from all visitors. Ha ha ha. Where do you think you can run you, a little imp? You know that you're already a grown woman now? So shouldn't you be more aware of your situation? If you ease me right, it'll give you this piece of goat leg for you to eat. Think about it. Isn't this a sweet deal? The man said arrogantly to the 16-year-old girl who was busy cleaning the carriages. She had been here for close to two years now, and it seemed like she was destined to never wake up from this never-ending nightmare. She had been defiled, beated, whipped, and worst of all, her womb had been made barren by these men, who would want her again. The only reason she had tried to survive, was because her twelve-year-old sister who was also here as well, boys, pin her down. The guards hurriedly grabbed the frightened girl, who was currently screaming her lungs out. She had been through this almost every night. But no matter how many times SK experienced it, it was still painful as hell to have multiple men force their way through. No. No, I beg of you. Please let me go, she resisted. Slap. Little girl, no one can save you no matter how much you scream. So shut up. As the men were about to begin their daily ritual on her body, she closed her eyes and prayed to her ancestors for the umpteenth time. Please. If you really exist, please save me and my sister from this hell. Bear. Suddenly, the man above her fell into her body like a lump of meat. Don't tell me that his guy had busted so easily just by looking at this seductress. Another guard commented. He he he. Since he's out, push his body aside and let's continue the fun, said another. 
with an evil look in his eyes. Puai, 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 puai. The girl opened her eyes fearfully, and before she knew it, she saw strange men running towards her dressed in weird but cool black attires. Their faces were all painted black, and they held on to several black metal sticks as they approached her. Previously when all the guards were taken care of, Idle Fox used a little mirror to reflect like to Landon and the other Ken who were currently waiting for the signal at the entrance of the hall. The little girl was confused, and somewhat scared. But when she heard what the weird man said to her, she instinctively knew that her ancestors had heard her prayers. We are not your enemies, rather here to save you all, so please calm down. I promise you that no one will ever hurt you again, Landon said in a comforting tone. The girl teared up and looked at him emotionally. Thank you. Chapter 204 Destruction of the Underground Camp 2 Landon looked at the left and right tunnels at the back of the hall and turned to face the men. Follow the plan and be careful. Major General Gary, take your men and go left until you reach in Transu at the barn. Following behind you will be Warrant Officer Golden Fox, I'll free the prisoners on that side. As for me and my squad, well take the right wing until I reach entrance B. Of course Captain Thray, you and your men will follow behind me and get all slaves out. Oh. Idle Fox it's good that you're here. When they bring out the slaves, have some men place them in wagons and keep them safe. Also, I need you guys to load up all caged animals, bags of food, and money as well. In Landon's mind, his place had a lot of caged Farukoyas beasts. So why not send them back to Baymard and start making a zoo? Granted the animals were only those that were found in the Pino continent. But still, this was enough animal capital to start an attraction. Previously, he would have asked Santa to ship them to him. But since they were here, why not take them back as well? And for the grains, even if they had to fit them into four or five wagons, he would still load them up. He didn't want any fruits or any perishables, just seeds. Of course the last thing that he requested was for them to get all the coins in this camp. He was definitely going to rob no pline. The men nodded at Landon's command and went their separate ways. Dot. The torch lights flickered, casting an ominous glow through the left tunnel. After the hall, the tunnels remained well lit throughout, as the guards didn't think that someone could pass through all their defenses. Hence they lit the torches up, and became even more relaxed at their jobs. Some of them have been guarding this place for more than four years now and no one had ever dared to attack it. No Pline had constructed these underground camps within three years. And for five years now, these tunnels had been running smoothly without any hindrances. So of course the men would get lax. As Gary and his squad proceeded deeper into the tunnel, they immediately spotted another man seated on a table just outside a room, and standing by his side, were two huge night guards. They looked like club security bouncers. And from the screams that they heard from within the chamber or room that these men were guarding, they could more or less guess what was happening within the room. In essence, this snowpline guy had built these tunnels like an attraction. So after every point, there would be guards, as well as a fee collector that stood in front of different massive doors. Of course behind these doors, held the attraction itself. People paid, and stepped into these rooms or halls. Also, the attractions were spaced out, so that at least 40% of the sounds from each attraction would die down a bit. He didn't want the noise from one attraction to really affect the mode in another attraction. Also, one had to know that some of these rooms or small halls were used for having sexual pleasure with multiple men and women. So those who weren't having that now, didn't need to hear the sounds coming from those attractions. Right now, Gary and his squad were looking at the entrance to the first attraction. From outside, they could already hear screams from the audience. BCH, you better survive this round. I didn't pay all that money just to see you die first. You better die last SL. That way I can win at the end. Underscore. Once Gary and his squad had taken care of those three men outside the attraction, Warrant Officer Golden Fox who was following behind, 
immediately sent someone to take the five full bags of coins that were lying on the floor. Gary on the other hand, opened the door slightly dot 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 as he tried to spot where the guards in the hall were. There were a total of 15 guards within the room who were too focused on watching the show that they had failed to notice when Gary opened the door. The room was actually huge, and resembled a bull rodeo stage. The center of the stage was dug deeper, for this attraction. On the stage below the audience's seats, were six women who had been strapped to poles. Right now, there was a snow lion in front of them that was busy tearing off one of the women's shoulders off. From the looks of it, she was already dear but the lion wouldn't let her go. The lion was light greenish in color with white dots all over its body. Its mane was a darker shade of green to its body, and it was twice the size of an average lion back on earth. Honestly, one would think that the god in charge of this world was a cute princessy girl. I mean, most animals were cute fluffy, and had bright colors like pink, purple, red, blue, green and so on. In all shades, there were rarely animals that had mature colors black. Of course there were exceptions like horses that were black. And what was up with the sizes of these animals? In this world, a fully grown elephant was as tiny as a puddle. And a kitty cat was about the same size as a wolf. It was totally different from Earth's dynamics. Anyway, Gary and 14 of his men had dropped down and crawled through the door to the back of the audience's seats. Once they had settled down, each and every one of them pointed their guns at the 15 night guards that were stationed around the room. Everyone was so focused, that they failed to see anything wrong. For them, no pline was all powerful. So what could go wrong? Pewee, pewee, pewee. The guards fell face down, and the audience was confused. How could all of them fall down at once? The next thing they knew, the snow lion began to whimper in pain, as it fell to the ground. They couldn't understand what was happening, but it was obvious that after the guards had died, Gary and his men had pointed their guns at the lion's head. The animal had received six bullet shots at the back and left side of its head, since its front was facing the ladies on the poles. Before the audience could even react, Gary got up and said, Drop to the floor now. Those fat and skinny nobles all kneeled while shaking. One had to know that living things feared the unknown. For them, these men were supernatural beings who could kill someone from afar without an arrow. Oh kind and wise one. P. Please share us. W dot 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 we were also forced to come here as well wise ancestor, please be magnanimous and let us go. That's right. W. We were forced to watch all of this. Underscore. Pui, 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 Gary shot them without batting an eye. After everything that he had seen so far, he was truly disgusted with them. If they had owned up to their sins, then he wouldn't have killed them. But for them to say that they were forced to be here. Were they taking him and his Ken as fools? He was sure that some of them had already defiled and killed multiple girls and boys here. With his death, he was praying that those souls sleep well in the heavens knowing that they had been avenged. While Gary and his men took card of those nobles, Golden Fox and his squad hurried down to free the women and get them to keep safe. The women cried when they realized that they were finally saved. It was a miracle. They instinctively knelt down at Gary. Golden Foz and their men, and poured out their heartfelt gratitude to them. Gary looked at them and felt a sense of justice and accomplishment. But he knew that to save everyone else, he couldn't delay any further. Time was of the essence tonight. He hurriedly left and went on towards the next attraction room. His mission was far from over. Dot. The night proceeded smoothly, and just like that. Their mission was concluded. In the dead of night, they loaded up all the slaves, caged animals, grains and coins into wagons and escaped from the camp. Chapter 205 The Aftermath It was a brand new day. As the dawn sent shimmering rays of light throughout Treginal City, 
the musical songs of the animals resounded energetically, chirp, 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 cock a doodle doo -oo -oo -oo. the birds and the roosters sang in unison, everywhere felt wet as the dew danced beautifully on the fields and, springtime was truly nature's most beautiful season. The busy citizens were already up and ready to walk. Good morning Swanson. Morning Ferguson. Off to trade your goods with the other villages nearby. Yup. Dot. The earlier I get there, the more customers ill have. Underscore. Local merchant Swanson and some of the other local traders, were currently heading out of the city to trade with the towns and villages nearby. But when they got outside the city gate, they immediately became confused. Why were the people crowding outside the city gate and blocking the road? Presently, there were guards and other citizens surrounding the other side of the roads. One could say that Reginald City was on the left side of the wide road. While the crowd was facing the right side that was facing the forest region. Merchant Swanson quickly told his assistant to take care of his wagon, while he took a look. Coming closer, he was immediately taken aback by the long three meter wide hole in front of him. The hole was so deep that some of the trees had been completely buried underground by it. Swanson looked at the hole that spanned from the road into the forest region in fright. It was as if some powerful being had used his three meter wide finger into the ground, and dragged the same finger into the forest. Were the ancestors angry at something? Just yesterday, the trees within this area were standing tall and proud. So what exactly happened? In truth, when Landon and his men had left the city at 3.30 a.m. last night, he had bought explosives from the system, and had also paid the system set the whole thing up. And when he and his men were a little distance away from Reginald City, Landon blowed the underground cave up, and since he didn't want to accidentally kill the innocent people in the city from destroying this camp, destroying the cave from the right end of the road to entrance sea in the forest, was the only alternative. Actually, an hour before Swanson got up, he had heard some sort of loud noise coming from afar, but he didn't really think anything of it. But looking at the hole that seemed to be as deep as a three-story building, he couldn't help but shiver a little. What if the path that the heavens had chosen to destroy was directly under his house? Wouldn't he have died without even knowing it? He somehow felt that his ancestors had only done this to issue out a warning to Reginald City. He secretly swore in his heart that he would pray more, so as to let the heavens pity him. As he thought about how to offer more gifts and prayers to the heavens. Those around him made way immediately. The city lord had arrived. Looking at the scene, the city lord immediately knew what he should do. One had to know that he had been bribed by no plan to keep this camp a secret. But now that this camp was destroyed and such a rare phenomenon had occurred, he knew that he must report this matter to the queen no matter what. Of course he was only going to report the fact that the ground had collapsed and not the fact that no Pline was involved. If he didn't report it and the Queen heard about the sinking land from other people, she would for sure see him as an untrustworthy person. All the evidence had been destroyed underground, so who could prove that there was an underground camp here? Plus, no one would dare search no Pline's barn or restaurant. So he was good for now, and because of this, he was sure that the nobles would definitely have their eyes on him for the time being. So it was impossible for them to reconstruct the camp any time soon. They had previously used several slaves to build this camp in a span of three years. At that time, they only used a few slaves, so as not to raise suspicion. And of course once the camp was constructed, they killed the slaves so as to seal off the information from leaking. As for no Pline. He had decided to send him a letter explaining the entire situation, as well as all his findings within this time. His men had also said that not far away from here, there was another sinking land incident as well. He had immediately guessed that it was the other tunnel that led into the city. But when he wanted to take a look at the other sinking land, one of his night captains came over and whispered something into his ears and his eyes lit up instantly. Good. He had just gotten his first clue. Very quickly, he got on his noble steed and hurriedly took off towards the direction of the barn at entrance A. Dot. Once he arrived, 
he could still smell the foul stench blood and corpses lingering around the air. His dead men were lying in and around the perimeter of the barn. Insects were crawling on their pale whitish faces, as well as their mouths. Looking at his men lying cold on the ground, his quickly flared up. From the report he received, none of the men guarding any of the entrances had survived the night. Damn it! Dot 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 he had lost close to 1,000 men. For heaven's sake, that was 18% of his forces. 18%? Who the hell did this? Did they know how hard it was to train and secure men under the watchful eyes of the royals? He truly felt like crying. What did he do to that rogue villain to deserve such a punishment? And not only that. The bastard still had the nerve to take away 40% of his income by destroying the camp. One had to know that as one of Noplin's right-hand men, he had been getting bags of money daily. Whatever was made by the end of the month, he would ship 80% out to Noplin, and keep 20% for himself. From there he would use 5% to pay all his guards and use the rest for his luxurious lifestyle. With his monetary flow cut by 40%, how could he not be pissed off? They began to wonder who the real culprit was. Was it Queen Penelope? Did she already know about my deeds? Dot. No. It couldn't be her. She wouldn't dare to go against no pline if she knew about this scheme, he thought. Judging from the length and depth at which the land sank, he knew that this enemy was filthy rich. The only thing that could cause such a sink was snow powder and it was already freaking expensive. To destroy all these tunnels at once, that meant that his enemy had come to the city with about 15,000 knights, and had positioned them on ground level, on top of the underground camps. From there, the enemy probably ordered his men to shoot over 15,000 powder-filled tubes on arrows at once, and judging from the size of the holes, he was also sure that these men had shit these tubes for close to an hour before it could collapse. They probably shot 15,000 the first time, followed by another 15,000 and so on. This enemy had truly been prepared. But who the hell was the culprit? City Lord Morok, it's here. Chapter 206 The Aftermath to City Lord Morok, it's here, said one of his night captains. Morok hurriedly walked into the barn, and immediately found a parchment note that was stabbed with five knives around it to keep it from flying away. He quickly took the knives off, and read through the note silently. You don't need to look no further for the culprit. He'll let you in on a little secret. This is my revenge to your boss for trying to make me and my people his slaves. Who am I? Well, imlandinably, P.S. If reading this, then know that I've already left Corona for good. Oh and tell your boss that he'll see him soon all right. Thanks bro dot 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 bye. In truth, Landon had decided to use his mother's last name ably, so as to confuse them a little. Of course it wouldn't take long before they knew that he was indeed Landon Barn. But because ably was a common and well used peasant name, no one would ever think of him as nobility. And coupled with the fact that almost nobody knew his mother's last name, he knew that no Pline would sweat a little before figuring it out. First names were commonly between nobility and peasants. But last names were not. For example, a prince could be called Arthur, and a peasant could also be called Arthur. But a lowly slave or peasant could never have noble last names such as Pendragon. Also, if peasants succeeded and one day became rich, then they were required to change their last names and register it with their city lord. Hence the name Landon was a very common first name. And coupled with his last name ably, one would be a fool to believe that he was nobility. Plus which nobility would have their families almost sold into slavery. Come on. This was definitely a peasant. No Pline had over 20,000 men who were assigned to kidnapping and roping slaves in. So how could he remember all the slaves that passed by? There was no way that he would remember a name like Landon Ably. Morok was confused. Ably, Ably. Wasn't that a peasant's name? Morok had already formed a hypothesis in his mind. To him, this Landon character was definitely a lowly dog who had been building his forces for years in secret. All in hopes of getting revenge. He probably trained his peasant friends who escaped with him and planned this whole thing with them. It wasn't unheard of, 
for slaves to try and revolt against nobles. Of course no slave had ever succeeded, so this wasn't news. But it looked like this particular slave had really grown a bit, for him to bring over 15,000 men here all at once. He wouldn't be surprised if the bastard had also made his money through robbery. And the worst part of it all, was that the bastard had already left Corona for good. Who knew where he would be heading to next? Would he be going to Deifrus, Yodan, Arcadina, or Tariq? Just where the hell were they supposed to start their search from? On the bright side. He was happy that his enemies were peasants. This way, he could go all in and assist no pline with revenge when the time comes. He was still petty about losing money and part of his army. But no matter how impatient he was, he knew that there was nothing he could do for the time being. Right now, if he sent a letter to no pline who was currently at the empire of Tariq, he was certain that no pline would only get the message in five months time. Sailing to Corona from Tariq would take three months. And moving from the Dr. Noplin's home would take another two months ride by horseback. And before Boss Nopline decided to finally take action, wouldn't that take time as well? Sigh. He could only wait patiently. Dot. Time flew by and it was already 1 p.m. Landon and his group had just arrived Loplin Coastal City and were immediately greeted by a few of Santa's men who were on the lookout for them, as his men as well as Santa's men aided in boarding the slaves, as well as loading up the goods. Santa pulled Landon to the side and looked at him strangely. He had been worrying sick these past two days, just for his brother and his men to turn up unharmed. This was truly a mystery to him. I mean, now could his brother go in with less me than his enemies? and come out unharmed. Heck even his men were fine and dandy. But the funny thing was that he couldn't see any sword sheath around his brother's waist. Was this some kind of joke? He felt like this brother of his defied the heavens time and after time again. Bro. Has anyone ever told you that weird? Underscore. Dot. After everything was packed and good to go. Landon sailed away with 12 ships towards the next coastal city within Corona. So far, only 5 ships were in full use, while the rest were empty. Of course the slaves, animals and goods from the other cities will fill up the remaining 7 ships. And if they needed more, they could just buy them there. As for the money that they had gotten, Landon had given 10% of it to Santa. And had also planned on sharing 15% of it to the slaves. They could use this and immediately pay for their homes and food for at most two months when they get to Baymard. And after two months, he was hoping that all of them would have already secured jobs by then. Landon felt like for everything that they had been through, the least he could do was make their transition into Baymard somewhat easy. This wasn't Baymard's money after all. So giving some out wasn't a bad idea as well. Speaking of the money, they had racked up a hefty sum. They had found a tiny room within the camp that was used as a vault for storing money. There were bags and bags of coins ranging from gold, silver, and copper. Ah! This snowpline guy had really made them rich. The amount that they had received could sustain Baymard for an entire year if nobody worked. He was now curious about how much he would get from robbing the other underground camps. He gave Santa part of the money because, well he had a soft heart for people who were good to him. Buying one ship alone was expensive. But Santa had bought twelve. Granted. Santa could be seen as a millionaire who would soon be a billionaire. But that didn't mean that he wasn't making a loss from all of this. When Santa came to Baymard, he hadn't planned on paying for all these expenses. Hence Landon knew that Santa had made his fair share of sacrifices for this mission. Santa had already bought food for everyone, as well as paid for the ships, horses and so on. One could say that buying one of these massive arc-like ships was equivalent to spending 150k back on earth, but Santa had bought 12 of them just like that. With all this stolen money in his hands, wouldn't he be a douchebag to not give some back to his bro? One should never be too greedy in life. As for the wagons and horses that they had brought with them, Santa had immediately kept them in his estate here for future purposes. He was a merchant after all and transportation still costed him a hefty sum of money yearly. Set out, Landon commanded. The sails were raised, the anchor was pulled, 
and the men all left the city with huge smiles on their faces, their first mission had been 100% successful. Dot. While Landon and his men were secretly rejoicing in their hearts, others began wailing at their own predicaments. How the hell did this happen? Chapter 207 Running Out of Time The Capital, Empire of Yodan. Dot. The streets were busy and the people were all in celebratory spirits. It was already May. And three days from now, Third Prince Sirius MacLean would be crowned the new ruler of Yodan. When the people had heard about all that he had accomplished, they were indeed taken aback. He was responsible for making peace between Yodan and Deiferes. As well as sending relief food to various villages and so on. He had also captured and killed all members of several notorious blood gangs. Hence making some of the tiny villages and towns safe. Usually, nobles always focused more on cities. In doing this, they normally ended up forgetting about the simple places like the villages giving blood gangs the opportunity to lord over those places. But from serious deeds, one could see that he had focused in every community. Be it small or big. Just based on this, the people were extremely accepting of him. And from what they saw, this new king of theirs was hard-hearted when he needed to be, and soft when the time called for it. It was also said that he was a rare talent who was actually proficient in all his subjects. Be it sword fighting war tactics and so on. This kind of king was what the people thought a ruler should be like. But of course, not everyone was happy about Sirius' claim to the throne. Dot. Pa. A cup had just been sent flying towards a group of kneeling men. You ingrates. Dot. You useless buffoons. You. You. Ah. How many times have you disappointed us already? For heaven's sake. The brat's coronation day is in three days' time, and you still haven't been able to touch him yet? Queen Ivy yelled out angrily, as she immediately lost her noble composure. The trembling men were frightened silly from her outburst. Their shoulders shook slightly, and their breathing became unsteady. Their hearts were about to explode from fear as they looked at their demons of a queen. In their hearts, they began to say a silent prayer for their lives. If they could turn back the hands of time, they would definitely beat their past selves for ever agreeing to work for such a lunatic. But it was too late now. They could never escape her, till death took them away. Escaping meant that their families would be hunted down and killed. Which was something they would never allow. Doing her bidding was the only way for them to survive. Ivy held her hands against her temples and lightly massages them, while looking up to the ceiling. She felt like if she kept on looking at them, she wouldn't be able to resist the urge to strangle them with her bare hands. They had just one job. One job. And they couldn't do it. Bloody hell. They had eight whole months to deal with the small wimp. Yet they had failed her time and time again. What was the point of having such useless men by her side? She needed to get rid of that brat, third Prince Sirius. So that her beloved son, Prince Malfoy, could claim the throne as his. In truth, it wasn't the fault of her henchman. Sirius had been hiding too deep all through these years. Right from a young age, he had been making his moves and setting up secret bases here and there. In fact, even till this day, no one knew that he was the owner of one of the most popular intel organizations within the empire. As well as the owner of many apothecary buildings, as well as merchant stores. He had spread his influence in almost every aspect of life. So how could he not know that they were trying to kill him? He had men, and spies that worked in ordinary places like the markets and even the farmlands. Ever since he was little, he had made up his mind to visit every village town or city before he became king. So he had gathered a lot of followers, as well as a lot of people who had helped him in his journey. His goal had always to become king, so he had worked him in accomplishing it. And to make matters worse, he was never in the capital. So tracking him was a little difficult for the men to do. Since he did a lot of things around the empire, he was always on the move. So no one could ever know his exact location. Even if assassins were hired, it would take them days or even months to get to where they thought he was. Of course by the time they got there, he would be gone. No one except for his second-in-command knights, 
knew his schedule, not even his mother or royal father knew of his moves, in his mind, what they didn't know couldn't kill them, hence getting rid of him was no child's play, if ice men had tried to tail him several times, but they couldn't keep up with his moves, he was indeed a tricky one, dot. Damn it! Why are you all so useless? Ivy yelled, ah dot 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 what happened to your confidence earlier? Didn't you say that it was indeed a guaranteed job he he he? So the all-powerful first queen could also produce the same results as I did? It seems like you have indeed lost your touch. Second queen Cedora mocked several months ago. She had teamed up with her nemesis, Queen Ivy, in hopes of dealing with third prince Sirius. To Cedora, this agreement was very clear. Step 1, kill Sirius together. Step 2, fight amongst each other until one of their sons sits on the throne. Even though Cedora was annoyed at the fact that they hadn't killed Sirius, she still didn't forget to rub Ivy's failure to her face. A few days ago when her own men had reported that they had failed the mission, Ivy mocked her and by saying that she could only produce such weak results, and at that time, she felt like she should take a dagger and slit the throats of these men who embarrassed her in front of her enemy. But today, the same woman who mocked her had still produced the same result as she did. So how could she not mock Ivy? On the other hand, if eyes could kill, Cedora would be dead by now. Ivy looked at her coldly, and decided not to give in to Cedora's provocations. The BCH was indeed asking for a beating. Enough, Dot. Let's focus on the task at hand, she said, while walking down steadily towards the kneeling men. Don't be so nervous all right. Dot. I promise he'll forgive you all this time, Ivy said playfully. When the men heard her, they immediately became fearful. Her? Huh? Forgive them. Impossible. They all looked at her silently as she approached them with a scary smile on her face, underscore. Ivy looked at them and smirked, they were the reason for today's disgrace. To be humiliated in front of her enemy Cedora, was the biggest shame that she could experience. In her mind, once they completed their mission, she would cut off their manhood, then slowly slice off their body parts, as well as burn their family members alive. Forgive them. Dot. Never. It'll give you all one last chance to redeem yourselves. Since the brat is presently staying here at the palace, I expect no slip-ups or excuses. I want him dead by all means. Whether you have to poison him, drown him, stab him, or even bore him to death, I don't care. Within these three days, all I want are results. Chapter 208 Mr. Death is a hot commodity in Domia City. The Empire of Arcadine. Dot. I sh be a little gentle will you, said a young man who was currently in pain. The immense pain had taken up a portion of his brain, as if dealing with it was expending all his brain power. For some reason, although the injured part hurt a lot, his brain kept receiving pain flashes, as waves of unbearable pain had washed over him, making him want to scream out in agony. His entire body felt like it had been run over by twenty horses, his butt felt like it had several boils on it, and his entire body felt like it would break apart any minute now. He couldn't eat. He couldn't sleep. He couldn't sit. And because of all these things, the man had become unbelievably cranky. The healers around the man were also somewhat helpless with the situation as well. They had been scolded by the man who had wanted his injuries to heal up by the end of the month, but that would be sorcery, from their point of view. Given the severity of his injuries, he would need at least six months before he was fully healed. They could only sigh helplessly at his antics. He indeed looked pitiful. The man's left cheek was swollen hard, as it had a very vibrant reddish-purple color to it. It was clear that whoever punched him, must have definitely used his full force as even the injury had another injury on top of it. There were several torn patches of skin on the man's swollen cheek, making it look a polka-dotted injury of purple and red. And that was not all, leaving his face and trailing down to his lower body. One could see that the young man had other purple welts scattered across his chest, back and right arm, like a contagious disease. At this point, even breathing to him was somewhat painful for him. 
as his ribcage was almost broken by his enemies. From the looks of it, he was stabbed with a sword at his lower belly, shot with an arrow at his right arm and back, as well as punched multiple times in different locations. Who was this man who had been beaten to a pulp? He he he. He was indeed the cowardly bootlicking third prince of Arcadina, James Barn. James truly aggrieved with his current situation. He had requested for the Empire of Terek to hand Lili, and had even promised to give them 60% of Arcadina's land. But how come Eli was fine, while he was lying here barely being able to breathe, damn it? Dot. He should have never believed those Terek scoundrels. Back to his situation, when he was sleeping in camp. He had met with six assassination attempts, all of which had left him with several injuries all over his body. He felt like those assassins were thugs rather than professionals. They would punch him, and laugh, while poking his eyes, and stabbing him here and there. Sure, he was a scumbag. But did he really deserve such treatments from his enemies? They had even slapped him and stepped in his neck and ribs multiple times. Funny enough. They said that they were just there to play with him. In his mind, he only had one question, which of his brothers did it? After thinking for a while, he had decided to pin all the blame on Eli. Connor often told him all his secrets and was also stupidly good to him. So in his mind Eli was the culprit. He had been deceiving and fooling Connor into telling him all his plans, so for him Connor was indeed a fool who would never harm him. Dot. Once the healers were finished with their work, James hurriedly called his second in command over. Since the men from Terry couldn't really aid him in killing Eli anymore. As Eli was presently around the heavily guarded central part of Arcadina, James had decided to hire a professional. How was it? He asked impatiently. Your Highness. Dot 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 he agreed. Mr. Death has agreed to see you. Ha 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 ha. Excellent. If I can get the number one assassin to kill that royal brother of mine, then he'll finally be one step closer to the throne, James said excitedly. The knight looked at him and sighed. This was the way noble families were. Talk less of royals. Everyone always wanted the throne, and killing for it was a normal phenomenon. Erm. Um, but do you think that he will agree? James asked anxiously. Your Highness. For me what I know. He only agrees to jobs that pay well. If you have the money, then he will agree. The knight replied. This was indeed a problem for James. Previously, he had spent most of his money in buying the loyalty of the citizens, as well as bribing the ministers and noble families. So he was really low on cash and now. It seemed like he would have to borrow it from his brother Connor. Normally, he would have asked his mother. But ever since his useless sister Jeanette died, his mother's situation had gotten a lot worse, I mean. If she wanted to die so badly, why couldn't she have done it next year or the year after that? Right now, father was displeased with mother. So how could father favor him? His stupid sister had died and made his standing worse. And his mother who used to be smart, had somehow grown a melon brain. The dead can never come back. So why suffer yourself so much? He had seen his mother's disgusting appearance a while ago, and immediately understood his dad's point of view. Ugh. She looked hideous, and even the smell she oozed out could kill a rat. Maybe it was because he grew up understanding that women are beneath him, so he didn't have any sort of special feeling for his mother. After all, when he was younger, he could see her only about four times a week. At that time. She was busy planning and scheming on how to be Alec Barnes' most favored woman. And now, she was almost a stranger to him. Anyway, after thinking for a while, James immediately made up his mind to get the money from Connor. Hiring Mr. Dot Death was the only way to guarantee Elis' death. Dot. Drapern City, the Empire of Arcadine. Dot. Connor was deep in thought. Surprisingly while he was fighting at the borders, he met with no assassins. It seems like his brothers didn't care to take care of him at all. He knew that James wouldn't do anything, but he was surprised that Eli didn't attack him as well. It seemed like he was the only one who was wary of them. What a bunch of idiots. Yes. During that time, he had sent assassins to both James and Eli. He sent assassins to play with James, 
as it would be suspicious if both brothers died at once. He had hired them to break James' body, so that he wouldn't be able to walk around for a while. For Eli, he had requested for them to kill him. His plan was simple. When Eli died and father saw that James was badly injured, father would have no choice but to make him the crown prince. But who would have thought that Eli would survive and ruin all his plans? He had to think fast. Right now, he had already got a reply from the number one assassin Mr. Death. Long story short, he also needed several bags of coins to please such a man. Unfortunately, he was somewhat short of cash. After all, he too had bribed people to his side a while ago. He reckoned that judging from the large sum of money used for his campaign, he would only be able to recover it all by the end of next year. He had gone all out, and at the end, the crown prince was still Eli. What a pity. In his mind, he had concluded that he would borrow the money from his mother instead. No matter what, Eli had to die. Hence, he was willing to spend any amount to kill him. And just like that, both brothers had been granted an audience with the famous Mr. Death. Dot. Whitewood City, the Empire of Arcadina. Dot. While his brothers were busy plotting on him, Eli was rather relaxed as he was looking forward to something else. Before he left the borders his men had told him about how they were disgraced by his bastard brother Landon. Surprisingly, he was still alive. But the funny thing was that he was now a bona fide savage. He had heard that his clothes and shoes were so tattered that they looked like a dog had chewed on them. Previously, he wanted to wait until he came back to the capital before sending his men to attack Landon. But his subordinates pleaded that they wanted to go ahead and deal with the brat, so he had sent them on their way with 1,300 men several months ago. And judging from the distance from his camp, to Baymard. Dot 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 they should be arriving any time soon. Finally, Baymard would soon be mine. Chapter 209 More Enemies Riverdale City, the Empire of Arcadine. Dot. You lazy good for nothing. Get back to work, yelled an arrogant supervisor as he observed the workers on the fields. He picked up a stone and shot it at the back of a 35-year-old man who only wanted to rest for a few minutes. They as workers, worked for 10 whole hours with only 15 minutes of break time. So of course he was tired. His bones felt broken, and his body felt weak and fragile. There was a certain level of tiredness, that equated to death. He felt like he would collapse any time, as he could feel his heart rate speed up, his head aches, and his brain tingled. He could only sigh at his own misfortune. Who asked him to be born poor? He immediately sucked up all the pain that he felt, and got back to work. He had his wife and children to feed. So this so-called headache could wait. The fields were about thirteen the size of industrial tea or banana plantations. With over a thousand workers on those fields daily. And with so many people there. It was only right for numerous supervisors to patrol and inspect the workers regularly. Presently, Major General Mark and his comrades were busy tilling the soil by the gates, when they saw twelve hooded men walking into the city. Tristan, Jayan, Wonpo. Follow them. Mark ordered in a whispery tone as he continued to till the fields. Tristan who was working on a farm bed beside Mark, immediately nodded and secretly took a look at the supervisor. The guy was currently busy scolding another worker, hence he wasn't paying attention to any of them. Tristan did several hand signals, and another comrade beside him threw out a chalk stick towards him. Since the chalk stick looked like ordinary clay or stone, no one would be suspicious of them even if they caught them. Hence they had decided that it was okay to bring this item with them. Plus it was sort of perfect for disguises and appearances as well. Tristan hurriedly stroked the chalk stick on his palms, and evenly rubbed it all over his face. Of course he didn't put too much, as it would look fake. What he was aiming for, was to make his face look pale and sickly. He had also added traces of dirt on his face so as to show that he had worked hard all day long. B then washed his hands with some of the water from his jug, and then proceeded to crush a tomato with his hands. From there, he mixed the crushed tomato with water, 
and cleaned up his surroundings. Swish, swish, swish. He placed the tomato mixture into his mouth and swished it vigorously. And after that, he his show. They were at work and they had supervisors here, so the only way to escape would be to show them that they were almost dying from sickness. He then signaled for his men to start the show, and immediately dropped to the ground. Tristan, Tristan. What's wrong with you? Yelled out Wampo emotionally. Don't leave us bro. Dot. Jian yelled. Instantly, everyone around the area, including the supervisor. What was happening over there? Blah. Tristan had vomited the tomato mixture dramatically. Was that blood? Oh my heavens. Just look at his pale face. It's so white. Do you think he'll die soon? Yup. He's dead for sure. I knew it. Dot. The land is cursed. I believe you too. Can't you see that the dead warrior's evil magic is calling him on? Underscore. The supervisor on the other hand, didn't go any closer to Tristan. As he felt that it was below his status to do so. Sure, he was a peasant. But there were levels to every societal class. He was a high class peasant who had worked his way to the top and well even friends with middle class people like merchants and healers. He had attended middle class parties, and was even considered super wealthy to most of the low and medium class peasants. Right now, these workers on the fields were locals peasants. So how could he lower his status by going over the? He held out a bluish handkerchief closer to his nose, and pretended that it was smelly. Well. It wasn't more like he was pretending. His mind had always associated these low class peasants as smelly and dirty. So of course his mind had also come to the conclusion that their puke was also foul. How could these people who eat garbage, puke anything that smelled remotely okay? In fact, he was sure that he could get the stench all the way from where he was standing. But little did he know yet it was all in his head. For heaven's sake. It was just crushed tomatoes okay? Ugh. Disgusting, he thought. Supervisor Mowgli, if we don't take him away right now, he'll die here. Jian said that he pretended to be anxious. When Mowgli heard them, he froze for a moment. Having people die on the fields was definitely unacceptable. These people were too superstitious. If anyone ever died on the fields itself, then the workers would think that the fields are cursed. In fact if a worker died on the roads along the farms, no one would have any qualms about it. But if they died on the farms itself, no one would come to work again. One had to know that these farmlands were once a large cemetery. And it took over seven years of convincing from city lord Shannon's father, before the matter was dropped. But even at that, from generation to generation, Ghost folk stories had always been told about the land being cursed. It was believed that an evil soldier was accidentally buried here, which led in the land becoming cursed. It was believed that because the man's wife came from Riverdale City, he had decided not to curse the entire land. Just the cemetery where he was buried in. The people had myths for everything. And to make matters worse, some five years ago, four elderly men died on the fields making the men frightened. It was believed that their souls were yanked out and eaten by the evil enemy buried within the fields. Of course the people refused to work again. But when city lord Shannon threatened to kill their families, they of course had no other choice but to do their jobs fearfully. Now that city lord Shannon dead, supervisor Mowgli couldn't afford to let another person die on the fields again. Sure, Marder was now the new city lord. But who knew if the brat had the same zeal as his father? In Mowgli's opinion, Marder felt short when he compared him to Shannon. And he wasn't sure that the boy could control the people. If someone did die, the people would definitely strike, and his paycheck would also be halved. No. Dot. He must never let that happen. You and you. Dot 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 quickly, carry him out of here. Don't worry about your jobs. Just get him out now. Grah. Tristan moaned as he was lifted and carried away by Wampo and Jian. They had to find those hooded men fast. Chapter 210 More Enemies 2 Once the men got far away from the fields, they immediately decided to split up. The streets were busy and packed, but after spending several minutes searching, 
all three soldiers had finally locked onto their targets. 42 minutes after they split up, Tristan immediately spotted some of the men currently loading several jugs and food items onto several wagons. As for Wonpo, after 20 minutes, he also spotted another group who were seemingly walking around in hopes of knowing Baymard's current situation. And for Jian, he too spotted several men who were also looking for intel on Baymard. It seemed like these men were indeed heading towards Baymard. And just like that, night had reached and these men had still not left. Even those that were tasked with buying food, still went over to pubs and pretended to be drunk, so as to suck out more information from the men around them. Tristan, Wonpo and Jian analyzed everything that they had asked for. And at around 7p.m, all of them stopped following the men and headed back to their inn. Dot. While Tristan and his men were out, Mark had already closed for the day. Hence he was currently in the inn with the girls. Any new findings? Dot. Mary, you start. He said in a whispery tone. One should know that the walls of their bedrooms were super thin, and could easily leak out information to their enemies if they weren't careful. Major General. From what I've found out, those two hooded men who arrived here last week were only here to spy on Marder Shannon. From the conversation that they had. They were apparently sent by a certain Baron Kane. That was all I could get from a listening in on their conversation. Mary answered. Several questions popped in and out of Mark's head immediately. Who the hell was this Baron Kane guy? Was he a potential threat to them? Forget it. Since this Kane guy wasn't looking for Baymard's trouble, then they would stay out of his way. But His Majesty said that they had to pay attention to news about all powerful people around so he would definitely keep his ears towards Baron Kane's matters. After all, just because they weren't enemies now, didn't mean that they wouldn't be in future. Everything was a 50-50 chance. Hence since he knew about these people now, it was beat for him to know their characters. So as to advise his majesty better on future matters. You did good Mary. Dot 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 now Josephine. It's your turn. Major General. I was able to free the slaves from the wagons just a little distance away from Riverdale. I stalked the wagons for a full 30 minutes before making my move. Later on, I sent them to Baymard under your name. Josephine replied. Actually. The previous day when she saw how those slaves were beaten and whipped, she almost couldn't control her emotions. She used to be a slave roo so seeing them experience what she used to go through was really heart-wrenching to watch. Humans were really brutal beings. On the city square, she had watched her they had stoned a nine-year-old boy to death just for fun. And they had also cut out a twelve-year-old girl's right hand off, because she dirtied a noble lady's gown. If not for Ava who was holding her hands firmly, she was sure that she would've brought it her dagger and killed them. But by then, their cover would've been blown. No matter what they saw in the daytime, she as a farmer's wife. Was meant to act weak and docile. Hence she needed to work on controlling her emotions more. They could only act out during the night, so she could only patiently wait before freeing the slaves. Excellent Josephine. Dot. As for Ava. Give me your report. Major General. Marda Shannon still hasn't made any major moves yet. He's still laying low and building his forces in secret. With his father's forces gone, he is indeed lacking enough knights. Oh. And he still believes that his father died three towns away from here. So Baymard is for sure safe from his watchful eyes. That's good to hear. Well done Ava. In fact. All of you have done well. Thank you Major General Mark. They all replied. That reminds me, Private Ava, where did you run off to two nights ago? Mark asked with a mischievous smile on his face. Josephine and Mary giggled, as they thought about what Ava had told them. Ava had gone to take care of the person who had been stalking Mark. Well, everyone around knows that the three women were indeed very ugly. Dot 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 due to their disguises. So of course the women would be jealous when they saw that such handsome men had stick to them like glue. A while back, a certain 23-year-old baroness who had lost her husband, had seen the 24-year-old Mark tilling the fields with his sweat dripping off his body so seductively. But when he looked up and their eyes met, 
she felt like her heart had stopped for a second. Heavens he was handsome, no matter what, she had to have him. Usually, she would never ever stoop so low as to look at a lowly peasant, but this guy gave her second thoughts. From then on, she began stalking him like a wild animal, who was hot for its prey. She had sent her men to find out more about him and what he loved and hated but the results were indeed humiliating. How could a man who looked like the gods were crestined from his image, choose to be with the lizard? It didn't make any sense at all. Did he owe that ugly toad some life debt or something? Was that it? No matter how she looked at it, that indeed seemed to be the case. Hence she decided to take matters into her own hands on his behalf. With this, she began making Ava's life unbearable. She would order her men to beat up Ava and ask her to leave her husband. But since Ava was supposed to act docile and timid, she would ball up on the floor and accept the beatings. The good thing was that, because she was already ugly, the men didn't feel the need to destroy her face. Hence they only hit her back or belly. Rape her? No way in hell. The woman was very hideous and revolting. You dot 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 his wife was so ugly that just looking at the monster's face, made them want to throw up. Ava on the other hand, had her own plans in this matter. How could she ever let them go? Every night, she would severely injure one of them and make it look like an accident. That way, no one would suspect that it had anything to do with her. And of course to end it all, she had decided to sneak into the Baroness chambers and cut off all her hair right from the roots two nights ago. She had done this after placing sleeping powder into the woman's tea. And now, the noble lady was bald. She did it so low, that anyone on earth would think that the baroness was a widow who shaved off all her hair. Long story short. Ever since then, no one had come up to make her life difficult again. H.M.P. Dot. Who asked her to have silly thoughts about her man. Serves her right. Just as they were rounding up their conversation, Tristan came in, followed by Wampo a few minutes later, finally Gian. Dot. So you're saying that they were asking about Baymart? Avo asked. Yeah. And they bought a ton of food too. They were probably camping somewhere around here. Tristan said while nodding and reaching for an apple on the tiny table in the room. Tomorrow. The enemy might attack. And it's our duty to alert our people. So Tristan, you'll do the honors. Firstly, Tristan was so sick that he was sure that the supervisor wouldn't mind if Tristan didn't show up for a day or two. So it was safe for him to leave the city and warn Baymard. At least let them know, so that they could easily mobilize and organize the men at the city wall. Tristan, if my guess is correct. The enemy probably has a lot of spies watching Riverdale's city gates, as well as the road towards Baymard. Hence if they see you heading towards Baymard, they might think that you've caught onto their plot. Or that you have ulterior motives. So when you leave, head in the opposite direction and use the swamps to turn around. And when you're a safe distance away from their grasp, use the road and head on straight. You may leave now. Chapter 211 The Future Queen Takes Charge The Outskirts of Riverdale City, Arc 18.11a.m. Somewhere outside the city. 1302 knights had already woken up, cleaned up dot 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 as well as had their fill, Titus, I think we should leave now, just thinking about how I'm going to tear that arrogant brat into pieces, really gets me excited, said Brody eagerly, how could he not be delighted, he had been waiting for this day since the day that they left Baymard last year in October, he was slapped, and even had his right foot stabbed by the SHTX prince several months back. Of course when he joined his master, Eli, at the border, he immediately pleaded and begged to hurriedly rush back to the base and gather more men to slaughter the scoundrel, and throughout his entire journey back, he had been having pleasant dreams about all the ways that the bastard ex-prince would die from his hands. He felt like letting Landon die on the battlefield was too good for him. So he had planned to catch the rogue alive, and kill him by boiling. He would place Landon in a large cauldron, and boil him to death. And after that, he would personally drink the blood broth and even grind the bones with his teeth. Even in death, he had planned to never let Landon go. Calm down Brody. Well get going soon. Oh. 
Did you send out the messenger? The broadsworded Titus replied. Brody smiled and gathered an ample amount of spittle in his mouth. K.I. P.U.E. I sent him out an hour ago. He ha he but whether they agree to the terms or not, my mind has already been made up. All of them have to die. Brody said while climbing onto his horse. Titus looked at Brody and grinned in agreement. The last time he came with Brody, they were utterly humiliated and had left the scene with their tails dangling between their legs. They had never faced such a situation in their entire lives. If word got out, their reputations would be tarnished forever. This was a strong eat sweet world after all. So if people knew that they were humiliated by a trashy ex-prince, wouldn't they automatically become the biggest joke within Arcadina? Heck. Dot. Forget about Arcadina, everyone who could identify them within the Pino continent would look down on them too. They might even have to change their names because of this incident. Reputation was everything. People only hired the best. Dot. No one would look for the 500th assassin, when they could hire those within the top 20. Likewise, no one would give out official assignments to incompetent people. Luckily, their kind and noble master, Prince Eli had kept the matter secret. Hence their subordinates, as well as their other comrades, dot 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 didn't know of their shameful experience. If word got out, even the men below them would lose respect for them. No matter how they saw it, that villain, ex-Prince Landon, was the cause of all shame when facing their master. Move out, Brody commanded, dot. Baymard, dot. Standing beside the tall majestic fortified walls, were Lucy, Lucius, Josh and several other warrant officers. Yesterday, Tristan had arrived at 11p.m to warn them about a possible attack within the next few days. Hence today at 6a.m, once the soldiers woke up, all of them had been informed about this upcoming threat. Princess Lucy, are you prepared? Lucius asked as he looked at Lucy warmly. She too was somewhat of a daughter to him, since she was practically raised with Landon from a young age. He sometimes wondered what her real barren father would do, when he realized that the daughter he had thrown away, was now the future queen of an upcoming empire. I'm 75% confident that he'll get it right. But if I make any mistakes, I know that you and Major General Josh will give me all the aid that I need. Lucy answered with a warm smile on her face as well. It would be a lie to say that she wasn't nervous. This responsibility was indeed a huge one. Before her fiancé left, he had told her that she and Lucius would be in charge of making all military decisions during his absence. She was dumbfounded at the thought of commanding an army. What if she messed up? Luckily. Lucius and Josh would aid her during this period. So she felt more relieved. In truth, apart from Queen Penelope, Lucy would now the second woman to ever command an empire's battle force within the Pino continent. Landon's thinking was simple. Forget the matter that she was a woman. She was the future queen. And if something should ever happen to him, Landon expected his wife to be able to protect the land and its people when they were younger. Lucy would sometimes protect him by taking beatings for him. Or even fighting with others. But at the end whether she lost or not, she would always forgive them. He had fainted once from the beatings, and had heard that she blocked several other whiplashes while he passed out. And of course she forgave them again. But did those who she forgave stop troubling them? Dot. Nope. They always came back with more energy to give out the same beatings all over again. This was a flaw in Lucy's character. She was simply too saintly for this era. She would always make even the devil look like a good guy. A king didn't need someone who would bring more troubles to the kingdom. What he needed was someone with a good heart and a tough will to fight for his people. If the enemy had said sorry to Lucy, Lanyon was sure that she would forgive the enemy immediately and let Hesh go. Lucy had a good heart, but that was not enough. Hence to toughen up her character, he needed her to take control for a while. She had also been taking some military courses as well so as to make her understand the consequences of her kindness towards her enemies. Of course, he also had her do combat training, so that if she ever got attacked, 
she would be able to protect herself without waiting for a knight in shining armor. Anyway last night, she had been discussing Baymard's attack plan for over two hours with the Warren officers, as well as Josh and Lucius. Initially, she felt sad for her enemy, but when she realized that they would kill the people, herself and Landon, she immediately steeled her heart. Her fiancé was right. She was too weak-willed. Chapter 212 Broken Nuts Time flew by and a rider slowly approached the gates. Lucy, Lucius and Josh had already been informed of this rider's appearance from the scouts. From the looks of it, this person was an official messenger. Dot. Halt. The rider was confused. Why would they stop him before he could even get close enough to the gate? In truth, he was somewhat fascinated by the tall stone-like wall in front of him. It was taller than any city wall he had ever seen. Even the capital city wall wasn't this tall. It looked impressively formidable and sturdy. It was definitely worth it, for his master Prince Eli, to take the land. As he continued to observe the scene before him, several ragged-looking men approached him on horseback. He looked at their appearances and couldn't help but show a bit of disdain towards them. Indeed, they looked like wild beasts. As they approached, he subconsciously held his nose in fear of their stench. Stop right there. We can speak from this distance, so don't get any closer. The messenger yelled while pointing at them. The soldiers who had arrived, secretly looked at each other and grinned. Hey old man. Enough chit chat, what do you want? One of them said arrogantly. Yeah? Are you here to give us money, TCH? Of course it's to give us money, why else would he come? Underscore. The soldiers were always taken as rogue savages, so why not act the part out completely? You. You. Do you know that I'm an official messenger who is highly favored by the crown prince himself? Anyway, I don't have time to talk with you lowly street rats. I'm only here to discuss war times with your bastard leader so lead me to him now. He yelled out angrily. How dare these savages talk to him like this. He was so mad that his heart felt like it would pop out of his chest any second now. The men bowed up their fists, as they heard this loathsome fellow call their king a bastard. They sucked it up and smiled at him mischievously. It was only a matter of time, before everyone would know of their king's true glory. By then, they wouldn't need to keep acting and accepting such blatant insults from anyone. All right. We've heard you. But since you called our leader a bastard, you'll have to stay here and wait for our leader here. After all, how could someone as noble as you step into a bastard's home? One of the men said with a sarcastic smile on his face. The rider didn't know how else to refute them so he could only curse them silently within his heart as he waited for their bastard leader appear. Dot. After a while, the rider looked up and saw five people riding towards him. There were Herculean men, riding alongside a beautiful little girl who was currently all dressed up in a red attire. Compared to the other savages, her attire appeared clean. Even though it still looked cheap and outworn, when they arrived, everyone, including the rider, finally got off from their horses and approached each other steadily. Speak. What do you want? Lucy said, as she tried to make her voice sound as cold as possible. She had been undergoing military speech and body language training with Lucius. So she knew that if she came off as weak, the enemy would never take her seriously or even respect her. She needed to be seen as fearless and powerful in their eyes. The messenger looked at her for a while and burst out laughing. But of course the more he laughed, the more Lucy's temper flared up. Bah ha ha. Dot. Don't tell me that all you brawny men have chosen to follow a woman. Isn't this just too shameful? Bah ha ha. In his mind, Landon was probably dead or sick. Maybe that was why he wasn't here. But just by looking at the stunning beauty before him, he had already come up with a hypothesis to back his thoughts. She was a harlot, a cheap floozy and a pretentious skank who had probably slept with all of them. If not, then why would these people willingly follow a woman around like stray dogs? It would seem that her horror-like services were indeed top-notch if she could control these men. Ha ha ha. No for real. Where is your leader? Asked the laughing messenger, 
who was now tearing up while holding his belly in pain. He had laughed so hard that it hurt his belly. Is this a joke to you? Lucy said while trying to rein in her temper. Erm. Um, pardon me little girl. But do you really want me to believe that you can lead them? Please. You probably got this position by spreading your legs for all of them right? You can never be anything more because you are a woman. So stop deceiving yourself. You are at most to SL who. And before he could finish his sentence, Lucy had already taken action. Slap. She had worked so hard in training, yet this fool dared to insult her. What's worse, he dared to question her virtue in front of her face. She was mad as hell. In fact not just her but everyone else was pissed off as well. How dare dare this ignorant son of a BCH insult their future queen. If she hadn't slapped him at that moment, they were sure that they would've sliced off his neck just like that. Ah. Dot. You slapped me? You. A lowly peasant woman slapped me? Do you know who the F I am? Exclamation mark. Yelled the messenger as he massaged his swollen jaw while looking at her with bloodshot eyes. He quickly calmed himself down and smiled at her maliciously. Little Giri, a while back, you all denied my master, Prince Elis request to own Baymard. If you all had just accepted his previous offer of being his slaves, then some of you might have survived. But now, retribution has come for you all. This time, he had sent his men to take the land and kill every single one of you. As the messenger spoke, Lucy's heart became even more cold. Become slaves? Dot dot never. When she thought of all the children in her classes, and all the people who gave her warm smiles, she couldn't help but want to slap her former self's thoughts. Only by completely eradicating her enemies, would Baymard remain safe. It was time for her to grow up. Little girl, I had initially come here to date and negotiate, and give you all a second chance in becoming my master's slaves. But since you've slapped me, then don't blame me for taking back this privilege. But if you apologize to me now, then when the time comes, I'll be sure to keep you by my side so that you'll know what true luxury feels like. In exchange, you'll have to warm this daddy's sped. So, are you going to kneel and beg? or not, the man said arrogantly, Lucius and Josh kept looking at Lucy, for any signal to attack this loathsome prick, but Lucy smiled at them and shook her head slightly, they all thought that she had given up on taking revenge, as they knew that their future queen was indeed too kind and soft-hearted, Lucy then smiled innocently, and walked slowly towards the buffoon, ha 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 ha, good, you finally recognized his daddy's status right? Come on. Kneel down to me. Ha 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 ha. This is all a whore is good at. The man said proudly, as if he was proving a point. The soldiers thought that she was actually willing to kneel for their sakes, so they began to feel like they had failed his majesty Landon. They immediately started questioning whether their training methods on Lucy was right or wrong. Either way, no one ever blamed her because they knew how pure and simple-minded she was, as they saw they slightly bent towards the man, their final thought was that they had failed their king, but what happened next completely surprised them, bam, ow, dot, my generation, my generation, the messenger was now lying on the ground, while rolling and cupping his little man with his hands, it hurt so bad, that tears began to flow from his eyes unknowingly, f, it hurt so bad, actually, Lucy wasn't bowing. She was gaining momentum for her kick. When she bent, she raised her right leg toward the back, and used her full force to hit the villain's nuts. She had learned that she was supposed to use this move if she was taken hostage by a man or attacked. But who cares? This guy was a villain, so he deserved to have such treatments. The other soldiers looked at the man groveling on the ground and subconsciously grabbed their own little men as well, they began to look at the man with pity, that move was indeed too brutal, the former had probably had his nuts broken by this move, could he ever use this thing again in future, he couldn't help but look at him and sigh, r.i.p to your little man bro, you b.c.h. you whore, you dot 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 you, he said while trying to gasp for air, i, 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 what, let me tell you, we will never be your slaves. 
and we will never give Baymar to you all. So run along like a little dog, and tell your friends that we will never surrender, Lucy said. The men looked at their future queen and smiled, while still subconsciously cupping their little men. It seemed like their training had indeed paid off. Chapter 213 Baymard's Second Battle The clouds moved in the afternoon sky, kissing up a portion of the sun's warmth, and on top of Baymard's city wall, peered several eyes that kept looking at the road ahead patiently. Flap, flap, flap. A large flock of birds flapped out from the trees as if to announce the enemy's arrival. The pissed-off messenger, quickly turned around and his eyes lit up. Finally, his saviors were here. He would for sure, make these savages look bad in the eyes of Captain Brody and Captain Titus. Captains, captains. You won't believe how these savages treated me. The messenger wailed shamelessly, as he ran towards them. Gallop, 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 gallop. The valiant horses leapt ahead majestically as the uneasy wind stirred across their bodies. The soft spring soil was no match for their hooves, as they marched on forward leaving only deep horse footprints in the ground. Eh, something wasn't right with the sight before them. As the muscular knight captains approached, they immediately became puzzled as they began observing the gigantic city wall before them. Was this really how they remembered it? If so, then why did it seem so different now? Was Baymar actually different from what they currently knew? And why were there so many painted stones lying around the field in an organized manner? As several thoughts popped into their heads, they began to subconsciously raise their guards even more. But of course when they heard the messenger's detailed explanation, they immediately felt that they were worrying for nothing. These savages were still wearing ragged clothings, and from the looks of it, they had still planned on fighting this war with 300 knights. Also, from the reports, no one had visited Baymard ever since their previous appearance here. Hence Titus and Brody soon dropped their guards down again because of these reasons. They instantly came to a conclusion that the reason why they probably remembered the wall differently, was because they weren't really paying any attention to it previously. Dot. So you're saying that a wheel ass will lead this battle for them? Ha ha ha. Brody laughed. Ha 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 ha. Are her services that good? They're lowly swines. So it's no wonder that they would give up their positions just for a skank. TSK. Dot 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 to think that the famous Commander Lucius was such a man. F. I want all the respect that I previously gave him back. Underscore. The men laughed, and the atmosphere became somewhat comical and lack. Was that bastard ex-prince out of his mind? Or was he just that dumb enough to trust a woman? Well either way, this totally worked out in their favor. So they weren't displeased at all. In their minds, these savages were already dead meat. 300 versus 1300. Who else could be the victor from such a battle? I don't think that they plan on riding out to attack us, Brody said as he continued to observe the tiny structures that stood way up on the city walls. I think right. Dot. Thera probably thinking that we wouldn't be able to break their gate. But Thera in for a real treat if they think that we'll attack with just keep attacking with our swords. Titus said while smiling Miss Saviouli. For this battle, they specifically brought out snow powder to destroy Baymard's city gate. Of course they knew that even if they hit the city walls for an entire day, it wouldn't crumble. But the gate was a different matter. They were hoping that they could shoot several dynamite-like tubes of powder with their arrows pointed towards the gate. Normally, city gates just had one iron bar gate that prevented the enemy from entering the city. But Landon's new gated tunnel, had four reinforced aluminium bar gates. As well as two vault-like metal doors at the front and back of the gated entrance tunnel. One could only open these vault-like doors from inside Baymard. Anyone who has ever seen a bank vault back on Earth, would know just how thick these doors were. The aluminium reinforced vault doors were 1.3 meters thick, with more than 12 lock mechanisms on them. All in all, the entrance tunnel-like gate region, was fully secured. Hence even if Brody, Titus and their men made their way towards the gate. There was no way that they would succeed in destroying it. Some of these doors couldn't even be cracked if one placed medium level explosives in front of them. 
talk less of these garbage explosives that they were carrying, but how could they have known that Landon had made a better gated tunnel, from where they were standing, the outer gated door looked like an ordinary but neatly done thin iron door, are the weapons ready, yes captain, perfect, Titus yelled, their plan was simple, some of the men would shoot their arrows of snow powder towards the gates, while others would hold out their armors so as to block raining arrows from their enemies up at the walls. Of course most of the population would move a little distance ahead, and wait for the gate to be destroyed, before they could successfully lead the men into Baymard. And even though Titus didn't know the exact distance between the forest area and the gate, he still showed the men where they needed to attack from, by pointing at the colorful rocks scattered all around the field for him. These rocks looked nothing more than mere decorations, it looked like these savages had wasted their time painting rocks so as to try and attract more visitors to the place. After all, he could understand their need for merchants to try and communicate with them. But too bad. Their plans hadn't worked out at all, since no one had visited Baymard ever since. As for where they got the paint from. He was guessing that it came from the homes of the former barons who used to live here. That was the only explanation he could come up with to explain the occurrence of these colored rocks. But of course, the truth was far from many of his guesses. Anyway, the entire field was 1 mile 1609 meters wide. He needed the archers and those holding the shield to get as close as possible at a safe distance of 300 meters, between them and the gates. And of course, as for the rest of his men, Brody and himself, they would move forward until they were 900 meters away from the gates. At this distance, their enemy Saros could never reach them. So this was a safe spot for them to observe the archers. He 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 dot 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 but unfortunately, it wasn't the arrows that they needed to worry about. Brody and Titus looked towards Baymard and smiled confidently. Soon, they would be able to get their hands on that little twerp dead or alive. It was time for revenge. Archers, move forward. Chapter 214 Baymard's Second Battle Two like organized flies swarming across the fields, Commander Lucy and the rest of the men above the city walls looked at them with annoyance and hatred. They were just bugs who thought that they could enslave Baymard's people due to their master. Lucius looked at Lucy and nodded slightly at her. Right, this was it. It was almost time for the soldiers to make their move. If she did a good job, then she would be able to protect her loved ones. She was both excited, nervous and somewhat terrified. She felt an awful amount of responsibility and pressure on her shoulders. But of course as a leader, she wasn't supposed to show it, so as to keep the men calm and collected during the battle. As she stepped forward, she couldn't help but wonder how her fiancé was able to always remain confident in times like this. Suck it up girl. You have a job to do, she told herself. The students from the academy who were watching her, were also impressed with her demeanor. Speaking of the students, it has been almost 12 months since Baymard's last battle, and with all the new students who had arrived within this time frame, Landon had wanted them to also experience the full force of all their long-ranged weapons at the city walls. For this battle, the students would witness the comprehensive power of the missiles, as well as the cannons. Lucy took a deep breath swiftly walked forward and raised both of her hands in the air like a concert maestro. After enemy sarchers had taken their positions, they immediately waited for the rest of the men to come forward as well. Their goal was to trap and kill all of them, while ensuring that no one escaped. That was why they had made several teams for these tasks. Team 1 would focus on attacking the back of the field from where they were standing while teams 2 and 3 will focus on the left and right hand sides of the field. And within each team itself, Lucy had specified what type of military formation they would use to tackle down their opponents. Bottom line, every missile launcher was supposed to aim at different locations according to the formation. They wanted their enemies to be trapped in a box with no other choice but moving forward towards them. To know the exact position for attacking, several three feet stones were blacked neatly around the entire field, as well as every 100 meters. The stones were also painted by different colors, 
so as to aid the men in counting the distance without any errors, one could now know where 200 meters was, or where 1000 meters was, again, they had decided the field horizontally and vertically. Making squares of 100 meters, all across the fields, with this, each team could easily allocate their men to these squares depending on their enemy's position, to make sure that these stones stayed in position. The ground below them had been dug slightly, so as to sink 14 of it into the ground, there were also sticks and ropes placed around the perimeter of each stone in hopes of permanently marking its position. When people looked at it, they would think that it was done just for aesthetics, no one would ever think that this setup would be used for military purposes. Teams 1, 2 and 3. Get ready, she commanded. The men in those teams immediately pointed their missile launchers at the positions that they were supposed to aim at, while waiting for Lucy's signal. Each missile launcher could shoot out eight missiles at once with each missile being 2.5 feet long. A hit from these weapons could easily cause as much, or even more damage, than regular cannons. Hence they were truly terrifying. Dot. Back down the fields, Brody and Titus, alongside the men, had already moved closer and settled down so as to watch the archers who were busy trying their hardest to destroy the metal gate. Titus looked at the situation and felt like something was off. Why aren't they shooting any arrows at us? He asked suspiciously, who knows? They probably don't have any right now. After all, we did surprise them with this battle. So it could be seen how unprepared they were. That's why they dared to hide behind their city, Brody said confidently. Titus thought about it for a bit, and eventually decided to believe in those reasons. It made sense after all. No one knew that they were coming, so how could these barbarians prepare ahead of time? Maybe they didn't have any blacksmiths to make them weapons, since no one was willing to trade or do any services for them anymore. They were basically shunned by the entire empire right now, so it made sense that they would choose to hide and watch from above. I think right, maybe they are waiting to ambush us within the city after we destroy their gate. Ha 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 dot 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 so what, we have more people than them. So no matter how you see it, there's no way that we could ever lose to them. Underscore. As they spoke, Lucy on the other hand was now ready to begin the show. Steady dot 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 steady. Fire. Bear bear bear. Instantly, multiple high velocity missiles were fired off at the same time. As for those below they immediately noticed several bright flashy lights going off and on, on top of the city walls. Why would these savages light up fire torches and immediately blow them off? Were they mad, confused, or just afraid? Did these savages plan to burn them from way up there? It seemed like they were more stupid than they thought. Titus, Brody and their men couldn't help but shake their heads wryly, as they watched the bright lights flicker off and on multiple times. They couldn't make heads or tails of what these uncultured people wanted to do, so they began to laugh at their idiocracy. But soon enough, their laughters turned to screams of agony, boom, the show had finally begun, chapter 215 a cursed land boom, 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 a rain of huge orange flames quickly engulfed their target spots, instantly uprooting the soil from the ground as well, the ground trembled fiercely as if the heavens were trying to split it wide open, followed by several dark clouds of smoke that slowly creeped across the fields like a wave that immediately blinded everyone around it. It was like being in a sandstorm of black smoke. The men couldn't even see the people standing ahead of them. Except they came extremely close to them. Everything was clouded. In a flash, their eyes became teary dot 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 as the ashes from the smoke continued to surround them like swarms of bees. Fear covered the men, as they moved haphazardly within the smoke trying their best to dodge whatever was thrown at them, he e dot 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 he, 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 the horses were spooked out and agitated from the attack, ah, dot, several men dropped dead from the missile's impact, while others exploded away as the missiles directly touched their bodies, splick, some of the men's body parts and blood, had just been sprayed over Titus and Brody. T dot 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 cough cough dot 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 Titus dot 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 cough. Are you there? asked Brody, 
who had fallen off his horse a while ago, damn it. Dot. The smoke was too thick and suffocating, Brody felt like the battlefield had gotten twenty times hotter than it was, when they had previously arrived. Heavens the heat. The heat from those heaven-like flames made his entire body feel like someone had begun roasting him over a large fire. He was dehydrated, and his skin felt like it would peel off at any moment from now. At this point, even breathing became somewhat difficult for him. As he kept on breathing in ashes from the air, he needed fresh air and water from his satchel that he left on his horse. Cough dot 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 cough dot 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 him here. Cough. Brody tried to follow Tutu's voice, until he finally bumped into him. Cough cough. What the hell is going on? Brody asked confusedly. Were the heavens siding with these savages over them? Or was this part of sorcery? I. I, I don't not. Boom, boom, boom. Just before Titus could finish his sentence, several more attacks rained on them viciously. The floor trembled and the ground erupted again, immediately pushing those around it away. Boom, boom, boom. Several cries echoed out from within the smoke, making everyone fearful. Those that weren't attacked yet, had begun to shiver inexplicably. As humans, Everyone feared the unknown. Was there a monster within this dark smoke storm? Why was everyone screaming if it was completely safe? They had just one thought now. And that was to run. They would have been willing to die on the battlefield from sword play, but this was clearly voodoo. In their hearts, Baymard was definitely a cursed place. How else were they supposed to explain the trembling grounds and the massive explosions that occurred within the dense black fog? Immediately, a few of them tried to make a run for it. But now could they escape if they couldn't even see the way? They kept bumping into each other and tripling over dead bodies and holes that were created from the missiles attacks. Boom, boom, boom. Ah, dot. Lucy looked down at the men who were screaming in agony, and for a second. Her heart wavered a little. In truth, they were all so pitiable in their own way. But she knew that even if they escaped, there was no guarantee that they wouldn't be caught and threatened for information on the battle. One had to know that even though Baymard would be open to the public soon, they still didn't want bigger enemies to be aware of the weapons at the city walls. It was always good to give their major enemies the element of surprise, leaving them with no way out. Obviously sooner or later, the world would know about their defenses. But it was better for them to take out massive armies of ten thousands, before the news about their city's defenses got out. Since news usually traveled a lot slower and could arrive several months, Baymard might be able to use this at its advantage. Who knows, maybe they could kill several enemies before the whole Pino continent got the news. Although Lucy felt compassion for them. She also felt that this was necessary in keeping Baymard safe. Hence, she toughened up her heart and gave out her next orders. Team 4 Take down the archers now. Those in Team 4 were all new recruits from the first graduating batch who moved up a rank. They were using cannons to take down the archers. While the warrant officers in the other teams were using the missiles. For this war, both cannons and missiles were going to be used. The men needed real battle experience. Hence this was the first battle where their warrant officers used the missiles, and the privates used the cannon. Of course they had been practicing at a large open region in District B. as well as the coastal region. One could practice something forever. But without real experience, there was no guarantee that they would be able to do the job properly. Hence. Both weapons were presently being used. Dot. Back on the fields, the archers and those that were supposed to shield them from arrows, were so stunned from the sight before them, that they didn't know what to do next. If their situation was on a T.V screen, people would think that they should have started running by now. But the question was, run to where? The situation on the battlefield was extremely scary to those who didn't know anything about technology or modern weapons. As they turned to look behind them, straight away, they could see a thick black smoke mist that looked like it had a mind of its own, slowly crawling and creeping towards them. Coupled with the wails and screams from within the mist, they had immediately concluded that the mist held some sort of monster within it. Gulp! They swallowed their saliva down and started trembling like frightened chickens. For some reason, 
they felt like if they got any closer to the gates of Baymard, they would be cursed. Dot. So they continued staying within their 300 meter range, while trying to look for any other possible exits. But sadly, they could only see one direction. And that was the direction towards Baymard's gates. Bloody hell. Chapter 216 A sad victory sh. Should we run back towards the gates? One of the men asked anxiously, as they kept stepping backward in attempts to avoid the mist that was crawling towards them. Since the missiles were constantly being fired, the massive hive of smoke had never really settled down. And those within it couldn't really tell that it was coming from Baymard for them. This whole phenomenon came from the ancestors. Some had even thought that maybe the ancestors had planned to punish Baymard today. But who would have thought that they themselves would show up and take the punishment for these savages? They all felt that they were truly unlucky. As for the archers and those holding their shields, they were too busy looking for an exit out of this situation, that they hadn't realized that all this was coming from Baymard's wall. They were too busy trying to avoid the man-eating smoke that wanted their lives. You. N. No way man. We can't go towards the gates. Dot 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 dot. This place is cursed. I dot 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 agree with him. What if we approach it and the ancestors send that fist of fire to us instead? I thought that the captain said that this would be an easy job. I regret coming here. Now we're taking punishment for them. Look, look. Dot. The black spirit is approaching us. Quickly, we have no choice. Let's run for the gates. Everyone thought for a while, and started running. But just after 20 seconds of running, they were immediately attacked by the cannons. Boom, boom, boom. Once again, the ground erupted, and the soil was raised up into the air as the men dived away due to its impact. Ah, ah, the field became gruesome. D dot 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 didn't I say that we shouldn't have ran towards the gates? Now we've truly angered the ancestors. Underscore. Boom, boom, boom. The men tried to run away from the falling cannonballs, but it was too late. On the other hand within the dense black smoke, Brody and Titus had been doing the same thing as well. They had been trying to dodge the missiles, while trying to escape from the thick fog of black smoke. They truly needed oxygen, as they felt like they would faint any moment from now. In fact, some of their men had actually died from suffocation and not from the missile attacks. Boom. Brody and Titus had dived in different directions. Dot. Ah. Dot. Titus screamed from the intense pain that he felt from his left leg. The pain was truly gut-wrenching. He quickly tried to wiggle his toes. But to his surprise, he couldn't feel them anymore. He sat silently for a while amidst the pain so as to slowly digest what had just happened to him, without even touching his legs, he knew, he knew that his legs had been completely cut off from his left knee downwards, ha 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 ha, he began laughing and crying at the same time, without his leg, his majesty Eli would never keep him again, his career was officially over, even if he went back, his master would definitely kill him, since he knew too many secrets, Hence he could never live a peaceful life again even if he wanted to. He was very sure that his master would hunt him down to the end of the world, if need be. Would he resent his master by then? The answer was number. No because that was just the way the world was. Knights were trained to accept death, as well as victory. Hence he didn't see anything wrong with it. Should he just roam around the continent with all of Elis' secrets? Dot. No leader would think that that was a smart move to make, hence he had to die, if it were just one of his hands, or even his eyes, then it wouldn't have been a problem, but to loose one's legs, meant that such a person couldn't run fast during missions or war, so such a person would be seen as utterly useless to their masters, Titus took out his dagger, and when he was about to stab himself, someone kept poking him and saying, blah dot 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 blah, blah, to him. The first thought that came to his mind, was that this was an annoying person. But after listening to the voice for the second time, 
He immediately knew that it was Brody. Brody had probably followed the voice of his laughter just to find him. What happened to you? Titus asked with concern. Brody took Titus' hands and placed it on his face. Titus was taken aback. And sadness immediately filled his eyes. For sure, he knew deep down that he wasn't a good person. In fact, he wouldn't be too surprised if many peasants saw him as a villain. But even villains had people that they loved dearly. Brody was his true brother, and seeing his situation like this instantly made his grown ass cry again. Brody's lips had fallen and swayed away, making his mouth look extremely large. His teeth were sticking out, and the teeth on the right side of his jaw was already visible within him opening his mouth. His right side face had a huge hole in it while his mouth had been stretched and torn out wide. This made his cheekbones protrude, and his eyes become sunken from sadness. He couldn't say words anymore. As part of his tongue and teeth had been cut off, he also had deep cuts and bruises on his shoulders and forehead, as well. And on top of that, his left arm was also heavily injured as it felt completely numb to him. Blah blah blah. Brody took out his own dagger and placed it in Titus' hand left hand. He then brought the dagger closer to his heart, as if begging Titus to kill him. Titus immediately understood and laughed out loud while crying. They both understood their own situations very well. Escape for a future? It wasn't worth it. It seemed like their time in this world was finally up. The only regret that they had was not finishing off that little brat of Baymard. Bro, let's do it like this. Let's just stay together and sit close to each other. We've known each other for more than 12 years now. So it would be an honor for me to die on the battlefield alongside you. Titus said proudly. Blah blah me too. Somehow, Titus could understand what Brody was trying to say. They sat together and waited patiently for their end. Titus kept trying to cheer Brody up by talking about all the fun things that they had done while they lived. Like raping women, pilgrimaging homes, burning villages, beating people up, winning wars, wrestling, duels and so on. One had to know that for most knights and rich people, this was the way the world should be. Like Landon had always said. No one was born evil. This era was one of the most uncultured times of all. And it was usually these people's environment, that made their characters become twisted. Many knights take their sons on journeys and sometimes end up raping women in front of their sons. Some go to the markets and act high and mighty, while abusing their powers just to get what they wanted. People were usually greedy and would always kill those who were in the same competitions as themselves. Why couldn't they just fight fairly? There were also those who would watch innocent people get killed for fun. There was something ridiculously wrong with this world... And that was why Landon had focused on making the people of Baymard grow a conscience. No raping, no murdering the innocent and so on. Brody and Titus continued their trip down memory lane as they waited for their end. Boom, 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 splick. Their bodies had just exploded from a direct hit from the missiles, leaving a ghastly sight on the battlefield. They had finally died. Dot. Once the battle had ended and the dust had settled, Lucy looked across the fields and tried to hold in her tears. Granted, most of these men had done terrible things. But they were also Samyon's son. She was emotional on behalf of their families. She couldn't wait for her fiancé to finally unify the world with the help of what he called peace treaties. He had told her that this was one of the things that he wanted the most. Not just for Baymard's sake, but also for all those without any power. Be it peasants, slaves and so on. That way, war would decrease, and maybe, just maybe, Everyone would finally live in peace and harmony. As she looked at the dead bodies scattered all over the gruesome battlefield, she couldn't help but give a silent prayer in her heart. The war was finally over, and Baymard had merged victorious. Chapter 217 The End Results After the Whole Ordeal the privates were busy talking about the battle while observing the entire cleaning process from above the city walls. Some people were just arriving, while others either stayed or left. Classes were still going on after all. What happened? asked an overly excited military private. As he looked at the bloody scene before him, wait. Dot. 
just coming here now, damn it, I had classes a while ago so I could only make it out, bro, you need to shoot yourself for missing this battle, oh my heavens. How could the field turn this red? Come on, tell me about the battle, bro. You should've seen Princess Lucy. She was freaking awesome, oh. And don't forget about the missile explosions. It was totally epic, dude. The full impact of those cannons really blew my mind away, underscore. As they began narrating the entire fiasco, those who missed the entire thing felt like crying. Why oh why? Why the hell did they have classes at that particular time? It was just not fair to them at all. Dot. Lucy stood on the bloody battlefield, as she watched the soldiers clean up the scene. The foul stench of blood reeked throughout the fields, making her feel like puking in her own mouth. One could find ears, limbs, eyeballs and other body parts scattered all across the fields. The entire scene looked like a graveyard filled with the unburied dead. In truth, the war itself had left her emotionally bankrupt. She felt so much sadness, as a void of helplessness and pity had enveloped her mind wholeheartedly. It took her a whole five minutes to steady her mind before she could come to terms with the fact that these people would never see their families again. As she looked over the scene, she quickly went over to aid the men in cleaning up the field that was once leveled had now become coarse and uneven. As several deep holes had been formed as a result of Baymard's attacks, the soldiers had collected all the armors and swords, as well as coins and any other metal items from the dead bodies. Since the armors and swords have different marks, crests and inscriptions on them, then we don't need to store them anymore. Send them to the construction industry. Chief Tim would know what to do, Lucius commanded. Yes army general, like last time, these weapons would be melted and used in producing other metal goods all around Baymard. I mean, why the hell would they use something that has the royal crest and seal on it? Also, carefully collect these coins and send them to Chief Accountant Christopher. Tell him to add it into the military's bank account. As for the satchels lying all around the battlefield, as well as those on the horses, I expect you all to collect them and take them to my office immediately, Lucius added. Yes Major General. The soldiers replied. What about the horses that survived? She asked inquisitively. Well, those ones would be sent to the ranch once we collect the satchels from their bodies. Dot. Time passed by quickly, and all items that weren't body parts were finally taken off the battlefield. Plump exclamation mark dot 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 plump plump. The bodies were piled up one after the other at one corner of the field. From there, the bodies were burned. The ashes collected, placed in massive garbage bags and put behind a wagon. Of course because of their superstitious beliefs about leaving one's enemy's ashes or body part around their land. They did more than just collect the ashes. In essence, they used the excavator to dig up the topsoil and filled it in another wagon. Because they didn't even want to leave any tiny ash trace on Baymard's land. And when they were finally done, some of the soldiers immediately volunteered to drive the wagons towards the outskirts of Riverdale City and dump it there. They planned to dump the soil there, but bury the garbage bags of ash deep into the ground. From there, they were also supposed to burn the wagons and ride the horses back to Baymard. Now with the dead bodies out of the way, several workers used the heavy machines in leveling up the field again. And while all this was happening, Lucy, Josh, and Lucius had already proceeded into Lucius' office. It was time for them to go through all the satchels in front of them. Last time, they were able to get real helpful intel from the satchels. But this time, it looked like there was nothing of major within these bags. Now that we're away from everyone else, you guys should tell me the truth. How did I do today? Did I mess up? Lucy asked anxiously. Everyone looked at her and smiled. Let's start with what you did right. You led us to victory, and you followed the plan 75% through. You also didn't waver, as you showed a brave front to the soldiers. As the future queen, you were a true role model out there today, Lucius said, while Josh nodded away in agreement. Now, let's focus on what you should improve on. Hearing those words, Lucy's heart sank a little bit. 
as it was completely filled with anxiety. I would only say that you should work on knowing the right amount of ammunition to use. You shot too many missiles and cannons out for this puny army. But even so, you did well for your first try. Overall, I would give you an A for today's job. Well done Lucy. His Majesty would definitely be proud of your accomplishments in keeping Baymard safe. Clap, clap, clap. As Josh and Lucius clapped, Lucy's nervous heart immediately calmed down. She couldn't believe it. She had actually led the men to victory. This feeling, this feeling was really great. As for her using too much ammunition, in truth, Landon had expected as much for this battle. In Landon's opinion, this was their first battle for heaven's sake, so there was no need for them to be compared to those professionals back on earth who had spent over 10 to 20 years in practice. Please. Dot. Everyone would make mistakes on their first tries. Lucius knew that if he was in control as well, he would have also be somewhat wasteful. In truth, he needed to personally control the battlefield, so as to learn on his own. Practice would never beat real life experience where the enemy he would run around in every direction. Plus, they had been making weapons for over a year now. And this was only their second battle. Please. What were they supposed to do with all the ammunitions that they had stored for several months now? Even if they used a lot, they weren't professionals yet. They had many more years ahead of them to figure things out on their own. Hence his majesty had said that they could use as much as they wanted for the battle. Of course as time goes by, they would be able to know the proper amount of ammunitions to use. But it was ridiculous to expect a first time user to launch out several attacks as if they were experts back on earth. Time and real life battle experience were the only ways that one could improve in this field. Chapter 218 Where is my husband? Pamlock City, the Empire of Arcadine. Dot. So you're saying that Baron Rogers hasn't come back for over a year now? Asked a 41 year old man. Yes. Yes. He hasn't come back yet, replied a petty looking woman. This woman was Baron Roger's wife, Baroness Cynthia. In her mind, her husband had left her because he didn't want to keep funding her luxurious lifestyle. Dot 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 but of course, that was far from the truth. Baron Rogers was the Baron who had accompanied City Lord Shannon to Baymard. He had died alongside Shannon. But in his Cynthia's mind, he had definitely abandoned them because he was broke. Cynthia came from a low-class noble family, while her husband came from a medium-class noble family, but when they lived in Baymard, their pockets were as filled to the brim making their family feel like a high-level noble family. Everything was fine and dandy, until that moron of a king, took away their happiness and posted them to another city. There. She had been reminded of her low noble status constantly. The other women would buy the most expensive bags and clothes. But what about her? Whenever she asked for money, Rogers would claim that he's broke. Of course she didn't believe him at all. How could a noble be broke? He came up with flimsy excuses like, oh, the city lord had taken part of his shares, or he doesn't have enough money to pay his elmites and so on. He stopped fulfilling all her needs, and everyone there immediately treated them like trash. It was utterly mortifying to have the BCH Diziora, walk around with her expensive facial potions, chain, shoes and so on. She felt like her husband was intentionally humiliating her. Even while he was there, those noble women would laugh at her and tell her that they had seen Rogers kissing and even sleeping around with other women. In truth, she didn't really love the man, as he was still a medium class noble, but what made her angry was the humiliation. And then it happened. The night before he traveled, she had asked for money from him. But of course, he shut her out of his chambers and the next day he was gone. Two months later, the noble women were talking about the fact that he might have gone to see another woman who has a child for him. And of course she had easily believed them as well, because while they were there, he had indeed cheated on her for the first time with several harlots. In fact, everyone's ideas got into her head. And five months after that, she immediately claimed that her husband was dead. And requested for their first son who was 18 last year, to inherit his father's title and position. She did this in a hurry, 
lest that man brings a bastard son to take over his position, after all although she didn't love him, that didn't mean that she would agree for this position and monthly fee to be given to anyone else other than her children, she would rather die, than allow that to happen, and since she had been around these noble women all day, it was clear as day to see that she had been influenced by their stories about her husband, anyway, since her family wasn't popular and they were seen as the in-between of lower and middle nobles. The king didn't bother to send his knights to investigate the matter, rather, he asked the city lord of that city about the situation, and when it was confirmed, her son Matthias, was finally made the new head of their family. Of course to get the city lord to agree, she had slept with the guy on the low and had also agreed to him part of their monthly allowance as well. He also gave funded her lavish lifestyle by buying her new bags, clothes, and so on. Of course, this was all done without the knowledge of his two wives and three concubines. Today, she was here to find out where her bastard husband was hiding. She wanted him dead. Lying to the king was a guaranteed death sentence. So if the king realized that he was still alive, then she would be killed for sure. In her mind, the only reason that her bastard was hiding, was because she had sought on him too. He had also lied about Baymard, so he knew that if he reported her, then she too would report him as well. Hence he had probably decided to go into hiding like a fugitive. But no matter what, he had to die. She that she could have peace. This was a dog eats dog world. Many nobles and wealthy people married for political reasons or for social elevation. And even when there are several wives in one household, everyone normally fights against each other. Just so that they could be favored by their husbands. This guaranteed power for themselves and their children. The children overtake the household, land, knights and even empires. So after all the years that she had pretended to love her husband, how could she just sit still and watch him give everything to a bastard child? No way. She was prepared to take him down before he could even see it coming. Dot. Presently, she had traveled to another city, and was currently staying at Baron Yanja's estate as a guest. Don't cry Baroness Cynthia. It's okay, I'm sure that we will find him soon enough. Baron Yanja, in a coaxing manner. The woman before him looked small and frail. In fact, she really looked too pitiful to him. Her husband had been proclaimed dead. But she had never wanted to give up on him without trying to find him. He could see the hurt in her eyes, whenever he mentioned Roger's name. He had also come from Baymard but had been posted in a different city from the rest. As the tears trickled down the woman's beautiful face, Baron Yanja tried his best to resist the urge to hug her. Sigh. Rogers was really a lucky bastard to have had such a woman he thought. Tell me again in detail what really happened? Yanja asked with concern. Cynthia wiped her crocodile tears and began to tell him a story that was 50% similar to the truth. She of course went through with her white lotus sacked, instantly making Yanja believe her. Yanja thought for a while and wondered. He knew his friend Rogers very well. The guy was greedy as hell, and always wanted everything to himself. From what Cynthia had said, he had left a few months after they had just settled in. She had also said that their nights had been decreasing in number and the city lord also took part of their money. Hence he could easily conclude that the issue was money. If he had left as quickly as he came, then would it be possible for him to have gone back to Baymart? Yanja asked. Cynthia knitted her brows for a second and continued to act pitifully. Baymart? Dot. But. But. If he did go there, then wouldn't the king punish him? True. But what if he wanted to go back to Baymard and make his money in secret for both of you? But he didn't leave with many knights. HMHM. But what if he had close help around Baymard instead? You mean? Cynthia's eyes immediately lit up. The bastard must have obviously stayed in Baymard with his new family, while he made money. Damn it. Dot. Whatever money he made was hers. It made sense that he would hide in Baymard. No one was willing to go there and inquire the wrath of Alec Barn. Hence no one would intrude on his space there. Plus Baymard was a month's journey away from the city she was now deciding in, so the scumbag probably thought that he could get away from her easily. She couldn't help but smile, 
as she realized that she had finally found his hiding place. In her mind, he was already as good as dead. I understand brother Yanja. Thank you. Chapter 219 Edward Page Tap, Tap, Tap Spring had once again blessed Baymard with the expected gift of rain. Almost every day, rain would drizzle down every now and then across the land. Sometimes it would fall heavily dot 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 while other times, it would only tease the people lightly. Edward Page could faintly hear the sounds of rain, drizzling outside his bedroom window. The raindrops almost felt like a gentle lullaby that kept luring him to sleep, and coupled with the extremely soft sheets and mattress, you'd had felt like he could just melt away from comfort. Dot. Honey dot 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 are you up yet? Going to be late if you don't get up now okay, said his 24 year old wife Mwani. Edward was just about to wake up when he felt a sharp pain in his head. Ah, he screamed inwardly. His head felt like someone had shaken it until his brain was thoroughly blemished. The shooting pain randomly stabbed through his mind. As it devoured his consciousness, he felt like he would die, if he continued to lift his head and further from his pillow any further. Why was he sweating so much even though he felt extremely cold? And why the hell did his body feel so heavy? He tried to get up once more but felt it utterly useless. His body felt like someone had tied several invisible weights to his limbs and neck. Sniff, sniff. His nose was also blocked, as he struggled to unclog it up. His face was flushed red, and his lips were trembling slightly as he tried to get up from his bed. His wife came out of the shower and immediately saw him still lying in bed, and gave him a puzzled look. She looked at her dear husband and her eyes lit up instantly. From the look of it, it appears that he was sick. Honestly, would it kill the guy to tell her about his condition? TSK, men. She thought while shaking her head. Unless they were usually in critical conditions, they would never say anything to anyone. Honey, I think that you're sick, she said while hurriedly rushing over to him. Nonsense. How can I be sick? Trust me, my nostrils are just clogged up. So there's no need for you to be overly concerned. After work, I'm sure that he'll be as fit as a horse, Edward said, while trying to beat his chest proudly. She looked at her supposedly healthy husband, and couldn't help sighing. Truly a stubborn man. She placed the back of her right hand over his forehead, and was taken aback. Goodness. Dot. He was burning up fast. Honey, I don't care what you have to say right now but today going to the hospital. Dot. Edward didn't even know how he got downstairs, but his wife and father had already shoved him down without his consent. From beginning to end, he had been protesting about going to the hospital. But everyone just treated his words like farts. Luckily, his wife also worked at the same industry as he did although it was in a different sector. So she had planned to fill out an absence note for him when she got to work. She just needed to fill his name, department, employee I.D number, the fate of today, reason for absence and so on. Obviously after he had gotten his doctor's slip, she would help him in presenting it as well. From there, the industry would give him several days off depending on the doctor's note. Could be a day to even a week off if the doctor had requested it. Her father, mother, and father-in-law all had to go to work today as well. So that left the duty of taking Edward to the hospital on her mother-in-law Edward's mom. Who was off from work today. Looking at Edward who was currently being forced to eat. It was clear that this person was weak and could faint at any time. Hence they didn't dare to let him go to the hospital alone. As for their one-year-old daughter, Mwani usually took her to work and dropped her off at the building that had an entire floor dedicated for nursery. As for their three-year-old son, they usually dropped him off at preschool while they went to work. But I don't want it to go, said the grumpy Edward who was apparently talking to air because no one replied him. When everyone had left for work, Edward's mother immediately ushered the grumpy son towards the bus stop, and just like so, they had quickly found their way to the hospital. The remodeled hospital was indeed more beautiful than the original. From the outside, one would be able to see a massive building at the car center, with several two-story regular size building alongside it. These buildings were set up in such a way that none of them blocked each other's view 
when one observed from the gate, the buildings were spread apart from each other, as different buildings symbolized different needs. Looking at these buildings more closely, Edward could see that the new building was the grand one at the center, while the old estate buildings were the other modified buildings that were surrounding the new one. There was also a massive car park at the front of the hospital entrance, as well as several roads emergency vehicles and guard posts as well. Edward could see people walking in and out of these buildings, while holding small plastic bags with them. Some were being pushed around on wheelchairs around another building, while others were just talking casual strolls at the hospital's garden. He could also see medical students in large groups rushing towards these buildings as well. Edward was honestly awed by the change in front of him. The last time that he had come to the hospital, was August of last year. So this was his first time seeing these changes, and to be honest, he was utterly impressed by it. Chapter 220 Edward Page 2 Baymard's Hospital Those were the words that were boldly written on the massive new building. Of course, he also saw different words on the new building like, emergency, main entrance, and so on. As they walked through the massive revolving doors, Edward was immediately greeted with the sight of a massive reception area. This area had a personality that was much like the rest of the hospital. The well-polished tiled floor was grayish tom color, and looked crystal-like to all those who first got a glimpse of it. The reception area also had several hallways that stretched towards different directions. Of course each hallway had different signs that showed the patients where they should go. Standing there, he began to feel awkward. Since this was his first time here, everyone else seemed to know where they were going, except for him. Even though he saw a sign that said, consultations on the wall, he still felt like he should ask around go be sure. Hence he walked towards the receptionist seated at the front desk for help. Good day sir, good day madam. How can I help you all today? Answered one of the receptionists. After being told that his previous guess was right, Edward had his mother immediately made their way towards the direction for consultations. They passed through a short hallway, and were immediately greeted with a massive waiting area. The waiting area had several seats, trash cans, and four mini glass offices at its front. From here, Edward could clearly see that there were three people within each office, a doctor, another staff worker and the patient. Dot. Looking at the entire waiting room, once again Edward was lost at what to do. But when he saw that the person in front of him take a tiny paper from a small box attached to the wall, he too moved forward and did the same thing as well. Once again, he also noticed that the patient wrote her name on another sheet of paper by another office, so he too did the same thing as well. And after sitting down, he quickly looked at the thin piece of paper and saw the number 89 printed on it. Number 77, said a voice that was resounding all through the massive waiting room. Here here, answered another man who quickly got up and, and walked towards one of the offices at the front. Number 78, here, said another man who rushed towards another transparent office as well. It seemed like those four glass offices were there to attend to them. A few more minutes passed by and it was finally his turn. Number 89, here, he replied, as he quickly picked up his documents and headed towards the third office door. Once in the room, he presented his healthcare card down his workplace, as well as his I.D card. From there, the doctor immediately noted down all his complaints in his hospital book, as well as asked several other questions like if he could cough out blood and so on. And after questioning him, the doctor quickly led him through another door at the right hand side of the office. Inside the room, was a bed, curtains, several machines and other medical tools. They took his temperature, measured his weight and height, checked his throat for any signs of swells, and so on. And once they were done, the doctor led him back to the office to conclude his assessment on the situation. He had spent over 25 minutes for consultation and checkup. Dot. This is serious doctor. So you're saying that I have the flu? Edward asked anxiously. One had to know that the flu was one of the main causes of deaths within this era. So he was scared silly. Even though he had heard about the drugs that they had produced over this period of time, 
something within him still felt like the flu was a gigantic illness to cure just like that, heck. Dot. His own grandmother died from that several winters back. The problem with flu was that sometimes, one could have a high fever dot 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 which would lead to exhaustion and even death. So how could he not be terrified? It had been over eight months since he went to the hospital or fell ill. So he only knew about these drugs from other people. Yes. Some of his family members used some of these drugs as well. But that was one mediocre illness is like light headache or something. This was the flu that they were talking about. At this point, he began to feel like he shouldn't have come here at all. He felt like he would be walking down death's path any moment from now. Dr. Fabian looked at him and chuckled. Sigh. I used to be like this, he thought. Yes Mr. Edward. From your symptoms and tests, you do have the flu. But not to worry, with the drugs that'll prescribe to you, this problem would be over in no time. Hearing Dr. Fabian, a little bud of hope began sprouting within his sunken heart. At this time, the other staff who had previously left the room when he went for the checkup, had now returned with the hospital book from the hospital's archives. Previously, he had written his name down on a piece of paper and waited at the reception hall for his turn. So while he was waiting, those who took the paper hurriedly rushed over to the archives and brought his book here. From there, the staff worker who was in the office with the doctor would go and bring his book over for the doctor to fill, sign and stamp. Once Edward left the waiting room, he and his mother went towards the pharmacy, got their drugs and immediately headed home. Several days later, Edward was no longer depressed. As his illness had subsided greatly, Mew ah Mew ah Mew ah, he kissed his one year old daughter on her cheeks with joy. He wasn't going to die anymore. He couldn't help but hold a bottle of pills in his hands as if they were heavenly gifts. The power of this drug made him firmly believe that His Majesty was Heaven's messenger. Thank you, Your Majesty he said silently, within his heart. As for Landon who was currently far away, provided the people used the drugs, he would be one step closer to completing his mission. What heaven's messenger? All this was necessary for his soul to be kept intact. Dot. Of course while the people of Baymard enjoyed peace and serenity, the same couldn't be said for others. Damn it! How did it turn out to be like this? Chapter 221 Done with the old, in with the new the capital, Empire of Yodan. Dot. Why? I don't accept this. How is this fair? Underscore. Seated in Maclean's chambers, where his five wives and two concubines, of course, he used to have six wives, but he divorced the other one Mother Winnie and sent her and her children to one of the coastal cities within Yodan. A while ago, Sirius MacLean had finally taken over the throne, and because he knew that his other sons were resentful, he immediately decided to post them to different cities that were far away from the capital. Likewise, he had also decided to send all his wives, concubines and younger children to his personal estate at the other end of the capital. One could say that the palace was situated at the north of the capital city, while Maclean's private estate was situated at the southeastern part of the capital. Traditionally, he was supposed to clear the palace and make room for Sirius and his future family. Could one imagine Sirius living in the palace with his future wives, his future children, his father's wives, his siblings, and their entire drama? That wasn't how it worked. Sirius needed his own space to grow, as well as full authority over the palace. If everyone stayed over, then some people might try to cross his path just to fight for authority. Hence with a new king here, the rest had to move out to different estates and live out their own personal lives there. The only people who would remain at the palace, would be, Sirius' mother Queen Emma who would be the new queen mother, and Princess Kendall who was Sirius' little sister. Of course Maclean would also have a courtyard in the palace as well, so as to aid his son in difficult matters. He would be sleeping at both places at once. Dot. As for his children, Maclean had thirteen daughters and eleven sons. One of his daughters had died when she was just a year old, while his other daughter and son, had been disowned alongside their mother last year, so that only left him with eleven daughters and ten sons. With six wives and two concubines, 
over the past few years. McLean would pregnate three or four in one year's time. And maybe in the next year he would pregnate none. In fact, some of his children were just months apart. Anyway, amongst his daughters, four were already married out, three were already above the age of 15 and had their own private estates in the capital. While the rest were under the age of 15, as royal children, they were entitled to their own inheritances. Hence Maclean had announced their inheritances, as well as given out written documents to them during the coronation ceremony. Of course, they would only be able to access their inheritances when they turned 15. His daughters would be given their estates, as well as their monthly salaries and guards. And when they finally got married, the palace would stop giving them salaries since their new husbands were supposed to provide for them. Also, they could still keep their estates as well, since there was nothing wrong for one to have several homes. As for their dowries, it was already prepared and stored within the palace safe, when it was time, they would get what rightfully belonged to them. Now for his ten sons, eight of them had already reached the age of fifteen and currently have their own cities to run which were far away from the capital, long ago. Maclean had already prepared for Sirius to rule Yodan, so over the years, he had been posting his sons to different locations that wouldn't pose any threat to Sirius. As for his other two sons who were under the age of 15, he had already prepared their inheritances as well. Well, that was all for the children he currently had. Unfortunately, if any other child was born after this period, then they wouldn't get estates or cities to rule they would just get money from his personal pockets. Maclean was no longer a king, so any child that comes later would be treated as a high-class noble. Hence he would personally have to provide for them. In short, the palace would not be responsible for giving them any inheritances. Dot. As for his wives, just like his daughters, they would have to receive their salaries from his pockets as well. For women, money from the palace can only be given to those who weren't married, as well as the queens and the queen mother. But since they were no longer the queens of Yodan and were also married to Maclean, then they too weren't entitled to palace money anymore. Also, all guards that were given to them as queens, had to be returned back to the palace, they were only allowed to keep those that were given to them by their individual families. These guards will be trained and used for wars, or could be given to serious future queens. The same thought went for their maids. They were only allowed to leave the palace with their personal maids, which were usually just four or five in number. But the other twelve or twenty that cleaned around their courtyard or made up their beds up, were supposed to stay in the palace no matter what. These maids would stay behind and serve the future queens as well. In short, Maclean had followed the traditions of the empire strictly as that's what his father did as well, when making him king. He too came from a large family, with nine stepmothers who hated him to the core. Imagine living with all of them alongside his family. He didn't think that his wives would have a problem giving up all their knights and maids, since his stepmothers had done the same back in the days. Whether the guards had been hired two weeks ago, or ten years ago, it didn't matter at all. His father had made sure that none of his stepmothers had left the palace with them. So he thought that his wives would give him an easier time on this matter. But the truth couldn't be more wrong. Over my dead body. Chapter 222 Done with the old, in with the new two over my head body. What the hell do you mean by your decision is final? Ivy yelled. Weren't you the former king? Change that bloody decision for heaven's sake. Queen Cedora bellowed. You must be crazy to think that he'll give up my knights just because I'm no longer queen. Queen Charlotte added. Underscore. Ivy looked at her buffoon of a husband, and became livid with anger. The entire conversation made her feel like slitting his throat over and over again. Every word stung her brain, which only fueled the fire that was burning deep within her. There was a scream from deep within her heart that felt like a demon was trying to break free from a cage deep with the abyss. Every word was like gasoline to her raging flames, which made her anger build up more. She gritted her teeth in an effort to resist the urge of killing the buffoon, while clenching her fists. Her face was red from suppressed rage, and her hunched form exuded an animosity that was similar to that of a ferocious beast. All she was asking the heavens for, 
was just one opportunity. An opportunity to punch the living daylight out of this bastard. How dare he, Yug? Every time he opened his loud arrogant mouth, her anger would immediately grow by mountain folds. What the f was he talking about? In her opinion, he was definitely a dreamer. So, after so many years of fighting for power and being one of the most favored queens, this was all she was getting? She had worked extremely hard, just to make sure that she would continue to hold power within the empire. But now, she wasn't even going to be the queen mother. McLean, you lie. And to make it all worse, now she would just be a duchess. Wasn't this a big downgrade from the first queen? She just didn't understand why she couldn't be the queen mother. So what if Queen M was serious mother? Was that oaf more suitable to be the palace's queen mother than her? And to make matters worse, the skank would still live in the palace, while she on the other hand, would have to go to an estate. Sure, the estate was a lot bigger than high class noble estates, but compared to the palace, it was just child play. Everything about her situation, spelled out downgrading to her. Hence she was very determined to stay in the palace, even if hail and snow fell on her all year round. Why couldn't they all live in the palace with that brat serious? So what if he got married and had children? Did they think that she would poison them or make their lives unbearable? Okay. Yes she would probably do it. But so what? HMMP. Dot. If he was truly king, then he should have the power to protect himself. So why was he sacred now? The more she thought about the situation, the more annoyed she became. She knew about the traditions and what not. But as the former king, couldn't he bend the rules a little bit? Granted, she had taken the knights of the old queens when she first stepped into the palace, but why should she hand her own knights now? In her mind, McLean was just doing this to get on her last damn nerves. Over the years, as the first queen, she had received 7,000 knights. And apart from these men, she also had 980 other knights that were either given to her by her father, or bought by from her allowances. If they took away her 7,000, then what would she be left with? She had already come up with a plan to convince her husband of her knights' loyalty to her. As amazing as she was, wouldn't they be devastated if they couldn't serve her anymore? But unbeknownst to her, even if she tried to convince the knights, none of them were willing to serve her any longer. In fact on the coronation day, her knights had been celebrating because they were finally free from their demoness of a queen. Once Ivy steps into Maclean's estate, they wouldn't be responsible for her any longer. The men celebrated, and kept waiting for next week to come eagerly for them. Freedom was just around the corner. In their eyes, the fact that if Ice son once chosen was a miracle, or else they would've still had to serve her as the Queen Mother. Their ancestors had truly heard their prayers. Ivy on the other hand, was still grumbling about her predicaments. What about her money? From what McLean said, he would only give them 30% of their regular allowances monthly. In truth, that amount was what high-class noble wives received from their husbands. But in Evice's mind, it was nothing more than chicken change. Dot. As for Cedora, she was also thinking about the same thing as well. How the hell was she supposed to kill Sirius with less than a thousand knights? She hadn't given up on killing that brat yet. For her, no matter how long it took, she would have to kill him, so that her son can be made king. But with the monthly allowances and the number of knights that she had left, she knew that she wouldn't be able to deal with the brat any time soon. From the ferocity of her venting, one could see that she had been holding her anger in for several months now. Like Ivy, from day one, she worked her butt off, and did everything that she was supposed to do. In fact, she had fashioned herself into his perfect woman. She acted patient, loving, sweet, and very festy, when they always did adult gymnastics. But at the end of it all, her son won't even Cho sent her be king. And to make matters worse, this scoundrel husband of hers had said that he had already chosen Sirius as king way back. So what was the point of wasting her time all those years? No one was more pitiful than her. When she thought about the things that she had done just to secure throne, she couldn't help but want to assassinate her beloved husband. Dot. McLean looked at his wives and couldn't help but feel disappointed. The only ones who were calm, 
were Cyrus' mother, Queen Emma, and his two concubines, the rest were just acting like mad raving dogs. For the first time since he married them, they had been screaming and yelling at him non-stop. For a moment, it seemed like they had actually forgotten about his authority. Who the hell were they yelling at? Everyone will move out in a week's time. And like I've said, anyone who doesn't want to follow the rules, will be divorced and sent far away. So if I were you all, I would immediately think it through and stay humble. This is my final warning to you all. Except for Emma, everyone else should get out. Chapter 223 Level 3 Today, the seas were somewhat calm, flat and emotionless. When compared to yesterday's wild and unrestrained currents, Landon was currently laying down on his cabinet bed, when he got a sudden notification from the system. Congratulations host, for completing your mission. Landon opened his eyes and a hint of surprise flashed through his eyes. He was still on his way back to Bay Mud, so he was somewhat astonished that he would receive his rewards when he was away. It seemed that the system would reward him if his task was completed. No matter where he was, before leaving Bay Mud, he had already completed 23 of the mission, which was to create drugs, pass down medical knowledge, and to do all surgical procedures on patients. With the aspect of passing knowledge on, the system required him to start teaching this knowledge now. As one couldn't know everything about biology, pharmacology, and so on in one go. Knowledge like this would take more than five years to digest. Hence he was only required to start teaching the people. So last October, he had first taught the teachers everything they needed to know for the upcoming semester. And by January, those teachers in turn taught the medical and healthcare students as well. Hence with regards to knowledge, Landon had already completed this task way back in January. As for surgery, he had already performed all six main surgical procedures in the hospitals, and had also taken his time in teaching the doctors and nurses on what to do. Of course after treating the patients in their presence, he had allowed them to do the same surgeries under his supervision over 50 times a month. The doctors had delivered babies in his presence, and so on. In fact, while the workers were focused on development, Landon had become a full-time doctor during the winter and had spent his days in the hospital all day long. And by the time he had left Baymard for this mission, those particular mission was marked as complete by the system's standards. So the only thing that took his time, was creating drugs. There were some raw products that Baymard didn't have or grow yet. Hence they could only wait for Santa's ship to bring them forth. For example, some products were abundant in other empires like Terrick and Yodan. So Landon had requested for the seeds to be bought, as well as bags of raw materials too. And even though Corona was generally a month's travel to Baymard by sea, depending on coastal port, other empires were not. Sometimes it would take two to four months for something Landon ordered to arrive. And due to this delay, he could only take his time when creating these drugs. But now, with the system's notification, it seemed that the remaining set of drugs had finally been created and sold to the citizens. With this, his mission was finally accomplished. Dot. Would the host like to receive his rewards now, or would the host like to see his stats first? The system said without any hint of emotion in its voice. Show me my stats first, Landon replied while rubbing his chin. Yes host. Straight away, a large screen appeared before him. Host name, Landon Barn. Age, 16. Status, King of Baymard. Level, somewhat of a novice level 2. Current situation healthy, as well as teach the people on all beginner and intermediate knowledge that host has received. Mission status, completed. 10 other surgical procedures. Advanced knowledge on biology only. 5 other drugs for the host to produce. 5 random medical techniques for treating patients. Recipes to make 10 different classic alcoholic and non-alcoholic beverages from earth. Lastly, 500 development points TP and 3100 technology points TP for creating printing press, paper money, watches, clocks, escalators, photocopying machine, bus. Dot 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 the system listed everything that Landon created. Host will receive 1220 DP. 
13490 p and 6700 pp. With all this, host can also choose to upgrade the system to level 3, using 13,000 TP and 4,500 DP to do so. Host's current balance is 7 DP, 18 TP and 1 BP. The host's current balance is as a result of buying knowledge on printing press machines, photocopying machines, bulletproof vests, paper money, comma, dot, 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 dot. The list went on. Dot. After reading everything, Landon soon realized that he could upgrade again and move towards level 3. It had been over 8 months since he last leveled up, so he was somewhat happy about this realization. System, upgrade to the next level, he said while looking at his screen. As you wish host, 18% completed, 32% completed, 69% completed, 84% completed, 100% completed. System has successfully upgraded to level 3. At this level, the amount of tasks given to the host will increase and the host will have access to more information as well. Host should note that the system is here for peace and development. Hence at this level, the host might have to do several spontaneous requests from the system based on the people's needs, as well as the needs of this world. Hurt Philia. Actually, Landon wasn't too surprised by what the system had said. He had already guessed that the system would try to make him the savior of the world at some point. From the moment he had previously heard about peace treaties from the system, he had instantly known that he would begin his journey of unifying the world. It seemed like he would have to purge the Pino continent before moving on to different continents. Well, these were just his speculations. Who knew what the supposed gods were up to? From what the system had said, his 100 years here would be like a two hour movie up in the heavens. So, as far as he was concerned, he was still an unpaid movie star in their sick show. Dot. After listening to the system for a while, Landon decided to focus on his rewards for the time being. Chapter 224 New Rewards Would Host like to receive his rewards now? Yes, Landon replied. Straight away, a sharp pain pierced through his brain. As if something was trying to hurriedly claw its way in. Ah, the pain only lasted for not more than 38 seconds. And after that, Landon's mind had completely eased up. And after 43 minutes of digesting everything, he slowly opened his eyes, sat up from his bed and massaged his temples in a soothing manner. From his reward, he was given, advanced knowledge on biology only. Five random medical techniques for treating patients. Five other drugs for the host to produce. Ten other surgical procedures which included, four bone marrow procedures, two dental procedures two neck procedures and two waist procedures, 500 development points TP and 3100 technology points TP, and lastly, recipes to make 10 different classical alcoholic and non-alcoholic beverages from earth, vodka, domperignan 2002 champagne, oblaga beer, corona light beer, fanta yellow colored one, Classical red fruit opia, sprite, grape juice, cranberry juice, apple juice. Dot. When Landon saw the list of drinks rewarded to him, he almost jumped. From pure joy, the drinks which were given by system could be placed in five main categories. Liquor, beer, wine, soda drinks and juices. Ah! He had missed some of these drinks dearly. In short, the system had catered to all age groups which was what he had been hoping for. Right now, it would take two more weeks before he arrived at Baymard. So his plan was to start producing at least one of each beverage category before July began. From the ship's speed, if nothing unexpected happened, he would be in Baymard by the third week of June. Bottom story, he needed some of these drinks made before Santa arrived. And from what Santa had told him, they would be arriving around the last week of July, so that gave him plenty of time to get things done before their arrival. Also, it seemed like he would continue his routine of being a part-time doctor, as he now had new surgical procedures to do, as well as new drugs to create. Dot. Once he had absorbed everything in, he immediately clicked on his mission tab and read through it quietly. Main mission, 
host should produce all 10 beverages given by the system, as well as perform all surgical procedures, produce the drugs needed for the patients who undergo those surgeries. Side mission, sign a peace treaty with the Empire of Corona and aid them in training their soldiers in physical combat only. As for the peace treaty, the system has already sent the terms of the treaty into the host's item box. Rewards Host will also receive recipes to make five classic snacks like Lay's and Cheetos from Earth. Host should know that beauty also plays a great part in development. The world here uses unsafe products here, which is detrimental to their health. Like adding iron fillings to their powders, and even drinking some unsafe portions to stay young and reach immortality. Hence, the system will reward the host with the exact formula for creating two types of lip glosses, five colored lipsticks and two types of shampoos. Host will still receive 10 medical procedures, as there are at least 3,500 surgeries procedures that the host needs to do before he dies. Host will also receive instructions for producing five other drugs as well. And lastly, the host will also receive 700 development points DP and 4,300 technology points DP. Deadline no specific time required for completing the main mission. As for the side mission, the system is giving the host 5 months max to get it done. Failure to complete the side mission on time, would result in the destruction of the host's soul. Dot. Landon looked at the side mission and felt a headache coming along. It seemed like the gods had demanded for him to form a treaty with Corona. Honestly he didn't have a problem with that since he felt like they were his kind of people. But what if they refused? Wouldn't that mean that his soul would get blown away into smithereens? Sigh. There was no use thinking about it now. The system wanted it done, so he had no say in the matter. He quickly opened the treaty in his item box and quickly scanned through it. There were over 50 rules listed there, but all these rules were acceptable to London. It banned rape, slavery, murder, fraud and other illegal acts. It also stated that if they had tough prisoners in their empire, then Landon would have to keep these prisoners in Baymard for the time being. It seemed like the system was hinted for him to use the maximum security prison that was still under construction. Bruh. Also, the treaty talked about training their knights in combat only. Well, that was understandable as most of these people weren't flexible at all. If one had to describe them, Landon would say that they were more like musketeers who were great with swords. But, if one compared a musketeer to a secret agent like Black Widow who could fight, was flexible and quick-witted. Then sorry, the musketeers were trash. Landon could also understand why the system only wanted them to train in close combat. This was because Corona had no way of making sure that weapons like guns, never reach their enemies' hands. Just based on the situation with no pline, Landon was sure that the Empire had spies that even worked in the government. So if these weapons got distributed, won't no pline and other criminals get their hands on them as well? Until evil is purged, and the entire world signs a peace treaty. These weapons weren't allowed to reach any one nation's hands. Landon sighed and massaged his tired brain. As the supposed savior of the world, he still had a long way to go from achieving his goals. Dot. Of course while superhero Landon was thinking of how to save the world, Santa on the other hand had just arrived at the capital, and was quickly making his way to the palace. He had to tell them about no pline. Why are you so late? Chapter 225 Santa's Ripper the Capital, The Empire of Corona. Dot. Santa stood at the hallway powerlessly, as he looked at his fire-breathing wife. All his feelings of excitement had been thoroughly washed away by her cold aura. He couldn't help but smile bitterly, as he continuously perspirated under her intense glare. Dot. So why are you so late again? Lie to me, and you're dead, said the stunning beauty before him. Santa looked at his future father-in-law, Carmelo... Dot 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 and grandfather-in-law, Adrian who were currently standing besides Penelope, and hinted for them to help him out a little. But to his dismay, the shameless duo kept looking upwards as if deep in thought, while pretending not to hiss his gestures. Brat. Dot. 
Are you trying to get us into trouble? Since she's your future wife, isn't it only right for you to deal with her? Underscore. Oh, wifey can we talk about it inside? He said helplessly. Sure. But only if you can make it to my study in one piece. Penelope said, while drawing her sword from her sheath. Shing. Wait, wait, wait. Let's talk about it all right, Santa said, as he tried to calm his fire-breathing fiancé who was now running towards him at full speed. His subordinate immediately handed a sword to him as if this was a normal occurrence, and quickly patted his back, as if saying, good luck bro. He didn't know whether to laugh or cry at the welcome party he had received after aiding Corona. This was not what he had in mind, Kling. I wasn't late intentionally you know, he said while pressing closer to her face, Kling, I came late because of a mission, Kling, a mission, well, she sure as hell didn't send him out on any mission, and she was also sure that her family didn't do the same as well, so what stupid mission was he talking about, and if he did go, why the hell would he do so without any backup, if he had died out there just like that, how the hell would she have known all about it, judging from his weak ass sword skills, it was already a miracle that he was still alive after going with no backup, HMMP, since he had abused the traveling freedom that was given him prior to his departure, then he would only travel twice a year max from now on, serves him right, cling, wifey, I know that you're mad at me right now, but believe me, I did this for Corona, the mission was for Corona's safety, underscore. Penelope placed her sword in her sheath and glared at him fiercely. My study, now, with that, she turned around and walked silently, and her faithful husband followed behind her pitifully. Carmelo and Adrian followed the duo, while sighing and shaking their heads wryly at the young couple before them. Santa was indeed perfect for their adorable princess. She was the dominant one, while he was the passive in their relationship. Dot. Bang. So. Those three city lords are working with no line, Carmelo said angry, while hitting his hand hard against a table. He was fuming with rage at the thought of all the illegal activities that had been going on within his empire. Previously, he had thought that he did a marvelous job as king, but now, he knew better. Based on what Santa had said dot 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 for eight years, these people had built and used these underground camps right under their noses, hence making a fool out of him and his family, and to make matters worse, all these city lords had sent letters to, to Penelope, talking about their own made up stories about the occurrences around their cities, those city lords had claimed that several innocent women and children had died from those disasters, and due to this, they had requested for a ton of money to pay off the families, and many more requests. Fortunately, they hadn't sent anyone to investigate the issues yet. Since they had just received these letters a few days ago, if these city lords dared to lie to them, then meant that they could also threaten people to act like they had lost their family members as well. Adrian was also pissed off as well. In short, he had already made a mental note to deal with them in the nearest future. How dare they disregard the royal family orders just to fill up their pockets. It looked like he would have to pay these places a visit real soon. Are you sure that no one was hurt? Grandpa Adrian asked. Yes grandfather-in-law. I even passed through one of those cities on my way here. There wasn't any damage to the city as well as the main roads. The phenomenon only occurred around the forests. No innocent citizens died. Just the guards who were guarding those underground camps. It's obvious that they were planning to use the money they requested, in getting more guards rather than aiding the people. But, should we oblige them, on one hand if we give them money, then they'll think that they had successfully deceived us, and in doing so, we wouldn't be able to alert no pline. But on the other hand, if we don't give them money, then they might start fearing our counter-attack and alert no pline, Penelope said. Even though they knew that giving the money was more beneficial, their hearts were still heavy at the thought that they would be giving criminals the citizens hard-earned money. Taxes collected, and most times, money could be sent out to aid those in need. The thought of giving the money to greedy nobles, rather than hungry peasants made their bloods boil slightly. No one wanted to be treated like a fool. 
so it was indeed painful to send money to someone who took them as such. Actually, you all don't worry about this matter. He'll handle it, Santa said. In fact, he had made a huge steal from these missions with Landon, so he was willing to use part of the money to solve this problem for him. This was money that he didn't work for as a merchant. And it wasn't coming from Karina's treasury, so it was okay for them to use it. Let's go with what you said then. Chapter 226 A Royal Vacation What about the slaves? Are you sure that this brother of yours can be trusted? Carmelo asked curiously. Absolutely. I wouldn't have even left my other sworn brother there if I didn't trust him that well. It's strange, we've only known each other for a while now. But straight away, I can tell that he's somewhat similar to me. Santa went on to talk about everything he knew about Landon. Of course. He particularly kept out details about Baymard's development. Since he wanted them to be thoroughly surprised when they got there. He had just told them that he would take them for a vacation, and that was all. When he showed them the VIP passes, their eyes immediately lit up as they looked at its cool sleek appearance in Marvel. They looked at Santa's mischievous smile, and came to a conclusion that his land and fellow wasn't as easy as he seemed. A person who was abandoned by an entire empire, wouldn't have the guts to take down any of Noplin's forces, except he was absolutely sure of his strength. Coupled with these cool looking VIP passes before them, they couldn't help but wonder what Baymard was actually like. We're going, Carmelo and Adrian said at once. Sure, but the only thing that I can promise you all, is that if we don't bring my mother-in-laws, aunties and my cousin-in-laws, then they would personally kill us all when we get back. That's why even though we have only 10 VIP passes here, it doesn't mean that the number of people going has to be restricted. Carmelo's eyes lit up and he smiled. Since he was going, then he might as well bring his two wives, as well as his sister and her family along. As for Adrian, he would be joining them alone. Since his wife Carmelo's mother, passed away a long time ago. In Santa's own case, he planned to take his mother, his sisters as well as their children for this trip. Of course he had hoped for his father to join as well, if he would only agree to it. The man was all work and no play. Pumpkin, would you be okay without using Corona? Asked the doting grandpa Adrian. I'm not alone remember? Even though you both are leaving, I still have Uncle Samuel Carmelo's brother and the other ministers by my side. Penelope answered with a rare smile on her face. In truth. Everyone in the empire doted on her like a priceless item. So she always had hundreds of people looking out for her wherever she went. Some of the ministers even took her as their adopted daughter who they pampered effortlessly. As for her doting uncle, he was the same breed as her father and grandfather. In her opinion, this vacation was a good break from some of her overly doting family members. She loved them dearly, but sometimes they were just too much for her to handle especially her mom. The only thing that made her a little sad, was that Santa was going to leave again. Benji, you can leave and show them the way. But after two weeks, I expect you to come back immediately. They can stay for as long as they wanted to. But in your case, don't even think about it. Dot. Riverdale City, RK Dean. Dot. So you're saying that those group of knights went there but never came back? Marder was sitting on this throne arrogantly, as he looked at the lowly hunter who had come to give a report about the suspicious men he had seen a while back. A while ago, he had been hunting deep in the forest, when he saw a group of knights jump onto the roads from the other side of the woods. He was around the outskirts of Riverdale City that was facing the direction towards Baymard City when he saw those knights come out from the woods. Fear? Fear quickly engulfed him, and he hurriedly hid himself for more than an hour, while waiting for the men to disappear from his sight. And after realizing that they had gone to Baymard, his fear instantly turned to confusion. Weren't they afraid of Alec Barnes' wrath? Anyway, just to be sure that they wouldn't attack Riverdale next, he had been hunting around that area ever since. And the more he kept to look out, the more anxious he became. His entire family and their surviving generations, all resided in Riverdale City, so he felt that it was his obligation to warn their new city lord about this matter. 
lest those knights plan to attack the city, Pabio, yes my lord, give this man six silver coins for his troubles, Marda commanded, five minutes later, the man had left in gratitude towards the new city lord, my lord, should I send people to investigate this matter, knight captain Pabio asked, Marda thought for a while and shook his head slightly, right now, his forces were weak, so he was afraid of offending someone he shouldn't, if those men hadn't returned yet, that meant that they had successfully killed Alec Barnes bastard son, and claimed Baymard for themselves, thinking about it thoroughly, these knights had probably passed through the woods just to evade Riverdale city, so it was clear that their target wasn't his city to begin with, he was a knight himself, so he knew how these things worked, if they truly wanted to attack him, then they wouldn't have waited for so long just to do so, they had gone through that route because they wanted everything to be done in secrecy, so if he sent spies and they got caught, these people might think that he was their enemies, with his current strength, he couldn't afford any battles at the moment, hence he would investigate the matter thoroughly, but not right now, a month from now, send even Shylock to look into this matter, by then, those men would have properly settled down in Baymard, so it should be fine to just stroll into the town as usual, but in the meantime, keep an eye out on the roads leading to Baymard, as well as the forest region, just in case they plan to launch any attacks on us, even though we're weak right now, that doesn't mean that we'll welcome any threats whatsoever. Chapter 227 Back at home time passed by quickly, and just like that, Baymard had entered the third week of June. And Landon was finally back. Dot. Welcome back your majesty, said the soldiers, who were around the harbor. Landon looked around and smiled, everything looked as it should be. When they were closing in on Baymard from the ocean, they could see several buildings and structures on each coastal district. With most buildings having a huge arrow sign on top of them, all the arrow signs pointed towards District I, which was where the visitors, merchants, and fishermen were supposed to be. The arrows were so massive, that only a blind person would miss them, and based on what he said prior to his departure, those arrows should light up at night like all those Las Vegas signboards back on Earth. Standing on the transformed harbor, Landon couldn't help but nod in satisfaction. Yup. Dot. It was perfect. The workers had already removed all those old rusted wooden stands. And had replaced it with steel and concrete. For the harbor, Landon had chosen the most common and well used harbor designs back on Earth. The general outlook of it would be like a giant octopus. Now. One could imagine that the octopus rectangular head and body region was where the offices, police stations, and so on were, but its tentacles that stretched into the ocean, was where the ships would have to dock once they arrive at Baymard, so that was generally how harbors were like, from the land, people would build bridges that stretched into the ocean, and ships would lock alongside these bridges to create more room for others, of course with how huge the harbor was supposed to be. The workers had only done 15 of the work so far, but this amount was enough to host at least 80 massive ships at once. They had been working on this harbor for three months now, so Landon thought that it was okay. Again, these bridges would have branches at different points, so as to accommodate more ships in future. One long bridge had five branches making the bridge look like a tree. Each branch could dock four massive ships on both sides, two to its left and another two to its right, and apart from these branches, there was still space along the main bridge to dock six more ships on it, so in total, each main bridge along the harbor could dock a maximum of 26 massive ships on them, hence building these bridges were top priority, when creating a harbor, and so far, the workers had only been able to build three of these bridges ever since departure, dot, oceans, seas, and lakes were often beautiful. But they weren't necessarily convenient places to build things, most tools and construction materials. Not to mention the labor force, work better in the dry, and yet, many infrastructures humans depended on, like dams and bridges across the seas, were constantly being built back on earth. So, how did they do it? Simple, 
they dewatered around the chosen area for these projects. Of course there are many dewatering techniques that we commonly used back on earth, but since Baymard's docks weren't being built far into the ocean, then the simplest technique could be used here. Of course if it were bridges that spanned for miles across the water, then that would be a different matter in its own altogether. In Baymard's case, the workers dumped soil into the water until it was tall enough to create an embankment around their chosen area, hence making some sort of fortress. From the, the water inside the fortress got pumped out, and the workers quickly placed steel sheets around the fortress for additional support to the sand. Of course since soil is somewhat permeable, the workers had to constantly pump the water out so as to keep their fortress dry, and from there, they drove the heavy machines to the bottom of the ocean fortress floors, and got to work ASAP. Once the workers finished creating the cemented dock bridges, they immediately cleared out and got on top of the newly built bridge. From there, heavy machines like cranes, carefully removed all those steel sheets that were keeping the sand embankment together. They also created several holes around the sand, so as to let the water flow into the fortress, hence allowing the ocean level, to return to its original height around the newly built bridge dock. Anyway, construction was still going on around the harbor. As Landon expected at least 12 more dock bridges to be constructed before they could stop, but with the addition of these new slaves, Landon was very sure that they would be able to finish the entire harbor sooner than expected. The slaves who had just come out of the ship were thoroughly confused at the sight before them. This grayish colored harbor was nothing like they had seen before. Walking on it, they couldn't help but wonder if they were still in Arcadine. VRMMM. The slaves could hear several unfamiliar loud noises two bridges away, that were coming from within a large hole around the water. Most of them stretched their necks in hopes of catching a glimpse into the hole. And when they saw several yellow colored carriages pushing dirt and constructing the bridges, their eyes immediately widened from shock. What sort of carriages were these? Landon looked at the slaves and couldn't help but shake his head wryly. Indeed. For those who were seeing this for their first, it was the same as seeing a real-life bumblebee transformer. The feeling was awesome. Dot. After all the slaves had been sorted out into their residences, Landon told them to line up outside the residence tomorrow at 9 a.m. prompt. From there, they would be assigned to various jobs, as well as have a grand tour around Baymard. They needed to know Baymard's rules and sign a non-disclosure contract as well. Once the slaves were well taken care of, Landon immediately sent for all the supervisors to meet him here, as well as all the main government officials, officers, head teachers and so on. It was time for an emergency meeting. Chapter 228 An official meeting Landon was currently seating in a conference room within the new coastal port, for visitor check-in and check-out within District I. The hall was massive. And seating across from him, were more than 30 people who were the heads of their individual professions, be it the chief cleaner, chief bank manager, chief accountant for the construction industry dot 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 or even the chief overseer for the horse ranch, everyone was here dot. Great. I called you all first and foremost to thank you all for your hard work and commitment during my absence. Even though I don't know how far your individual workplaces had gone with our original plans, I'm sure that everyone must have done their best during this time frame. So once again, thank you all, Landon said while bowing to them. Your Majesty, it was nothing. Please raise your head. Your Majesty, it was our honor. Your Majesty, underscore. They all spoke embarrassingly as their hearts got filled with warmth, which king could do what his majesty had done. Their king was neither proud nor haughty, when facing them. He was always polite and friendly, as well as very patient, when telling them what to do. If they made a mistake, he would never kill them or punish them harshly like other kings. He was their backbone. And they had been grateful to him ever since his arrival at Baymard. Landon looked at them and smiled and his heart felt warmth from within as well. It's been over a year since he started this crazy journey with them. And since then, 
he too had felt a close connection with them as well. Dot. Let's talk about July. Soon, visitors will storm this place on a daily basis. So here's what I need you all to focus on. Let's start with food, Chief Lai Or. How was the assignment, Your Majesty? At the beginning of April, we had a lot of issues without your guidance, Your Majesty. But by May, everything had picked up well, and we've been improving these products since then. We've successfully made sugar, biscuits, popcorn, pretzel sticks, waffles and pancakes, store packaged mixtures, boxed fried wings with different seasonings, and lastly, ice cream. Lior said excitedly, heaven knows how hard he had worked on these products. He only hoped that his efforts were good enough to please reach his majesty's expectations. Chef Blake, Chef Benita, what about you both? Your majesty, using some of the ingredients made, we were able to make pretzel buns and seven types of pizzas Chef Benita replied, as well as fifteen types of sandwiches and several different pastries cupcakes, and so on. Your Majesty, it was a complete success, Chef Blake added. Good, she lie or. Within this time frame, I want you to create these listed here, Landon said while passing a notebook towards Lior. The earlier he made these drinks, the sooner his mission would be completed. After dealing with Lior, Landon focused on giving new drug formulas to the pharmaceutical industry, as well as giving new demands for Tim's industry. Previously, he forgot to create bicycles. But now that the thought about it, it made no sense for there to be skateboards and roller skates without bicycles. Hence he had decided to create them as well. Also, he had realized something while walking into the coastal port. There were no luggages for travelers to buy and place their things in. Here's the thing. He wasn't going for all those fancy luggages. No. On the contrary, he just wanted simple made luggages with wheels on them. In this era, people used worn out clothes to sew bags and dump all their clothes into. For larger items, they would wield metal trunks and carry them all over the place. Wasn't it easier to roll their luggage through, rather than carrying it on their heads and shoulders? Hence he decided to make simple clothed luggage bags that were fiber made, and not hard cased or luxury brand types. These ones were your average wheeled traveling bags in Walmart and so on. With this, traveling should be made better for the visitors. When they arrived at Baymart, Landon also wanted several sizes as well, from extra small to XXL. Dot. Time passed by and the meeting was reaching its conclusion. Lastly, let's talk about money. From all three missions, Landon had spent his time counting all bags of coins with the soldiers, and had already labeled how much was in each bag. Of course after settling Santo and giving the slaves enough money pay for two months rent and their daily needs, Landon was left with a total amount of, 215 gold coins 21,500 silver coins or 21.5 million copper coins. This was indeed a lot of money. Hence he decided to split it up like so. 5% stays with the royal family. 35% stays in Baymard's personal bank account in case of any unforeseen incidents in the nearest future. Things like wars, natural disasters, hunger and so on. 30% will be kept in all bank accounts of national forces. Be it army, police and so on. Of course since he planned on training the Navy firefighters this month, then they would also be included in this amount as well. And 30% will be shared amongst all businesses within Baymard and kept in their bank accounts. This money was emergency money. And would only be used for expanding their workplaces or investing in projects and so on. This was the only time that they would have this benefit. As in the future, Landon was hoping that with more customers they would have enough money for their paying for such projects. Right now. Landon gave this away as capital for major projects. For example prior to leaving, Landon had footed 42% of the bill for remodeling the old school estate and changing it into its new appearance. Of course the school had also taken a loan from the bank, which covered 17% of the total cost needed. As for the rest, they paid it up front using their profits from tuition. Previously, they never used to pay for tuition. But from January this year, 
it all changed. Landon used to foot the bills for the teacher's salaries. But he couldn't keep doing that forever. And since everyone was somewhat well off in Baymard, then it was time to pay for them to pay for their children's tuitions. Of course those who were orphans had government plans which took care of their matters. How else were they supposed to pay their teachers? What if the school wanted more desks, chairs and so on? Where was the money supposed to come from? Tuition was a must. The only thing was that, he made it cheap for those in Baymard. The real people who would spend money would be the international students. In fact, Landon felt like these times were Baymard's baby stages, so it needed all the help it could get. But once more international students, visitors and customers come. Then their profits would soar high up into the skies. Not to talk of the profits that they would get from all the goods that they had produced. In fact, they needed customers for their city to boom as well as merchants who would take their products throughout the fun o continent and the world. Meeting adjourned. Chapter 229 Firefighters and Baymard's Marine, Navy and Coast Guard Academy After leaving the coastal region, Landon immediately headed towards Toulouse's office. It was time to train Baymard's first firefighters, as well as other military forces. Dot. How do we train these firefighters? Lucius asked. This son of his had always managed to surprise him every time they saw each other. It was like his brain was an entire warehouse filled with ingenious ideas. From what Landon had told him, these firefighters were also seen as rescuers. They could rescue people from trapped spaces like mines. As we as aid people and animals during other emergency situations. They also rescued people from within hazardous materials, poisonous gases, chemical spills, and so on. Lucius felt like having firefighters was definitely a must, especially for the city. And apart from that, they also took care of fires anywhere, be it in burning buildings, burning forests and so on. If someone accidentally lit the trees in the national park on fire, then the people were to send for the firefighters immediately, with radio waves and walkie-talkies around. The police officers at every point within Baymard, could report these matter to the firefighters as well. Presently, the Baymard's protection forces, like the army and police station, all had several communication rooms within their premises. These rooms were filled with wires, receivers and so on that aided them in contacting their different office stations around Baymard. Within these rooms, they could even send Morse codes, as well as talk to each other from various offices as well. If Landon were to describe these rooms, he would say that they were very much similar to how army communication rooms in the 18th century were. Everything was too big, and required more soldiers to maneuver the entire thing on a daily basis, these rooms were filled with several soldiers that sat there for hours. As they paid attention to the radio frequency communication devices all around them. Typically, if any emergency occurred at the other stations. Then they would get the message instantly, and quickly relay it to their supervisors. Likewise, the police station had those as well for them. They would wait patiently for messages from those officers who were around the city as we as relay message back to them again. If a police officer called for backup, then they'd be able to send reinforcements ASAP. Anyway, the fire stations would also have their own communication systems as well. It would be good for them to rescue people faster, just in case a fire really did break out. So will you open an academy for them? Lucius asked while reading the notes in his hands. Yes but it's going to be short. They'll study and graduate after three years. And while they studied, they still needed to attend the classes at the public school as well. Of course they would work part-time while studying. And when they graduate, they'd get hired as full-time workers by then. Landon replied, fires weren't the only things that firefighters focused on. They also had to take training and certifications for chemical identifications, leak controls, decontamination, smoke rescue situations, and so on. Firefighters alone had to get over seven certifications before they could go on the fields. So when they graduated, they would get these certification licenses, and begin their full-time jobs. One should know that these certifications could only last for 12 years. 
so once they expired, the firefighters would have to keep renewing them by taking several theoretical and physical exams again. In every field, things change all the time. Hence, it was important for these men to stay ahead of the game when it concerned the safety of others. For their teachers, well get more warrant officers to sign up for that as well. As for the campus building, well use the estate that's close to the police academy. It'll tell some workers to renovate the place while they study there. That's good then. So now that we've concluded with the firefighters, let's move on to the next group. With the completion of the boot camp at the upper region... and the facility at the coastal region. How do you plan to train these new military forces? Lucius asked. He was really curious about this particular topic. Well their training is somewhat similar to that of the army. With just a few differences here and there. Landon replied. Prior to leaving, he had asked the workers to build a boot camp or an academy. As well as the navy and marine facility at the coastal region. Of course with everything done. He felt like he should start training these recruits immediately. He planned to train coastal guards, marine forces, as well as navy soldiers. Navy armed forces were only supposed to handle water-based operations. They typically dealt with any approaching enemies that tried to attack Baymard from its shores. These forces used ships, submarines and so on, to invade their enemy's defenses. As for the marines, they were a typical infantry force that specialized in supporting navy and army operations at both land and sea. In essence, these marine soldiers could hop from one ship to another, capture ships, and so on. Hence, they were sort of seen as stealthy pirates. Sometimes, they could even use these ships, sail towards the shores, and raid their enemy's camp. As for coast guards, they were usually the for doing things like search and rescues, and enforcing a country's ocean laws. If someone went out swimming, and was reported missing, then they had a responsibility to keep searching the waters, until the corpse was found. The coast guards were also in charge of port security and military readiness, as well as environmental protection for all sea life. Lucius read through their duties calmly, while nodding his head in agreement. As for their ranks, he was also impressed by them as well. The Navy and Coast Guard rankings were exactly the same, and were divided up into three categories, the enlisted, warrant officers and officer grades. The soldiers would start from the enlisted category and move up till they were at the officer grade category. The ranks were as follows. Enlisted grade, takes six months to move up a grade as well. E1, Private Private E2, Private First Class PFC E3, Lance Corporal LCPL E4, Corporal Corporal E5, Sergeant Sergeant E6, Staff Sergeant SSGT E7, Gunnery Sergeant GSGT E8, Master Sergeant MSGT E9, First Sergeant First SGT Another E9 Master Gunnery Sergeant MGSGT, E9, Sergeant Major SGT Ma, E9 Special, Sergeant Major of the Marine Corps SMMC. Warrant Officers takes two years to move up a grade, rank W1, Warrant Officer 1 W001, W2, Chief Warrant Officer 2 CW2, W3, Chief Warrant Officer 3 CW3, W4, Chief Warrant Officer 4 CW4, W5, Chief Warrant Officer 5 CW5. Officer Grades, most take 2.5 years to rank up. 01, Ensign ENS. 02, Lieutenant Junior Grade LTJG. 03, Lieutenant LT. 04, Lieutenant Commander LCDR. 05, Commander CDR 3 tiers to rank up. 06, Captain Captain 3.5 years to rank up. 07, Rear Admiral Lower Half RDML 4 years. 08, Rear Admiral Upper Half RDMU 4 years. 09, Vice Admiral VADM 4.5 years. 010, Admiral Chief of Naval Operations Commandant of the Coast Guard ADM 4.5 years. 011, Fleet Admiral FADM 5 years. Dot. Let me guess. He'll be the fleet admiral as well? Locuus asked playfully. He was the current Lethianly one within Baymard who could assume such a role. 
So the answer was very obvious, yes. But I want some captains and warrant officers from the army, to also join the navy team as well. They have a lot more experience when handling weapons. So I'm sure that they'd be able to lead several the recruits in attacking any enemy ships successfully. Landon replied, what if he wasn't around, and Lucius was at the city wall attacking Baymard's enemies? Then who would protect the waters? What he needed were capable soldiers that could ensure Baymard's victory. Hence he was thinking of having Thray and Gary focus on battleship wars, and since they would join this team, they could also act as Marine Corps and go on missions as well. Of course he wouldn't force them to leave the army, since he wanted them to decide on what route they wanted to take on their own. For now, he would just give them the best of both worlds. And after a certain time frame, he would ask them again to pick a side. Either way, they would still maintain their positions and would still be working under Lucius. So he didn't think that it would be a huge issue for them. As for the Marines, their ranking system was also as follows. Enlisted grade, takes six months to move up a grade. E1, Seaman Recruit SR. E2, Seaman Apprentice SR. E3, Seaman SN. E4, Petty Officer 3rd Class PO3. E5, Petty Officer 2nd Class PO2. E6. Petty Officer First Class PO1, E7, Chief Petty Officer CPO, E8, Senior Chief Petty Officer SCPO, E9, Master Chief Petty Officer MCPO, Another E9, Command Master Chief Petty Officer KMCPO, E9 Special, Master Chief Petty Officer of the Navy MCPON. Warrant Officers takes two years to move up a grade, starts at W2. Chief Warrant Officer 2 Go 2, W3, Chief Warrant Officer 3 Co 3, W4, Chief Warrant Officer 4 Co 4, W5, Chief Warrant Officer 5 Co 5. Officer grades, most take 2.5 years to rank up, 01, Second Lieutenant 2nd LT, 02, First Lieutenant 1st LT, 03, Captain Captain, 04, Major Major, 05. Lieutenant Colonel Col 3 tiers to rank up. 06, Colonel Col 3.5 years. 07, Brigadier General Gen 3.5 years. 08, Major General Maj Gen 4 years. 09, Lieutenant General LT Gen 4 years. 010, General Gen 4.5 years. Dot. After talking with Lucius for a while, Landon immediately went back to the castle to rest. With all those caged animals from his mission, it was finally time to add in another attraction site for his visitors. Tomorrow, he would start construction on Baymard's National Zoo. Chapter 230 The Last Batch of Slaves The next day, Landon woke up early and headed over to the estate where the newly arrived slaves were staying. This batch was the largest that they had ever received and would also be the last batch of slaves that Landon would take in for the time being. They had welcomed a total of 19,498 people from all three underground camps. Everyone was young, fit and able, with the women being all below the age of 26, while the men were all below the age of 34. 58% of the population were female, while the rest were male. During their mission to the last two underground camps, they had realized that the city lords of these places had kept over hundreds of slave boys locked up in several large estates. Apparently, these city lords had been slowly torturing and training them tirelessly, so that they could become knights under their rule. The men were trained to be fighters, while the women were typically used as objects for lust. These men were never allowed to leave the estates, until they had given their loyalty to these city lords. In essence, they resembled those ancient Roman gladiators back on earth, who fought and lived in the Colosseums their entire lives. Spartacus was an example of such gladiators. They were never allowed to leave the Colosseum, until they fought for their freedom about a hundred times. Sometimes, they would battle each other, while other times, they would fight ferocious beasts. Some had ended but fighting for more than 30 years without even winning their freedoms back. The amount of winnings needed for freedom were just too much. 
it was almost like the Romans didn't want them to leave. The only difference between these rescued men and those ancient Romans, was that these ones weren't fighting with each other in front of a massive crowd. These ones would never be freed. They were being trained as part of Noplin's army for future wars. Freedom was not an option. The people of this world thought that it was a total waste to have men kill each other just for fun. So they let the women do those fights in the underground camps instead. Men were seen as valuable resources for power. Dot. Anyway, when they had successfully rescued some of the women at the second camp, a few had said that they wouldn't leave without their brothers which had left Landon thoroughly surprised. He had no idea about these estates. So they quickly made up another plan that same night, and hurriedly rescued those gladiator men. So of course after rescuing those at the second and third cities, he had no choice but to go back to the first city that he had attacked and free those other gladiators as well. This while ordeal made him spend more time than planned on this mission. But it was definitely worth it. Some of these men had been in those estates since they were nine years old. And had never left the place since then. They had probably been whipped, bullied and beaten by their instructors for being weak. Some had been there for more than nine years now, making them had more combat experience when compared to other. This was perfect. As he needed more military men for the marines navy and so on. But amongst these men, he was also sure that there would be many who wouldn't want to ever touch a sword again. This was still okay, as more workers were still needed around Baymard as well. No matter how he looked at it, this mission was truly a blessing in disguise to him. Baymard had gotten more money, animals, over 18 carts of free grains, which he would've probably bought from Santa as well as more people. It was definitely a win-win situation for Baymard. As well as Corona. Dot. Standing before the crowd, Landon quickly gave a shirt speech that summarized Baymard's rules and regulations and so on. Amongst the group of 19,498 slaves, 1,207 were children below the ages of 15 public school. 370 volunteered to join the hospital. 92 decided to be teachers at the public school. 419 decided to join the business academy for training accountants. And so on, since they were learned. 398 government officials. For working at agricultural council environmental safety council and so on. 112 decided to be caretakers, 251 decided to be cooks, and 7620 volunteered to be in the military and other citizen protection forces. From this group that still chose to still fight, Landon had decided to send 1000 to the army, 1500 to navy, 1500 coast guards, 1,500 to the Marines, 800 as police officers, 800 as security guards, 520 as firefighters. Of course when Landon had made it clear that women could join in as well, several girls had volunteered too. Dot, 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 as they felt like they had to get strong enough to protect their younger ones too. Dot. Overall, after clearing out all the volunteers, Landon was left with 9,030 workers, which he divided up amongst all the industries and workplaces around Baymard. He sent some to the newly established oil industry as well. Ever since winter, he had specifically told them to start building individual industries for several products. Previously, oil production was a branch under the alchemy industry. But now, they had finally finished construction on its separate industry a little distance from the alchemy industry. The overseer for this industry, was one of Wiggins' friends. As well as the supervisor who used to look after the oil production department. So with his expertise and experience, Landon felt like he had left the industry in safe hands. Apart from the oil production plant, several other industries like rubber, plastic, light bulb production industries, were still under construction. So once they were done, they would move out immediately as well. Of course many departments like the car manufacturing companies, the weapon manufacturing industry and so on, had already moved out long ago. Bottom line, construction was always going on in Baymard. 
and several projects were already underway. Now that you all are settled, please kindly follow these officials and get your identification cards done immediately, as well as sign non-disclosure agreements too. 1043A.M. After dealing with the new recruits, Landon quickly looked at his watch and hurriedly made his way to the construction industry. Yesterday, he had told Tim to select 1,000 construction workers for today's project. Chapter 231 Baymards National Zoo Your Majesty, the construction materials have already been loaded up into the trucks. And the workers and myself are ready to go. Tim said excitedly. He felt like today was his birthday. Usually, he would only help out at the construction sites from now and then. But this time, he would be involved throughout the entire process. So how could he not be excited? Prior to Landon's arrival in Baymard, he had always been a person who had always been fascinated by creating things in his blacksmith workshop, as well as aiding the people in building thing homes. So when he became overseer, he didn't have the time to take on an entire construction project on his own. But now, his majesty had given him the opportunity to do so. Excitement and eagerness was written all over Tim's face, as he hurriedly looked at the design plan that Landon had given him yesterday. In truth, he was wholeheartedly amazed by Landon's thorough design. His majesty's design plan had taken into consideration two main criteria: the number of people coming over, and how long they would be stopping by at each attraction site. If their experience was super short and boring, then it wouldn't leave a lasting impression on the visitors. One needed a way to captivate them, making them feel like the trip was worth it. Plus, more people meant more money for Baymard. Hence the design plan had to be flawless. So far, Landon had successfully collected 11 types of ferocious animals from his mission. He got, Hangols, Boundles, Lechhuns, Catilones, Mountain Lions, Pumas, Snow Wolves, Cougars, blue bears, green bears and saber toothed tigers. Even though some of these animals were familiar to those back on earth, their skin colors and sizes were completely different. Take for example blue bears. These bears looked like regular bears, but their skin tones were blue, and they could only grow up to 5 feet tall. But for some reason, their teeth and claws were longer than regular bears and they literally had ears that were as long as a wolf's. Even the saber-toothed tigers had strawberry-colored skin, and were as huge as a moose. In fact, most animals in this world were something else altogether. And luckily for Landon, he had successfully acquired 327 caged animals of all 11 species. Now apart from these 11, Landon had previously asked Santa to bring 15 more types of animals when he arrived in July. These animals were, deers, reindeers, moose, elks, geese, wolverines, hedgehogs, guinea pigs, ducks, turtles, hares, bisons, lynx, woodpeckers, and beavers. Buying these animals wasn't particularly hard as they were all almost everywhere within the Pino continent. Owning animals was seen as a sign of prestige. People owned tigers, mountain lions and so on dot 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 just to brag to their friends, so Santa could easily get these animals for Landon. Birds like the woodpeckers, were very expensive and was mostly owned by several noble women. Of course in future, he would get things like apes from the other parts of the world. But for now, he could only get the ones found within this continent. Apart from the animals that would get placed at the zoo, Landon had also requested for Santa to bring in several dogs as well. Especially the Eskimo dogs that were mostly found around the Empire of the Empire of Deiferous, and the north and east of Arcadina. Santa could buy these dogs from Corona as well since merchants had been selling them all through the Pino continent. Some of those dogs would be trained for the military, guard and police forces, while others would be taken care of and placed at a pet store. Landon felt like if anyone wanted a dog, then they had the right to get them as pets. Anyway concerning the zoo, Landon had made plans to have 26 different types in total. Dot. As for the structure of the place, 
land and wanted to organize each animal's territory based on their preferences. So rather than placing them in tight caged spaces, he would prefer to keep them outdoors like most zoos do. Each animal species territory would have massive areas that are enclosed by either fences, glass walls and so on. The key point is that the ferocious animals needed more space to run climb and so on. So most zoos would create man-made rooks, lakes, caves and cliffs for them. As well as strategically plant several trees as well. Of course when designing these things, one needs to take into account how high and far the animal can jump from each fake cliff. No matter what, these animals should never be able to escape their enclosed territories. Bottom line, with all the animals and their massive territories. To put it simply, a visitor could walk for more than 510 minutes around certain animal territories without stopping. Like a bear-toothed tiger that was as huge as a moose or the mountain lions. Even smaller animals like beavers, needed to have their space to build dams around them and made streams in their territories. Imagine 150 beavers in that same area. Dot. Heck. They needed all the space they could get. That's why most outdoor zoos gave the option of having tour rides around the zoos. Which could even take up to an hour, when passing elephants, giraffes and so on. For Landon he had a lots of ferocious animals that needed a lot of space to form their packs or herds in that space. Hence things like fake cliffs and caves took a lot of space to begin with. Also, due to how high the animals enclosed space may be. Most zoos would have several wide tourist bridges at different elevation points, so that the guests can view the animals from above. In some zoos, these bridges could even go up as high as those fake cliffs, making the guests come face to face with the animals on top of those rocks. Dot. As for the safety and medical care of these animals, Landon had decided that each animal's territory should have a massive building that would cater to their needs. These buildings would have passages and compartments that connected the animal's territory to the building. For example when it was time to for feeding, if the animals were friendly, then the caretakers could just walk through a door from the building and step into the animal's territory. But if the animal was ferocious, then the caretakers would stand on tall long bridges that extended from the second or third floor of the building, and throw chunks of meat down to the animals. In fact, one could imagine the scene in Jurassic World, where Chris Pratt was feeding the dinosaurs from a bridge as well. And just in case it was raining, they could still place the food in a large mechanical box that would dispatch the food out to the animals. Of course when it rained or snowed, the animals could take shelter at the various caves, and other structures around their territory. Also, when they had to be treated or vaccinated, the animals would be shot with tranquilizers to keep them down. Lest they injure the workers, Landon had based his architectural designs, as well as safety precautionary methods, from more than 12 famous outdoor zoos back on Earth. For the fact that it was outdoors. Landon just had to focus on building the roads, enclosing areas with fences, glass and other protective barriers. He also had to create fake bonds or lakes, rocks, cliffs and other natural scenarios. As well as construct several buildings for the zoo, these buildings would mostly focus on the entertainment aspect and day-to-day -day running of the zoo. Up first, Landon had also decided to build several one-floor buildings after every attraction. More specifically, these buildings would have drinks and foods like fried wings and ice cream. And of course restrooms as well. Also for friendlier animals like the hares and turtles. The guests could pay to go into their territories and feed them too. There will also be a new cub section where the guests would be allowed to feed bottled milk to baby tigers and other wild animals as well. Mobbing on, Landon had also decided to have a massive building at the front of the zoo as well. This building will take care of multiple services like, entree fees, lost and found, first aid, baby care centers, and handicap services. It also had an area for the booking zoo tours, as well as restrooms, dinners, shopping stores for products like zoo logo printed shirts with animal design on it and so on. In addition at the front of the park, there would also be a bus stop, car parking and train stop too. In short, 
Landon had made sure that this zoo would appease people of all age groups. Dot. Looking at the well-detailed plan, Tim couldn't help but smile from ear to ear, Your Majesty, can we go now? Chapter 232 Zoo Construction VRRMMM Over a hundred machines filled the construction site, as the workers went about their assigned tasks. Some workers were busy leveling up the fields, while others were marking up other regions within the territory. They had marked up about 80 acres of land, which was the average size of regular zoos. On average, most zoos take two to three hours for visitors to completely walk through them. So they had a lot of land to mark up and level. But because 65% of the zoo was going to be outdoors, it took relatively less time for all 1,000 workers to work on the other 35%. And nine days later, the men had successfully leveled up all areas that would have buildings, roads, fake ponds and so on. Also, during these nine days, the new recruits who later joined the group on the second day, were busy learning all they could from these construction veterans. They had been overwhelmed with surprise, curiously and amazement as they went about their new professions. It took a while for their excitement to sink in. As even before their eyes, they realized how larger than life Baymard was. To be specific, they looked at his majesty in awe and reverence, while wondering how one could come up with all these things. He was their life saver, as well as a god. They immediately wanted to prove themselves as being worthy of his trust by doing the best they could at work. Dot. Senior, what is this? It's called a measuring tape. When you measure a certain distance, always write down the s.i units as well. That way, well know if it's in inches or centimeters. This machine is a mixer. We use it to mix cement, sand, water and aggregates together. So that we can form concrete. Concrete? What's that? Erm. Um, you those smooth stone looking buildings around Baymart? That's concrete. It's one of the materials used to replace stone when we do construction. Senior. Am I doing it right? Getting better. The problem is that when you mark the fields, you don't follow a straight pattern. Your markings are somewhat crooked. Underscore. With the land marked and leveled up, Landon quickly decided to focus on their zoo's entrance. Immediately. He divided the men into four groups, those that will pave the car parks, train and bus stops, those that will place underground pipes, cables and so on, those that will make the gate and fence, and those that will pave the massive entrance space between the zoo's massive gates and the car park. This entrance space was supposed to be very huge and wide. In essence, it would take one six minutes to walk from the car park to the entrance gate. Landon wanted it to have statues of various animals at different points around the entrance, as well as a large billboard that shows the zoo's logo, opening closing days and hours, and so on. Of course since the zoo's name was already on the massive gate up front, Landon felt like it would be redundant to add it to the billboard again. And while all this was going on, the group that was meant to place the cables and pipes also did their jobs. Since the pipe and cages trenches had already been dug days ago, all they had to do was place the pipes and cables in, all the way into the park. Landon had decided to let them continue this routine until they succeeded in completely piping and wiring up the entire zoo. As for the gates and fences, Landon had decided to use golden rod like fences like the ones used at the French Palace of Versailles. Back on Earth, the Golden Gates had to be 2.5 meters tall, and will also be as wide as a two-lane road. For security purposes, two security posts will also be added at each end of the gate, as well as several other security posts along different positions all around the zoo's premises. Just in case someone tries to sneak in, or cause any troubles. As for those who made the car park, Landon had instructed them to make the bus stop somewhere within the car park itself. As for the train stop dot 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 Landon had also decided to place it at the left hand of the car park. So all the workers had to do was pave a pathway for the visitors to walk from the train stop to the car park. Dot. The workers worked swiftly, and after two more days, they had successfully completed the zoo's front entrance. They completely tarred and painted the car park. 
as well as paved the entrance space using the pavers, spreaders, and other heavy machines. Up next, Landon focused on building the first sector of the park. This sector would have that massive building for entrance fees, booking tours and so on. This sector also had another bus park the for the zoo's tour buses, animal ambulance cars, and so on. This building would be three stories high and would also be extremely wide. On the ground floor, one section would be dedicated to the zoo's fire station and trucks. There will also be multiple sections for visitor check-ins, tour and activity bookings, a massive food court, zoo store for buying zoo merchandise, and the zoo's main security station all at the ground floor. Some of these facilities may even occupy up to two floors like the fire station. If anyone back on Earth had ever gone to a large mall before, then they would instantly know what Landon meant. There were some stores in the mall, like H&M or Gucci, that had both upstairs and downstairs compartments within their stores. So for the fire station section within the building, Landon wanted to give them two floors. They would have a pole at the center and slide right back down if need be. The zoo's police station would also have this privilege, as they may need a cell to lock up any troublemakers, until they get transferred to Baymard's main police station. The second floor will also have first aid and childcare center, conference rooms, staff rooms with lockers and rest areas, and the third floor will be filled with offices for the accountants, secretaries, and so on. And more other conference rooms too. Dot. Construction continued as usual. And very quickly, Landham and the workers had proceeded to work on different areas around the zoo, apart from focusing on animals. Most zoos also gave the opportunity for biological studies of certain birds and plants. Hence Landon had also decided to create certain garden scenes around the zoo. The plants would be labeled. And in the future, biology students could come here on field trips and learn more on them as well. There would also be a butterfly house, and bird house for visitors to see as well. Time flew by. And Baymard had already entered its third week of July. Yes. It had been opened to the public for the time being, but who knew about it being open apart from Santa? Right now, all he was looking forward to, was the arrival of his special guests. A few more days, and he could finally start discussing the treaty. Chapter 233 King Lecter Parsley the Capital, Empire of Tariq. Dot. My king, queen mother, he survived, answered a forty-something year old man, who was kneeling to the annoying young king before him. King Lecter Parsley III III. Lecter was the thirteenth son of his father, former King Michael Parsley. Even though Lecter was the thirteenth prince, his oldest brother the first prince was just nineteen years old. While he on the other hand, was seventeen years old. His father had seven wives, four concubines and nine live-making vessels in his harem. Lecter's mother Queen Kamara, who was the sixth wife in the harem, had schemed her way into giving him the position of king. She had poisoned her husband, and had forced him to agree upon his wishes. She had gotten one of the renowned apothecaries from the continent of Morgany, to concoct this toxin for her. At first, former King Michiel thought that he would be able to cure himself. But after verifying from his royal apothecaries that this poison was strange and had no cure, he had no choice but to follow her wishes. Their deal was simple. Every time he agreed on her wishes, she would give him a small dose of the antidote as a reward. But of course how could Kamara let him become fully cured? Mixed within the antidote, was another deadly poison that would slowly kill her husband. This poison was similar to the poison that Landon previously had. The only difference was that this one would take several years to kill its victim and all through these years before the victim died dot 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 the poison would leave the victim weak and bedridden, with no strength to even get up from their beds. During July last year, she had begun her scheme, and had poisoned her husband very swiftly, and within that time, she had successfully executed four wives, two concubines and all the lovemaking vessels within the harem, she had killed them alongside their own children under the farce of treason. So far, 
Only the first and fourth wives had managed to escape with their children. She had been searching for them ever since, but sadly, they were nowhere to be found. From the looks of it, they had probably escaped out of Tariq. But where could they have gone to? It's been close to eight months since she last saw or heard from them. And right now, the entire empire was under her control. Although she was worried, she knew that she had a strong backer. Dot dot dot, so she never really bothered with them. Her backer was her super wealthy and ridiculously powerful elder brother, Master Nopline. It was he who had invited the apothecary, as well as worked out her entire plan. Apart from him, she also had the full support of her true love and the real father and her children, Raoul Parsley. Yes, Raoul was former King Michael's junior brother. Before getting married to Michael, she and Raoul were an item in secret. But when Raoul saw that Michael liked her, they both devised a long-standing plan to take the throne for themselves. Raoul had to get married as well. But even after marriage, no one had ever taken the title as wife. They were all just concubines. No one knew the reason for this, but she knew that it was preserved for her. Anyway, she, Raoul and Nopline had been planning these schemes for years now. Michael Parsley had too many loyal supporters in power so they had no choice but to wait for the opportune time. Finally, her chance came and she had successfully placed her son as king. At first, the ministers were furious, as they knew that the first prince should have been the one whom his majesty had decided on. But when they saw Michael who was bedridden to the point that he couldn't even talk or write, dot, they knew that he was dying. Some of them even had a hunch that it was poison, but they dared not speak lest the new king kills them alongside their entire families in a fit of rage. If his majesty could speak again, then they would want him to testify against Kamara. Even though they had shut their traps, their hearts still couldn't accept that they would have such a king. Lecter was a good for nothing. He was terrible at swordsmanship, and also bad at understanding or commanding armed forces. In short, what he did most of the time was to eat, play with women, throw parties and so on. His lifestyle was nothing similar to that of a king. His mother and her forces were the real brains of the operation. They did everything in his name. So even his enemies from far away thought that he was the one who issued several orders. And to make matters worse, this chubby pig liked cutting people's hands off for the smallest grievances. The ministers felt like crying every time they thought of the empire's future. Dot. Ah, how is he still alive? What good are you all? Kamara yelled out angrily. I thought you said that it was a done deal. Lecter spoke while chewing loudly and holding a large piece of chicken's leg from his plate. Burp. The knights who were kneeling on the floor couldn't help but frown in disgust. What a pig, they thought. My king, queen mother. We had followed your orders and sent 24 assassins strategically to Eli Barn during the border wars. But it seemed like he was also prepared as well. One of the men replied. Kamara looked at the man and sneered. Are you saying that it's my fault then? TSK, I gave you a simple task, yet you blame your failure on a woman? And what about the other task? Why haven't you found those traitors yet? Are you going today that him to blame for that one as well? Exclamation mark. Dot dot. Dot 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 let me give you all a word of advice. You all are just useless dogs that are meant to serve my royal family. So never forget your place. Now, I'm giving you all four more months to send out your spies around the Pino continent. I want news, and I now at it now. Chapter 234 The Culinary and Bartending Academy With a few days left before Santa's arrival, Landon decided to go around Baymard for a complete inspection. Previously whilst he was working on the zoo, he had requested for other things to be done as well. Firstly, Chef Blake and Chef Benita had personally come up to him, requesting for a culinary school to be opened. Of course he thought this was a marvelous idea, as food was one of the world's major concerns. Hence he decided to start construction on the world's first culinary and bartending academy. And by late November, he expected construction to be completed. This culinary academy would be open to everyone in Hertfilia, be it visitors or those from Baymard. Landon felt like it should be so, because good food was meant to be shared, and not hidden. In this era, 
people generally didn't know how to properly cook or use several ingredients. Hence Landon felt like educating them wouldn't necessarily be a bad thing to do. Firstly, he wasn't scared of his technology being exposed. Because they would have no way of knowing how some of these cooking materials came about. During their classes, they might be asked to use the cooking stove, fridge, oil, butter, cardboard milk, granulated sugar and so on. But what does that have to do with the industrial production methods of these items? Sure, they might know that granulated sugar comes from a sugar beets plant. But how does one change a wet juicy plant into grains of sugar? There was no way that they would know all the chemicals, additives and other industrial procedures needed for manufacturing them. TSK. And what about things like fridges? In short, there was really nothing that scared Landon about this matter. Secondly, he felt like this was a good way for Baymard to create wealth. By allowing these international students to use Baymard's products, he would be making them become more reliant on these goods as time went by. For example, if they were now used to Baymard's ingredients. Dot. Then when they got back to their empires or continents, they would immediately order large bulks to be used there as well. And if they stayed in the dormitories, then they would have the luxury of using mattresses and so on. Which they could order and ship again to their empires too, be it from food, to house needs. This academy would give Baymard free publicity for most of its products. The only thing that might make the international students cry, was the fact that their empires wouldn't have electricity, water supply, heating and sewage treatment. This would definitely make them weak, because even if they learnt using an electrical cooker, they still needed to go to their countries and practice over large open fires. Even the privilege of fridges and so on, were not available in their empires. So it would definitely be a hassle to them. But that wasn't what this academy was meant to focus on. Adaptation was part of their training. Dot. As for the academy's educational side. Dot 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 it would have two main types of bachelor degree programs, culinary and bartending. Those who choose to have a bachelor's in culinary arts, would learn, the true values of being a chef as well as the ethics and code of conducts for all chefs. Proper knife skills, and cooking methods, be it baking, deep frying, pan frying, steaming and so on. Effects of heat when cooking. Food safety and sanitation, which also includes how to access good, bad expired and rotten raw materials for cooking. How to adapt one's cooking in various circumstances be it whether they had an electric cooker or not. How to know and estimate when food is properly cooked. Time management, communication and group leadership, proper restaurant management and customer etiquette, serving skills, setting the guests tables, customer satisfaction and so on. Beverage servings, like what beverage goes best with what foods. How to cook several palates that existed back on earth. Meat seafood and food preparation. And finally, nutritional science, studying the food properties of the raw materials. Be it thyme leaves, butter, cardboard milk and so on. As well as knowing the health benefits of each raw material. Like those that give vitamin A and those that would be bad for people with different allergies. In short, he was teaching the students everything there was to know about cooking. Dot. As for the culinary structure. It will take five years for them to graduate with a bachelor's degree, four years in school, and one whole year doing an internship. The school might give them an internship in Baymard, or send them to any of the empires or continents that had a signed treaty with them. Of course if they were going out of Baymard, then the school will send them in groups of twenty, and will also assign one teacher to each group. This teacher would be in charge of grading and assessing their entire performance, while they were there. These students might even cook in places like the Royal Palace of Corona. So they had to do their best at all times. One had to know that this academy would be open to everyone on Hertfilia. So Landon was expecting the school grounds to be packed and full. Empires might send their chefs to learn and other merchants and business personnel might do the same as well. Hence Landon had to make sure that he got it right. Now under this Bachelor in Culinary Arts, the students could also major and minor in, baking, 
pastries and desserts, seafood, meat and poultry, pantry and breakfast cooking, general and fine cuisine, culinary nutrition and menu designing, food sanitation. Dot. With these majors, the students could become chefs, food policy workers, caterers, menu developers and so on. For those who choose to continue on to their master's degree, they would study for an additional two years as well. Three semester studying, and another semester doing an internship. For these internships, be it masters or bachelors, they had to do it before their last school semester or year. Anyway for the master students, they could specialize in food and nutrition, international cuisine, baking and pastries, food preparation and sanitation, wine and beverage management, restaurant, kitchen and food service management. These master degree holders could become food critics, head senior chefs, executive chefs, restaurant managers, and so on. In short, both bachelor and master degree holders could work wherever there was need for food, be it hospitals, hotels, restaurants, schools, retirement homes and even cruise ships. All in all, Landon was pleased with the Academy's culinary structure. Chapter 235 The Culinary and Bartending Academy 2 Moving on from the culinary side of the academy. Those who choose to focus on bartending, would learn, code of ethics and conducts, as a bartender. Alcohol nutrition contributions and effects on customers with certain allergies. Time management skills, leadership skills, communication skills and the laws and etiquettes partaking to alcohols. How to cut fruit and decorate tropical and other specialty cocktails. Basic and fancy recipes. How to understand wine service and tasting. Bartending serving and shaking skills. Knowledge on how to use all glassware and bartending tools. Safety and sanitation. Customer service and socialization. Bar management set up and daily activities, bar cost regulators and control. Dot. For bartending, the students would only study for a maximum of three years. Dot 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 where five semesters will be spent studying, and the last one will be spent on an internship. And after their first year of taking general courses, the students could major or minor in any of the specialities below. Bar preparations, beers, wine, spirits, cocktails, mixology and recipes, safety and sanitation, alcohol and fruit servings. With all this in mind, those who successfully graduated could work anywhere with a bar within its vicinity, be it hotels, restaurants, bars, resorts, parties, nightclubs, cruise ships and so on. Anyway, be it bartending or culinary work. Once the students graduate, they would be given their licenses for their individual professions. Of course these licenses would expire every four years. And after that period of time, the owners of these licenses would need to retake another exam again and renew them as well. Dot. Moving on to the Academy's entrance examination, Landon wanted it to be somewhat special. In truth, his fantasies were running a little bit wild. Dot 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 because he wanted the same or eye inspiring exam like the one in Hunter x Hunter. He just wanted it to seem like a big deal to everyone around the world. Of course, in the Academy's case, rather than fighting, they would cook, show their knife skills, pick out the right ingredients used to create certain dishes, and so on. There would be eight exams in total, all done within four days. For example, when they first arrived, the instructor might ask them to make a dish that would please him with the main ingredient being an egg. They could use any other ingredients, but the egg's overall richness shouldn't be drowned out in any of their dishes. For the next exam, the instructor might allow them to taste different dishes. And their only goal would be to identify the ingredients used for making the dishes. They could also be asked to spot bad ingredients or cut tomatoes, greens or onions, so as to show their knife techniques. Of course for this first year, Landon wasn't going to go hard on those who came to study. He would set exams which was 60% passable based on this era's cooking knowledge. But as years go by, the entrance examination was going to be legendary. He wanted the school to be an elite school for cooking. 
where one would feel like they had made it just from passing the examinations. Also, since proper bartending wasn't that well respected and common, Landon felt like he should add it at part of the entrance exams. The students would have fruits, alcohols, ice, a blowtorch, and several tools in front of them. Their main goal would be to create new cocktail recipes and serve their instructors. Even if the taste of their cocktail was somewhat bad, the instructor would also check several other things, like customer service, serving skills and so on. In general, everyone within the academy would learn about culinary and bartending during their first school year, and after that, they could specialize in whatever they wanted. This was a great way for Landon to introduce them to bartending. As for living quarters, Landon wanted the academy to have dormitories or residences that would be assigned to the students based on their results. Landon wanted the whole dormitory situation to be like how normal universities have their own residences for their students. But now, Landon wanted to expand that idea and build the residences to be extremely huge like apartment complexes in large cities. These residences were all going to be 14 extremely wide six-story buildings that could house over hundreds of people in it. And since this was a cooking and bartending school, competition was definitely important in motivating the students. So the first four floors of each residence would have a total of 52 apartments, with each apartment having four students in it. At the fifth floor up, only two students would be in the apartment. And finally, the sixth floor would have students in massive studio apartments. This was the deal. Those who came in now would all fit into the first four floors. Each floor would have a massive kitchen within it. And at the start and the middle of the semester, each floor would have its residences compete with each other. From there, only the top 30 from each floor would be considered as winners. Making a total of 120 winners from all four floors. Dot. Again, these winners would compete against each other and the top 15 would go to the 6th floor where the massive studio apartments were. As for those within the 16th to 40th positions, they would go to the 5th floor, which were the two room apartment complexes. One should know that Landon had planned to make the 6th and 5th floors luxurious, which were all the perks of being the best. But how could Landon stop the Once all the 6th floor top students in all the residences were chosen, they would then compete with each other again. And from there, the school's elite top 10 team would be chosen as well. As elites, how could they share their residences with others? Landon had decided to specifically build another massive six-story building for them. Of course he wouldn't build the same sized building just for 10 elites. As he felt like that would be too much. The normal residences could house at least 200 people on one floor as each apartment had four rooms in it. So how could he construct the buildings for elites to be that huge? He chose to build a thin six-story building that could take two massive studios suite apartments on each floor. The ground floor would have a massive kitchen, dining region and so on. But from the second floor, the 10th and 9th elite students would have their apartments there, while the 8th and 7th will have theirs on the third floor. Dot. And this would continue until the first and second elite students resided on the sixth floor. Even though the building was a lot thinner than the other residences, each elite suite would have massive space, walk-in closets and other top-notch facilities around their apartments. And apart from this, the elites would get 30% off all food items in Bay Mud, and many other perks. Of course if the other students wanted such privileges, then they needed to work twice as hard to reach their goals. And once they felt comfortable enough, they could issue out challenges to the top 15 or 40 within their respective buildings. Or even to the elites. If they won, they would sit on the loser's position as the new top 14th or whatever seat position they went for. Back on Earth, Landon loved watching Shogun Food Wars with Yukihira Soma. Forget it. Dot. Food wars were a must. How could he miss such a grand opportunity? Never. They were going to compete, and that was that. Anyway, the culinary sector would have its own top 10 elites. And the bartending sector would have its own as well. Let the Academy War begin. Chapter 236 A New World, 
New Adventures Riverdale City, Arc 18. My Lord, am here to report the status of my mission. In the luxurious audience room, several knights were currently standing before their city lord. Report, my lord, I've successfully bought 1,300 new slaves from different cities around the base. As per your instructions, they are all aged 15 to 18 years old. We will train them in the way of the sword from now on my lord. Also, for those who we forced. We had kidnapped their family members as well, so the Lord doesn't need to worry about their loyalty towards you. Only by training and fighting our battles, will they be able to see their loved ones. As for their family members, we kept them at the other base my Lord. They are working there as farmers and maids. Captain Tommy said, Excellent. Captain Hook. What about your mission? Any news? Marder asked, My Lord. For now. There wasn't any news concerning the mysterious force that killed Master Shannon. Marder frowned as he listened on. But are you sure that the war happened within that valley area? Yes my lord. Even though the snow had cleared away most of the evidence, we saw several piles of huge boulder pieces that had several cracks on them. And from the way that they were spread around, it was safe to say that they had been dropped from the cliffs above. There were also several deep holes around the valley's road, that also supported our thoughts about people dropping G's huge boulders from the cliffs onto the valley. Apart from that, after searching for over nine more days, we also found several torn knight uniforms with the master's crest on them. As well as several other rusted swords that were buried deep within the rubble. Some of these swords had the Shannon family's crests on them my lord. Captain Hook said. Of course Landon had planted the evidence there, just in case. It seems like the battle truly happened there. To ambush my father at a time like that meant that the person was aware of my father's summon to the capital. In everyone's mind, the culprit was either Alec Barn or Baron Kane. Swayze. What about you? Marder asked, my lord. Day in and day out, we have been keeping watch at the roads fervently. And within this period, those knights from Baymard haven't made any moves to attack us yet. Captain Swayze replied, just as I thought. Those men were never there to harm us in the first place. All right. By the end of this week, send even Shylock to have a look at the city. Yes my lord. Underscore. Far away from the troubles within Riverdale City, a ship full of inquisitive passengers. Were quickly heading towards their vacation destination. Dot. The ocean. Dot. Whoosh. 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 The waves swished against the ship in a transient manner. Gently rising and falling steadily as each wave rolled in as strong and bold as the last one, like a living work of art, the scattered rays of light magnified the rich deep bluish color of the ocean, making it seem like an ever-changing painting. Uncle, are we there yet? asked an impatient cute little six-year-old girl, who was currently pouting from boredom. You see those tiny figures far from here? That's where we're heading to, Santa replied, while pointing towards Baymard. Dot. For this trip apart from his crewmates, and 30 royal guards, Santa had brought 26 other people with him. He had brought those from the royal family with him. Along with his mother, father, three sisters and their children. From the royal family, he had brought, former King Carmelo and his wives Megara and Uthana, Grandpa Adrian, Duchess Mina Carmelo's sister, her husband Duke Richard, and their three children. Draven and Alex and Layla. And from his own family, Santa had brought, his father Baron Hamilton and his mother, Olivia, his three sisters, Nora, Stella, and Willow. As well as their children and husbands too. Dot. The children were somewhat restless, as they had been forced and dragged into this vacation by their parents. What was so good about the place that they were going to? How different was it from their luxury homes? In fact, Everyone had the same thoughts as well. Santa had only told them that if they didn't come, then they would miss out big time. So everything was somewhat mysterious to them. Duchess Mina's children, who were Penelope's cousin, 
thought that this brother-in-law of theirs had been duped, while Santa's nephews all thought that this uncle of theirs had hit his head too hard on a rock, just what sort of place was so marvelous that they had to be dragged out like this, and if it was so great, how come they had never heard of it before, as for the adults, they were just curious to see what Baymard looked like, even though this place could make these strange VIP passes. They still felt like it would never look grand or magnificent as Corona's capital city. But a few hours later, they soon realized how wrong they were. Oh my heavens, pinch me, I must be dreaming, mom. What's that? How, how, how did they achieve all of this? Underscore. As the ship closed in on the harbor, those on board were utterly overwhelmed by the sight before them. Their eyeballs popped out, and their lips slightly quivered. As they looked at the magnificent harbor that seemed to stretch further into the ocean. How did they do it? Adrian squeezed the ship's wooden balcony in excitement, as the ship finally docked at the harbor. Dot. Welcome to Baymard, im harbor guide Frieder, and I will be in charge of leading you all to the coastal port for check-in. Standing before them, was one of Baymard's harbor guides, before the ship had docked. The woman had walked over from one of the many office posts around the shores. Her clothing was strange, unique, classy and gorgeous. Looking at her, one would think that she was royalty as well. The woman wore a grey shirt, blue blazer, blue pants had a blue necktie around her neck. Her hair was tied up, she was wearing a gold-coloured watch, tiny gold-coloured earrings, and her blazer had a name tag on it as well. In fact, she looked like a confident professional boss who knew what to do at all times. As they followed behind her and listened to her tour guide couldn't help but praise her remarkable manner of speech. She was telling them the importance of all the other buildings that they had passed by. She spoke about reporting theft or crimes to the police station a little distance from them as well as were the areas that are privy to visitors and so on. Her enthusiastic and warm manner of speech, made them feel very welcomed at Baymard. They smiled and nodded, as they listened on to the polite lady moving alongside them. First impressions were always the most important, and so far, they had been completely sold by Baymard's care and attention towards them. Forget it. Dot. Hands down. This was the best port experience that they had ever had. Dot. Standing outside the massive port building, they couldn't help but loom at the beautiful glass-like building in awe. Was this glass? And how did they gather it all? Wasn't glass one of the scariest things around? So how could they have this much? The men felt like their brains were about to explode just by looking at the magnificent glass building. In truth. Landon had built it to resemble an airport. So he had built it using a ton of glass. The men felt like they would faint any time from now, just from looking at the entire structure. How rich was this Landon fellow, to actually allocate all these glass resources in one place? And how many workers did he use to build it? Did 50,000 men gather these glass pieces and place them by hand one by one? Everyone looked at Santa suspiciously as they just couldn't come up with any ideas of how this structure was built. At the center of the building, the words Coastal Port was written in bold red for all to see. Again, at the front of the building, they could also see a massive strange flag hanging around the building. Obviously this flag was Baymard's national flag. Everyone kept turning around in circles, as they moved forward in amazement. And just when they got close to the huge glass doors, Magic happened. Shoop. The door opened on its own. Silence. Everyone froze as they looked at the magic doors. Of course the doors could open due to sensor systems which were pretty much a four-step method to produce. Sensor systems already existed, as that's how temperatures and pressures were controlled in the industrial plants. As well as the street lights all around. Dot. The guide looked at them from inside and smiled warmly at them while indicating that it was okay for them to cross over these mysterious doors that led to another dimension. But once they saw Santa cross over while smiling at them, they quickly sucked in a lot of air and moved forward as well. Old geezers, why are you hesitating now? You're scared right? Santa said playfully. Hump. Who's scared? Garmelo replied. Damn brat. Dot 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 if you can do it. 
then I can do it too, Adrain said, everyone looked at the duo and shook their heads helplessly, this father and son were exactly alike, once they saw Santa safely in, the children quickly rushed in as well, they were quite curious about this new world that they had been tossed into, what other magical items could they find, as they passed through the mysterious glass door, their excited hearts began pounding as hard and loud as a drum, a new world, new adventures, chapter 237 welcome to Baymard stepping through the magical doors, everyone was taken aback at the massive interior, the floor was all layered with grey marbles tiles, with some black marble tiles forming distinctive lines across certain sections within the vicinity, just up front, there was a massive board that said, welcome to Baymard, and apart from that, there were also several other sign boards with arrows, that said things like, station 1, station 2, restrooms, VIPs, help desk, workers only, and so on, of course there was security around as well, should in case someone was here to cause any troubles, there were several weight engine line retractable rope dividers up ahead, as well as several 35 wide spaced reception stations at the front, amongst these stations, 15 were for visa approval, 10 were for check-in, 2 were for lost and found help services, and finally, 8 were for docking fees and reschedules, when people get their visas approved, they would go over to the stations that registered and paid for docking fees, the ships were like cargo, hence they had to be treated as such, previously when these ships got docked, the guides would give the visitors a card which had a number on it, it could say, a1 or B6 and so on, so when the visitors got to these stations within the coastal port, they would give these number card to the workers here, and from there, based on their visas, the workers would come up with the exact time for when their ships needed to leave Baymard, usually, the visitors would have the option of choosing any time within the day given to them, provided it was between 8a.m and 9pm, the Baymard coastal port closed at 10p.m, Hence, they needed to leave before then, and if they miss the leaving time, then they would have to wait till the next day and pay an extra fee for lateness. One should know that these ships needed to leave on time, so as to make room for new ships as well. There would always be a schedule for leaving and incoming ships. Also, Landon wanted them to pay for docking after they got their visas, so that if they were rejected, they could just sail away without the whole refund situation happening. Dot. Anyway, after they've paid for their dock spaces, they would then line up at any of the check-in sections for identification verification, and from there, they would pass through the narrow hallways by each check-in station, and proceed onwards. Dividing the visa and check-in stations up was a must, so that if someone already had their visa, then they just needed to check in without any interruptions, of course for VIPs, they had their own separate hallway just between the 14th and 15th check in stations as well, as VIPs, they would be led to a comfortable room that had stood and drinks, and from there, they would be taken care of all through the way, dot, walking into the astonishing building, a drain felt like an explosion had just occurred within his brain, it was the good sort, the type that carried an air of amazement within it, instantly, he felt like he was ten years old again, he felt like running around the massive room and kissing the floor from sheer excitement, but of course, he couldn't, he used to be a king after all, so doing so would be most disgraceful, as for Carmelo, the word amazement didn't quite cover it, he felt like someone just took his spark of wonder and poured kerosene all over it. May I know which one of you are V.I.P.S? asked their guide. Instantly, everyone looked at those ten passes in Santa's hands, as if they were precious rare artifacts. Previously, even though they felt like those passes were well made, they didn't think anything of it. But now, it seemed like VIP got some sort of golden treatment here, son, have I ever told you how proud I am of you, boy, aren't I your father-in-law, dot, are you trying to cheat me out of this after stealing my daughter away, uncle, have I ever told you that my hero, underscore, a few minutes later, 
all the passes had landed in the hands of most of the adults. There were only ten passes, so the unfortunate adults and the children all went to line up for visa approval, while the VIPs went to their cozy lounge. In there, the staffs would take care of everything for them in VIP style. Dot. After everyone had checked in, they passed through a screening and baggage storage section. Of course back at the harbor. They had been given several airport baggage trolleys, for placing their bags and metal trunks. All this time, their royal guards have been pushing the trolleys behind them. The baggage trolleys came in all sizes from small to large. And was very effective for those with too much cargo. When they first say the wheeled trolleys, they felt a little embarrassed for using trunks. The trunks were extremely heavy, and had to be carried by several people on hand or carried on some Eon's head. But this trolley thing just trolled their trunks away as if it was nothing. They couldn't help but shake their heads wryly, at Baymard's thoughtfulness. Once within the screening and baggage storage section, they immediately placed their weapons on several trays at the sides as per the guard's instructions, and passed through large metal detector doors. VRRMMM. The conveyor belt began to move, and the tray moved towards the guards ahead. Once again, they had found another magical item. As for the metal detecting door, it generally followed the theory of electromagnetic waves and magnetism. All one needs is a battery, control box, transmitter circuit and a transmitter coil. Place those up together, and one could even make those tiny metal detectors used for looking for treasures around the beaches. Anyway since swords and weapons weren't allowed within Baymard, the men had to register their weapons and store them within the coastal port. At the end of it all, they were given receipts and a card that had a number on it. Of course this number showed what locker their items were locked in. And while that was going on, their luggages were thoroughly checked for any other weapons as well. Dot. Leaving this section, they were immediately sent to the booking section, where they could book and pay for bus services to Baymard. But what exactly was a bus? Chapter 238 Welcome to Baymard Tours for the VIP members, they had the option of using a VIP bus or getting individual car rides, but since they came with their family at the ordinary section, they chose to forego these options and join the rest of their family members. So far, they had been extremely pleased with their preferential treatment here. They had eaten the chicken wings, pizza, ice cream and other heavenly food items dot 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 as well as drank some of the awesome beverages around, like champagne. They were also given little bags that had a welcome message from the king, free pens, and many more goods. This VIP show was something. After meeting up with the rest of the gang, everyone immediately began shopping to their heart's content. Dot. I'm getting this one. Honey. Do you think that this hat looks good on me? This lip gloss thing is really amazing. Mummy mummy. Can I have this pink bag please? Look. This is used for writing. They call it a pen. Look at this one. They said it's a watch and it tells the time, what, underscore. The gang felt like these items were the best that they had ever seen. Even the guards couldn't help but agree as well. If they had known that Baymard was like this, then they would've tried to bring their wives as cooks for the trip or something. The children were excited as well, as they could also see pens, books, and cool bags of all colors with the words Baymard on them. Fifteen minutes passed by in a blink of an eye. And soon, they could see a magnificent giant carriage driving towards them. Where were the horses? What was happening here? Everyone quickly went out like mindless zombies, who were stuck in stupor at the sight before them. The glorious red-colored carriage stood firm and tall, like a warrior on the battlefield. At least in their eyes, this carriage was way sturdier than those wooden carriages that they were used to. Santa looked at their expressions and smiles. Been there, done that, he thought. Dot. Once everyone got on and sat on the soft cushions, they all looked over at Santa again. If eyes could kill, he would be dead by now. How dare he come h 6 so multiple times and not even bother to take them as well. Wasn't this guy just stingy? Would it kill him to just bring them along too? Even Santa's father and mother, Baron Hamilton and Olivia, 
were somewhat dissatisfied with this son of theirs. But they had all forgotten that not long ago, most of them had wanted to kill Santa for dragging them all away from Corona to Baymard. As the bus proceeded, the bus guide began talking to them with the help of the bus's radio speaker facilities. Once again, I would like to welcome you all to Baymard. As per your bookings, you will be making a stop at the Four Star Winnie Hotel. And while we make our way there, I will give you all a brief tour of Baymard. Silence. How? How come the guide's voice was that loud? And how dot 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 forget it? At this point, they had decided to accept the fact that Baymard was in another world other than Hurtfilia. Sitting on the bus, their expressions were filled with infinite impatience. As they passed through the numerous towering buildings. Some areas had two-story buildings, others had three or four-story buildings and so on. The ride was smooth and the passengers had no uncomfortable experience with it. One should know that in a regular carriage that was pulled by horses, one could be jolted more than 15 times within a single trip. But this one could even make them feel sleepy, if they weren't filled with so much excitement right now. They stretched their necks to like chickens, as they constantly looked from left to right, and front to back. Dot. Dear passengers, just in front of each seat, are four main documents, a bus schedule, train schedule, booklet and what we call a brochure or pamphlet. These two items show all activities that are available for you all within Baymard. Everyone quickly took out the map and opened it. Dumb. Dot. How could it be so detailed? The booklet had several pages that went into detail on all hotels, library, police stations, public school and entertainment activities, as well as what these places offer, their addresses street name and number and a map that showed one its exact location around Baymard. With this small booklet, if someone wanted to report a crime, they could just look at the address and map, and head on towards the station. Likewise, if they wanted to go to the park, to the hospital, register as international students at the public school, or extend their stay at the government offices, this booklet would lead them on the right path. Of course only the things accessible to guests were placed within the booklet. As for the foldable brochure, it gave a welcome speech from the king, and also spoke about their most important things to do when one came into Baymard. It says that we have to open something called a bank account. It seems that it has something to do with their money. It also says that we can pay the hotel deposit with coins. And from there, we only have 2,436 hours to get paper money and complete the entire fee. Also, only by getting this bank account, will we be able to shop and really enjoy ourselves in Baymard. Underscore. As they read through the brochure, they immediately set their plan into motion. And Dune, they had finally arrived at their four-star Winnie Hotel. Dot. Stepping out, they were once again blown away by the professionalism and well-tailored outfits of the hotel employees. Once everyone was given the keys to their rooms, and shown how to use these keys, they couldn't help but sigh. This key thing was really genius. No one could enter unless they had them as well. Adrian placed his hand on his chest, as he felt like this Baymard had shocked his heart too many times. Anyway, since Santa was funding the entire trip, he placed the guards and his crewmen in double bedded rooms, as well as the children. Of course the couples had their own suites as well. Look! Water is coming out on its own. What sort of torch is this? How can this bed be so soft? Goodness! Is this tabletop is made of glass as well? Honey, this metal box is producing cold air. Dot. After everyone was done jumping on their beds, and showing appreciation to all the fixtures in their rooms. They immediately regrouped and headed towards the bank, and from there, they had planned to see this almighty king. Did he have two heads? Was he even human? As they stepped out of the hotel, they couldn't help but smile broadly. Soon, they would finally get the chance to see King Landon Barn. Chapter 239 Meeting the King The gang excitedly proceeded to the bank. And an hour and a half later, they had all been thoroughly briefed about their new bank accounts, as well as the use of money here. In essence, 
one copper coin was equivalent to 0.7 bay. 0.7 bay equals 1 cc. They had been told about the exchanges, as well as what the importance of their individual account books. Everyone above the age of 15 could open up an account. And parents who want to plan for their children, could open things like trust funds and so on. They were all impressed with the banking system and felt like this sort of system should be applied in Corona as well. So, we can make money just by leaving our money in our accounts? Dot. Amazing. I like this system. This way, no one can touch Anon's money without permission. Kid. Are these the royal family members on these Bay Paper notes? Everyone's eyes twinkled, as they looked at the shinny money in their hands. They immediately bought some wallets from within the bank and placed some of their money in it, just like the workers had said. Dot. Stepping out of the bank, they were immediately greeted by twenty men and women, who were dressed in greenish camouflage attires. Salu esteemed guests, Gary commanded, and immediately, the rest of the soldiers placed their feet close together and their right hands on their heads. They looked like an organized unit of ants performing the same actions at the same time. Amazing. Their majestic display of self-discipline and attentiveness had won Baron Hamilton's respect. He was a battle fanatic, who was always crazy about training men daily and fulfilling official duties daily. This level of self-restraint was something that wasn't easy to learn or do already. He was somewhat curious about their training methods, not just him. All the men, even the royal guards and young boys who were pages and squires, were amazed and curious as well. And to their surprise, they could also spot several women amongst the group as well. Previously, they had thought that Corona was the only place that accepted women to join the Empire's forces. But now, they were pleased to see that Baymard was quite similar to them in this aspect as well. Dot. Welcome to Baymarda's teamed guests. King Landon Barn had sent for us to check on you all. He humbly asks to know your schedules, so that he could arrange a time to meet you all. If you all are available now, then we could lead you to his majesty. But if it is inconvenient right now, then we will be here to know your availability on the matter. Everyone here is his majesty's honored guest, so whatever works for you will work for his majesty too, Gary said with a welcoming smile on his face, Elder Gary. Of course well go now, duh, Santa said playfully while poking Gary's jaw, over the last mission, he and Gary had bonded as well as they sailed for a month towards Corona, our schedules are not important, we can see him now, yes yes, well go now, we want to see him too, underscore, no problem esteemed guests, Please follow us and board this VIP bus, Gary said, while pointing towards a sleek black colored bus behind him. Right now, even though cars have been manufactured, they wouldn't be launched till a few days from now. Landon wanted to put on a car show for the citizens, so that they could know the cars better. Presently, the people had been taking driving exams, using some of the manufactured cars. So once the car show ends, the car shops would be officially opened and everyone could buy their own cars and drive around the city, provided they have their driver's license. As of now, the people used the buses or trains to quickly get around Baymard. VRMMM, the bus took off, and after a while, they had finally arrived at the grandest castle that they had ever seen. Everyone sighed in defeat. Forget Corona, this palace was probably the most beautiful one in the entire Pino continent. Scratch that the best in the entire Hurtfilia, and stepping into the palace's main building, they all thought that they would faint from constantly being shocked, a man could only take so much, alright, everyone became slightly nervous, as they felt like they were going to meet a living god, only Santa seemed normal, walking past the stunning room with mirrored walls, they quickly stepped into another large hall, little bro, as if on cue, Everyone looked up at the massive golden stairway and saw twelve figures descending. Dot. Landon was wearing a white outfit similar to his Prince Charming one, while Lucius was wearing a black colored one and Biri wore a blue colored one. On their outfits, one could see badges on them as well. As for little Momo, he wore a blue prince outfit, 
and Linda wore a pink princess gown. On the other hand, Mother Kim, Mother Winnie and Grace all wore simple but elegant colored clothing pieces, that made them look like Greek goddesses. The styles were somewhat similar to Megara's outfit in Hercules, but more covered up around the chest region. And finally, Lucy wore a white roar and outfit that made her look like she was a beautiful fairy queen from a mythical realm. Major General Josh, Mike and Captain Thray, were also there. And they wore their military uniforms as well. For Landon, all these people were his family members so it was best for them to meet these esteemed guests. Of course Scary was also present, as he had brought in the guests from the bank. Dot. Tip, tip, tip. As the immortals descended, everyone below almost forgot to breath. In their eyes, these beings were definitely immortals. Just like the sun, they gave off a feeling of having people orbiting around them as they shone brightly. The bright sunny smile from these immortals, warmed up as they watched them inch closer and closer towards them. Just when they were basking in the glory of these stunning beings, someone just had to ruin their glorious vision. Dot. Little bro dot 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 uncles. Aunties. Im back. Underscore. Chapter 240 Meeting the King 2 Little bro dot 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 uncles. Aunties. Im back. Underscore. Dot. You little brat, can't you see that this is not the time for this? The gang thought, as they watched the shameless Santa run towards the descending immortals. Baron Hamilton felt like spanking this disgraceful son of his, while Olivia felt throwing their shoes at the idiot. Carmelo and Adrian looked up to the ceiling and prayed for patience, while the children all buried their heads in their hands in shame. Duchess Mina, the other women, men and guards who had followed, also felt like hitting Santa for the very first time. Hey was this punk always like this? Since they didn't know these immortals personally, they didn't want them to be offended by Santa. Hence, they were somewhat worried. But after seeing that the immortals didn't mind, everyone sighed from relief. Phew. It seemed like they were close after all. After Santa freed Landon from his bear hug, Landon immediately stepped forward to greet the gang. Welcome to Baymard everyone. Benjamin has told me so much about you all. In Landon Barn, this is my mother Kim Mobley. The introductions proceeded with both sides introducing themselves to each other. And at the end, Mother Kim, Mother Winnie, Grace and Lucy took the women away for fun, while little Momo and Linda took the kids to go pay at the indoor playroom. As for the royal guards, they were given a day off and told to do whatever they liked around Baymard. And finally, the only people who were left with Landon were the men. He quickly led them to his cozy study room, as he knew that they had private matters to discuss with him. Dot. On behalf of Corona, I'd like to thank you all for assistance, Carmelo said while bowing. Immediately, all the men bowed as well. Without Landon's help, who knows what other things Nopline would've done in future. With his power, the man could even integrate himself into the Empire, as well as take over it in the nearest future. Landon had destroyed his main roots in Corona, and for that, they will be ever grateful to him. So bowing was the least that they could do. Landon looked at them and smiled. Please. Raise your heads. Honestly, we should be the ones bowing to you instead. I've heard a great deal about Corona and its excellent leaders. From your principles, acts and sense of justice. You all are the type of people that the Pino continent needs to look up to. I've admired you all for a long time, as I truly feel like your earnest efforts has turned Corona into an outstanding empire. Benjamin is my sworn brother. So if ever he or his people were in danger, I would do my best to help at all times. What I did was not just for Corona, but for those innocent, weak and defenseless people who had been dragged into slavery. So please, raise your heads. As we did what we should have done in the first place. If you all really want to thank us, then can we drop this whole formal way of speaking? It makes us sound so distant, Landon said, with a warm smile on his face. Once everyone heard him, they couldn't help but smile as well. Good, good, good. This is how it ought to be, Adrian exclaimed happily while patting Landon's left shoulder. They all felt proud, 
as someone had finally praised their long-standing efforts at changing the continent, people laughed at them for stopping slavery, while others treated them as weaklings. But this immortal king also thought the same way as well. By the way, while we talk, would you all like to play chess? Chess? Dot. What was that? Dot. A while later, everyone was so into the game, old man, cheating, poo yai. Dot. Who needs to cheat when playing with you? This is your second loss. Are you sure that you want to continue on? Don't forget. If you lose, then I get to keep 100 bays. HMMP. You talk too much, play the damn game. Underscore. As they played, Landon began to think about the treaty even more. From the system's rules. He had to sign the treaty within five months, but he also had to sign it after he was officially crowned. Hence he had planned to make the coronation day at the end of next week. Even though they were impressed by what they saw, people like Carmelo and Adrian wouldn't sign a treaty if they didn't know how the people truly lived. Were the people living in slavery, suffering or was all this a front to rope them in? Hence within this time before the coronation. Landon wanted Carmelo and the others to see how the people were living and understand Baymard better. Partnership in itself was a business. No one would allow to partner themselves with any brand or company, if they thought that the brand was doing some shady activities in the dark. After the coronation day, Landon would wait a little more before popping the question. Within this time frame, he hoped that they would better understand what Baymard's lifestyle and promise for the future. As the men played, they began to feel at ease with each other. They started telling jokes, and even playfully teasing each other. And soon, they felt like old pals. At the end, they didn't even notice that they had spent more than four hours in Landon's office. They had played chess, and also fought with each other in the training room within the office. They had bonded extremely well when fighting. What surprised them the most was that these Baymardians were all pros in hand combat. Even immortal Landon was as fierce as a beast when dealing with them. Adrain couldn't help but give two thumbs up, when they watched Landon literally lift Santu up in the air like King in Tekken, and slammed him hard on the foamed padded floors. Awesome. As for Lucius, he had won several times when fighting Carmelo and Baron Hamilton. But this people kept coming back for more beatings, especially Baron Hamilton. One more time, bam, again, bam, again, underscore. Baron Hamilton was confused, he had seen Lucius' hands coming for his chest. So how was it that after blocking it, he would end up lying on the floor. What hand technique was that? He found that he wasn't as flexible as he thought he was. Lucius would bend in all kinds of positions when fighting. Sometimes he would fall to the floor in a split, and other times he would act like a crane. It was like there was no end to his abilities. Adrian looked at these fights, and had immediately assessed that the men here were more proficient than them, be it their king or soldiers. Every one of them was good at close combat. But when the men from Corona were fighting, their fighting stance was always that of someone who was holding a sword or dagger. He couldn't help but think about Landon and his men. What were their training methods? And would they be willing to teach them as well? Landon looked at the men who were deep in thought and smiled. This was the desired effect that he had hoped to achieve from these activities, be it chess or close combat. He wanted to show them the endless possibilities within Baymard. With this, hopefully, they would be more willing to sign the treaty with Baymard. Dot. Saline City, Arcadine. Dot. Is it here? Yes, Your Highness. This is the spot. Good. Lead the way, it's time to end this once and for all.